Imagination, fantasy, daydream. How often we chide others and ourselves for wasting valuable time, for building castles in the air, when we should be concerned with the so-called practical things in life. Perhaps. But this pursuit of the will-o'-the-wisp is truly a safety valve. After all, how long would we endure if we had to live in the real world all of the time. Hello, Tom. What are you doing back in town? Visiting old friends. Well, as an old friend, I want to give you a piece of advice, George. Confess. To what? Murder. Why should I? It'll be good for your soul. Well, now, you ask the average person, and they'll tell you I don't have a soul. mystery drama, The Search for Myra, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Mandel Kramer and Marion Seldes. It is sponsored in part by Sinoff, the Sinoff Committee. The light goes out. The years pass by. And what was it? What happened? It's so hard to remember, so easy to forget. Why bother? Janet? Janet? Janet! Where is that girl? I could have sworn she was sitting at her desk just a minute ago. Probably reading some book. I have put love behind me. I am free of that mistake. You shall seek and never find me. I have no heart for you to break. Oh, oh, Mr. Hastings, uh, did, did you ring? I, I guess I didn't hear you. Um, uh, do you want me to take some dictation? I, uh, I, I thought I was still on my lunch hour. See, I eat in now because I'm going to college at night. I'm taking this course in new poetry, and I was just reading. What was that poem? I have put love behind me? Yes. I am free of that mistake. You shall seek and never find me. I have no heart for you to break. Do you like poetry, Mr. Hastings? Not really. Well, it's a required subject. Oh, you, you did ring for me, didn't you? Yes, I did. Oh, well, I, I'll just pick up my pad. I'll come right in. No, that's all right. I can dictate this right here. Oh, yes, sir. <laughs> it's a funny thing about this poem. It's part of a group of poems. They don't even know who wrote them. Uh, just let me think for a minute. Now, this is to uh, Franklin K. Armstrong, mm -hmm. president of Southeastern State Institute of Technology. Dear President Armstrong... I am honored by your offer of an honorary degree. Mm -hmm. It is... Uh, if, if you'll excuse me, Mr. Hastings, mm -hmm. it, doesn't, it doesn't sound quite right. You know, honored and honorary. Oh, yes, yes, that's right, Myra. Mm -hmm. Well, let, let's start again. Uh, dear President Armstrong, I am flattered uh, by your kindness in uh, considering me a candidate for an honorary degree. Does that sound too humble, Myra? You are 
right, Mr. Hastings. Of course I'm all right. Why shouldn't I be all right? Oh, this is, this is the second time you've done it. Done what? Call me Myra. Myra? Why would I call you Myra? I, I don't know, Mr. Hastings. My name is Janet. I know your name is Janet. Do, um, do I happen to remind you of someone called Myra? I don't know anyone named Myra. Oh, well, it, it isn't important. I just thought I'd call it to your attention. Myra? Why would I call you Myra? George? Yes. Dinner ready? We're dining out. Have you forgotten? Oh, I always forget. That's because basically you're an old stick in the mud stay at home. Only because, my dear Myra, you make my home a place of rare delight. What'd you call me? You just wait till you hear what I have to tell you, Myra. You're doing it again? The most fantastic. Why are you suddenly calling me Myra? Who's Myra? Myra? We've only been married 25 years. I should think you'd know my name by now. What are you talking about? What's my name? Ruth. Right. Now, let's go one step further. Who is Myra? I haven't the faintest idea. That isn't true. When a man calls his wife by another woman's name, the reason is usually quite obvious. Now, just mm, hold on. Suppose I were to call you Tom or Percy or Launcelot or anything but George. Ruth. What would your reaction be? Truthfully. So who is Myra? I don't know. I think you do. Darling, what are you building this into? Have you met any attractive ladies named Myra lately? No. Anyone at the office named Myra? No one anywhere. If it makes you feel any better, I also call Janet, my secretary, Myra. I tell you, it's nothing. Well, if it's nothing, why are you getting upset? I'm not upset. Then why don't you lower your voice? Because I'm in the privacy of my own home and I can talk as I please. I think it's time you went up and got dressed for dinner. None of that. None of what? None of that thin-lipped, well-bred, silent disapproval. I can't help it if I have thin lips. It's not a pretty feature, I admit, but it isn't my fault. Oh, for crying out loud. And I certainly shall not apologize for being well-bred. All right. And as far as silence is concerned, why, (laughs) you make enough noise for both of us. I'm sorry. I know you are. And to save my immortal soul, I couldn't tell you why I called you Myra. Why don't you ask? Ask who? A psychiatrist. Psychiatrist? They never really help anybody. Now, that's not necessarily true. All right, look, I simply cannot imagine why I should have called you or Janet Myra. But I did. And it's just one of those things, and why don't we forget all about it? Actually, Doctor, it's a very minor thing. Is it? So small, so unimportant, I even hesitated to make an issue of it. Well, big or small, the fact that you've come to see me demonstrates you are making an issue of it. All right, I'll tell you why. It's a foreign body. A foreign body? Yes. You see, I'm a chemist. I deal basically with formulations. Now, every ingredient, each element has its place and its function. You understand? I think so. Inside me... There is a foreign body, something that I don't understand. Who is Myra? You insist you don't know anyone by that name? No one at all. Now, why should I call my wife Myra and my secretary? Uh, Tell me, am I I making too much of this? (laughs) Only you could know that. If my wife ever found out that I want to see a psychiatrist. Do you keep many things from your wife? No, no, no. Just just hold on, Doctor. That's not why I'm here. No? No. I'm here to find out about someone called Myra. Now, what does this have to do with the things that I tell my wife? Well, what? I mean, what's your answer? I don't have any answers. You don't? No. (laughs) Well, this is great. Why do you think I came here? To find the answers that seem so important to you. But you just said you don't have any. I don't. But you do. Me? Inside. Somewhere inside your mind, your heart, your psyche. The answers are waiting. They exist. But only you can discover them. How long will this take? A week, a month, a year, or perhaps never. It all depends on how deeply you bury them. Or how truly you wish to find them. Shall we begin? Begin what? The search. The search for Myra. Where do we start? Anywhere. What do you want me to do? 
whatever you think you should. Well, tell me. I have nothing to tell you. I have no answers. Well, ask me something. I mean, what is it I'm supposed to do? Is, is it all right if I move around? Doctor, just start me off somewhere. I... Yeah, I was a little kid, as far back as I can remember. And there was a sandbox, and there was a maid who took care of me. Her name was Julia. And there was this little, this little girl in a red pinafore, runny nose, nasty little girl who kept hitting me with her shovel. I was three years old, Doctor. That was 47 years ago, and I remember it. And that kid's name was Lois. Want me to go on? Okay. Kindergarten names. Let's see, there was Harriet, Jenny, Mary Lee, Eleanor, and Rachel. All the names through school. Melissa, Bertha, Alice, Beatrice, Eunice. I didn't think it was possible. But I have listed as closely as I can remember the name of every woman I have known in my life. Every woman? Every name I can remember. Casual acquaintance, a clerk in a store, a waitress, a girlfriend. Anyone, everyone. Those I may have met casually, those I knew intimately. Those who were important, those I met just in passing. Everyone. Except Myra. There is no Myra. I, I, I've racked my brain. She must come from somewhere. I've cut through the years. Names, faces, they come at me like a montage in a movie. Twenty years ago, I shared a taxi in Dayton, Ohio, with a woman named Corinne Davis. Ask me what's so remarkable about that. Go ahead, ask me. I'll tell you. We were strangers coming in from the airport. We never even spoke a single word. I happened to notice the name tag on her valise. I'm pulling names out of everywhere. Why can't I account for Myra? Why can't I remember Myra? Why don't you stop trying? Stop trying to remember? Evidently, it isn't working. Well, how will I remember if I don't try? Instead of trying to remember who she is, why don't we try to discover why you should have thought about her today? Why? Suddenly, you found yourself calling your secretary Myra. And then you called your wife Myra. Does this suggest anything? No. Your secretary is how old? 21, 22. And your wife? 48. And you call both of them Myra. Was Myra a young girl you wanted to marry? I don't even know who she is. Marry and live with and grow older with? I don't know how to answer that. Myra is the woman in your life. Maid and matron. I tell you, I don't know any Myra. You're not telling it to me. You're telling it to yourself. Why? Why do you insist that you don't know Myra? Why have you rejected Myra? You have gone through a virtuoso performance. You've listed well over 100 women. You weren't trying to remember their names. You were trying to forget hers. That isn't true. Myra is emerging. She has emerged from the shadows. And each time you speak the name of any of the other women who were in and out of your life, it's an attempt to drive Myra back into limbo. Why? I don't know why. What happened? What did your secretary do that, that made you look at her and say, Myra? Was it a look in her eyes? The way she wore her hair? Her dress, her perfume, a tone in her voice. Her... her voice. Yes? Her voice. She said... I remember Myra said, I have put love behind me. I am free of that mistake. You shall seek and never find me. I have no heart for you to break. Myra? These were supposed to be the lines of an unknown poet. So we were told. 
when we heard them for the first time. Obviously, our friend George hasn't heard those lines for the first time. And if you're an old-timer on this show, or even a new recruit, you know perfectly well that Myra wrote them. But who is Myra? Ah, for this, we must all await the second act. The romantic poets of the long ago were enamored of the name Sylvia. She was indeed a paragon of virtue and beauty. Shakespeare in particular wrote, Who is Sylvia? What is she? That all the swains commend her? And so forth. Actually, you never really find out. We, on the other hand, are asking, Who is Myra? And with two acts to go, we have a pretty good chance to find out. A poem of love, Mr. Hastings. And you still say you don't know who Myra is. Myra, you shall seek and never find me. I have no heart for you to break. What does that mean? I don't remember, Doctor. But it did have a meaning once. A very personal, even a poignant meaning. I don't remember. What a superb effort of will. How you fought to blot that woman from your memory, and you did. Until someone, quite by accident, brought her to mind. And then all your defenses were swept away. You remember her now, don't you? Now you know who she is. Yes. She was always there, hidden just beneath the surface. How you had to struggle to keep her out of sight. What a strain it must have been to fight, to forget her every day of your life. Yes. Yes, it was. Obviously, she's the one you loved and still do. Yes. Why didn't you marry Myra? Her father, Ruthie's father, had the money. I see. I didn't have a dime. I waited on tables. I ran the boilers in a power plant. Ruthie was my chance. She wasn't beautiful like Myra. She wasn't even pretty, but it wasn't her fault. She came from a very thin family. Very long, very spare, very thin. But one thing about them wasn't thin. Her father's wallet. Uh, therefore, you married Ruthie. Well, it made sense. Myra, what was Myra? College romance. She wanted me to starve to death as a school teacher, mold young minds, have an effect on the world. But I'm not a failure, Doctor. I built a great business. You've heard of Hastings Chemical? Yes. Well, that's me. And I'm even getting an honorary degree. It's, it, it's for a synthetic flavoring. Well, that's also important, isn't it? Whatever is important to you is important. Well, it's even important for humanity. Now, what about Myra? Myra? Nothing. I've lived without Myra for all these years. No, you've lived with her in your mind. Well, I'm just... I'm just going to have to face reality. Now that it's out in the open, I can just forget all about it. Thank you very much, Doctor. Beautiful, George, but... Uh, but what? Nobody should flaunt jewelry these days. A necklace like this? Everybody will turn to look. Mm, including all the jewel thieves in the country. You don't like it? I love it. But you didn't have to buy it. Yes, I did. And you didn't have to get me that brooch last week either. Ruth, how would you like to fly to Paris for the weekend? We were just away, remember? Well, that's right, but what's the difference? We have a lot to make up for. Twenty-five years. I love you, Ruth. Finally. Ruth. I always loved you. Was Myra beautiful? Will you forget about Myra? Oh, I would if I could. I know how it was, George. She was beautiful, but she was poor. She must have been, otherwise you would have married her. On the other hand, I was homely, but I was rich. You weren't homely. Oh, thank you. Yes, I probably could have gotten a husband on my own. After the really attractive girls had skimmed the cream, I'd have found somebody. But I wanted the cream, too. I wanted a man who was spectacular, like you. Oh, I wasn't all that great. So I said to Daddy, I want George Hastings. Buy me George Hastings. And he did. 
So I got what I wanted. So really, I should have no complaints. And didn't you get what you wanted? Money, position, power? Yes. Mm, there's a law. It must have been made in heaven. And it says you can't have everything. You can't have all those things. And Myra, too. Let's go out to dinner. No, I liked it better the other way. What other way? When you kept us separate. Myra and me. What are you talking about? I was your wife. You went through the motions. You didn't pretend to love me. That was the part of you you saved for Myra. What do you want me to do? Don't give me any more jewelry except on my birthday. And don't shower me with gifts and trips and flowers because here's what I think of them. Myra! Yes, Myra. Oh, look at you. I have never seen seen you so emotional, so filled with passion. And whose name do you speak? Hers. I'm sorry. Why don't you go to her? I can't. Why not? What have you got to lose? My father's dead. The factory is yours. You can do as you like. Go to her? Oh, I see you're afraid. What are you talking about? Of course you're afraid. Afraid of what? All these years there hasn't been a single moment that you haven't thought about her. That's not true. Oh, no. But the question is, does she still think of you? You're afraid to face that possibility. What if she's happy without you? What if you're only a dim and distant occasional memory or perhaps nothing at all? Go back and see. No. All right? It's up to you. But I can tell you this. You won't have me anymore. Ruth. I say you won't have me. You never had me. You could have, but you never wanted me. I want you now. Oh, no, you don't. You're willing to make believe I'm Myra. And you'll give me everything. Oh, it's very tempting. But I'm somebody, too. Don't leave me. How can I leave you? I was never with you. There was never any room for me. You were always with Myra. Go back to her, George. I can't. You've been married for 25 years. 26, yes. Your marriage goes on. Your life goes on. The days come and go by the hundreds, by the thousands. So many days. And then one day, you just say no. I don't want this anymore. My husband never loved me. Please, Ruth. I'm almost 50 years old. I'm not a beauty, but I'm a person of substance. Maybe I can find someone to love me. I'm going to try. So you just go back to your Myra. Ruthie, listen. Goodbye, George. I loved you, but it's over. You never loved me, and it's too late to try. Sheriff, I guess I was pushing it a bit. I don't give a lot of tickets, but when I see somebody doing 80... It's Tom. Tom Calders. George Hastings. Well, you might tear up that ticket for old time's sake. For old time's sake, I should give you two of them. Why, are you still sore at me, Tom? May I see your license, please? Oh, come on. And your registration. <laughs> All right. You know, Tom, it was almost 30 years ago. Well, I'll let you go this time with just a warning. Is that all you have to say to me? So you've come back. I wonder why. Maybe it's to make a statement. What kind of a statement? You and I both know what kind, George. Look, you had your chance, Tom, and she had her choice. She chose me, that's all. I can't understand why you'd come back here. I can't imagine who'd be glad to see you. Now, why don't you turn right, just up ahead? It's a new road. It's built since your time. A shortcut to the interstate. Go back where you belong, George. Look, this is also my hometown. Just don't expect anybody to kill the fatted calf. Yes, hello. 
Mrs. Kendall? Oh, yes, I'm Mrs. Kendall. Don't you remember me, Mrs. Kendall? Are you selling something? No. Well, most people come by or want me to buy something, you know. Mother Kendall, don't you remember me? Well, I, I don't need very many things anymore. It's George. George? Yes, George Hastings. Oh, uh, well, Tom Calders will stop by and say hello. Maybe once a month, Harry Jones will cut the grass, trim things. I, I used to be able to do it myself, but I can't anymore. And I don't like to ask Myra. Myra? Oh, poor thing. She works so hard. She still lives here? Oh, yes, yes. She isn't married or anything? Oh, no, no. She's taking care of her old mother. And you don't remember me? George Hastings? George Hastings. Oh, it's, it's so hard to remember. Sometimes it, it's as if you're, you're reading and suddenly the light goes out. You're in the dark. And you, you can't see. George Hastings. I was going to marry Myra. Were you? Don't you remember? Oh, sometimes I remember everything. And sometimes I can't remember anything. And most things get so mixed up. Is Myra at home? Oh, yes. Would you ask her if she'd like to see George Hastings? George Hastings. George? Yes. Ask her if she'll see me. Well, why wouldn't she see you? After the way I treated her? George. Oh, a man like you can get away with anything. And you know why? Because you're so handsome. You know what I always say to Myra. It's a good thing you're my daughter because he's so good-looking. I'd, I'd try to steal him for myself. Do you really think she'd see me? Oh, George. After what I did to her? But it was only a silly lover's quarrel. But I left her. And you're back. You're here now. Does anything else matter? Come on inside. Why are we standing here? Now no, walk right into the parlor. And here, here's your favorite chair. Please, sit down. Thank you. And after a while, we'll have a glass of your favorite lemonade. Uh, Myra! Myra, will you come down? Myra? Uh, did she answer, George? <laughs> I, I'm so hard of hearing now. Uh, Myra! Yes, Mother? Uh, come downstairs, dear. We have a guest. Isn't that, Mother? Yes. I, I think I heard her. How is she? How is she? Why? How, how do you expect her to be? Well, it's been a long time. Yes. When you're in love, every separation seems to last forever, even if it's only overnight. Is she still beautiful? Well, why shouldn't she be beautiful? Hello? Hello, dear. You have a guest. Hello, George. Myra. Yes, it's Myra. You, you, you can't be Myra. <laughs> Who else could I be? Well, you should, you should be her daughter. Her daughter? Why do you say that? Well, you, you, you can't be Myra. You, you can't be a day over twenty-one. But I am Myra. What happened to you? What happened? Or. What didn't happen? Take your pick. What did happen to make her become younger? Or what didn't happen to make her grow older? Some women admittedly appear young for their age. But a woman of 50 cannot possibly pass for 21, especially without the magic of lighting, cameras, and makeup. But here she is, and here we are waiting as usual for the third act. He saw a picture of a girl on a Grecian vase, and of her he said, she wilt be forever fair. It's true. That lady is at least 2,500 years old, and she's still as pretty as she was the day the artist painted her. However, flesh and blood ladies are less fortunate. They grow older with every passing minute, and... After a while, they must show their years. Is it possible that the Myra Kendall who is 50 is exactly the same as the Myra Kendall who was 21? Now, why don't I just go inside and fix us some nice, cool lemonade? Myra? Yes, George. I'm Myra. <laughs> I can't believe it. I knew you'd come back, George. I always knew it. I should never have left. 
Oh, yes, you should have. Don't say that. It was for the best, that other girl. What was her name? Ruth. Her father had the money to give you what you wanted. Now I know I wanted you. But you see, darling, the timing is everything. Had you chosen me then, you would have regretted it. Never. Oh, yes. You would have gotten tired of me. So you chose the money, and in time, you became tired of the money. And now instead of walking out on me... You're walking out on her. Myra, Myra. You wanted two things in this life. You wanted me, and you wanted wealth. And by choosing wealth first, you're now able to have both of us. Myra, <laughs> Myra, why are you still so young? Young? Yes, you have the look, the, the, the freshness of a young girl. Uh, I'm always young to you, George. Always fair, ever lovely. Age will never mar thy face. Only spring and early summer, thy everlasting living place. We are young. We live forever a dream of never-ending youth. We have sought and found the secret. Love is our eternal truth. Oh, you remembered. Why are you still so young? I'm only young in your eyes, George. You are in mine. I'm not young in my eyes. I'm 50. And I look it, I feel it. No, no, I'm not dreaming. I see you as I saw you on that last day. The day I left you. Everything about you. Look, the skirt you're wearing. It's the same. It is, isn't it? Yes. And the blouse. And it's still fresh looking and new. It doesn't look 30 years old. You became very successful, didn't you, George? Oh, I don't want to talk about that. Oh, you should be proud of it. I feel as if I've wasted my oh, life. Oh, George, you became rich, famous. But I didn't have you. You have me, George. You have me. No. No, I've grown old without you. And look how young, how beautiful you still are. Why would you want me? Because I love you, George. After everything I did? Do you remember Professor Gordon's physics class? Do you remember... Professor Gordon. Physics? I took physics just so I could be with you. We were the only two people who ever held hands in a physics class. I remember what Professor Gordon said about matter. He defined matter as something that could neither be created nor destroyed. It just exists. Well, you could substitute love in that definition. Where love doesn't exist, it can't be created. And where it does exist, it can't be destroyed. But it can be put behind you. Oh, oh that. Yes, oh. that. I have put love behind me. I am free of that mistake. You shall seek and never find me. I have no heart for you to break. <laughs> that was the last poem I ever wrote. I know. I wrote it on that last morning. Do you know you're becoming famous? That is, your poetry is. Oh, yes. Tom Calder found a whole bunch of my stuff, and he showed it to the professor in the English Lit Department at college. Why didn't you let the world know that you wrote them? I never wanted publicity. You know that. I, I was always so afraid of it. You know, Tom Calder, I saw him today. He wanted to give me a ticket. Oh, well, there was never any love lost between you. Well, it, he knew me first. And... You still see him? No. I don't see anyone. What what have you been doing with yourself? I've been waiting for you to come back to me. Oh, would you answer that, George, and I'll go and give Mother some help with the lemonade. All right. Hello? Hey, is that you? Who's this? Tom Calder. What are you doing there? Now, just hold on, Tom. I don't think that's any of your business. Haven't you done enough? Must you continue to persecute that poor woman? Look, did you wish to speak to anybody? Well, I certainly didn't wish to speak to you. No, I guess not. Mother's having a little headache. She went upstairs to lie down. Oh, I'm sorry. Who was on the phone? Tom Calder. Oh, yeah, he calls Mother frequently, just to check. He's a very good person. George, why are you holding my hand like that? Do you mind? No. Why are you staring at it? Why are you so young? I just look young. No, no, there's a difference. George, do you remember the last day? Yes. I'm glad. No, I'm not. I never 
I've never gone on a boat ride since. Oh, let's go now. Now? Yeah, why not? You really want to? Yes, because this time it'll be the best. We're together again, in love again. Is there still a boat? Oh, well, why shouldn't there be? Well, it's been almost 30 years. Oh, but a lot of people tie their boats up down at the dock. Now they wouldn't mind if we'd borrow one for a bit. Oh, come on. All right, if you're sure you want to go. Oh, I do. Except if you happen to have bad news for me, like you did the last time. Oh, darling, I have no bad news for you. I'll never have bad news for you again. Well, let's go. Mrs. Kendall? Mrs. Kendall? Yes? Who are you? Mrs. Kendall, it's me, Tom. Oh, yeah. Yes, Tom, Tom. I, uh, I just stopped by to see if everything's okay. Oh, yeah, things are just fine. It's, it's just that he's in town. He? George Hastings. Oh, oh, George, of course. And I know he's been out here to see you. Oh, yes, 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 he's been here. Well, that took considerable nerve on his part. Nobody could blame you if you just threw him out of the house. Oh, no, they were getting along so beautifully. Who's they? They? Myra and George. Myra? Well, certainly, Myra. But Myra... Well, what's it about, Myra? Nothing. Y you were going to say something about Myra? No, I, I wasn't. Now, don't say that to me, Tommy Calder. I was your kindergarten teacher. I know you well enough. Now, what were you going to say about Myra? Now, don't make me say it again. Say what again, Tommy? What I had to say to you 30 years ago... Your hair turned white. You never got over it. Then what were you going to say about Myra? She... she she's dead. Oh, she's dead, is she? Yes, Mrs. Kendall. She, she's dead. You may be a sheriff and wear a shiny silver badge and sport a gleaming nickel-plated revolver, but you don't know everything. I'm sorry, Mrs. Kendall. She died 30 years ago. Is that a fact? She went with George, and she fell out of the boat and drowned. <laughs> that was quite a story. All these years, you just couldn't accept it. Now, I'm sorry you forced me to say it again, because I'll never be able to prove it, but I know George killed her. He threw her out of the boat. Oh, poor Tommy. You say Myra's dead. She's dead for you, because you could never have her. And you have to tell yourself that the man who took her away is the man who had to kill her. It's the truth. Yes, for you it's the truth. But if you want the real truth, Tommy, if you can face it, go up to the lake. The lake? I heard them say they were going there. Up to the lake. Go there and face the truth. So beautiful just drifting here. I'd forgotten what it was like. And you've come back to me, George? Yes. I've come back. It's as if I'd never left you. You're the same. You're exactly the same. Have you really come back to me? I'm here. What is it you want to tell me? I want to tell you I love you. What else? What else? Yes, the last time we were in a boat on this lake, you told me you were leaving me. I know. But that was long ago. I never believed you'd stay with me. I was too happy. No human being has the right to so much happiness. I knew you'd leave me. That's why I wrote the poem. I didn't write it that last morning. I wrote it the first night. Even then, at the beginning, I knew that it would end. Myra, I didn't mean to. What chance did I have? I was a town girl given a scholarship tolerated at a wealthy college. I had no chance against her. All that money. And that's what you wanted. That's what I thought I wanted. Oh, you still want it. I've come back here. Have you? Oh, Myra. 
Myra, now I know why you're still young. It's what's inside you. All the love, the hope. No, no, George. I'm young to you because this is how I looked on the last day of my life. Don't say that. But why not? It's true. This is the spot. The very place. The deepest part of the lake. And there's a kind of whirlpool just below the surface that pulls you down, down, deep down. Oh, believe me, Myra, I made the wrong choice. All I want is you. Is that true? Yes. I only want to be with you. Then come with me. Come home with me. I want to. Come to where I live, here. In the lake, on the bottom of the lake. Oh, dearest. Will you come and live with me? Be with me? Oh, my... Come home with me, George. I'm so young, so much in love with you. Come with me, George. Hey! Don't stand up on that boat! Come to me, George. Come to me. Hey, George! Are you crazy? I'm waiting, George. Waiting. Sit down! Waiting for you, George, with all my love. Yes, Myra. And still so young. Don't leave me, Myra. Don't go. I'm not leaving go. you. Come with me, George. Come home with me. George! No! Don't! And so he found Myra, finally, and just where he had left her. Because we are romantics at heart, we will let the story end here, at the last reunion of two lovers. For as the poet said, in the end, those who love will be together. Love is the only immortality. I shall return shortly. Life goes on a predictable, almost preordained path. Routine is the common lot of mankind. Every day, the same thing. And then, suddenly, someone says a single word, and the world is turned upside down. And in this case, the word is a name. And the name was Myra. Our cast included Mandel Kramer, Marion Seldes, Carol Titel, and Cork Benson. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. For another adventure in the macabre. Pleasant dreams. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater. Come in. Welcome. Welcome to Mystery Theater. I am Hyman Brown. According to Pythagoras, anything that can happen to anyone, anywhere in the world, can also happen to you. I guess what the old gentleman was trying to tell us is that there's no custom so strange, no usage so foreign, no fate so unusual that it cannot suddenly pierce the protective barrier of the familiar behind which so many of us cower for safety. Why did you kill Georgiana Slater? I don't even know anyone named Georgiana Slater. Are these your clothes? Yes, but... What were they doing in her house? I don't know. Is this your gun? Yes. It's the gun that killed her. Tell us the truth. I didn't kill her. I didn't know her. I never even heard of her. Our mystery drama, It Has to Be True, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars John Beale. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Just suppose, says the philosopher, that this was the last day of the world. Well, of course, no one is really prepared for such a question. 
much less for such an eventuality. And yet, it's possible for the world to come to an end. Suddenly, silently, a candle blown out by the wind. It happens just that way for so many people. At one moment, they glory at the light, and at the next, they grovel in the dark. Why'd you stop me, officer? Step out of your car, please. I wasn't speeding, I'm sure. Come out very slowly and keep your hands where I can see them. What's this supposed to be? Turn around. Lean forward. You mind telling me? Place your hands against the hood of the car. Now, hold it, officer. You don't have to search me like this. I'm, I'm, I'm not some criminal. I'm James Arthur Correll, assistant sales manager of Arcturus Electronics. We have instructions to pick up a James Arthur Correll who answers your description. And is driving a gray four-door Aurora sedan. Pick up? What do you mean, pick up? You'll have to come with us, Mr. Corral. But I have to be in Chicago this evening. I'm sorry, sir. Officer, I have no intention of resisting arrest, but this is a mistake. If it's a mistake, it'll be straightened out. Mr. Corral, I'm Inspector Luther. Homicide. Homicide? What does that have to do with me? The arresting officer has already informed you of your rights. What am I being accused of? Did you know a Mrs. Georgiana Slater? No. She resided here in Benton City, 87 Rutherford Place. I don't know anybody at all in Benton City. No? I never even stopped here before. You didn't? Well, it's just a place I drive through en route to Chicago. Actually, I don't even drive through it. I, I bypass it on the highway. A Mrs. Georgiana Slater was murdered this afternoon. Well, what does that have to do with me? At this point, you're a material witness. Material witness? Inspector Luther, is that your name? I, I didn't witness anything. And I'm certainly not aware of any material that could be of any use at all. You deny you knew Mrs. Slater? Of course I deny it. You never called at her home on 87 Rutherford? I don't even know where that is. You never parked your car in front of 87 Rutherford? Of course not. You never spent the night there? Never. You didn't have a relationship with Georgiana Slater? I told you. I never even knew such a person. Excuse me. Uh, Eddie, bring in the carton, please. Inspector, would you mind telling me what's going on? Of course. Oh, thanks, Eddie. Now, put the carton down on the table. Now, Mr. Corral, in this box are some items of wearing apparel. Well, that's... Well, those are... Those are my... This cardigan sweater. Can you identify it? it? It's mine. And these blue pajamas. This maroon robe. Look, all those things. That they're mine. Where'd you get them? In Georgiana Slater's bedroom. Oh, oh, no. No, there's no way they could have gotten there. No way, Mr. Corral? No, no. This, this thing, it's crazy. I got... Inspector Luther, listen to me, please. I was driving north on the highway. For no reason, two officers in a police car stopped me. And they bring me here. I'm informed that I'm a material witness in a murder. And I have... Have I lost my mind? What's happening to me? All right, relax, Mr. Corral. Everything will be all right. I'm being made the victim of some... Some frame-up. Isn't there anything I can say that will make you understand? Yeah, yeah. There is. Eddie, uh, you want to come in here with your stenotype machine... Mr. Corral is ready to make a statement. What kind of statement? A confession. What am I supposed to confess to? The murder of Georgiana Slater. Now, believe me, you'll feel better. I have absolutely nothing to confess. All right. But we have absolutely everything we need. We've got your car parked at the house, your clothes in the closet... The letter from Mary Cordelieu. Who's Mary... whatever her name is. And what letter... Mary Cordelieu is the agony columnist, you know, the advice of the Lovelorn editor, on the Benton City Daily Mail. Georgiana had written to her asking how she could get this married guy she was going with to leave his wife. And she got a letter back saying to give him the gate. So we've got some padding on the motive. She was ready to kiss you off. Well, that letter doesn't have to refer to me. Well, it describes you pretty well. And we've got the gun. What gun? Your gun. A thirty-eight caliber Darnley Stewart revolver, serial number QH2354. 
registered in the name of James Arthur Corral. Well, yes, that's my gun, but... But it's been lost. Uh, it's been my experience, Mr. Corral, that lost guns always turn up in, uh... inconvenient places. Where was it found? Next to the body of Georgiana Slater. No, how could I have killed her? What are you doing to me? I'm innocent. And you're also very tired and upset. You need a good night's rest. Eddie, we're holding, Mr. Corral. You mean I'm going to have to stay here? Mm -hmm, overnight. Well, I'm entitled to a hearing before a judge. You're getting one tomorrow morning. I want to call my lawyer. Absolutely, he should be here. Well, I don't understand. What's happening to me? James? James? Uh, Wake up, darling. Uh, oh, oh, oh. I'm here, darling. I'm here. Oh, Della, did I have a dream? A nightmare. I dreamed I was in... I was... I was in... James? Della, it wasn't a dream. I'm in jail. We couldn't get a plane till six in the morning. We? Walter Sturgis and I. Oh, Walter? Well, I... I know you're not overly fond of Walter, but... Well, I can't imagine why. He thinks you're the salt of the earth. Well, I told you to call old man Paulson. He'd have the corporation attorneys defend me. Darling, you see... Mr. Paulson said that while he would certainly support you all the way down the line... It would have to be... How did he put it? What are you saying, Della? Off the record... It would not be prudent to emphasize your connection with the Arcturus Company. Oh, I see where this is going. I gave Arcturus 15 years of my life. I opened up the entire Middle West. And now that I'm in trouble... Dearest, Sellers and McIntyre are basically corporation lawyers. They don't have any criminal practice. And Walter is a top trial lawyer. He's already taken over. He's in with the district attorney right now. We'll have you out of here in no time. James? Yeah. I could hardly understand what you were saying on the phone last night. You're actually being held on a charge of murder? Yes. I don't believe it. You couldn't kill anybody. Who's murder? A woman named Georgiana Slater. Did you know this woman? Of course not. Then why do they say you killed her? They claim I was having an affair with her. A what? I know. It's ridiculous. You you know I'd never have an affair with another woman. You know that, don't you? Yes. Of course I know that. But why did they arrest you? Well, they claim I was seen in the house and that my car was parked outside it. But that could have been mistaken identity, a coincidence. Well, surely they can't arrest a person for that. Well, they, there were some other things. What other things? They found some of my clothes in the closet and my revolver. It was the weapon that killed her. They found it near the body. Oh. Stella, I, I don't know how they got there. James. James, have you... Have you been... I, I don't know what to say. Condella... Please, I, I know it looks bad. Oh, maybe it's all my fault. What was your fault? I, I, I've been a little difficult to live with these past few years. I resented all the time you had to give to your job. Thought you were working too hard and neglecting oh, me. Della. It hasn't been easy for you at Arcturus. Paulson is unreasonably demanding. I should have understood that. Della, what are you saying? But maybe without meaning to... Without even knowing it, you drifted into this, this situation. You needed a place where you could just escape from pressure. Oh, darling, I'm so sorry. Bella, I don't know what you're talking about. I don't care what the evidence implies. I didn't kill this woman. I believe you. I didn't have an affair with her. I didn't even know her. Darling, don't say any more. I'm your wife. I love you. I'll stand at your side. Uh, thank you, officer. I'll uh, call you when I want you. Walter, get me out of here. I can't get bail. 
But you said you'd try to work something out with the DA. Well, the DA claims you'd jump bail and leave the country. Well, couldn't you convince him that I wouldn't? No, his point is that you were a fugitive. You were running away. If after the murder you'd have given yourself up, well, that would uh, prove that there'd be no risk in letting you out. Now, wait a minute. If after the murder I'd given myself up, who says I committed the murder? Oh, James. Do you believe I'm guilty? They have the gun and the ammunition. Well, I'm telling you I'm innocent. But they have your clothes in her house, your gun on the floor by her dead body now. Now, how do you account for it? I can't. Now, there are certain cases you can't win unless your client... Uh, adopts a mature attitude. Well, which means what? Which means you must realize that there's a give and take. What do I have to give? You must admit that you were having an affair with her. But I wasn't. You've already been found guilty of that. In what court? In the most important court in the land. The court of public opinion. Now, deny the affair and the jury absolutely will refuse to credit anything you have to say. You admit it, or at least I'll listen to you. But it isn't true. I spoke to Della. She forgives you. But there's nothing to forgive. James, you only have one way out. You are madly in love. No, no, no. Hopelessly infatuated with Georgiana Slater. Is everybody crazy? Uh, she was a beautiful woman, and you fell for her the way only a middle-aged man can. Walter, are you for me or against me? One day she became tired of you, and you lost your head. In a terrible fit of insane jealousy, you shot her. No, I did not. Why can't you believe me? I'm innocent. Are you? Really? Yes. How do you know? How do I know? I know what I did, what I didn't do. Could you have killed Georgiana Slater and not been aware of it? Could you have been carrying on an affair with her and not been aware of it? How could I have been unaware of it? How would you like to find out? We should all like to find out. Here we have a man driving along, minding his own business, when suddenly he's taken to jail and accused of murder. And they have a whole battery of live evidence against him also. What's going for him? His own conviction that he's innocent. How's he doing so far? Not so good. We'll see how it goes in Act Two. not, says the philosopher, judge by appearances. Very good advice, but seldom followed. The unfortunate part is we do judge books by covers, birds by feathers, and women by beauty. But is everyone with liquor on his breath a drunk? Is everyone caught with his hand in the till a thief? You see, all this has to do with circumstantial evidence, which is why so many lawyers get rich. You're saying I could have had an affair with a woman and be unaware of it? Exactly. And I could have murdered her and not be aware of that? Precisely. How's that possible, Walter? You can ask someone who knows. Doctor, I don't know what my attorney, Mr. Sturgis, has told you, but I want the record straight. Well, by all means. I'm in the middle of something. What? Well, something I can't explain. Ordinarily, I'd say it's a dream, a, a nightmare, except if it were, I, I should have awakened long ago. Mm, try to describe it. Well, on my way to Chicago, I'm suddenly arrested for the murder of a woman I don't know named Georgiana Slater, who lives in a city I've never been in. And I'm confronted with a mass of circumstantial evidence. And next week, I'm actually going to trial. You don't know how this evidence could have gotten into Mrs. Slater's home. Well, now, the gun, for instance. I had actually lost it some weeks before. I didn't even know where it was. Mm -hmm. Have you had any serious problems lately? Oh, I never have problems. Just go out and sell, that's my motto. Well, you're under no strain, no pressures? No, there's always some strain and pressure. 
Why? What's the nature of the business? You have to be thinking and planning and pitching every day. Mm, any strains between you and your wife? Yeah, absolutely none. Absolutely? Well, well, there's always this and that in married life. Huh. Any serious arguments? Well, it depends on what you call serious. What do you consider serious? Well, there was an awful lot of flack about the... The amount of time I give to the job. And so things are not exactly cheery at home, huh? Would that be a fair one-word description? Mm, I suppose it might be. And at the office, did things run smoothly? Do things really run smoothly anywhere? Mm -hmm. Some places they do. What was your problem at the office? Well, who said I had a problem? Your wife was unhappy because of the long hours. Is that true? Well, yes. Well, there was a certain amount of friction. So the core of the problem is at the office. You put in long hours. Why? Well, I told you, it's a rough, competitive business. There's no clock. I guess delicate never really understand that. Do you feel that the time you're putting in, the, the, the energy that you're expending, the work that you're doing, is appreciated? Never, not in a million years. So you feel you're not getting the recognition and the compensation you deserve? Well, Doctor, nobody ever gets the recognition and the compensation he deserves. Oh, some people do. Uh, I certainly was being cheated out of mine. Cheated? That's a strong word. Well, that's the exact word to describe it. What I did, the, the way I was putting out, the, that was just taken for granted. And the result is that you're frustrated on the job and unhappy at home. As you just said, your boss is cheating you. And since you don't have the resources to quit, you have to cheat somebody too. Hmm? Who? Your wife? Oh, that's crazy. I'm not that kind of man. That's right, you're not. It goes against your moral fiber. Therefore, it's an act that you've got to perform without knowing it. To that end, you deliberately develop a form of amnesia, and you lead a double life. A double life? Yes, yeah, consciously, you're completely unaware of it. You find a woman far away from home with whom you can have a very uh, discreet relationship. No, I can't believe that. It. it can't be. Your clothes in the closet, are they real? And the gun account for that? I, I can't, Doctor. The gun is the key. You were living in two worlds. The first, the primary, was the world of your job, of your wife and your children, your home. The world you would call reality. But there was another world, an unconscious world, the world of Georgiana Slater, the world you tried to keep secret, even from yourself. You can never make me believe that. The gun, the gun is the bridge between the two worlds. The gun exists in both worlds. It's common to both worlds. When you feel you must end the relationship with Georgiana Slater, when you feel you must kill her. Oh, doctor. The gun is the instrument. But it's at home, in the other world, the conscious world. You need it. Therefore, the conscious James Arthur Correll hides the gun and claims it's lost. While the unconscious James Arthur Correll knows where to find it. And thus, you... All right, but, but just tell me, now, if I did know her, and if I was having an affair with her, if, if I did kill her, why did I leave my clothes and my gun by the body? If I knew she had written a letter to that columnist, why did I leave the implicating answer lying around? Mm, why? Yes, why? Because you wanted to be found out, caught, and punished. Doctor, this, this story you've just told me, do you actually believe it? I believe it could be true in your case. Why? Because I've come across it before. You mean people can be unfaithful to their wives, lead a double life, e even commit murder? 
and be unaware of it? Mm, certain people, yes. And that's what's happened to me? James, are you all right? Della, Walter, I, I don't know what to say. The uh, trial is coming up. I realize, Walter. Della, there's something I have to tell you. I didn't want to plead guilty because that would be admitting to the world that I'd had an affair with another woman. That's between you and me, James. It's no one's business but ours. Well, how could I tell you a thing like that, Della? You'd never forgive me. James, if it were the other way around, would you forgive me? Yes. Why? Because I... Because I love you. And I love you, James. And we can work it out. Are you ready to believe you knew her and killed her? I don't know. It's just that everything points to it. Everybody insists on it. How long can I fight it? I guess it just has to be true. Well, Mrs. Luther, enjoying dinner? Oh, I was, John. I think I'm starting to unenjoy it. Yep. In less than 30 seconds, you'll be going to work. No, no. I didn't let anyone know where I was. No one from headquarters can get in touch with me for the next three hours, no matter what. In 15 seconds, you'll be back on the job. You're on it right now. You never stop being a cop. Your motor's always running. Gee, I'm sorry. Darling, you can't help it. Five minutes ago, something in this restaurant caught your attention. It's been buzzing around down in your unconscious mind. You're right. Helen, I know now what caught my attention. Hmm. Should I take a cab and go home? I finally placed those two people. That couple at the table near the wall. Yeah. I know who they are. You should have asked me. I know who she is. Her picture was in the paper. She's the wife of that fellow who's being tried for the murder of that woman. Oh, what was her name? Georgiana Slater. Yes. You worked on that case, didn't you, John? Yeah. Fellow with her is Walter Sturgis, her husband's lawyer. Well, why should all this bother you? Those two people, do they look friendly? Well, they look like they're friends. Is it possible that they could be more than friends? Yes. Yes, it's possible. Now, wait a minute, watch what he does. And notice, he reaches over and holds her hand. Oh, she takes her hand away quickly. And shakes her head. He smiles. It's happened a few times. Well, she seems to be giving him that kind of look that says, not in public. And she's right. But he obviously cannot keep his hands off her. <laughs> she's quite a dish. Why does it intrigue your cop-like instincts? You have a man being tried for the murder of his alleged mistress. Meanwhile, his wife evidently has a thing going with his attorney... Something bothers me. What? I don't know. Well, should we have dessert? All the evidence is in. But suppose, just for the sake of argument, suppose that James Arthur Corral is innocent. Where does that leave us? I don't know. We must ask, is it true that James Arthur Corral killed Georgiana Slater? It has to be true. Why? Well, you know that better than I would. Aren't you the cop that gathered up all the evidence? All right, look, I'll take you home. There's something I want to do right away. Remember me, Mr. Corral? Yes. You're the police inspector. Well, what do you want? I mean, it's the middle of the night. I uh, want to ask you some questions. Why? Just answer them. Oh, what's the difference? I spoke to my lawyer about my plea. Walter Sturgis? Yes, that's his name. How come you picked him to be a lawyer? Look, what is this all about? Now, just answer. I don't have to answer anything. Why don't you try? What for? Maybe you were right all along. 
The last time I saw you, you were trying to get me to sign a confession, remember? That's right. I was. And I kept refusing. Because I was positive I was innocent. Remember? Yes, I remember that. Well, I was wrong. About what? About my innocence. Well, what happened? Do you now admit that you're guilty? Look, uh, this conversation is off the record. Yes, I... I believe I'm guilty. You were so sure you were innocent, you almost had me convinced. When I first questioned you, were you putting on an act? No, I believed beyond a doubt that I was innocent. And now, I believe I'm guilty. Why? Because it has to be true. Why does it have to be true? Because... Because it's the only thing that makes sense. You see, even the hardest rock is slowly eroded by the constant rains. And even the strongest conviction may be undermined, confused, and overcome by the unrelenting pressure of circumstance. There comes a time when further resistance is impossible. And a man can be forced to say that black is white, day is night, and wrong is right. Mystery Theater will return shortly. You may find this hard to believe today... But five centuries ago, a man got himself into hot water by insisting that the Earth revolved itself around the sun instead of the other way around, which was the accepted wisdom of the time. Well, if they could force Galileo to recant publicly what he knew to be true, what can we expect from James Arthur Correll, an ordinary, average, everyday, middle-class citizen? Wait. You're telling me now that you're guilty, Mr. Corral? Well, isn't that what you kept telling me? I'm doing exactly what you said, Inspector. Don't fight it, you said. Well, I'm not fighting it. You and the psychiatrists said I could be guilty without knowing it. All right, I accept it. What more do you want? Do you accept it because your lawyer told you to, or do you really believe it? Look, I, I'm tired. It's, it's late. Why did you engage Walter Sturgis to defend you? Why? He's a top criminal lawyer. Any other reason? Oh, he's Della's friend. Oh? And he's my friend, too. He was married to a girl Della went to school with. Later, they got divorced, but, but he stayed friendly with us. Why did they get divorced? Well, why is that important? Is it possible that this school friend of Della's became jealous of Della? Why should she be jealous of Della? Well, she may have thought Della was having an affair with Walter. Well, that isn't true. I mean, it isn't true that they were having an affair. All right, let us suppose for the sake of argument that you were telling the truth when you explained you were innocent. We now have some problems. How do we get the clothes into the house, the car parked outside, and, of course, the gun? The gun. Inspector, I'm convinced that there is no way they could have gotten there unless I'm guilty. But if you're not, somebody else is. Maybe you didn't do anything. Maybe you just drove from your house to Chicago and never stopped in Benton City at all. It's an eight-hour drive. I could get an early flight the next morning and be there in 58 minutes. Why drive? All right, why did you? Well, the conscious part of my mind says I hated airplanes. But is that the reason? Did I drive so that I could stop here and be with Georgiana Slater? I, I don't know anymore. I just don't know. <laughs> How'd it go last night, Inspector Luther? Ah, uh, crazy. Two weeks ago, I'm hammering away at him to confess he's guilty and he insists he's innocent. Now, suddenly, I'm beating at him to believe he may be innocent and he insists he's guilty. What if somebody was out to get him? His wife? And his lawyer? Hmm. 
I would consider them prime suspects. Hmm. Let's say they arranged an elaborate frame-up. They pick a city on the way to Chicago. They find some woman who lives alone, who likes to have fun. Has that reputation. Yes. From time to time, they park a gray sedan outside the house to attract attention. It could even have been Corell's when he wasn't using it. Now, the murder... They time it to take place on a day they know he's headed for Chicago. They kill her. Leave the gun and the clothes there, and then... then... Yes? I remember exactly how it broke. A call came in saying that there was a noise. Sounded like a shot from 87 Rutherford Place. Anonymous call. They could have placed it. Then there was another anonymous call to the effect that there was a gray Aurora sedan parked in front of 87 Rutherford. The license number. And a man was seen getting into it right after the shot was fired. The description turned out to be Corell's. John, are you actually saying the wife and the lawyer are guilty? When they brought Corell in, I never saw a guy who seemed so genuinely surprised... Suspects are constantly insisting they're innocent, but Corell actually had me going for a minute. Well, what can you do about it? I don't know. Wait a minute. What is it? The letter. What letter? That was supposed to have been the final touch. It appeared she'd written a letter to Mary Cordelieu asking for advice because she got a letter back which said... And I remember... You have to give that Lothario the shock of his life. It's either or, and if he refuses, show him the door. You're just serving as an oasis between Turnersville and Chicago. Turnersville is where Correll comes from? Yeah. With this letter, the prosecution could prove she was ready to throw him out. Adds to his motive. John, are we sure Georgiana Slater wrote for advice? All we have is the answer. It's a signed letter from Mary Cordelieu. Well, could it be a forgery? No. Because if it turns out to be a forgery, then... Then... Yes? Look, if it turns out that Georgiana Slater did not write to Mary Cordelieu, then whether the answer is forged or not, it proves that it was deliberately planted. And every other piece of evidence also has to be suspect. But how can you prove it? I need a lucky break. And so does James Arthur Correll. Come on. Oh, uh, I was told this was Mary Cordelieu's office. Uh, who are you? Inspector Luther, homicide. Oh, well, uh, what do you want to see Mary about? Yeah, I'd rather discuss that with Mary... Uh, is it important? What's your name? Bob Burley. You know where I can find Mary Cordelieu? Is this her office? Uh, Inspector, can I trust you not to blow the whistle? I'm Mary Cordelieu. What? Yeah, yeah. Mary wrote the column for years, but about a year ago she got sick and had to leave. Well, yeah, the name belongs to the paper, so I asked the publisher if I could take over. <laughs> All right, Mr. Burley, I need your help. I want to ask you about a letter you wrote to a Mrs. Georgiana Slater. Yeah, go right ahead. You remember writing a letter to a Mrs. Georgiana Slater? Yes, Slater, why is that name so familiar? She was murdered. Oh. Do you, uh, recognize this letter? Sure, sure. You wrote it? Yeah, I wrote it. There's no chance it could be a forgery? No. Nope. Well, why should it be funny? It was in response to a question, then. Yeah, all of them are. You remember getting a letter asking advice from Georgiana Slater? <laughs> You'd be surprised, but I remember everything. I'll prove it to you. I even have that letter she wrote to me. What? Do you save them? Oh, yeah, sure, sure. Part of my permanent files. See, I, uh, see, I put it in the A file under <laughs> Affairs with Married Men. <laughs> I'd uh, like to show you how it's all cross-indexed. Oh, yeah, here we are. Uh, the letter from Georgiana Slater. Ah, uh, may I see it, please? Mm -hmm. Uh... Dear Mary Corleo, I am madly in love with a married man from Turnersville. He drives to Chicago once or twice, sometimes three times a week, 
and stops here in Benton City to spend the night with me. He keeps promising to divorce his wife, but I'm afraid he'll never get around to it. Please tell me what to do. Georgiana Slater. How do we know that Georgiana Slater wrote this request? Oh, well, she signed her name to it. How do we know this is her signature? Well, why would anybody else write me such a letter? See, the letter happens to be typewritten. Is that strange? Well, yeah, in a way. You know, many of them aren't. I think people feel that such personal things should be in their own handwriting. Could you let me have a copy of this letter? Eddie, I have a letter here. I want you to do a couple of things. First, go to the bank Georgiana Slater used and see if it's her signature on it. Second, check through the list of effects in her apartment and see if she owned a typewriter. Well, have you uh, seen James? Oh, yes. I visit him every morning. And how is he? Reconciled. Mm. He believes it. The way it sets up against him, it's hard not to believe it. Oh, Della, darling. Walter, not now. I have so many things to do. And you must be busy, too. The trial starts tomorrow. You know, Della, sometimes I I wonder if you really love me. Oh, darling, how can you even doubt it? It's it's just that I'm so nervous. (laughs) There there is no reason to be nervous. I have to appear in court as his loving, supportive wife. And I can't do it if I... Do you understand? Yes, yes, of course, of course. There'll be so much more time later, darling. He'll be in jail. I can get a divorce quietly. Who would that be? Doesn't matter. But should I be here in your suite? Why not? I'm your husband's lawyer. Uh, gentlemen? Mr. Sturgis? Yes? I'm Inspector John Luther... This is Detective Edward Smith. May we come in? Oh, yes, of course. Uh, this is uh, Mrs. James Correll. Uh, Jella, these gentlemen are police officers. Oh? Yes. What can I do for you, Inspector? I have a copy of a letter. Is it familiar? Well, why would it be familiar? Would you like to look at it? Walter. Uh, now, Della, Della, this, this is evidently a trick of some kind. Now, Inspector, I demand to know what you're doing. I just want to know if this letter is familiar to you. Well, it uh, purports to be a request for advice written by a uh, Georgiana Slater to a Mary Cordelieu, uh, who's evidently an, an, an advice columnist. But why shouldn't it be familiar to me? The answer from Miss Cordelieu to Mrs. Slater would be a nice touch, a finishing touch for the prosecution. But you forgot the letter that Mrs. Slater would have to write to elicit such an answer. What is he saying? Uh, Walter. Officer, now, if you're making a charge or an accusation... If the letter of inquiry is phony, then everything else becomes phony. Georgiana Slater didn't write such a letter. But you still haven't said how this involves me or uh, Mrs. Correll. You forged Georgiana Slater's name to a phony letter to Mary Cordelium. Inspector, if this is an accusation... No, no, at this point, it's just a suggestion. Walter... Jella, say nothing. You thought there could never be anything to tie you to this request. After all, the columnist probably throws the letters away, and besides, who would ever think to probe? Walter, what is he saying? Nothing that he can prove in court. The bank says the signature is not familiar. Mistake number one on your part. Then we know that Mrs. Slater did not own a typewriter. Mistake number two. Well, Georgiana Slater could have uh, found a typewriter somewhere. The letter was typed on a machine in your home, Mrs. Correll. We checked it. Walter, you thought you were so smart. Della. It was your idea. You scared me into it. But you killed her. Inspector, I don't know why I listened to him. Maybe because James was away so much. Della, they have no proof. They found out about the letter. They can find out about anything now. Anything. But it was your idea. His idea, Inspector. I don't know what got into me. I must have been out of my mind. I was upset. Confused. Uh, Mrs. Correll, do you mind talking a bit more slowly so that Detective Smith can take it all down?
I'll be back shortly with a final thought. How marvelously complex is the human psyche. How quickly we can be led to conclusions. How completely our own convictions may break down when confronted by what appears to be an overwhelming flood of so-called evidence. Sometimes we simply surrender in the face of, it has to be true. It takes courage to stand up and ask why. Why does it have to be true? Our cast included John Beale, Robert Dryden, Joan Shea, and Earl Hammond. Associate Director, Marlon Swing. This is Hyman Brown, producer-director, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, then, pleasant dreams. Radio Mystery Theater presents Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. In the mythology of ancient Greece, Hypnos, the god of sleep, and Thanatos, the god of death, were twin brothers, and for good reason. When you turn out the light beside your bed and snuggle down under the sheets for a good night's rest, you finally slowly drift off into a form of unconsciousness. This blacking out, this easing into a soft and shapeless state of non-existence, gives you an inkling, a kind of preview of what it may mean to enter the doorway of sleep's shadowy brother, death. The brown-purple blood gathered in a swift bead trickling over my side. I could see it. Forrest flung the scalpel aside and began to shout. Ice! Ice! Quick, somebody let me have some ice! Lots of it! Even though my body still clung to me there on the operating table by the merest thread... I knew that Dr. Forrest, in spite of all his skill, had murdered me. Our mystery drama, The Long, Long Sleep, was suggested by a short story of H.G. Wells and was especially written for the Mystery Theater by Arnold Moss. It stars Larry Haynes, I'll be back shortly with Act One. When destiny decides a man's time has run out, when a gaunt figure menacingly emerges from the half-darkness, his face cloaked under a huge black cowl, and his long, bony finger beckons you to join him. How can you be sure whether or not you are ready? By what signs do you recognize this to be the final eternal sleep? The sleep from which no one awakes. It's the night of December 31st, and Norman Hill and his wife, Lori, a couple in their middle 50s, are at home, alone. New Year's Eve, the end and the beginning. For the first time ever, Laurie and I had decided to stay home together. Why? I wasn't really sure. But there was an unknown something that was bothering me. Only a couple of minutes to go, Laurie. Well, another year will have gone by. Mm -hmm. You don't feel bad about our not going out? Norman, of course not. What we're doing makes the only sense. This is perfect. Yeah. Just the two of us alone. 
in an apartment that's begging to be painted. Well, I'll have the painters in any day now. I promise. <laughs> okay. Ooh, now let's get to that jar of caviar. Right, and real imported champagne, the best that money can buy. Now, when you get the promotion they've been promising you at the office. Yeah. And the very good chance of my book being picked up as a paperback. Oh, Norman, I'm a very lucky woman. Hmm. And I love you very much. And, Laurie, I love you. Bill, hmm. after all these years, <laughs> you don't want to trade me in for a later model? Uh, not just yet, dear. Oh. But I'm delighted to be stuck with what I've got. For a while, <laughs> anyway. Well, thank you, darling. You're still very sweet and so romantic. <laughs> This is it. Oh, have some of the toast and caviar. Yes, of course. Mm. Oh, it's great. It's wonderful. Happy New Year, darling. Oh, happy New Year to you. And with luck, to another 30 years to go. Well, at the very least, I'll drink to that. To us. <laughs> what is it, Norman? What's wrong? Norman? What's happening? Oh, what can I get you? Oh, Norman? <coughs> Speak to me. What is it? Norman? Norman, darling. Open your eyes. You're frightening me. Are you all right? Uh, where am I? Oh. Uh, Lori. Oh, everything's going to be all right. Now, uh, you started to drink your champagne. You began to choke. Uh, and suddenly you passed out. For long? Five, ten seconds, maybe. You all right now? Yeah, I'm fine. Just fine. I think. Has this happened before, Norman? I, uh, didn't want to worry you. Recently? The last couple of weeks, two or three times. Oh. Once at lunch with a couple of the fellas from the office. Have you been in pain? No, no, not really. Well, you've got to see a doctor. Yeah, I suppose so. Maybe I will. No, no, no maybes, Norman. Tomorrow morning you make an appointment with Forrest Hatton. What, New Year's Day? It's a holiday, even for doctors. Well, then the next day, Tuesday. Yeah. All right, maybe, maybe it's not a bad idea. I'll call him at home. Norman, you just scared the living daylights out of me. Yeah, I guess I did. Anyway, happy New Year, darling, to both of us. Lori was scared. And I was, too. If you've made up your mind you want to go on living, then you make up your mind to follow the rules. The doctor's rules. Forrest Haddon, who was one of my closest and most trusted friends, put me through the most thorough physical examination I'd ever had in my life. Every test in the book... And then a few days later at his office. Norman, I've never kidded any of my patients, least of all you. I don't see the point. Uh, when, Forrest? How soon? The operation? Yesterday, Norman. No. The longer we wait, the greater the chance we take. We? Do they suspect at the office? No, no, of course not. And, uh, Laurie... Lori. Lori is something else. Oh, what do you say? I am all yours, Dr. Haddon, I guess. I've already called the hospital. They can take you Thursday morning. That's the uh, day after tomorrow. I wouldn't wait, Norman. Okay. Then Thursday morning it is. And, uh... The odds of my survival, of my uh, pulling through? Oh, I'm a doctor, Norman, not a gambler. I don't give up. But if you did? All right, I'd say an even 50-50. No worse? No worse. You'll be at the hospital Thursday morning at 8, admitting room. Um, where are you headed now? The office, then home. I think I'll walk. Clear my head a bit. Do you mind if I walk along with you? <laughs> you were my last patient. No, no. Of course not first. Are you sure? Yes, I'm sure. You're, um... You're afraid I'm about to dissolve into a huge mess of self-pity and despair, aren't you, first? Uh, I might take it into my head to do something rash, right? Could be. 
And if I did? Oh, that would be very foolish. Well, what would be the sense? None. No, no, Forrest, you're wrong. At this moment, I feel absolutely nothing. Not self-pity. Not despair. Nothing. Just a big... Big emptiness. As if... I were already dead. This afternoon, as I walked along with Forrest Haddon facing the possibility of my own death, it was all very strange. Every deep, passionate feeling I might have had, depression, fear, resentment, anger, was in some curious way drained out of me. There was nothing left inside me except a bloodless, tranquil resignation to a 50-50 chance of the inevitable. Now, there's no point in minimizing the danger, Norman. It's a very tricky, delicate procedure. Oh, I'm not an alarmist. You know that. I know what I'm doing. And I'll be working with a team... And as we trudged as through the snow across from the park toward my office, Forrest kept on assuring me that my life was in the most capable hands. But I couldn't get over the feeling that here I was, living in the very real shadow of death, without my being able to do a thing about it, to control in any way what was happening to me. And what surprised me most was the fact that I was unmoved by the whole thing. And I was cool. Lucky that I, I was uh, calm. Uh, no. Until... Norman, look out! Move it! Well, what happened? Uh, that big pot with a plant in it must have toppled off the roof of that penthouse. The wind must have blown it. It's a good thing you saw it coming first. And pushed me out of the way. It was just in time. It missed my head by inches. split your skull right in two. Well, come on, let's not stand here, Norman. Let's move before anything else happens. Yes, thank you. Thank you, Forrest. Thank you very much. <laughs> For a moment, I'd been brought back to reality. And then a minute later, that same dullness, the feeling of being isolated from the rest of the world, began to take over again. I think that's wonderful about your book, Norman. You know, I don't see how you manage it. A full-time... Forrest my kept on talking you know. about my work, and possibly to get my mind off whatever was wrong with well, me. That's great. That's we kept walking through the slush and well, snow. What kind of thing do you And I was yeah. oblivious to what was going on. I remember starting to cross the street, and then... Norman! What are you doing? Come back here. <laughs> Against you. The brakes on that fellow's car hadn't held you to have been killed. Yes, I, I suppose so. I, I'm sorry. I wasn't thinking for us. My mind uh, uh, on, on other things. Well, of course, I'm aware of that. But for Pete's sake, Norm, oh, what are you trying to do? Uh, my, uh, my office is in that building over there. I think I'd like to sit in the park alone, if you don't mind, for us, before I go up. Oh, sure, Norman. I, I appreciate your company. It was very thoughtful. I'll uh, see you. Day after tomorrow at the hospital. 8 a.m. Admitting room. Thanks again, Forrest. And whatever you do, you take it easy, please. I sat down on one of the park benches, and I must have dozed off into a kind of dream. I thought I saw myself actually dead, with it, tattered one eye, pecked out by birds. And through the trees, I saw a vision of the resurrection. A flat plain of writhing graves and rolling tombstones. The rising dead seemed unable to breathe as they struggled upward through the frozen snow out of the earth. After no more than a minute, I came to and started for my office. Now, what was the sense of not quite being connected with what was happening? Was this some weird anticipation or presentiment of my own death to come? The falling flower pot, my walking in front of that automobile, were they triggered by something that was making me withdraw from all reality, all sense, instincts, even of self-preservation? Before that cold and bony hand was laid on mine, I had no way of knowing. A certain
certain soothsayer warned Julius Caesar to be on his guard against a great peril, a peril that could lead to his death. On the day of the month, the Romans called the Ides, the Ides of March. When that day came and Caesar was on his way to the Senate, he passed a soothsayer in the street and with a smile he said, The Ides of March have come and nothing terrible has happened to me. The soothsayer answered, Yes, the Ides have come, but they are not yet gone. I'll be back shortly with Act Two. is the veil which those who live call life. They sleep, and it is lifted. That was written by one of our great poets. Do those words apply to Norman Hill, or are the words of Aesop, the teller of fables, more appropriate? He said, better die once and for all than to live in the continual terror of death. On a bitterly cold winter's day, Norman sits alone on a park bench, taking the measure of death. The year was only a few days old, the beginning of things. I wandered slowly out of the park toward my office. The children were romping with their sleds in the fresh snow in the winter sun, gathering strength and experience for the business of life. And I kept thinking, I have been part of all this. And for all I know, I'm nearly done with it now. I walked through the doors of my office, and a curious thing, no one paid any attention to me. Not a soul even looked up from his desk to greet me. It was as if I weren't there. I couldn't understand it. Had I suddenly become invisible or what? I got to my own little cubicle of an office, and I felt a sharp jab of pain just below the heart. My office was bare, completely bare. The chair and the desk were gone, the carpeting, my books, the pictures on the walls, everything. My, my name plate on the door, even that had been removed. And for the first time since leaving the doctor's office, I lost the feeling I'd had. That feeling of numbness. Now, what's been happening here? Where are my things? Huh? Well, somebody talk to me? Talk to me! Hey, hey, easy. Norm, take it easy. Relax. Now, Mr. Lewis, what is this? Just look at my office. <laughs> Surprise! Surprise? Now, for Pete's sake, what on earth are you talking about? That... I'm sorry, excuse me, excuse me for shouting. I, I didn't mean to yell. Oh, that's perfectly all right. We may have overdone things a bit. We had no idea you'd take it this way. Take what? What way? <laughs> Your promotion. My what? Oh, my boy, the way you handled our new account, that was absolutely brilliant. No one in the office could have done it the way you did. And so the board and I decided to kick you up to an executive vice presidency. <laughs> Congratulations. Uh, yeah. Yeah, that, that, that's wonderful. Wonderful, Mr. Lewis. Thank you. Th thank you very much. <laughs> that's why we had, to, had them clear out your old office. Uh, the big one in the corner, over there. That's yours. All new furnishings. Your personal things are already in. Well, you know, for a minute there with nobody in the office even looking well, at that me... that was part of the act. Part of the surprise. Yeah, well, I... I must say you threw a real scare into me. I had the feeling maybe... Maybe I wasn't really here that none of those things was actually happening. Oh, they're happening all right, Mr. Vice President. <laughs> <laughs> I hope you'll be with us for a very long, long time. Well, that, Mr. Lewis, at the moment is uh, a little questionable. Questionable? Well, I'll, I'll know better on Thursday, Thursday morning. Now, now look, we're, we're ready to match any offer anyone else is making you. Oh, I doubt that you could match this one, Mr. Lewis. Anyway, I wouldn't... Uh, call it an offer. Not exactly. On my way home, I found myself lost again in a shifting maze of thoughts about death. I felt 
more and more certain that on Thursday morning, I was going to die under the operation. Lori? You home, dear? It's me. My wife wasn't home. She was shopping, of course. Shopping. At this time, something very odd was going on. The, ch the chairs, the, the sofa were all covered with big white sheets. Every surface of every table had been cleared. The drapes had been taken down. And that dull stab of pain hit me once again in the pit of the stomach. I started for the bedroom to change my clothes. What? Hello? I'm so glad to find you in at last. Been trying to get you all afternoon. Who is this? Who's calling? About the arrangements. The director wasn't quite clear about one or two of the details. Uh, what? What arrangements? Which details? Who is this? First, he wasn't altogether certain how many limousines you had ordered. Limousines? The remains will be properly embalmed, of course, as ordered. But was it your desire to have the lid of the casket of the departed left open or closed? Now, would you, for heaven's sake, tell me who this is? Sir, you are not answering my question. Now, before I hang up on you for the last time, who are you? Who is this? The Golden Rule Funeral Services, of course. Serving families, as you know, with dignity and sympathy at all modest costs since 1898. This is the secretary of the director speaking, Mrs. Haven Castle. F funeral services? Why, why are you calling us? Well, isn't this Mr. Yamashita? Mr. Shizuki Yamashita? Or have I, by some mischance, got a wrong number? Oh, sister, have you got a wrong number? Sorry, terribly sorry. <coughs> I drifted back into the bedroom. Is that you, dear? Oh, what a surprise. What a big surprise. Lori? Have you been home all this time? Well, of course, in the other bedroom, trying on a couple of new dresses I bought. I had the door shut. Is that, is that one of the new dresses? Mm-hmm. <laughs> what do you think? And what are you doing home? Uh, at this time of day, that is. Well, uh... It's been a long day. A pretty full day, too. I, uh, I saw Forrest Haddon this morning. He had the x-rays, lab reports, everything. And? And he, uh, he's operating on me uh, Thursday morning. That soon? Yeah, my, uh, my chances of getting through the operation are no better than 50-50, uh, Forrest says. Lori, at the office, I... Uh, I've been promoted. Executive vice, vice president. New office, new everything. Isn't that wonderful? Yeah, vice president. Maybe uh, for one whole day. What do you mean by that? Well, I... could be dead day after tomorrow. Norman, dear. Worrying about it isn't going to help. Now, both of us, we have to think positively... And feeling sorry for yourself won't help. You know, uh, a strange phone call as, as I came in. A uh, funeral parlor. What? Yeah, it was the wrong number, they said. Now, Lori, what, uh, what on earth is going on here? Now, what's wrong? Tell me what's wrong. Norman, you're hurting me. Let go of me, please. What's the matter with you? Uh, why have you got sheets all over the furniture? Why is everything cleaned up and put away? As, as if we or you were, were going on a, on, a, on a long trip someplace. As if I were making arrangements to close down the place. Now, why? But darling, you know as well as I do. The painters are coming in to do the apartment tomorrow morning. Tomorrow? Now, now try to control yourself. I know the strain you've been under. It, it's not been easy for me either. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. You're... Your whole attitude since I came in, like I was speaking to a stranger, the way you look at me, the way you talk. It's all in your mind. As if for some reason you were frightened of me. As though you were looking at a, at a ghost. Somebody who'd come back from the grave. Norman. That dress, that dress you're wearing. What about Well, when me? you take it off, that's what a widow wears, isn't it? You're in mourning for me already. Oh, Norman, you can't mean what you're saying. That's a black dress. It's black. Out of respect for the dead. Let me turn on the lights. Now, what color is my dress, Norman? It's, uh... It's blue. 
It's blue, isn't it? Kind of a, a navy blue. I thought it was black. I'm sorry. Mitch, all right. Lori. Lori, what's wrong with me? Oh, you're upset, Norman. Terribly upset. And you have every reason, every right to be. Oh, look, darling. Why don't you lie down for a bit? You know, when Forrest told me about my chances of pulling through, my, my, my body, my mind, everything seemed to go numb, lifeless. As if this were about to happen to somebody else, not to me. And then, and then it suddenly hit me. This is, this is happening to me. And I'm afraid. A, a nap. A nap before dinner will do you a world of good. Put all those dreadful thoughts out of your head. And in the morning... In the morning, nothing will have changed. Nothing. But in the morning... After tossing frantically in my bed all night without even a minute's sleep, I had an idea that I... I thought might put my mind at ease. Laurie, let's drive up to Avalon. Avalon? Uh Uh-huh. The cemetery? Yes, exactly. You want to drive to the cemetery in this rainstorm? We'll be drowned. Darling, I'd like to go. I'd just like to walk around and... Look at the family gravestones, you know, the, the whole families. I don't know why, but I think it'll make me feel better. Well, if that's what you want, dress warmly. Oh, it'll be freezing up there. And we'll take two umbrellas. Thank you, Lori. In less than an hour, we were at Avalon Cemetery, where my family had been buried for over a hundred years. And we stood there before the big family plot while the wind almost tore our words away and the rain drummed down on our two black umbrellas. Oh, keep your coat buttoned tight around your neck. Yeah, yeah that's uh, Grandfather Curtis over there, my mother's father. Christopher Curtis, born 1859, died 1911. That, that big headstone over there? Yeah, my, my father's father's father, my great-grandfather, Charles Robert Hill, born 1838, died 1863. Only 25. Killed at the Battle of Shikamapa in the Civil War. The lettering on some of these stones is so worn, you you can hardly read them. Uh, This is your father's grave over here, isn't it? And uh, and next to him, your mother. Yes, yes, that's right. And right behind them, over there... No. Oh, no. I I don't believe it. Norman, what is it? Next, next to Grandfather Hills. That's, that's impossible. What are you talking about? The letters are badly worn, but you, you can still see the name. Norman Hill. Lori, the grave we're looking at is mine. At this moment, it would seem that his fear of death has led Norman Hill to the point where he questions whether or not he is still alive. With Shakespeare's Prince of Denmark, he may be thinking, for in that sleep of death, what dreams may come when we have shuffled off this mortal coil must give us pause. There's the respect that makes calamity of so long a life. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. Hill, under the dark shadow of a fate he sees as fairly certain, death has suddenly become definable, perceptible, real. So much so that he's beginning to doubt whether he is still alive, or perhaps he has fallen into the kind of deep sleep that is death without dying, living but not life. He and his wife, Lori, on a windy, rain-swept morning, stand in a corner of a cemetery looking at the cold, gray headstones over the graves of Norman's family. What you see? Right behind those other gravestones, over there. Oh, no, I don't believe it. Norman, what is it? That, that headstone next to my grandfather's. It, 
That's impossible. What are you talking about? The letters are badly worn. You can barely make out the name. But look closely. It says Norman Hill. Laurie. The, the grave we're looking at is mine. Norman, be sensible. Now, get closer to it. Look again. I know. It's so hard to see in the rain. Well, look at it. Look at the letters. Look at the dates. Born 1859. That's Grandma Hill. That's my grandmother's grave. Of course. And her name? Her name was Norma. I was named after her. That's what the headstone reads. An O-R-M-A. The extra N. I thought I read. It just isn't there. Darling, it's cold. Yeah. Wouldn't it be more sensible to go back home now before we both come down with pneumonia? Next morning, I was up at dawn. I'd been awake and hot and thirsty all night long. The glow of pain under my ribs seemed more massive than ever. We'd better go, Norman. Sure. On a dot of eight, I checked into the admitting room at the hospital. I kissed Lori. Was it Goodbye. After what seemed like an eternity of details of preparation, I was finally placed on a table and wheeled into the operating room. Forrest Haddon, in his operating greens, was standing over me. Good morning, Norman. How do you feel? All right, I guess. <laughs> Will it hurt much? No, not a bit. You'll be out cold under a general anesthetic. And your heart's as sound as a bell, so we don't have to worry about that. Oh, that's good. All right now, Norman. Start counting backwards. Begin with the hundred. Backwards. One hundred ninety-nine. Ninety-eight. Ninety-seven. It's very good, Norman. Excellent. Ninety-six. Mm-hmm. Ninety-five. Mm-hmm. Ninety-four. Just breathe normally. Ninety-three. Spine. Ninety-two. Fine. Ninety-one. I knew I'd never come out of the ether. Just as I was going under, I think I heard Forrest say to one of his assistants, We've got to be extra careful. One little slip of the knife into a branch, any branch of the portal vein, and we're out of luck. I could still make out his words. This was my last moment of awareness, my last act of consciousness. 73... 72, 71. And then, a great silence, a monstrous silence, an impenetrable blackness came over me. There must have been an interval of absolute unconsciousness, seconds, maybe minutes. And I realized I was not dead. I was still in my body. But all the sensations that make up the background of consciousness had gone. I do not think I saw. I do not think I heard. But I was aware of everything that was going on. Forrest was bending over me. The lower part of his face was masked. Behind his glasses, his eyes were intent, unmoving, glued onto whatever he was doing. Stand by the suction. Scalpel. I saw him reach for the scalpel, a large one. I saw him slice into my flesh with swift dexterity. It was interesting to see myself being cut into as if I were a drum of cheese without the slightest bit of pain. I was looking into Forrest's eyes, into his mind, his brain. I could see that he was being extremely careful, afraid of cutting a branch. Uh, what do you call it? Oh, yes, a branch of the portal vein. And ending my life right there and then. I could read his thoughts in his eyes. You're right, Norman. Absolutely right. 
I'm struggling between the two possibilities of either cutting too little or cutting too much. And I'm afraid. Afraid. And then suddenly, like an escape of water from under a floodgate, I could see a great swirling a brush of horrible realization in far size. Damn. The vein. I've cut into the vein. The brown purple blood gathered in a swift bead trickling over my side. Forrest flung the scalpel aside and began to shout. Ice. Ice. Quick. Ice. Lots of it. And hand me that clamp. Thoughts rushed through my mind with incredible speed, but with perfect clarity. Even though my body still clung to me by the merest thread, I knew that in spite of all his skill, Forrest had killed me. I was aware of a growing pull upon me as though some huge magnet were drawing me out of my body. The doctor, his assistants, the nurses seemed to have vanished. And I was in midair, flying swiftly upward. And the circle of scenery beneath me grew wider and wider. And the sky became deeper and richer in color until in no time at all, it had become a terrifying black. As dark and foreboding as no blackness I had ever beheld before. An innumerable host of stars broke out upon the sky. And then as from nowhere, the sun suddenly appeared. Wiping out the darkness, an incredibly strange and wonderful disk of blinding white light rimmed about with a fringe of writhing tongues of red fire. Turn away, Norman. Don't look at it. Protect your eyes. How? How do I do that? Put your hands over your eyes. Uh, just... Just a minute. Who are you? Where are we? I'm here to help you. Why? Well, I, I can't see you. I have the feeling that I've not left the earth, but that the earth is pulling away, leaving me. It's interesting that you should notice uh, so soon. Well, not only, not only the earth, but the, the whole solar system seems to be streaming past me. I wonder if scattered in the wake of the earth there must be others like me, maybe millions and millions of them floating through space, the same as I am. That's altogether possible. But suppose I, I, I should collide into some of them. Oh, that's not very likely. Why not? The space through which you're all traveling, you and they, is infinite. It has no beginning. It has no end. Plenty of room for all of you. Look! Look! The North Star. Over there, the Little Dipper. And the, uh, isn't that the Southern Cross? It's so clear, so big. You know your stars. What you, what you see in my latest book, Lost in the Stars, I, I, I called it. Yes? Oh, I, I shouldn't be talking about my book, not now. Oh, my. Such color. As though the light were coming from a world of sapphires. And, and that, oh, that big red one down there, like a brilliant ruby rushing up to us. That's Mars. And uh, that one was Venus. Oh, yes. And, and uh, the one with the little moons around it and all those rings. Saturn, of course. Oh, yes. And those rings are all crystals of ice. Now, with luck, we get to the interesting part. Oh, and what's that? Outside and beyond your solar system. Past all the planets you know. With luck. What does that mean? Where... Where are we? Where have we come to? To the edge of the outer universe. It was hard to believe what I was saying. Faster and faster, one galaxy after another rushed by, a hurry of whirling fireballs speeding into the endless void of space. Countless unfamiliar planets and constellations circled about me, catching the light in some ghostly fashion and then vanished into non-existence. I had at last reached the complete wilderness of space. And now, at last, I knew what happens when you leave this earthly life. The long, long sleep. Now I knew what it felt like to be dead. 
me, I was no longer a detached observer. I was terrified, thrown into an intolerable darkness, horror, and despair. Because I knew now, I knew now I didn't want to leave the Earth so soon. I knew now I wanted to live. And again, I heard that same voice. Norman, you see that little speck of light? Yes. Keep your eye on it. It's growing bigger. It's more distinct, like... like a pale brown cloud of some kind. That's funny. Funny? The, the shape of it, I, I think... I think I've seen something like it somewhere before. It's, it's like a... Yes? Like a clenched fist. Do you see anything else? Yes, the, the fist, the, ha the hand. is holding a, a stick. A shiny white stick of some kind. But no, nothing, nothing is very clear. Nothing is in focus. And above the hand, there's a little circle of, of light, sort of phosphorescent. Uh, the, the stick and the hand are just below it. You'll be all right, Norman. Everything's going to be all right. All right. And there will be no pain, Norman. No pain ever again. Why? How? You Why? may live to be 115, Norman, and able to eat and drink almost anything. The operation, I'm happy to say, has been 100% successful. Haddon, my doctor, was standing beside me. I was in a hospital bed. The circle of light I'd been looking at was the face of a clock on the wall. And the white rod was the railing at the foot of the bed. Norman. Norman, darling. Oh, thank heavens it's all over. Lori. Lori. I'm alive. Of course you're alive. How do you feel? I'm not sure. A little weak. You see, I've been away for a while. Far away. On a rather long trip. I know, dear. I know just what you mean. Hey, you know what? I have a wonderful idea for my next book. Oh, you mustn't talk. You must rest. It's about... This fellow, whose doctor starts to operate on them, a 50-50 chance of his making it. The doctor's knife slips. The patient sees the accident, realizes he's dead. Goes off on a journey into space. Sees all kinds of strange phenomena. If a writer of science fiction envisions his passage to eternity as an eerie odyssey through space, how do you suppose another person would see it? A coal miner, for example. Would he perhaps find himself digging down, down, down forever until he reaches ink-black oblivion? Or a carpenter? Would he be building an unending stairway of steps and risers leading to... A perpetual, everlasting nothingness. We'll never know. I'll be back shortly. In recent days, there have been many heated discussions over the true definition of the word death. Biological death? where there is total and permanent cessation of all vital functions, legal death, where many of these vital functions continue, but where there are no other signs of life as we know it. We leave the resolution of this question to the theologians, the scientists, even the lawyers. One thing we're almost sure of, along with Norman Hill, the journey to death may not only be terrifying, but it will also be very interesting. Our cast included Larry Haynes, Ann Williams, and Ian Martin. 
The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. This spirit, having achieved the ultimate understanding, leaves the body and tries to become one with the universe. Leonard, I'm drowning. But the time is not yet, and so it must be born anew in another body. Leonard, is this you? Bridges, I am finally free. I know at last. I know. The guru showed me who I am. Who are you? I have been born again. Recreated. Although, uh, realistically, I never died. Yeah? Once again, I walk the world. I think. I dream. I create. But who are you? That is, who do you think you are? Oh, I know who I am. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> I'm Leonardo da Vinci. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. for the sweetest three-word phrase in our language. The three words which best quiet fears and quicken hope in the heart. What three words would you give me? Probably you'd say, without much hesitation, I love you. Am I right? Of course. But think again. Are there not another three words which comfort and gladden in much the same way? And are not those... Other three, I'm going home. Why do I feel I know you? Know you very well. We've never met before, have we? Well, never. Then, then why do I feel it too? That I know you. Know you very well. <laughs> mystery drama, The Wandering Wind, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars John Deal and Terry Keene. The name of our story is The Wandering Wind. We have selected it from a poem that probably few of you know. The Deva's Song by Sir Edwin Arnold. Four of the lines run like this. We are the voices of the wandering wind which moan for rest and rest can never find. Lo, as the wind is, so is mortal life. A moan, a sigh, a sob. A storm, a strife. Imagine a man getting married at 63 for the first time. Especially a man like me. For I'm not even a sociable person. I'm apt to cross the street to avoid speaking to an acquaintance. If I do have to greet someone, I tend to keep my eyes on the ground and then hurry on. The truth is, human contact is simply too much for me to endure. All that I knew of life 
beyond the struggle to earn a living, I got from the books I read. The philosophers and the poets. They reached me. They touched me. With them, I, I could make contact. But a living human being? Out of the question entirely. So how, you're asking, when I was entering the frosty climate of old age, did I summon the courage to marry myself to a woman that I hardly knew? And why did she choose a man like me? For it was her notion that we should marry, not mine. Are the shelves up, John? Yes, Miss Dawkins. Uh, how much do I owe you? Well, I'll leave that up to you. Whatever's worth to you. Now, those shelves are where I keep my materials, my extra materials, remnants and things. Uh, would four dollars be all right? Well, that's all right. And uh, how much for the lumber? You had to pay for the lumber, didn't you? I want to pay you for that. How much? Oh, I got it cheap. Two thirty-five. But it's good pine. So I owe you six dollars and thirty-five cents. Is that right? No, well, if it's all right with you. You know, John, if I charge for my sewing the way you charge for carpentry, <laughs> well, yeah, there, that's six dollars. Well, I don't have the thirty-five cents on me. Oh, that's all right. No, John, that's not all right. I still owe you. Oh, some other time. No, now. I got some change in the teapot. Well, it's not too much trouble. Uh, you can see how much trouble it is. Now, there, there's three dimes and a nickel. Okay. Thank you, Miss Dawkins. Don't thank me. You earned it. Yeah. Well, thank you. I'll be getting along now. John, wait a minute. Sit down for a minute, can't you? Well, well I, I could... Then sit. Would you like a cup of tea? Oh, no. Thank you. You want coffee? No, no. I, I have to be getting on. Well, where to? Oh, uh, well, back to where I live. And where's that? Well, I have a, a place. What kind of place? A room. I better be leaving. Please. Sit down. I said sit down, John. Please sit down. Well. John, do you like me at all? What? You don't hate me, do you? Oh, no. No. Do you maybe like me? Oh, well, I'm... I'm not asking you do you love me. You understand that, don't you? Well, I, I... Just, do you like me a little? Do you like me at all? Is that so hard to answer? I will... y y yes, it is hard. Why? Why is it so hard? Well, well because... Because I, I don't think about such things. Liking, loving, all that sort of thing. I, I just don't think about things like that. Miss Dawkins, I better go. Thanks for the job. Thanks for the money. I, I, I got to get back. John, I want you to marry me. What? I want you to marry me. Is that such a terrible thing to say? You look so shocked. I'm not a frightened kind of woman, am I? Well, no. You think I'm... Bold, don't you? Too forward. Is that it? No, that's not it. Then what is it? Please sit down and tell me what it is. I, I, I'm... I'm frightened of everybody. I'm, I'm a frightened man. What are you afraid of? Do you know? People. I'm afraid of people. They scare me. And do I scare you? Well, not so much as before. i got to get going. John, if you go now, you'll never come back. You won't, will you? I don't know. You won't because you've told me about how you are and you think I'll take advantage. Am I right? Tell me, am I right? I guess. But I won't take advantage, John. Because the way you are... That's the way I am, too. I don't know how she did it. 
but she did it. I moved into her house. A nice house. A few miles out of town, medium size, with a wide porch that ran around two sides. But it was in a terrible state of disrepair, especially the porch. I wanted to get to work on it right away, but Doreen wouldn't hear of it. Did I say her name was Doreen? Doreen Dawkins. Even after I moved into her house, it was quite a while before I could call her anything but Mrs. Dawkins. Actually, I didn't call her Doreen till after we got married. And even then, not right away. But after a while, I started to feel there was something... Well, something right about me being in that house with her. Being married to her. It was a, a feeling... I don't know how to say it. I can't... I can't find the proper words, but it was a feeling that... that I was... that I was home. Terrible night. Don't stand by the window. I like to watch it. Hey, that was a big one. You see that lightning? Lit up the whole sky. You come away from the window? You know what, Doreen? What, John? A bolt of lightning was to hit this house. It won't. Well, it could. But it won't. Well, if it did, this whole house would go up like a box of matches. Two, three minutes. Fit it. Don't start up again. What? Don't start talking about fixing up the house. Well, why not? I got the time. I got the tools. I got the know-how. Well, you leave this house alone. Well, just a few things. It'd be easy. Like the porch now. The floor is sagging. The... The ballast is falling apart. The steps are broken. I like it the way it is. How can you like it, a woman like you? I like it. Why, there's so much trash collected underneath that porch. Leave it there. Spontaneous combustion. That could happen. I don't want to talk about it. I don't wish to discuss it, understand? Just leave it alone. Leave it the way it is. Good Lord. There's a man standing out there. A man? Now I could see him by that last flash. He's standing by the road. Get away from the window. I could see his face just as plain. He's looking right at me. Close the shutters. He was soaking wet. It is no business of yours if he wants to stand out there. We could catch his death. That's his affair. Be a young fella. John, if you're thinking of asking him in here... You think I shouldn't? If he wanted to, he'd come to the door and he'd ask. Well, I don't and know. And if he does, don't you let him in. Don't answer the door. But if you... I don't want anybody in this house with me. Oh, what is it now? I saw his face. So clear. He had the look. He wants to come in. He's afraid to ask. So leave him be. He, he's afraid of us. I didn't sleep all night. I kept seeing that man, a oh, boy. He looked to be about 20. Thin, white-faced, sobbing with rain, staring at the house. Not a muscle of his body moved. He just stood and stared. And now, as the sun was coming up, I recognized the look he had. Not that I'd seen it before, but I'd felt it on my own face. Felt it in my own posture. It was the look of separation, isolation. The look of being absolutely alone and helpless to do a thing about it. Doreen left early to deliver a dress she'd made for a lady. And after a while, I went to the door and opened it and looked out. And there he was, sitting down now, leaning against a big oak tree with his face turned up toward the morning sun. Good morning. Good morning. John Masters is my name. What's yours? Simon Kaskia. You were here last night. Mm, mm, yes. I thought I should ask you inside, but my wife said no. Would you like to come inside now? My wife's going out on an errand. Well, would you? Mm, uh, uh, yes. Well, then, come on. Come on. What is it? You afraid? Well, I can understand that. I've been afraid in my time. Mm, no more? Not so much as I used to be. But it took little doing and little luck. <laughs> you understand? Huh? Mm, no. Well, that's all right. I don't understand either. 
It's just something I said because I felt like it. You ever say anything like that? No. Not even once? Well, I understand that, too. Because I was a lot older than you before I said anything just because I felt like it. Well, how about coming inside? Have some breakfast, huh? How about it? I wouldn't hurt you. Of course you know that. You're not afraid I'll do you any harm. You're just afraid, huh? Isn't that how it is? Of course that's how it is. Now, you just give me your hand. Let me pull you up. Yeah. Like that. That's it. Now, we're going to walk into the house together. Side by side. See? That's it. <laughs> One foot. Mm-hmm. Other foot. That's it. <laughs> One foot, other foot. Here we go. One foot, other foot. John! John, what are you doing? Come on. One foot, other foot. Don't you dare take that man into my house. One foot, other foot. Don't do it, John. Now, stop. Pay no attention, Simon. One foot. Underfoot, one foot. And I got him inside. As much for my own sake as for his. Because a great feeling of satisfaction spread over me. I had recognized a fellow sufferer. After such a long time, I had recognized my fellow man. Let me quote to you four more lines from the poet cited before the act began. Somewhere there waiteth in this world of ours for one lone soul, another lonely soul, each chasing each through all the weary hours and meeting strangely at one sudden goal. I'll be back shortly with that too. thing when you take someone into your home. You're inviting him to look at something that is very personal, very much your own. You risk his disapproval even as you silently hope that he'll approve. You're taking a first tentative step towards asking him to know you yourself. And he knows that in entering, his risk is quite as great as your own. Now you just sit there, understand? All right, now, my wife will be here in a minute. She may carry on a bit. Matter of fact, I know she will. I don't know why, but she doesn't want anybody in this house but herself and me. No, 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 no. Don't get up. Stay right where you are. John. Don't you move. I told you never to let anybody in here. This is my house. Doreen, I want you to go in the kitchen and make a big pot of coffee. Coffee? Our friend here was out in that rain last night, and he hasn't dried out yet. Oh, friend. He could be coming down with a cold. I don't care if he does. Yes, but I care. Now, you do what I said, Doreen. Good, strong coffee. I don't know. Do what... it now. What has come over you? Good, strong coffee. Now. I don't understand this whole thing. Doreen makes very good coffee. You'll feel better after. Now, I want to tell you something. What you're feeling now, I've felt that all my life. Have you? felt it all your life, I mean? I thought so. Like a stranger, huh? An outsider, huh? Like everybody else is playing some game that looks like a lot of fun, right? Sure. Only you don't know how to play the game, right? Mm -hmm. Yes. You'd like to play. You want so much to play, but you don't know how. You don't know the rules. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Right. Yes. Sure. I know that feeling well. But but at the same time, you have this other feeling. Very, very small, very faint, but very persistent. It won't go away. That if you could just learn the rules, if somebody would just tell them to you, well, then you'd be able to play the game. And you'd play it very well. You'd, you'd play it as well as anybody. Isn't that it? Don't you have that small feeling... That feeling that won't leave, you won't go away. Mm-mm. Won't go. That's what I thought. I'm very grateful to you. You know that? To, to me? 
Yes, you, 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 you've made me put it into words. I could never do that before. Till you happened along. Mm-hmm. I've been here before. You have? Lots of times. Why, if you don't mind telling me. Mm-hmm. The house. What about the house? It isn't much of a house. It, it could be a lot better if my wife would let me fix it up, but, but she won't. She's got this thing in her head that I mustn't do anything to the house. And me a carpenter, too. What do you do for a living, if I may ask you? I... I beg. You beg? Oh, well, now, that's not good. That's not good at all. You know that, don't you? Of course you do. Who let you grow up like that? Not knowing how to do anything. What were your parents thinking of? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, you were an orphan, huh? Is that it? Well, who brought you up? Brothers. You had brothers? Yeah. Oh, you didn't, huh? Well, then what... Oh, you mean the monks. Yes, monks. The brothers of the repentance, right? Yeah, sure. They have that monastery on the other side of town. Yes, I, I've passed it lots of times. So that's where you grew up, with the brothers. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yes. Is that where you got your name? Did they give you that name? Simon Kaskia? Oh, oh, I see. Simon Kaskia. I know that name. Mm -hmm. A saint. Of course, Simon of Kaskia. Mm -hmm. See, now, he was he was a lay brother, wasn't he? Yeah, yes, he was. He never got to be a real monk. He was, he was still secular, but he has a... They let him work in the monastery, didn't they? Because he was such a good cook. Yeah, isn't, isn't that the one? <laughs> the one. Well, now, uh, are you a good cook? Mm -hmm. Oh, I... I. Did they let you spend a lot of time in the kitchen? At the monastery? Mm -hmm. All. All your time? In the kitchen? Mm -hmm. All my time. And you learned how to cook, huh? Mm -hmm. Some. Here's the coffee. You asked for? Doreen, our friend here's a cook. He can cook. What do you know about that? Well, he could hire himself out as a... I've bought some toast, too. Oh, that's nice. I thought he might be hungry. Of course he's hungry. Why didn't I think of that? Pour the coffee, will you, Doreen? I brought two cups. Well, why didn't you bring three? We could all have some coffee together. Oh, that's cream and sugar. Good. Get another cup, Doreen. We'll all... I'm going upstairs. Simon was telling me about himself. When he's finished, he's got to get up and go. Now, oh, Doreen... Tell him that. Make it perfectly clear. Pay no attention. She doesn't really mean that, or she wouldn't have made you the toast. Go on, now. Eat up. Help yourself to cream and sugar. Now, look here. Doreen's brought you some strawberry jam. See? I told you she liked you. She'd never have done that. It's just this house that she's so particular about. Mm -hmm. A house. You know, something about this house. She, she wants it left just like it is. Mm -hmm. Yes. Now, so much could be done to it. You've noticed the porch. It's going to fall down one of these days. But she won't let me touch it. Won't let me near it. One of these days. And the trash that's collected underneath it. She won't even let me clear it out. Dangerous, all that rubbish. Must have collected for years. How's the coffee? Mm, the, 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 it's good. Oh, and the toast? Good jam, isn't it? Mm, the, good. Simon, do you mind if I ask you something personal? Mm, the, 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 no. Well, you, uh, you have a peculiar way of speaking, uh, uh, you know that, don't you? Mm. <laughs> yes. It's kind of a, a hesitation. You, you say your words all right, but every so often this... Mm, this uh, <laughs> you know you do that, don't you? Yeah, I know. <laughs> it's not a terrible thing to do. I, I don't mean that. It's nothing to be ashamed of. But only the way you do it... it mm, <laughs> Sometimes one, sometimes the other, sometimes both, sometimes neither one, but, well, it's different. It's, uh... Oh, well, never mind. It's not important. It's just that, 
Well, I, I'm interested in you. You understand, don't you? I, I'm not prying. Yes, I understand. There now. That time you didn't do it at all. Oh, well, forget it. Because I want to get on to something more important. What are we going to do with you? Mm -hmm. What? I, I'm not going to turn you out and let you go back to begging again. I won't do that. I want you to stay on here for a while. We've got the room. You can do something to earn your keep, if you feel like it. Or you could help out Doreen in the kitchen, if you want to. I'm no good in the kitchen, that's for sure. John? Uh-oh, that's my wife. John, is that man still there? Pay no attention. John, I want you to come upstairs. Mm -hmm. you, you better... You come up here, John. I want to talk with you. You better go. John? I'll come right back. Everything will be all right. You see. I'll talk to her, okay? Okay. But you stay right there, you hear? I'll have a talk with her. I'll come straight back. It was so important to me. I wasn't going to set this boy adrift to go wandering about the world. Afraid to open his mouth to anyone. Afraid to wake up to the morning. Afraid to close his eyes at night. Afraid to feel, afraid to touch, afraid to know, afraid to live. Oh, I'd had too many years of that myself. I wasn't about to let him do the same. For him, it had to be different. I opened the bedroom door. And Doreen was lying on the bed, staring at the ceiling. Is he gone? Nope. He finished eating, didn't he? Yes. Then get him out of here. No. I want him to stay here with us for a little while. No. I won't have it. Please. Don't you me. brought him in. You fed him. I fed him. What more does he want? It's not what he wants. It's what I want. I want him to stay on with us till he gets to know us. I don't want him to get to know us. I don't want him in this house. I want him out. Doreen, don't you remember how I was before you asked me in? Asked me to sit down and talk? Asked me to marry you? What's that got to do with him being here? Everything. Don't you see? He's the way I was. I was that way when I was his age. I was that way all my life till you changed me. I don't know how. I don't know what you did. I don't even know if you did anything. I don't know if I did anything. Maybe it was just luck. Just pure dumb luck that you asked me and that I said, okay. All right. Maybe, maybe God just took notice that I needed something, someone, to pay attention to me. And you needed someone to pay attention to you. So he moved you to speak, and he moved me to answer. This is different. Just get him out of the house. What's so almighty precious about this house? It's my house. What is it, sanctified or something? Yes. Yes. It's sanctified. It's holy. You oughtn't to say such things, Dory. It is. It is. It's not about a house. It's sacrilegious. A house is just boards and nails and plaster. Not this house. Any house. Not this one. A house is for people to come into, not to shut them out of. Not my house. Why not your house? Why is your house so different from other people's houses? What makes it so special, so spectacular, so all fired sacred that nobody can set a foot in it? You tell me, Doreen. Well, I swear I'll walk out of this precious house of yours. I'll leave you to it. You can live in it by yourself. You wouldn't do that. I would. You can count on it. John? Now, you tell me. What does this house mean to you? Why do you hang on to it like it was all you had? Every time I want to fix something or change something, make it better, why do you yell out like I was going to do something to hurt you? You tell me, Doreen. I want to know. My, my daughter was born in this house. Your daughter? My daughter lived in this house. My daughter died in this house. Her daughter. I'd never known she'd had a daughter. Now a whole field of grief spread across her face. A grief such as I had never known and would likely never know. I took her in my arms 
And I held her. Held her and rocked her back and forth. And she cried and cried. Without tears, without sound. I forgot entirely the young man who was waiting for me in the parlor downstairs. May I quote to you another poet? An American poet named Ralph Waldo Emerson, who lived in the century before ours. Here is what he wrote in 1841. A sublime hope cheers the faithful heart that elsewhere souls are now acting, enduring, and daring, which can love us and which we can love. I'll be back with Act Three shortly. Again, let me quote to you from Ralph Waldo Emerson, who thought a great deal and wrote at some length on the subject of friendship. A friend may well be reckoned the masterpiece of nature. And this, happy is the house that shelters a friend. Now, let's get back to the final act of The Wandering Wind. I sat and held her for a long time. This woman, who had so strangely, almost accidentally, become my wife, and thereby made all her griefs, as well as her joys, my griefs and joys. Doreen, honey, don't you want to tell me about it? I don't know if I can. You could try. I suppose. Sure you could. Now, you had a daughter. What was her name? Tell me that. Mary. Mary. That's a pretty name. Oh, she was a pretty little girl. I loved her so much. Of course you did. After her father died, we just had each other, nobody else. Mm Mm-hmm. And we... We protected each other, took care of each other. Do you know what I mean? I think I do. (laughs) Not that either of us knew anything. I certainly didn't. You did your best? My best. My best wasn't good enough. My best was nothing at all. Doing my best. I killed her doing my best. Honey, don't go. You don't expect me to believe that. But it's true. It's true. Uh, You just tell me all about it. I love you, you know. What? I love you. You never said that before. Well, I should have. Well, I'm saying it now. I love you, John. You've never said that before. I should have. (laughs) We never got around to it, did we? Stupid. Oh, not stupid. Scared. Yes. Scared. Well, now. Now that we understand each other, tell me about your daughter. Mary was... Well, she wasn't perfect... Maybe I was too strict with her. When she was 13, she started, you know, seeing boys. She had lots of boyfriends. She was so pretty. I was very proud and pleased. She'd tell me all about them, and I'd listen and remember how it was when I was her age. So exciting. So exciting. Sure. But confusing, too. Oh, sure. Sure. I should have told her more. I should have told her. Told her what? About boys. About men, all that. Only I didn't really know anything. I didn't know what to say. I I would have said it. If 
see, nobody ever told me anything. I just got married when I was 16, and I had Mary a year later, and then my husband died, so I didn't know anything about other things. One day, she was just 14. She came home, and she told me she was pregnant. Oh, Doreen. Yes, pregnant. 14 years old and pregnant. Why? Well, what did you do? I was so scared. So scared somebody would find out. You know how people are. They wouldn't give me any work. They'd shun my daughter. They'd call her names. They'd snicker behind her back. I mean, you know they would, John. Well, some of them, maybe. Most and of them. And how was I going to support her? How was I going to raise the baby? Who was going to pay for all that? So what'd you do? I... I shut her up in this house. I never let her go out. I told everybody that asked about her that she'd got a job in the city. I said she wrote me all the time and called me up, and she was fine. I kept her in the house till the baby was born. Well, what did you think you were going to do after that? I don't know. I thought I'll think of something. Okay. Go on. The baby started to be born. Here? Here in this house? Well, I couldn't take her to a hospital, could I? I knew how it was to give birth. I'd done that myself. I knew about that. And I stood right next to her, and I told her what to do. And it wasn't too bad. The baby got born right there on the kitchen table. And we were both so happy, both of us. And the baby was healthy and beautiful. And he seemed happy, too. He did. He really did. Well, then what? Well, I thought in a few days we'll start to make plans. We'll go away, the three of us, change our names maybe, do something. But then... Then? She started to not feel so good. Her forehead was hot, hot to the touch. She was burning up with some kind of fever. And after a while, I couldn't talk to her because she wasn't making any sense. And we couldn't make any plans because nothing she said made any sense anymore. And after a few days, she died. She died. Oh, Dory. My daughter died. Oh, honey. And I took the baby one night, and I put him in a basket. All wrapped up warm. And I left him on somebody's porch. That's what I did. That's what I did. It's all right now. It's all right. You just rest, honey. It's all right. What was that? What? I heard a door slam downstairs. That man. Oh, good Lord, I forgot all about him. He's gone. I told him to wait for me, and then I forgot him. It's good he's gone. No. I, I... don't want him in my house. Yes, but I told him... To... No, well, don't go. Well, this is important to me, Doreen. I'll explain it to you later if I can. But I have to tell you something, John. Later, later. I'll be back. I raced down the stairs. I left Doreen lying on the bed, exhausted, but calm and peaceful. I don't know what was driving me, just this tormenting feeling that nobody, nobody should be left to wander this perilous world alone. I couldn't save all of them. I couldn't catch up with all of them. But this one man, there was a chance. A chance for me. And a chance for him. And I could not bear to miss that chance. Simon? You here? Simon? Simon Kaskier? Young man? You here? It's me. I'm back. I said to wait for me. Where are you? Simon. Simon? Did you leave the house? Did you think I wasn't coming back? Simon! Simon Kasky, it's me! I'm here! John? Please, John? He's not in the house, Doreen. I, I, I looked at all the rooms. Well, then he's left. Well, he can't have gone far. I'm going to get my coat and go after you him. You don't even know which direction he went You're in. Probably towards town. That'd be logical, wouldn't it? He begs for a living. Did I tell you that? That's a disgrace, a young fellow like that having to beg on the streets. 
All he needs is somebody to straighten him around, feed him up. Not just food. That part's easy. I mean, feed up his confidence. Let him know somebody's by his side. Like me being here. Doreen, I'd never have moved in here if you hadn't asked me. You know that. I know, but... Then you know why I have to go find that young man. Only if you do find him, John. Don't bring him back to this house. Why not? Because... My daughter is buried here. Too much had happened. I'd been told too much, learned too much, felt too much. I couldn't listen anymore. I simply had to follow through with what I'd started out to do. I put my coat on and I went outside. Down the rickety stairs. And Doreen followed me, but I kept going down to the road... Looking in one direction, then the other, for some side of Simon Kaskia, the young man for whom I felt so responsible. Help! Doreen! Help! Doreen! Doreen! I told you! I told you! What's the matter? What is it? Look. Look there under the porch. Look. There's nothing. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, there's nothing, Doreen. Just some trash. Somebody's been clearing out some trash, that's he all. He did it. He did it. Of course, Simon did it. I talked to him about all that rubbish under the porch. Look, it's it's all right. He probably did it as a favor before he took off. He thought we'd like it. It was to show his appreciation. He was trying to do a nice thing. Put it back. Put what back? The Put rubbish? it back under the porch. All right, now, all right. I'll put it back if you want me to. But why, Doreen? Just tell me why. Because... Under that porch is my daughter's grave. She's buried there. I didn't put the rubbish back. I couldn't, after what she said. I crawled under the porch myself, through all the debris that had collected there, and I found a two-by-four about three feet long stuck into the ground and another piece of wood nailed to it crosswise and on the cross piece a name had been scratched first with a nail and then filled in with ink Mary Dawkins but that's not all the cross with the name scratched on it stood at one end of a bed made of stones stones driven into the ground Enough of them to cover the casket of a young girl of 14. And on that bed of stones was Simon Kaskia, fast asleep. Simon? I'm here, Simon. He's here, Doreen. Simon's here. Simon? Wake up, Simon. Wake up. I'm here. <laughs> Wake up now. It's all right. I'm here. Mama. Papa. We're here. Right here. One of these days, Doreen and I are going to go and see the Brothers of the Repentance. They must have some record of a baby boy they took to live with them some 18 years ago. Maybe it'll turn out that Simon was that baby. That Simon is Doreen's grandchild. It'll be very nice if that turns out to be the case. But it doesn't matter too much. The thing is, he's living with us. And he doesn't stammer anymore. He doesn't try so hard to say Mama and Papa. He's come home. Do you believe such things that a grown man can, without knowing what he is doing, search the world for his parents? I do. And I believe that in some hidden corner of his heart, Everyone does it. Somewhere in that corner, a tiny voice is calling Mama. Papa. Yes, 
Yes, I believe that. And I believe that the little voice keeps on crying his whole life through. I'll be back shortly. of us start out calling our parents mama and papa. Then about age five, that seems babyish, lacking in dignity or respect or something. Some people even graduate later on to sir and ma'am or call their parents by their first names. I've heard of people who do that. But the sweetest words, the words of love and dependency will always be mama and papa. Our cast included Terry Keene, John Beale, and Gordon Gould. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. No 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 Hyman. One of the most fascinating and terrifying themes of the playwright has been parasite, the murder of a father by his own child. The fifth commandment reads, Honor thy father and thy mother, that thy days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God hath given thee. But some people think that parents are not entitled to respect simply because they are parents. And it's thoughts like these when carried to the extreme that can lead to... Now, John, you gonna do as I tell you? No, Pa. I don't think I am. <laughs> Your nose is bleeding when I hit you. Wash your face and hands and come in for breakfast. And then we'll both go out and dig that ditch. You can dig that ditch all by yourself. And while you're at it, Pa, you can also dig yourself a nice big roomy hole for your grave. <laughs> mystery drama, The Thing at Nolan, was especially adapted for the mystery theater from the short story of Ambrose Bierce by Arnold Moss. It stars Russell Horton and Court Benson. The year is 1879. A hundred years ago, the place, the southern part of the state of Missouri, the plateau of the Ozark Mountains, a unique region of soft hill scenery. The area is sparsely populated by a tough breed of pioneers, most of whom struggle to scratch a livelihood out of the livestock they breed and the forage crops they raise. It's a cool morning in June. The sun has just risen. Charles May, his wife Elvira, and their grown son, John, an isolated frontier family of fiercely self-reliant people, are finishing breakfast. Uh, I'll have another cup of coffee, Elvira, whenever. Yes, Charles, in just a minute. Oh, well, it looks like we're going to have another bright and sunny day. Don't it, John? Looks that way, Paul. You know, each morning when I open my eyes and look at them easy, beautiful hills out there, I still can't thank the Lord enough for giving my grandpa the good sense to stop here years ago and settle just where we did. Mm. Good old Missouri. Golden gateway to the west. Hey, you can laugh, John, but we ain't done bad. The work may be back-breaking at times, but it's worth it. Well, maybe to you, Paul. Meaning? Meaning nothing. Nothing at all. Oh, here's your coffee, Charles. Uh, I gotta figure out a way to get more water out of that lake to them cattle of ours. Uh, just ain't enough gets to them. I was thinking maybe I could... Now, this coffee is hot, Elvira. This coffee's not hot at all. 
What's more, it tastes more like dishwater than it does like coffee. I'm very sorry, Charles. Now, if you'll just wait a minute, I'll make you another cup. Uh, uh, never mind. I'll do without. It won't take me a minute. I said I'd do without. Or didn't you hear? But, Charles, there's no reason to what? There's your coffee. Now, hold your tongue. I said be quiet, woman. I, I'm ever so sorry, Charles. Now, get out. I said get out and get out of your chores. <sighs> Come, old woman. Paul, you got no right to talk to him all that way. No right. <laughs> Will you look who's talking? The boy who's teaching himself to read. I got a right to do or say anything I like. This is my house. Well, she didn't mean no harm, you know that. Ain't asking you nothing, John. But I'm telling you. Whether you like it or not. Now, don't you talk that way to my ma ever again. You talk to her with respect. She has earned respect. <laughs> you, that ain't the funniest thing I ever heard. <laughs> respect. You know, it ain't, it ain't funny, Pa. It ain't funny at all. And from now on, I mean to see that ma's treated like a human being. <laughs> Have you gonna... Make me do that? Is that right? You give me cause. I'm big enough now and strong enough. <laughs> if you give me cause. <laughs> now, you just listen to me, son. Whatever happens around here, whatever, is going to happen just one way. The way it's always happened. The onlyest way, and that's my way. And neither you, my big strong son. Neither you nor nobody else is ever going to change that. Do I make myself clear? Very clear. Because that's the way it's going to be. Maybe, Pa. We'll see. Henry, I can't tell you how much I appreciate you coming all the way out here from Nolan just to Bring me this new spade. Well, seven short miles for cousin. It ain't much. It ain't nothing of a good sale, too. Business at the store ain't been all that good lately. That's uh, so. Besides, it is Sunday, and it gets a little lonely sometimes down in Nolan on Sundays. Schoolhouse closed, blacksmith shop closed, my general store closed. Hardly no one around to chew the fat with. And no one out on the lake and back of the store. Too hot. Uh, of course. Uh, this is one beautiful spade, Henry. <laughs> Good heft to it. Sharp cut, Major. Oh, the best, the brightest, the longest wear in that wholesale place in St. Louis has got to sell. You better carve your initials into the handle. Yeah, good idea. Big CM case. In case anyone should take it into his head to borrow Charles May's property. Yeah. Well, I'll get John to do just that. You remember with my lack of school and I can't tell one letter from any other. So you just tell him a big C.M. You know, Henry, I finally figured out how to get the lake water down to my big pasture. You did? Yeah. You know where my creek makes a real sharp horseshoe turn to the west? It's uh, up near the foot of Medicine Lodge Hill. Yeah. I figure I can dig a deep ditch right through the woods. From there to the pasture. It's a little over half a mile only. And a big hole at the end of it. Oh, which will give you all the water you need and still keep your livestock inside the pasture. Yeah, but you'll need help. My son, John. We can start next Sunday, week from today. Two of us together should be able to... Good morning, Henry. Well, ain't it more like good afternoon, John? You just get up with well, here. Sunday, I slept a little bit later than usual. Very noon, boy. Yeah, reckon it is. Where was you last night? Out. I asked where. Around. What time did you get home? Mm, kind of late. Very late. What kind of foolishness was you up to? I don't think I care to answer that, Paul. Or any of the other questions you've been asking, you'll uh, have to excuse me. I'm real hungry. Gonna get me some breakfast. Well, I should have gone. Easy, 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 Charles. Boy has a right to his own life. 
He's not a little boy no more. You got to get used to that. That's what he keeps telling me. But it's true, ain't it? Maybe. But as long as I furnish a roof over his head and provide him with three meals a day... Every bit of which he earns. This is my house, Henry. No one is denying that. But you've got to start treating that boy different. Push him far enough and he just may turn on you. <sighs> he wouldn't dare. Well, wouldn't he? I've been watching John these past few years... Charles, that boy knows how to hate. And he's got the quickest temper. If that boy was ever foolish or had strong enough to do me harm, real harm, he'd never again be able to put me out of his mind. You, uh, you believe that, Charles? I believe that. I'd come back and haunt him for the rest of his days. From wherever I was. Get up, boy. I said get up. Oh, oh l- l- let me be, Pa. I want to sleep. I'm tired. The sun's almost up, John. We start on the digging of that ditch from the lake. Down to the big pasture. Today? Pa, it ain't Sunday, ain't it? Get up out of that bed real fast and get dressed. Pa, I think you better get started on that ditch digging by yourself, huh? I may be telling you. When? Later. I said when. When I'm good and ready. What did you say? You heard. John! John! Breakfast on the table! Uh, we'll, we'll be right there, Elvira. Did I hear you right, boy? I think you did, Pa. Now you get this straight. We've got work to do, important work. Building a ditch to carry water from the creek. And when I leave here this morning, you leave with me. I don't think I will. I know you will. In that case, I think you'll have to make me. Now, you go away and let me get some sleep. Go to that bed, I uh, say. Let me, stand up let me go. Feet like a man. Now, you get your hand off me, Paul. I'll teach you a lesson, you young good for nothing. Don't you dare touch me. You'll be sorry if you do. Yeah. You're going to do as I tell you, or ain't you? No, Paul. I don't think I am. Your nose is bleeding where I hit you. Wipe your face. It can bleed. It does me no hurt. Go wash your face and hands and come in for breakfast. Hey, what are you two up to? The uh, food's getting so... John, well, your nose is bleeding and your cheeks are beginning to puff up. What's been happening to you two? I'll be right with you, Ma. As for you, Pa, you can go dig your ditch all by yourself. And while you're at it, you can also dig yourself a nice big roomy hole... For your grave. John, what are you saying? There's no way to talk. I know what I'm saying, Ma. That picture of Abe Lincoln you hung up next to the door is a joke, Pa. You still treating Ma and me like we were slaves. I... I shouldn't have hit you, John. That's right. You shouldn't have. I'm... I'm sorry. First time I ever did that. Even when you was a little boy. Yeah, and that's the last time. Meaning... You're going to pay for what you just done, Paul. You're going to pay for that. Where is he, Ma? Oh, gone off like he said he was going to with that new spade of his to start digging the ditch. Mm. Uh, what time would it be? Oh, past noon, John. I got a lot of things to do. Well, I took care of the hogs and the milk cows. Well, first, they got to shave, and there's a couple of letters I have to write. Ain't finished reading last week's newspaper. Oh, by the way, Cousin Henry was by early this morning. Brought you this week's paper. Hmm. Real nice of him. He come by just as you two was quarreling. He stayed outside, he said, because it sounded like a very private family affair, but he heard it all. I got the paper out in the kitchen. Thank you. You know, John, your pa can't do that digging all by yourself. Too much for one man alone. Then I guess uh, maybe I'd better join him. Oh, that's a good boy. He was sorry for hitting you. He told me so, and I know you didn't mean what you said to him. You just lost your temper for a minute, didn't you? Just the way he does, right? Exactly. I understand that. Now, you be a good son and go along and help. He needs you. 
A person working all along, all that digging, it could kill a man his age. Even a man as strong as your pa. I suppose it could. Now, you be sure to keep away from the deep part of the creek. You know you can't swim. You don't have to tell me. Yeah, I'll be going now. I'll take the newspaper, practice my reading some while I'm resting. Well, I'll see you later, Ma. Well, ain't you taking a spade with you? You'll need a spade to dig. Paul's got his spade, ain't he? No. I don't think I'll need a spade. In Proverbs we read, Hearken unto thy father that begat thee. And again, the eye that mocketh at his father, the ravens of the valley shall pick it out, and the young eagles shall eat it. John May is planning to defy the teachings of the scriptures. Just how far is he prepared to go? I'll be back shortly with Act Two. highways find their way, whenever newspapers, movies, radio, and television become part of a community's lifeblood, the people gradually lose their unique characteristics and take on the coloring of the rest of the country. This has been happening in the Ozark Mountains. But a hundred years ago, these hill folk were still isolated. Their relationships to each other still primitive, still had their own fierce uncompromising ways of solving their problems. Is that you, Charles? I'm out in the kitchen. No, Ma, it ain't Charles. It's me. It's nearly nightfall, John. Where you been? Well, where I told you I was going. Up to the spring. The creek near Medicine Lodge Hill. Then you did help your pa. Good boy. Get much done? You know... Where is your pa? Ain't he come home yet? No. Didn't you leave together? Well, uh, no. He, uh, he said he wanted to work just a bit more before the sun set. Well, it's nearly dark. Your pa out in the woods alone. No, I... I wouldn't worry about him. He can take care of himself. He always has, hasn't he? I suppose. I'd better light the lamp. I'm going into my room. No, oh, no, just a minute, John. Look at me. Just no, turn. don't turn away. <laughs> your, your clothes, your shirt's all tore. So's your jacket. All them brambles down near the creek. Oh, just look at your jacket. And your pants, they're, they're soaking wet. Oh, don't fret about me, Ma, please. Hey, and what's this? Did you hurt yourself? You did something to yourself and you're not telling me. I, I don't know what you're talking about. Well, here, on your jacket. It's blood. You, you've been trying to wash it off, ain't you? Oh, I couldn't lie to you, Ma. I, I did cut myself. Oh. I did. I felt so much while I was digging. A little blood from my hand got on my clothes. And, and I, I did try to wash the stains off. I, I didn't want you to worry, now. Let me see your hand. Maybe I can... What? Why are you putting your hand behind your back? Why are you looking at me that way? There's something wrong. You, you look strange. No, there's nothing wrong, Ma. Did, did anything happen between you and your pa? Come on, tell me. Nothing. I'm, I'm, I'm just tired. I, I'm, I'm all right. I, I'm, I'm sorry, Ma. I, I didn't mean to get that job. I'm a little upset. Now, if you don't mind, I'm going to bed. But Jane had your supper. I couldn't eat anything. My stomach ain't right. I, I, I don't feel well. Oh, let me help. Is there something I can do? Nothing, Ma. Just let me be, please. Well, Myra. You're Myra May. Good morning, Henry. Oh, it brings you to town this early of a Monday morning. There's some kind of trouble. I need your help bad. What seems to be wrong? But Charles ain't come back. I don't know what you mean. Well, yesterday, after he and John quarreled, 
He went off into the woods to do that digging. And? Oh, that was more than 24 hours ago. Well, Laura, you telling me you ain't seen him since? And I'm worried sick to death. He ain't never done anything like this before. Yes, of course. Elvira, did John join Charles the way Charles asked him to? Well, not right away. He left around noon sometime to go wherever it was Charles was working. And you ain't seen either of them since? No, Henry. John come back around nightfall alone. I see. That's why I'm so worried. John was in a terrible state. His manner was strange. His, his look was wild, like a mad animal almost. His clothes were torn, seemed to have blood stains on them. He said he, he cut himself. But did he say anything, anything at all that would have given you some hint of what might have happened to Cousin Charles? Not really. No, nothing. But where is John now? Back in his room. Oh, what are we going to do? We're going to pay a visit to Calvin Jackson, the new sheriff. Sheriff's got to be called in on this, of course. Well, what, what's on your mind? Nothing. Nothing, little Lyra. Not until the sheriff has a good look around near that bend in the creek. If there's any answer, that's the place we're going to find it. This way, Sheriff. Just follow me. Cruz, it's pretty heavy back here. Charles has been promising for months to clear some of it out. Never found the time. Well, watch your step there, Elvira. <laughs> had uh, anything happened between you and your husband, Mrs. May, that would have led him to, uh, well, it might have given him cause not to come home? Well, Charles has a mean temper sometimes. Says things he's sorry for the minute he says them. Mm-hmm. But Nothing like I think you're suggesting, Sheriff. Uh, I apologize, Miss May. Well, I think the sheriff ought to know about John. Your son? Well, Charles and John quarreled just before Charles left. Who? Serious? But Charles struck the boy in the face. That's about all. Hey, excuse me now, Elvira. That ain't quite all. And you know that. Oh, what else is there? Sheriff Jackson has the right to know. After he was hit, John threatened his father's life. I, I, I was right outside the cabin. I heard John say, you got to pay for this. Hmm. You suppose a minute? Oh, now, here we are. Horseshoe bend in the creek. And here's the ditch that Charles was starting to dig. He hmm. got quite a lot done, didn't he? Well, let's have a look. Hmm. Well, now, here's where he began digging. And he continued straight along this line to that spot over there. Huh. Well, this is most interesting. Well, what's that, Sheriff? Come over here, both of you. Look at this pile of dirt here. Come out of the ditch. Hmm. It looks all trampled on. As though someone had been jumping all over it. Or as though they... There'd been a struggle, a fight of some kind. And look here. These fresh footprints in the soil, this clay. Oh, that one there, that, that's Charles' footprints. Those are the marks his boots make. Yeah. And, and these footprints here? Well, those are the marks of John's boots. I, I know by the brand name on the sole. He bought them in the store about a month ago. Henry, there's something I don't quite understand. With all the digging Mr. May was doing, where's the spade he was digging with? Well, last week I showed him a brand new spade. He burned his initials in the handle, and I... I think I see what you mean, Mr. Jackson. Yeah. I see no spade, Henry. No whereabouts, no trace of a spade. And no trace of Mr. May. But I do see this. Pages from the St. Louis newspaper. Yeah, look at the date. It's last week's paper. With blood on it. Yeah. <clears throat> well, it's getting dark. If you don't mind, Henry, uh, walk Mrs. May back to the cabin. I got a good deal of work to do. I'm glad to. In the morning, Mrs. May, I'd like to pay you a little visit. 
Have a talk with your son. mustn't get out of bed, John. Uh-huh. Now, the doctor said you were to stay in bed. Uh-huh. And you mustn't worry about uh-huh. nothing. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Don't go away. Don't you touch me. Don't you dare. Oh, yeah. Easy, John. Uh-huh. Easy. No, it's just your ma. Uh-huh. Oh, I must have been dreaming, huh? Real bad dream. Yes. Well, you, you got to stop worrying, John. Uh-huh. I ain't worried. Pa will turn up. I know it. Our face. I just can't figure where he would have gone. He'll never turn up. And they'll never find him. How do you know? How can you be sure? I have a feeling. John, is there something you ain't telling me? Nothing happened. Nothing. This is me. (laughs) Calvin Jackson. It's Sheriff Jackson, John. What's he want? He wants to talk to you. Come right on in, Sheriff. I've... I don't want to talk to nobody. Good morning, Mrs. May. Good morning, John. I got nothing to talk to you about. I, I I didn't do nothing. Well, no one said you did, John. Well, then, well, what are you doing here? Your father's missing. No one's seen him. No one knows where he is. You were the last person with him, I believe. Well? Did you, uh, did you have any kind of a fight with your father in the woods? That's none of your business, Sheriff. Answer, Mr. Jackson, John. Please. Well, we did have a little bit of a fight. No, nothing much. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. And, and this newspaper, St. Louis newspaper, I found it back there. Did you, uh... Did you take a shovel, a spade of some kind with you? No, I, I didn't. My father had his. I figured we could take turns digging while the other rested. Have you any idea where the spade might be? We couldn't find any more trace of it than we can of your father. No idea. Well, that's a nice-looking pair of boots you got here, John. Hey, now, you put those boots down. Oh, they are yours. Don't you touch them. Well, now, that's most interesting. Well, what's that, Mr. Jackson? On the soles and heels. Could that be blood? Huh. Are you accusing me of murdering my father? Murder? I never said a word about murder. I didn't murder anyone, Sheriff. No one. John, did you ever threaten to kill your father? Of course not. He never gave you cause to say to him, you die for that or you pay for that? Yes, he did, but but that don't mean that I... Well, what does it mean? That there's a power that would punish him one day for what he was doing. But that power was was not you. If you're thinking of accusing me of murder, you'll have to find my father's body first. Oh, I know the law, John. That's my job. But I can tell you this. Word's already gone around the whole town of Nolan that your father's missing. And whatever evidence there is about his disappearance points to only one person. Meaning me? For your own good, John. For your own protection. I'm sending one of my deputies out here. What for? Until we find your father's body, I'm putting you under arrest. House arrest. On suspicion of murder. The relatives of a murdered man in Ozark country will sometimes throw pawpaw seeds or a tiny pinch of cornmeal over the corpse, on top of the coffin, or into the grave. Or they will pull down the top of a small cedar tree and fasten it with a big stone, which is supposed to help in some way catch the murderer. But when there is no grave, when there is no corpse to be buried, join me shortly for Act Three. like the May family, who lived in the isolated parts of Missouri's Ozark Mountains a hundred years ago, were once called the most deliberately unprogressive people in the entire United States. From the early 1800s on, they seemed like foreigners to the average American, secretive, sensitive, but never simple. 
Their loves, their hates were deep and not easily understood by the outsider. And their minds moved in an involved system of signs, of omens, and curious beliefs. Their laws reflected their minds. No, John, there's nothing you can do about it. The trial will be held tomorrow. The people have demanded it, and uh, the sheriff has, too. Well, I just don't understand it, Henry. How can they try me for a I crime? I know, I know. On suspicion of murder when they haven't found the shadow of the man you're supposed to have killed. Exactly. Hasn't the whole male population searched the wood bottomlands with a fine tooth comb? Haven't they beaten every bush in the neighborhood and come up with nothing? Then for all anyone knows, there is nobody, no corpse. Is that what you want us to believe? That your father's alive and well somewhere? But where? Nobody knows. And nobody knows why he disappeared. How he disappeared into nowhere. Gentlemen... I think we all must agree with the defense that a man cannot be tried for the murder of a man whose body no human being is professed to have seen. One not actually known to be dead. This case has been tried on its merits until and unless we can prove that the man who is supposed to have been killed is in fact dead, we have no case. <clears throat> On that basis, gentlemen, I, I'm asking along with the defense that this case be dismissed and that we permit young John May to walk out of this courtroom a completely free man. Uh, that the old sheriff? Well, a handful of tobacco plugs, Henry. My supply's getting a little low. Uh, here we are, sheriff. Well, now, if this heat would only let up a little. Yeah, I see you're keeping both your front and back doors open, eh? <laughs> if there's any kind of a breeze lurking around the lake outside the back door, uh, I figure maybe I can catch a bit of it here in the store. <laughs> yeah, of course. You know, Henry, I'd give just about anything I own to find out what happened to that boy's father. I can't see how a man could just disappear off the face of the earth overnight. At any rate, not in this part of the world. Not without foul play of some kind. Yeah, I know what you're saying, Sheriff. The men in town are still grumbling that the trial was what they're calling a miscarriage of justice. Yes, but suppose they had taken the law into their own hands and one of these days Charles would suddenly turn up. <laughs> They'd never forgive himself. Henry O'Dell, I'm about to tell you something I wouldn't tell another soul. In spite of everything I said at the trial and the things I knew I, I had to say, I'm sure that none of us will ever see Charles May again. Unless he were to come back from the grave. Uh, strictly between the two of us, I couldn't agree with you more. But how can I prove it? Uh, Excuse me, Sheriff. There's a customer coming in. Well, I'll be running along. No, wait, wait. Wait just a minute, Sheriff. Turn around. Take a look at who's coming in the front door. Who is it? It's him. It's him, all right. Cousin Charles. Charles me. He's putting one heavy foot ahead of the other. Mechanically, is it? As if his feet were made of lead. Walking straight toward the back door. Staring into space. Eyes wide open. Another a milky white. There's no pupils in him. His hair is all wet and matted with blood. Over his eyebrow. The left eyebrow, deep gash. Blood flowing over the whole left side of his face and neck. Onto his shirt and vest. Onto the floor. How he holds his hands over his head as, as though defending himself from some kind of a blow. The fingers spread crooked like claws. His mouth all twisted open as if he was trying to say something. 
Mr. May. It's Charles May. Cousin Charles. Keeps on moving toward the back door. Charles! He's going out the door, toward the lake. Well, shouldn't we follow him? Let's watch him, see what he does. He's going to the edge of the lake to try to wash away some of the blood. Shouldn't we be doing something to help? Oh, we, we might do more harm than good. It's like waking up a sleepwalker. Let's go out and see what he's up to. Where's he going to? I can't understand it. He was out here just a minute ago. Not a whisper of him anywhere. But if he'd have gone into the lake... Well, there's not a chance. The water's as unruffled and smooth as glass. What do you suppose was wrong with him? He must have been in a fight of some kind and wandering about the days ever since. Oh, but how do you explain? Probably suffering from some kind of loss of memory. Oh, it's enough to scare the life out of a man. Well, we've got to find him. Let's get back into the store, Henry. I have an idea. What's that broken step? Yeah. We follow the trail of blood he left. Wouldn't it lead us back to wherever he come from? It might. And that could lead us to... To... Oh, just a minute, Mr. Jackson. Cousin Charles stopped right about here. The blood dripping right onto the floor. Now you just take a good look. With a hive bee. The floor is as clean as a whistle. Not a drop of blood here, or for that matter, any place else. Henry, Mr. Jackson, they found him. They found him. They found no, Charles. No, 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 easy, easy, Mrs. May. You've got to take it easy. No. Sit yourself down over here, Elvira. <laughs> Try to calm down. Now, what are you talking about? They found him. They found his body. The two little boys. What, 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 what two little boys? Oh, I'm sure it was boys. They was playing in the woods up near May Creek. Near where it makes that sharp turn. I tell you, it was awful. Uh, it was how, awful. how was the body hidden? Uh, under two, three feet of soil, covered over with layer after layer of dead leaves and twigs. And some wild hogs must have been rooting through the leaves and uncovered the handle. It looked terrible, just terrible. What handle, Elvira? The handle of Charles' new spade. Here, I brought it to show you. Broke off from the spade itself right in the middle. Let me see that. The, the, the Sherwood boys. They found him. They found Charles and come rushing up to the cabin to get me. I, I could hardly bear to look at him. His eyes, his mouth, that big hole in his head. No, 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 no. Try to take it easy, Mrs. May. We'll, we'll go back with you to make a positive identification. I, I don't know if, if I have the strength to look again. Uh... Are you sure this was your husband's spade, Mrs. May? Oh, that was his spade, all right. Sold it to him myself, and there's his initials, the initials that John burned into the handle for him. C.M. Hmm. Strange. What strange, Mr. Jackson? Well, that's not a C at all. Those initials are J.M. Those are John May's initials, not his father's. Coroner has taken care of the body. Almost no decomposition. Some preservative property in the soil, I expect. Yeah, that soil is rich in minerals. There's one thing I can't understand. Hello, oh, Mr. Jackson. How are you? Oh, Henry. John. Well, where on earth have you been? We just come from your place, and we've been looking all over for you. I've been very busy. Your father's body's been discovered. Yeah, I know. Whoever killed him did a mighty fine job hiding it. So I was told. Gentlemen, I uh, come here to say goodbye. Well, where are you going? Party's leaving tomorrow morning for Oregon. I'm joining them to seek my fame and fortune in the Golden West. Ain't you going to have the common decency to wait until your father's body is put in the ground? No, no time. No time for that. John. Yes, Mr. Jackson? 
You killed your father, didn't you? You ain't got the right to ask me that, Mr. Jackson. Not anymore. I was arrested by you on suspicion of murder. I was tried. I was found innocent. Now, I may not know too much about these legal things, but I do read. And? And you can't try a man for the same crime twice, even here in the mountains. Double jeopardy, I think they call it. Where'd that wind come from? Blew the front door clear shut. Who's that? Oh, no. It's my father. But that can't be. Can't. Where'd you come from, Paul? You're dead. Dead. just like he did the last time toward the open back door. What, what are you doing to me, Pa? Stop it. John, John's following him. <laughs> he can't take his eyes off his father. <laughs> he can't help following him. No, no, I won't go with you. I won't. The old man's <laughs> moving right toward the edge of the lake. Don't, don't make me, Pa. You know I can't swim. Well, it's true, John can't swim. When I look now, we just can't stand here. What do we do? I don't think there's anything we can do, Henry. They're both vanished under the waters of the lake. No, Henry, there's not a doubt in my mind. John May murdered his father by splitting his skull open with a Knife sharp edge of this spade. Yeah, I know you're right, sir. One thing I can't figure out. The wound over cousin Charles's left eyebrow, the gash on the left side of his face. Yeah. And the half open mouth, the hands like claws. Exactly the same as they was on that thing that come from nowhere, passed through my store and pulled on after him to, well, to who knows where. Puzzles me. What's the answer? Charles once said to me that if the boy ever took it into his head to do his father any real harm, that he'd come back and haunt him from wherever he might be. We folks up here in the mountains don't like to admit it to strangers, but in these lonesome places, yes. Well, you think that thing could have been... I have no idea what it was, Mr. O'Dell. Not the slightest. There are those who believe that we, all of us, are walking spirits of some kind. Spirits that are shaped into a body squeezed into a recognizable appearance of reality, and that sooner or later, we fade away into air and invisibility. That we not only carry a future ghost with us from the moment we are born, but that we are, in very fact, ghosts. All of us. Everywhere. I'll be back shortly. evaluating the story you've just heard. We can go along very dramatically with Shakespeare and say, for murder, though it hath no tongue, will speak out in the most miraculous organ. That's from Hamlet. Or, in a slightly different vein, we might be reminded of the parallel of Lizzie Borden. Lizzie, you'll recall, took an axe, gave her mother forty whacks, when she saw what she had done, 
which she gave her father, 41. Our cast included Court Benson, Russell Horton, Bryna Rayburn, and Arnold Moss. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown, 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 of Hyman News. American forces are preparing the bodies of more than 400 Jonestown, Guyana cult members for return to the United States. This is Doug Poling reporting on the CBS radio network. The Americans are doing their grim work wearing gas masks because of the growing danger of cholera at the jungle commune. From Georgetown, Guyana, CBS News correspondent Steve Young has a report. Since their death by poison Saturday, the victims of the Jonestown Suicide Pact have been lying in the steamy jungle where they fell. A joint U.S.-Guyanese news conference announced tonight that the first 40 bodies finally have been processed and helicoptered to the airport outside the Guyanese capital. It's expected that they'll be flown out of the country in the next few hours. Officials were unwilling to be pinned down to how long it will take to evacuate all of the bodies of the remaining victims. Repeatedly, officials came under fire from dozens of reporters convinced that stumbling blocks to on-scene coverage have been established in order to cover something up. U.S. officials denied that and also denied that less than friendly political relations between the U.S. and Guyanese government have led to less than full Guyanese cooperation with the operation. Many of the questions were openly scornful of what many reporters from around the world judged to be a higher priority given to evacuating the dead and to searching for possible living survivors. Steve Young, CBS News, Georgetown, Guyana. Authorities there have arrested Larry Layton, a 32-year-old cult member, and charged him with the murder of Congressman Leo Ryan and four other Americans in the Ryan party. The San Francisco Examiner says an eyewitness has named seven cult members as being in the ambush team that killed Ryan and the others. More news in a moment. I know what you're going to say. Here's Tony Randall again with still another commercial for Matus Rosé. Well, yes and no. I discovered something, friends, rather disturbing, and I must share it with you. I found out that many people don't even know there is a white Matus wine. Well, you could have knocked me over with a feather. Being something of a wine aficionado myself, I assumed everyone knew about White Matus, the bright imported wine with a captivating charm all its own. But it seems that the rosé is so popular, whenever people hear the name Matus, they automatically think rosé. Imagine all the white wine lovers who thought there was no Matus for them. Oh, the rejection they must have felt. Now, I know you've already stocked up on Matus Rosé for the holidays, but you're going to have to go out and get a bottle or two of white Matus for your white wine lovers. For heaven's sake, haven't they suffered enough? Well, that's all I have to say on the subject. White Matus, imported by Dreyfus Ashby and Company, New York, New York. President Carter today placed a telephone call to President Sadat of Egypt to urge Sadat to accept a compromise American proposal for an Egyptian-Israeli peace treaty. One report on the call says Mr. Carter urged Sadat to agree to elections in the Palestinian West Bank and the Gaza Strip within a year and drop the short-range election timetable the Israelis have rejected. Officially, the State Department is saying the United States expects negotiations between Israel and Egypt to continue. White House inflation fighter Alfred Kahn appeared today before a House banking subcommittee to say that the effort is going to be a long one. Kahn said the entire country will have to cooperate as inflation is hurting everyone. There's nothing in this country today that is doing more to rend the fabric of our society than inflation itself. And there's no use of our resources, no protection of special interests, however meritorious, that can be exempt from the closest possible examination in our struggle to combat it. Khan, incidentally, appears to have been engaging in an involuntary act of reducing government spending. For about three weeks in his new job, he was not being paid. Somebody forgot to put him on the payroll, Khan said. I discovered yesterday my bank account is overdrawn. Senator Edward Kennedy and members of his family went to Arlington National Cemetery today and placed yellow roses on the graves of Kennedy's two slain brothers, John and Robert. It was 15 years ago today in Dallas that President John Kennedy was assassinated. Now this. 
Our guest today, Mr. Selwyn Searle, yes. is an advertising agency radio expert. Yes, I still have my original floor model. Mm -hmm. Is it true the average household has almost six radios? True, the average... That many? Uh, yes. What do you like on radio, Mr. Searle? Goldfish bowl looks nice. Uh, Unless, of course, the fish is dead, then I recommend a bowling yeah, trophy. I mean, what yeah, advertising right. campaigns do you like on radio? Uh, like Oxy-5 became the number one skin treatment item in America with a big assist from radio. Is that a fact? Or Take Mailgram. Yes, Take Mailgram. Radio was the dominant medium in establishing Mailgram as the forerunner of electronic mail. Electronic mail. Mm -hmm. Or Time Magazine. Time, yes. Mm -hmm. Since they began their current radio campaign, Time Magazine's advertising and circulation revenue have never been higher. I've heard times. Yes, um, uh, they were created by Dick and Jane. Uh, love their books. Yeah, Bert. Jane and Bert love their books too. Yeah, Mr. Searle, either A, you're an imposter, or B, you know nothing about radio. Ah, uh, I choose A. What? I'm sorry. What is B again? Oh. To learn how radio can sell for you, ask this station for the Radio Fact Book, furnished by the Radio Advertising Bureau. A Baptist minister from Marshall, Texas today ended an unusual feat that lasted for two and a half years. Hans Mulliken crawled on his knees for 1,600 miles to the gates of the White House, where he was turned away in his quest to see President Carter. Mulliken said he just wanted to shake the president's hand and tell him he's praying for him. Asked why he made the long journey by crawling, Mulliken said, I just wanted to show America that we need to get on our knees and repent. He added with a smile, a lot of people think I'm crazy. Doug Poling, CBS News. KQV News Time, 1006. The weather forecast for the Pittsburgh area. Cloudy tonight right through Friday with occasional rain on Thursday and Thursday night. It's possible the rain may begin late tonight. We'll have an overnight low tonight in the upper 30s in the Pittsburgh area. High tomorrow near 50 Thanksgiving Day. Low tomorrow night in the low 40s. There's a chance of more showers again on Friday. Friday's high in the upper 40s. Chance of precipitation 30% tonight, up to 80% tomorrow and tomorrow night. The extended outlook calls for partly cloudy skies on Saturday. Chance of more showers back again on Sunday. Highs in the 40s with lows from the upper 20s to mid 30s each day. Right now in Pittsburgh, the barometer is steady at 30.26 inches of mercury. Winds are from the northeast at 7 miles per hour. Relative humidity, 82%. At the airport, cloudy skies, 39 degrees. In downtown Pittsburgh, cloudy as well. And we have a temperature of 40. Now, CBS Mystery Theater. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Has God forgotten all I have done for him? exclaimed an exasperated King Louis XIV on an unhappy day when his army was defeated in battle. We may smile at such a remark, but we might do better to learn from it, because it teaches us that there are people in this world who expect to be paid in full for every kindness they extend, and that there comes a day when they will present the bill to everyone and anyone, whether here below or up above. Now, Miss uh, uh, Morrison, what can I do for you? Nothing. I've come here to save your life. I had no idea it was in danger. A man intends to kill you. His name is Anthony Pringle. What did you say his name was? Anthony Pringle. But I'm Anthony Pringle. I know. But that doesn't change anything. <laughs> Our mystery drama, The Gray Slapper, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Carol Titel and Gordon Heath. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. I want that sinus medicine. Headache tablet? No, it relieves headache and congestion, internal sinus pressure, and post-nasal drip. And it has added strength. You mean added strength sign-off. Exactly. Added strength sign-off tablets give you pure aspirin plus 50% more sinus drainer. To help sinus pain while you drain. Right. And more sinus drier for post-nasal drip. Added strength sign-off. The sinus medicine in the bright red box. Take when needed, only as directed. S-I-N-E-O-F-F. -F. Sign-off. 
can't beat the clock, and right now the clock is running against us. Every 60 seconds, another American is diagnosed diabetic. Today, 10 million Americans have diabetes. A newborn child runs a 20% chance of developing diabetes during its lifetime. It's time to cure diabetes, and it's time we all help. Take a minute. Call your local American Diabetes Association. I'm Jesse Owen, and I thank you. Hi, I'm KC of the Sunshine Band for the American Heart Association. You know, when you're young, we learn a lot of things. A lot of good things and some things that aren't so good. What's important is to be able to tell the difference. I'll give you an example. Some kids, when they're still pretty young, learn how to smoke cigarettes. They see their folks doing it or their friends tell them it's cool. But the fact is, it's not cool at all. It's dumb. Cigarette smoking is dumb. It cuts down on your wind. It spoils the taste of your food. Worst of all, the American Heart Association says it's bad for your heart so if somebody offers you a cigarette remember there's nothing cool about putting a hot stick of tobacco in your mouth if you want to find out more about cigarette smoking and what's wrong with it ask your american heart association they're fighting for your life remember a song that went H-A-R-R-I-G-A-N spells Harrigan, you're not as young as you used to be. There was also a saloon called Harrigan's, and there still is, except old John Joseph Harrigan has gone to his reward, but there is a grandson named John Joseph still among us. And this watering place, as he likes to call it, was the home away from home for all the leading politicians in this beautiful town. Indeed, there were cynical people who insisted that every night the city was for sale in Harrigan's. At any rate, not too long ago, on a particular balmy evening, a slim, well-dressed lady, neither young nor old, approached the bar. Of course, ladies have never been exactly encouraged in Harrigan's, even in these days. They do play the devil with a man's privacy. Good evening, ma'am. Yes, good evening. Permit me to state, ma'am, that while you are as welcome as the very air we breathe, I must ask you to sit down at a table. Why? As to the why of it, we have a house rule. Unescorted female ladies are not permitted at the bar. Well, I'm only looking for someone. Yes. Yes. That, uh, that rather distinguished-looking gentleman at the end of the bar with the white hair and the trim, neat moustache. Oh, Mr. Pringle. Ah, oh, yes. Anthony Edmund Pringle. And do you know Mr. Pringle? I know him very well indeed. Excuse me, Mr. Harrigan. Uh, Mr. Pringle? Yes? I'm Dolly Morrison. Oh. Do I know you, Mrs. Morrison? Miss Morrison. Oh. You assumed quite naturally that a woman of advanced age must be married. I would hardly say you're of advanced age. Thank you, but I am closer to winter than to spring. Shall we say Indian summer? Thank you again. And now what may I do for you, Miss Morrison? Do for me? Yes, of course. Oh, you think I've approached you for a favor? Well, yes. A political favor. All favors are political. Yes, that's the moralist in you speaking. Oh, it's been a long time since anyone called me a moralist. Didn't you say once that politics is a matter of morality? Did I ever say that? I remember it so well. You said those who would separate politics from morality could never hope to truly understand or practice either. I think I remember. Do you also remember, without morality... The people perish. Yes. But how do you remember? I never forgot. It's been so many years. And you don't remember Dolly Morrison? Dolly Morrison. The rather pale, dark-haired girl who sat in the front row? When I was teaching? Yes. When you were teaching political science at the City University. Of course. At night? Yes. At night. I remember... You were all such good students. We had to be. We worked during the day. And college wasn't much fun for you, was it? Well, at least it was college. 
and we were ahead of our parents, most of us. They had to go to night school. We were going to night college. Miss Morrison. Dolly Morrison. We didn't have time to learn leisurely to savor knowledge. What we needed so desperately were those pieces of paper, those documents which said we could go to law school or become teachers or accountants. Yes, I knew that. It was cut and dried and very intense. And now and then, some of us were lucky enough to encounter a teacher with the, the gift to inspire and... Oh, Miss Morrison, you must let me buy you a drink. No, no, thank you. Then, Miss Morrison, ask me. Ask. Say it, whatever it is. Day and night I am beset by those who seek my favors. Mr. Pringle, I don't think you understand. I understand perfectly. You are a proud woman, and asking a favor does not come without effort. But ask. And if it is within my power, I shall joyfully... What is it you want? An introduction? A job? Perhaps a smoothing of a purse? An easing of a pressure. Is that what you think I want? I am completely at your service. You're not listening to me. Of course I am. I did not come here to ask for a favor. You didn't. Is that what you thought? <laughs> of course. What else could I think? What else could you want? What else? Yes, Miss Morrison. What do you want? Right now, I want to do just this. Say, what's the idea? Goodbye, Mr. Pringle. Hey, hey, Mom, you, you can't... Tony, you want me to call a cop? Dugan's just outside. No. No, John. Never mind. Let her go. What sort can she be? She come in here and it appeared butter wouldn't melt in her mouth. What'd she slap you for? Uh, was it uh, the usual reason? John... She didn't slap me for any reason that I know of. And now for some jottings from here and there and everywhere. He Who Gets Slapped. Yes, that's the title of a famous Russian play. And it's also descriptive of a little by-play that took place last evening at Harrigan's, where you find the movers and shakers of our great city. The receiver of the slap, or the slappy was perhaps the fastest mover and the hardest shaker in town, Tony Pringle. The slapper was an attractive lady, dressed in gray, who disappeared immediately. When pressed for details, Tony Pringle maintained what can be described as either a gallant or a discreet silence. Oh, turn him off, And John. now for the... Have you seen the papers, Tony? I've seen the papers. The fourth estate is having itself a veritable jubilee. Here's Mullins in the Tribune. Who is the great slapper? A catchy phrase. The great slapper. Mm -hmm. It'd be the making of Mullins, too. Therefore, he'll be grateful to me. Uh, no. He'll be out to put you in prison. Mullins. After all I've done for him. Oh, I'm surprised to hear you say that, Tony. You should know better. Friend Mullins will become all puffed up with his own self-importance. And so he'll no longer be satisfied with being just a reporter, heaven help us. He'll want to become a journalist and win the Pulitzer Prize. He'll start muckraking and whistleblowing and making a general nuisance out of himself. Mullins? It's the first noteworthy thing he's ever reported. I cannot imagine why that woman would want to slap my face. Are you still telling me you do not know who she is? It goes back many years. I was teaching school. She was one of my students. Ah, oh, and did you give her a failing mark? <laughs> As a matter of fact, I gave her the highest mark in the class. Yeah, you know women. I tell you what I'll do, Tony. I say she just wandered in here, drunk. And before I could ask her to leave, she made a spectacle of herself. I... I don't know. You don't need this kind of embarrassing situation. Besides, she had to be drunk. How else can you explain it? Yes? Oh. Oh. It's you. Yes. 
A gray slapper. I'm not dressed in gray. Oh? Have you decided to become the red slapper? May I come in? If you promise not to slap me again. No. I didn't come here for that purpose. For what purpose have you come? I've come here to save your life. Oh? I can see you don't believe me. I have an idea I'm going to hate myself, but... All right. Come in. Hmm. Very nice little place you have here. Far from the madding crowd's ignoble strife. (laughs) How did you know where to find me? Very few people know about this place. You told me about it. I told you. An important man like you, constantly surrounded? You need this little hideaway. Miss Morrison... You insist on talking in riddles and creating mystery. First, you say you've come here to save my life. Second, you say I told you about this little retreat of mine. Now, I insist that you illuminate both of these points for me. I shall. But first, why did you tell the media I was drunk? I didn't tell them. You permitted a lie to be told. There had to be some explanation for your gratuitous action. But it wasn't true. I was not drunk. What's the difference? The difference is, you slandered me. You told a lie. Miss Morrison, what do you want of me? You were willing to sell my reputation down the river for your own convenience. Can we come to the point? We've never left it. I am here to discuss what you have become. And what you did to me is very much in character. I would have done nothing to you had you not slapped me. Now, why did you do it? Because I... I had to come there to try to save you. And you were so blind, so deaf. Blind and deaf to what? What happened to you, Mr. Pringle? Stay on the point. How are you going to save me? It will be very difficult. And from what shall you save me? From whom? From yourself. All right. What is it that I intend to do? Kill yourself. I see. That would be suicide. Technically, I suppose. Miss Morrison, I have absolutely no desire, no thought of doing away with myself. That isn't true. Now I remember you. You were very intense and very attractive. You haven't changed a bit. I had never met a man like you. That is, in real life. Well, I I did meet men like you in books. Brilliant men. Men who could capture the soul and release the spirit. Are you saying that you fell in love with me? Yes. A schoolgirl crush? I was hardly a schoolgirl. I was out in the world and supporting myself... I'm without false modesty, Miss Morrison. I knew I was good-looking, smart, I had style. I knew most of the girls in my classes would fall in love with me, and most of them would get over it. I never did. I'm sorry, but I couldn't help it. I, I never flirted with any of you. I never tried to lead any of you on. That's true, isn't it? Yes, but you, you awaken me to the world... I'm still Miss Morrison. You ruined all other men for me. I'm sorry. I believed in you. And then you made the inevitable discovery. Your idol has feet of clay. Yes. If you examine them closely, all of them do. I believe you stated the case. Idol. I never saw you as a lover. I always thought of you as an idol. A god. And so perhaps it wasn't love, but worship. Women, as a rule, are (laughs) very susceptible to this kind of thing. (laughs) You must let me offer you some refreshment. (laughs) I'm so happy you came. Are you? You realize what's happening to me? I am actually having a discussion with a civilized, literate human being. Quite a change. From what? We haven't said one word about who's going to get the contract or the nomination or the judgeship. It's quite a change for you, isn't it? We are in the midst of a philosophical conversation which began with theology and shall range through morality and ethics. 
Since we've already discussed poetry, I'm sure we shall treat with literature, art, and music. Yes. You still have the old sparkle. Perhaps the basic instincts can somehow be revived. I said there was hope for you. He, of course, wouldn't hear of it. He? Yes. He claimed the change was irreversible. You say he. But who is he? The man who intends to kill you. But didn't you say, just before, that I'm going to kill myself? Exactly. That's why I'm here. To see if you can help me talk him out of it. At first blush, assuming, of course, that these days there are still people who actually blush, what she is saying doesn't seem to make any sense at all. However, if you think about it, you may divine a certain meaning. Like all mysteries, all you need is a key. The key here is a number, and the number is two. And that's all the hints you get until I return with the second act. I know what you're going to say. Here's Tony Randall again with still another commercial for Matus Rosé. Well, yes and no. I discovered something, friends, rather disturbing, and I must share it with you. I found out that many people don't even know there is a white Matus wine. Well, you could have knocked me over with a feather. Being something of a wine aficionado myself, I assumed everyone knew about White Matus, the bright imported wine with a captivating charm all its own. But it seems that the rosé is so popular, whenever people hear the name Matus, they automatically think rosé. Imagine all the white wine lovers who thought there was no Matus for them. Oh, the rejection they must have felt. Now, I know you've already stocked up on Matus Rosé for the holidays, but you're going to have to go out and get a bottle or two of white Matus for your white wine lovers. For heaven's sake, haven't they suffered enough? Well, that's all I have to say on the subject. White Matus, imported by Dreyfus Ashby and Company, New York, New York. This is Irma Bombeck. What if I told you Ernest Hemingway, William Faulkner, and John Steinbeck lived in your neighborhood? What if I told you you could get a handyman who made house calls, free entertainment for your children, or check out Paul Newman for seven days? Trust me, all these things are possible at your public library. It houses one of the most complete lines of interest you'll find anywhere. Check out a how-to book for your husband on making minor repairs around the house. Or if he doesn't like fiction, select one of his favorite sports. For the children, there are story hours and bike repair lessons and concerts. And if you're one of those women who is still trying to plow our way through Guadalcanal Diary, maybe you could use a master speed reading course. Your library could be the most important card in your billfold. I love it. My husband was at the library just last night. And when he came home, he said, Hey, Irma, I was at the library, and all your books are in. But that was so cruel. A public service message from the American Library Association. at some people and we say they never change. But that isn't true. Everybody changes, even if it doesn't seem that way. After all, the scientists say that every six months, 90% of all the atoms in our body are completely replaced. Or is it after 90 months, 6% of us is brand new? What's the difference? The fact is that inside, things are happening. There's action, conflict, Nobody, nothing, is ever really standing still. Let me see if I can sort this out, Miss Morrison. What you're saying is that you've been having conversations with me. Yes. I, of course, am unaware of these conversations. The you that is in this room is unaware of the conversations. I shall try to follow this. There are times when I am not in this room and I am talking to you. Yes. However, I don't know that this is happening. Therefore, there can only be one explanation. Yes. I am a somnambulist. Hmm. I walk in my sleep. I seek you out and we talk. That is not the explanation. You mean there's another? Yes. 
I said the you that is in this room is unaware. The you that frequents Harrigan's saloon. The you that stalks the city hall, the state house, the national councils of the party. The you that is the mover, the shaker, the kingmaker. You flatter me. I merely describe you. I describe the you that is unaware. But there's another you. Is there? A 30-year-old you who is eager... Idealistic, honest, decent, hopeful. You are now describing the symptoms of a disease called youth. That's the you I speak with constantly. Oh. I caught that inflection. You think I'm crazy. Well... Admit it. Crazy, normal. These are political definitions. I speak to him quite often. Him? Anthony Edmund Pringle. You probably do. You intend to sound sympathetic, but there is just the tiniest patronizing edge to your voice. Miss Morrison, I sympathize with you. And let me be truthful. This may seem like arrogant boasting. However, when I was young, attractive, I had almost unlimited idealism. I believed in justice, brotherhood, fairness... And you no longer do. I realize that these are not simple, cut-and-dried affairs. I know now that men must give to get. That accommodation is the basic rule of life. That we only pass this way once. But uh, we digress. You fell in love with me. And with what you stood for. What you thought I stood for. And then I went into politics. I was so happy. I thought you would be the first of a new breed. And I disappointed you. Yes. I made excuses for you. I I tried to justify some of the things you did. And after a while, you could do that no longer. After a long while. You had a considerable investment in me, didn't you, Miss Morrison? An investment of hope and emotion. Yes. And now it was lost. All of it. Yes. And so, since you could no longer tolerate what I had become, a cheap, cynical politician, you conjured up what I had been, the young idealist. This is what you believe? The 30-year-old Anthony Edmund Pringle, lecturer in the humanities at the City University, actually exists for you. You believe you'll see him and speak to him. How glibly you can spout the mail order, do-it-yourself, instant psychology, so popular and so meaningless. If the young Tony still exists, if it's true that you see him and talk with him, tell him he cannot complain. If he doesn't like what he has become today, he himself chose the path. Only because you fooled him? You lied to him? Miss Morrison... Yes. I don't wish to be rude, but I must ask you to leave. Of course. I realize this has been difficult for you, but Tony is desperate. Please, Miss Morrison. Listen to me. Tony intends to kill you unless... Unless what? Unless I can convince him not to. I'm powerless without your help. You must make him believe that you can actually change. Tony despises what he has become in you. Let me tell him things will be different. All right. Do that. Don't. Don't make the mistake of humoring me, of patronizing me. Tony is serious. And the latest piece of, uh, of sheer, uh, what, what can I say? Deviltry, you propose? Deviltry? Yes, deviltry. This monstrous betrayal of the public trust... What else can be can it be called if not deviltry? There are any number of words you might have used. Why deviltry? And what are you talking about? Please consider what I said. It's not too late. Welcome, stranger. Nice quiet evening, John. I must say, you're not looking well, Tony. What have you been doing? Thinking. Oh, dangerous pastime. When you were young, John, what did you want to become? When I was young, no one ever asked me. What did you want for yourself? As soon as I could walk, 
I had to assist my old gentleman in the running of this here oasis. Is that what the young John Joseph Harrigan wanted? To tend bar and saloon? Yes, that's what the young John Joseph wanted. Then, today, if he confronted you, he would have no quarrel with what you are. None. Is this leading to where I may safely assume it is? Yes. I see. Well, uh, is the young Anthony Edmund Pringle disturbing the peace of mind of the older one who stands here before me? In the confidentiality of this bar, I confess that the young Tony and I are not at peace with each other. Mm. What's the trouble, Tony? Who said there was any trouble? You're a thinking man. And thinking has been the ruination of many a politician. I remember you and you coming to this place for the first time 30 years ago. You had the common touch. He'll go far, I said. And you did. Mm, did I? You know you did. What were you, a teacher? You've been just fine for the party, Tony. And unlike a lot of them, you haven't been too bad for the people. You haven't done any real harm to the country, as far as I can see. But what have I been for me? Each man answers that question for himself. If he dares. Tony, what's wrong? Why do you ask? It has something to do with that woman, doesn't it? What woman? Uh, now you're pretending not to know. The grey slapper. Oh, what would she have to do with anything? You tell me. Well, of course you don't have to. But uh, ever since that incident, something seems different about you. Different? In what way? Well, you're kind of moody. And sometimes you seem to be in another world. Some of the boys was remarking about it. Why did she slap you? Why? Because she was disappointed in me. Does she have a right to be? She thinks she does. Have you read Mullen in today's Tribune? Mullen's been bitten by the bug. Pay no heed. Promise betrayed the story of Anthony Edmund Pringle. Tony, when you can quote these things by heart, it's a bad sign. What has become of the eager, dewy-eyed Anthony Edmund Pringle, who 30 years ago entered the lists? A St. George to slay the dragon of corruption that strangles the life from the city. Has he become the dragon? And by the same token, we might inquire, what has become of young Jimmy Mullins, who is going to write the great American novel? Why is he only a reporter on a second-rate newspaper? That's unfair. Fairness is a matter of post positions at the racetrack. Tony, you're a successful man. You've worked very hard. That's true. You haven't done everything you wanted, but who has? And there's an empty place in your heart. Yes. You played the game. You were interested in nothing else. And now you're 60, and all you have is the game. No wife, no kids. You're lonely. Yes. But that's the normal way to feel. Don't make more of it. I suppose you're right. It's easy for a man to feel down, to question. But then the thing to do is just go straight ahead. Straight ahead. That's been you all your life, Tony. You can't change your style now. No. Millions of people know about Tony Pringle. Millions of people will give anything to be where Tony Pringle is. Ah, this is an invention of the devil. Hello. Is Mr. Pringle there? Who is this that wishes to speak with him? Tell him it's Miss Morrison. Uh, please, hold the telephone. You want to speak with a Miss Morrison? No. I'm very sorry, ma'am, but he's not here. This is very important. Tell him, please, that under no conditions is he to be part of the deal with Mr. Dahlgren. What? What is that you said? Uh, ma ma what did you say? Uh, hello, hello. John, what's wrong? I, uh... 
I don't know. This Miss Morrison, what did she want? Tony, who is she? Who is Miss Morrison? She's just some lady. Tony, do you know whose name she just spoke? No. The name, Tony, the name. What do you mean, the name? She said it. How could she? How would she know about it? Tell me exactly what she said. She said, and these are her exact words, tell him that under no conditions is he to be part of a deal with... And then she spoke the name. Hey, Tony, where are you going? It seems there's a name, and it seems there's a deal. And it also seems that there is great concern about various people finding out about it. And since this seems to be a story about politicians, it would appear that this is only more politics as usual. Or is it? Well, that's why we have third acts. Take your contact. Take it now. Take your cold to contact. I'm going to change your mind about nighttime cold medicine. You see, of all major medicines, only one works up to 12 hours against the cloggy virus symptoms that keep you awake. Only contact. One capsule's relief stays with you all through a long night's sleep, no matter what cold virus attacks. Only contact. If you're cold, to contact. Take off me as directed. When you carry Master Charge, you carry Pops. Love to go Christmas shopping, even after a full day at the office. Thing is, I hate carrying all that cash. Sometimes I think I need an armored car. Not this Christmas. I'm shopping differently. Thanks, Master Charge. It's so easy when all you have to carry is your clout. When you carry Master Charge, you carry clout. If you are blind or know someone who is, listen to this message. There is a unique, specially prepared monthly sports magazine for the visually impaired. Feeling Sports, a service of the Braille Sports Foundation. It is written and produced exclusively for sports-minded individuals who want to be in close touch with the sports world and with organized athletic programs for the unsighted. Feeling Sports is offered in two forms, in Braille or on cassette tapes. I'm Ray Scott. And for the last three years, it's been my pleasure to be the cassette voice of Feeling Sports, reading amazing and inspiring articles about blind people who participate in various sports such as beat baseball, golf, and many others. For a sample copy, contact the Braille Sports Foundation, room 301, 730 Hennepin Avenue, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55403. Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55403. Feeling Sports is available free of charge to physically handicapped persons unable to afford the cost. Sang the poet, My secrets cry aloud. I have no need for tongue. My heart keeps open house. My doors are widely flung. Yes, that's the attitude of the poet. The politician is another case, however. His secrets must be silent, his door closed, his window shuttered. His theme is expressed in a word that poets have absolutely no use for. Discretion. It's you. We have to talk. About what? About a certain name you mentioned. We better not talk here. Why not? Because I'm expecting him. Expecting who? You know who. Let's end this charade. I'm coming in. He'll kill you if he finds you here. Answer this question. Who told you about Dalgren? I'm trying to help you. Get away from here. Who told you? Does it matter? Tell me who told you. You did. I did. He did. What's the difference? Tell me the truth. Tell me or... Or what? What do you know about Dahlgren? He's a... a senator. Yes. What else do you know? I know that you and he 
have been on opposite sides for years. You've been bitter enemies. What else do you know? Now, I suppose I know everything. What's everything? You are going to support him for the nomination. Yes. He won't let you do it. Anthony Edmund Pringle won't let you do it. I've had enough. I am Anthony Edmund Pringle. Somehow, you got this information. No. There's an Anthony Edmund Pringle who is 30 years old, and he'll kill you before you bring him to this ultimate disgrace. What ultimate disgrace? What's wrong with what I'm doing? Dahlgren is a scoundrel. He's not the only one. But he's the worst, and for you to back him is the most cynical... What do you know about it? Please, I want to help you. I have a very, very angry young man to pacify. But you have to help me. You just disavow this this Dahlgren person. I can't. Why? Because when you get to be where I am, you can't stand still. You must go forward. You have to be with the winner. Dahlgren will be the winner. Who's that? It's probably Anthony Edmund Pringle. Hello? Yes? No. He's... He's not here. I don't know where he is. Yes. As soon as I find out. Goodbye. He knows about Dahlgren. What? Everybody knows about Dahlgren. It's in the papers. It's on the news. It's impossible. Would you like to hear it? Gentlemen, we are still with our special newscast concerning the greatest political bombshell of the decade, the Pringles-Dahlgren Alliance. It all came to the surface as a result of a story in the Tribune by veteran reporter James Mullen. Mullen? These two former sworn enemies prove that anything is possible in the political arena. And as a team, now they're virtually unbeatable. As Mullen notes, there is, of course, a little matter of morality. But that won't bother too many people. Shut it off. Have you heard enough? Mullen. It's the truth. Of course. Why should Dahlgren and I destroy each other? Doesn't it make sense to join forces? But how did Mullen find out? This wasn't supposed to break for another month. Call the broadcasting stations, the press. Hold a conference, say it isn't true. In that way, he'll forgive you. You claim I told you. Yes, you did. Whatever it is, whatever game you're trying to play, it's not going to work. You know... You're an interesting lady. Oh, no. <laughs> no, not that. Not now. Years ago, there would have been a, a point to it. A home, children, a whole life we might have made together. Now it's too late. And I don't like your newest friends. You're a very positive woman. That's your problem. And you're very convincing. That's my problem. You have a way of talking. It can almost make a man believe anything. Even this nonsense you've tried to peddle me about a young addition of myself that is still making the rounds. He intends to kill you. I confess I, I let it get to me somewhat. But it's because I've been under a strain. Well, it has been extremely interesting. And now, if you don't mind... I must leave. Fight, Dahlgren. Fight him. We have just become blood brothers. That should cement our relationship for at least this one campaign. It's the only way Anthony Edmund Pringle can be made to respect you. Good night, Miss Morrison. When I think of what might have been... Well, the word's out. Did the earth shake? Briefly. <laughs> and then? And then, people said words like master stroke. Brilliant strategy. Terrific tactics. Natural allies. Ah, you see, it has now become the normal and accepted state of affairs. And what do you think? As a friend, 
I would not have done it. I needed that big dramatic move. Of course. But you could have done better than Dahlgren. He was available. Time was not on my side. Well, what's done is done. Uh, Tony. Yes. There was a fellow in here looking for you. Uh, what was his name? I didn't say. Lots of folks are looking for me all the time. Yes. There is something different about this one. In what way? Uh, this may be a somewhat uh, delicate question, Tony. Did you ever have a son? John, I've never been married. You understand that is not a direct answer. The direct answer is no. The reason I say this, the fellow was about 25 or 30, and he was a dead ringer for you. He was? A carbon copy in every respect. The difference? He's half a lifetime younger and thinner, but he was you as you looked at the time. And I remember. He asked for me. Yes. Wanted to know if you were here. What did you tell him? What could I tell him? You weren't in. Then what did he do? I don't know. Try to remember. He... He just disappeared into the crowd. He's never been in before. No. Tony, is something wrong? He looked just like me. The image to the line. And he's looking for me. Yes, I just said he was. Tony, there's something wrong. I know it. I have to... I should get away for a bit. I would certainly say so. I know I need a rest. You do. Where it's quiet, where nobody knows me, where nobody could find me. But where is such a place? Well... I have a little lodge up on the coast of Maine. Nobody's using it right now. John, I couldn't. I... You want to go where no one can find you? Here. I'll give you the keys. Don't go. You? What are you doing here? Don't go. Don't go where? To Maine. How do you know I'm going to? He told me. Listen. He's already gone there. He's waiting for you. Don't go yet. Let me talk to you first. What is there we can talk about? Besides, we, we can't talk here. Too many people will recognize you me. You have to listen to me. All right. Let's go to your place. the alliance with Dahlgren? I told you that's impossible. Why? Because I'm committed. I had to cut some throats to do this. I suppose you did. They would just as quickly have cut mine. Anyhow, there are certain breaches that cannot be healed at this time. Then I cannot help you. You must. Tell him. What can I tell him? Tell him how hard it was for me to just be a school teacher. Yes. Tell him that one morning you wake up and you suddenly realize you can have everything. I'll tell him. Tell him it's a drug. A drug? Power. It's the deadliest drug of all. The more you have of it, the more you need. And you can't give any of it up. You can't. I'll tell him. I know how he feels. I was like him once. You weren't like him. You were him. I can't change. I can't go back. I know it. And he knows it. And that's why he has to kill you. No, please. Don't start that again. Because you have made nothing of his life. Nothing. I'm one of the most powerful people in this country. What have you done with his life? You filled it with, with, with tobacco smoke and tinsel. You've packed it with broken promises, with, with greed and corruption. You have become prosperous by bringing out the worst in other men. No. No, you will have to die. Oh, no, no. Do you think I'll stand by and let him kill me? Who's that? You know who it is. Do you think I'll just stand still and let him kill me? I'm armed. I have a gun. See? Look. It won't help you. Let him in. Who does he think he is? Let him in. This insufferable two-bit philosopher. He would have been different. He would have been able to withstand temptation. 
Did anyone ever tempt him? Let him in. I'm not afraid. Come on in. Let's look at you, Tony. You dare to look down on me. I've played golf with billionaires. I played poker with presidents. Look at you. In your threadbare trousers, patches on your corduroy sleeves. Look at me. Look at what I did for you. Thank me. Thank me. Wait. No. Don't look at me like that. Don't. Keep away. I'll shoot. I swear, I'll shoot. And now for the news. We know who the gray slapper is. She's Miss Dolly Morrison. This evening, Anthony Edmund Pringle, companion of presidents, confidant of kings, and counselor to billionaires, was shot to death by her hand in her apartment. Evidently, it was a romance of long standing. The place is filled with his pictures, stories, and books about his long career. These things happened. He tired of her. She slapped him in public. And later, killed him. They say, cherchez la femme. And in this case, we found her. You want to know what I think? I would say there was more here than meets the eye. But exactly what it is, I cannot tell you. Ah, how about another? On the house. As usual in these affairs, we give a multitude of possibilities. The first is the story we tell you, that his own youth killed him. Of course, it's possible that Dolly could have been playing a game, or even John Harrigan, or Tony's political enemies. Or have you been inspired to come up with a solution of your own? This is all to the good, and we shall talk about it shortly. Isn't it nice to know that in almost 300 different well, I didn't see it for everybody that in Ellen welcome waiting for you. Under the big, bright, sunburst sign of Quality Inns, you'll always find comfortable rooms at very comfortable prices. That's what makes Quality Inns the most comfortable place under the sun. See your travel agent or call us toll-free for reservations. Quality Inns, the most comfortable place under the sun. When I have a sore throat, I don't feel like myself. My throat feels raw and irritated. That's when I use chloroseptic. Chloroseptic helps me feel better because it helps block the pain of a sore throat. So when you get a sore throat, don't let it slow you down. Get relief with chloroseptic and feel like yourself again, fast. Chloroseptic spray or lozenges for temporary relief of minor sore throat pain. Use only as directed. Do you have a sight problem that prevents you from reading? Hi, this is Max Morath with news about Choice Magazine Listening, a free service of the nonprofit Lucerna Fund. Six times yearly, Choice Magazine Listening brings you eight hours of selections from leading publications on phonograph records. For information about a free subscription, write Listening Box 10, Port Washington, New York, 11050. Remember, it's free. So write Listening Box 10, Port Washington, New York, 11050. Consider some basic premises. If you are 50, what became of the you that was 25? Ah, you say, he grew older. But how can you prove it? 
Are we one person who ages, or are we an infinite multitude of people who live for a day, or a week, or a year, and are then replaced? Impossible? Really? How many times have you said of somebody, why, he's simply not the same person? Our cast included Carol Titel, Gordon Heath, and Robert Dryden. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. more than 200 years ago, is the only animal who knows he will die. But man does not and never has accepted this dire bit of knowledge, not completely. He struggles still to discover or invent some reason to believe that he is immortal. That, however altered, he will nevertheless live on forever. And that is why, centuries ago, ghost stories were born. You must appease the god Hermes. But my daughter... Pacify the Eumenides. What of my daughter? Reconsecrate the temple. All pollution must be removed. My daughter, my daughter, what of her? Your daughter cannot be laid to rest within the boundaries of this city. She must be taken outside these walls... And buried there. Our mystery drama, Night Visitor, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Terry Keene. possible that the cavemen sat around the fire after dark and told stories of strange shapes they had seen and awful sounds they had heard and wondered aloud if their ancestors were trying to get in touch with them. We can't know for sure because they could not record their experience. But a ghost story from the fourth century before Christ has come down to us. Its setting is Macedonia and we have given our adaptation the title of Night Visitor. He couldn't have picked a worse time to pay a visit. It had been a scant few weeks since the light had gone out of our lives. I suppose it's possible he had not heard of my daughter's death. After all, he lived in Therma, and I don't believe he'd traveled to Amphipolis more than two or three times on business for King Philip II. And he'd never before been a guest in our home. Still, demonstratives, my husband and I, did our poor best to prepare for his arrival. Achates is very close to the king, you know. I know. And to the young prince Alexander, too, I believe. Craterus was a general in Alexander's army. He's dead, Sheridan. Six months married, and he died. Then she died. There's no need to remind me. Forgive me, my dear. Such a brilliant marriage, such a happy marriage. Then a widow so soon. Then... Dear wife... She don't... lingered only a few months after his death. Our only child. Our lovely young daughter, our beautiful Philinian. Dear wife... Now this, this... 
fool intrudes himself on our grief. You said yourself he may not even know. Yes. It must be that he doesn't know. Or he couldn't be so tactless, so unfeeling. His room is ready for him, I suppose. He'll be tired after his trip from Therma. It's prepared. I gave Melissa instructions. Properly prepared, I hope. Our best linen sheets. Food and drink. Spice cakes, apples, plums. A carafe of wine. Oh, yes. And our best crystal goblets with the gold rim. Mistress? Yes, Melissa. The gentleman from Therma has arrived. Ah, Mercedes is here. It had been several years since Mercedes had last been in our city, so I had no clear picture of what sort of man to expect. I must admit that I was most pleasantly, most favorably impressed. The man who entered our house was, I should think, about 40 years old, strikingly handsome, well-built, intelligent, and beautifully mannered. I must confess the thought crossed my mind how our daughter Felinian would have admired this man, perhaps, perhaps even loved him. I told him briefly of her marriage, of her widowhood, and lastly of her death. He was most sympathetic, very kind, very understanding. Really a remarkable young man. We said goodnight to him and Melissa showed him to his room. A proper young man. I'm happy to have him for a guest. So am I. Are you sorry you were so fretful about his coming here? I couldn't know he'd be so charming. I think I've planned everything well. Melissa will devote all her time to him. Uh, can't we give him a servant who's not quite so old? Perhaps we should. I can't imagine that at court he's tended by an aged crone. I suppose not. In the morning I'll see what I can do. I think you should. We want to make a good impression. I know. Well, are you ready to retire? Oh. What's that? It sounded like Melissa. Well, what kind of... Mistress! Master! Melissa, what is it? What's possessed hey, Come in, you? woman, come in. What's frightened you? Demonstrations. Some wine. Up there. Up there. Where? Where? Up his, where? His room. Here, drink this. Uh, whose room do you mean? The gentleman. The one from Therma. Mercedes. What do you know about Mercedes? Oh, I looked in, in upon him a minute ago to see if he was cold or if he needed anything. Oh, oh, mister. Yes, yes, go on. He was asleep, in bed and asleep. Of course. I, I peered at the bed. He was sleeping peacefully. But beneath the coverlet, I could distinguish a form. Not his. Oh, another's. What do you mean, old woman? Two people were in that bed. Side by side. Oh, come now, you're joking. Of course you are. Oh, your eyes are failing. Yes, that's it. No, no, no. I saw them. Melissa. But that's not all, my mistress. I crept closer to the bed. I thought, as you think now, that I must be wrong. But there they were, the two of them, lying next to each other. Oh, mistress, how can I tell you? One of them was... Felinian... Felinian, your daughter. Can you conceive of what I felt? Incredulity, of course. It was not yet six months since we had placed the body of our beloved child on the bier within the tomb. The old servant's words were a desecration. A fluttering fear trembled within us both. What if... What if something between disbelief and anxiety and a desire to quiet the old servant, something made us decide that one of us should accompany Melissa to the bedroom where Mercedes lay with... With whom? With what? It was decided that I should be the one. I think you were losing your senses, Melissa. You stay. I'll go in. Yes, mistress. It's true. 
true. There are two of them. You see. You see. Mercedes and a, a woman. Go closer. Close to the bed. Yes. A woman. Valinian. No. Not Valinian. Yes. It is she. But it's impossible to tell. It is she, The mistress. room is so dark. Her hair, her skin, her nightdress. I can't believe. Billy. Billy. It's not my daughter. It's not the Leninian. It's some stranger. It is your daughter, mistress. I'll swear to it. Close your mouth, old woman. I saw what I saw. I tell you, I saw. Hush. Hush. We must not be found here. My husband is waiting for us below stairs. Come. Indeed, Demonstrasus was waiting for us in a fever of impatience. I had decided that I would not tell him anything of a definite nature. For I was not sure myself. There had been a moment there in the bedroom when I thought I recognized the hair... The skin, the nightdress, they were familiar to me. But that signified nothing, really. Felinian could not have been the only girl with chestnut hair and peach pink skin. Not the only one to wear a white sleeping gown threaded with yellow ribbons. Oh, no. No. Well... What did you find? Nothing. Am I right? Nothing at all. Nothing. He says we found nothing. Tell him. Go on, tell him. Charito, tell me. It is true. Mercedes was not alone in his bed. Not alone? There was a woman. Valenian. What? No. No. Someone who... who looked somewhat like who could conceivably be mistaken for her. The hair, the, the coloring, the clothing. It was Felenia. Be quiet, you crazy old woman. I knew her from the day she was born. I watched her grow to womanhood. I tended her in the cradle. I guarded her at school. I cared for her till she married and left me. I know her head to foot, body and soul. Her life has been so interwoven with mine that I could not fail to recognize her if I met her in hell. Stop your ravings, Melissa. Our Felinian lies on her bier in the tomb where we placed her. She has left it. She has escaped and found her way into this house, into his bed. I forbid you to speak another word. Do you want to be dismissed from our service? Do you want to beg bread on the streets? I saw what I saw. Uh, go to bed, Melissa. You're tired. All the same, I saw. We will talk in the morning, Melissa. Crazy old woman. What uh, did you see, Charito? I saw a woman, that's true enough. But it was no one we know. And most assuredly, it was not Felinian. The very idea. Uh, Mercedes must know many women in Amphipolis. He must have stirred more than one feminine heart in the past. It could have been some woman from our streets. Uh, what are you going to do about it? Why, nothing. But you must do something. What would you have me do? Do I ask him? Ask him who invaded his bed in the middle of the night? Demonstrative. It could have been anyone. Mercedes is an attractive man, so virile, so handsome, so distinguished. It would be a simple thing for him to plan an assignation. And nevertheless, it was in my house that he carried it out. And I mean to confront him with it in the morning. No. Are you afraid, Charito? Afraid of what I might learn? Yes, it was true. I was afraid. A nameless, gnawing fear twisted my bowels. A haunting anxiety about what might lie ahead for all of us. And a terrifying suspicion 
that Melissa was not fabricating, nor was she deranged. That what she said she had seen, she had, in all truth, actually seen. Arthur Schopenhauer, who died in 1860, was a renowned German philosopher, well known for his pessimistic views of the nature of man. It was his contention that we are born with a belief in ghosts and that never, never will we be free of it. But of course, as I have said, Schopenhauer was a pessimist. I'll continue shortly with Act Two. The sheer... of us, it's safe to say, has at some time lost a loved one. Our memories combine with our sense of loss and deprivation in a huge effort to bring them back to us. There are moments when it even seems that our love and longing must be strong enough to accomplish this. But what if it were true? What if we truly possessed such supernatural power? It's enough to scare us to death. It was the king himself who had suggested that I spend my three days in Amphipolis with Demonstris and Cerito. True, I remembered them from times past, an agreeable couple with a well-run household and most excellent food and drink. They had seemed a happy little family, and I was sorry to learn of the demise of their only child. I frankly felt that they thought well of me, and that they honestly liked me, so I was startled when early the next morning I heard an angry, imperious knocking at the door of my chamber. Mercedes, open the door. I must speak with you. Now, Mercedes, now. Demonstratus, what is the meaning Let of... Let us in. And, 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 and Charito, what, what, what is the reason for this early intrusion? I did not want to come, but my husband... Are you going to let us come in? Look, yes, of, of course, of course. I, I am your guest. This is your house. Come in by all means. By all means, come in. Uh, thank you. Uh, de Demonstratus, what's happened? Why are you... Uh, there's no one here. You see, Charito, there's no one here at all. Well, did you expect to find someone? A woman. Oh, Oh, yes, yes, a woman. Yeah. Melissa looked in upon you last night, some hours after you retired to see if you needed anything. She saw... She saw a woman by your side. And, as was her duty, she informed us. Well, yes, of course, it was her duty. I, uh, I hope you, you were not unduly perturbed. It's true, then? Oh, yes, 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 it is quite true. A few seconds after I reached this room, a most lovely lady appeared. I was quite taken by surprise, I can tell you. But she was so fair, so lovely, I could not on the instant send her away. You understand. Uh, go on. And besides, she told me with such passionate sincerity that I could not disbelieve her completely that she had loved me for years. It was someone you knew? Uh, to my knowledge, I had never seen her before. I... I did not press her for her name. She was clearly a lady of breeding and distinction. And, and she begged for my love, and I, I gave it to her. Uh, forgive me if I violated your hospitality, but I was sorely tempted, and I succumbed. All of that is understandable, Mercedes. Perhaps forgivable, too. I thank you for your tolerance. Uh, where is the woman now? Well, when I awoke this morning, when you and your wife came knocking at my door, she was gone. Sometime during the night, she went away, or was spirited away. What? Why do you say that? Why do you say she could have been spirited away? Why, why because both her arrival and her departure were so mysterious, so completely out of the ordinary, so unconventional. She was a spirit? A ghost. Is that what you think? Oh, no, 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 no. I, I meant nothing of the sort. This was a... This was a real woman. A woman of this earth, of flesh and blood. <laughs> Why do you think she... Of what are you accusing me? Uh, Mercedes, my friend, uh, you had best sit down while I tell you what is suspected. Only suspected, mind you. Suspected by an old and unstable servant in the house. Melissa? Melissa says 
she swears that the woman in your bed was our daughter. Your, your daughter? Our Felinian. But your but your daughter is dead. You told me last night that... Mercedes, after Melissa told her story of what she had seen... Or thought she had seen. I myself came into this room. The woman in your bed, though there was little light to see by, still... The woman did bear... I must confess it in the name of truth. She did bear a certain resemblance to Felinian. Oh, no, 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 no. The, the woman who invaded my room, she, she was no specter. She, was, she wasn't a ghost. Look, look, look there. We sat at that table and we ate and we drank. We ate cakes and fruit and drank wine from your beautiful gold rim goblets. And he, look, look, here's something else. Two things she gave me as tokens of her love. I put them in this coffer. You see? See here? Look, a gold ring. She took it from her finger. And a gold belt from around her waist. Oh, no. Oh. No. There, you see? You see? The, the, these are gifts from a tangible, a palpable woman. <laughs> that, that was no ghost that visited me. Well, you do see, don't you? Mercedes. That ring, that belt. They were worn by our daughter, Felinian, during her lifetime. I, I, no, I, I can't believe that. No. And they were buried with her in her tomb. The ring upon her finger, the belt around her waist. But, uh, it's... But then somebody robbed the tomb. Uh, yes, yes, of course, that's it. Somebody broke into the tomb and stole the gold trinkets from her, her poor dead body. And, and somehow they came into the hands of my night visitor. Yes, of course, that's how it happened. Now, don't you see? I suppose it's possible. Well, of course it is. Can it be proven? Oh, yes, yes, yes. Yes, I think it can. Can you prove it? Well, no, not by my efforts, perhaps. But look, ah, it comes back to me. Now, during the night, this woman whispered to me that she would return. Yes, yes, she promised that she would return each of the three nights that I slept here in your house. That she would come to me at the same time. Now, now, if you and your wife will hide yourselves outside the door, you will see her when she appears. We could do that. Yes, but do not stop her from entering. Let her come in. If you fill the table with fruit and cake and wine as you did before, you will see that she is human, that she is alive, and she is a true woman. She is no ghost. And she is not your daughter. At long last, they were persuaded. They believed in my sincerity. And I was sincere. Oh, believe me, I had no wish to injure these good people in any way whatsoever. I wanted to satisfy them beyond their slightest doubt that my night visitor had been a living, breathing girl. No spirit, no phantom. What I did not tell them, what I could not bring myself to tell them, was that my visitor had whispered her name to me at one moment of that delirious night. And that name was... Felinian. Now I was determined that they should convince themselves of what to me was incontrovertible. That the woman was wholly human. And it was with eager anticipation that I awaited the appointed hour of the next night, knowing that the monstrous Centurito lurked in the shadows outside my door. Mercedes, my love. Is it you? Who else should it be? My dearest heart. No one. Did I not promise you that I would visit you here in this room each night you slept here? Yes. Then light a light. Let me see you. And you look at me. We will gaze upon each other across this little table. Oh, look here. Cold meats and bread. And grapes. And the finest brandy we could wish. Sit there, my sweet love. There's your glass. And mine. Now, let me fill our plates. 
tell me something? Anything. Whatever you want to hear. Oh, there are things I want to hear. And there are things that I do not want to hear. Your plate, my darling. Uh, thank you. Now, ask me whatever interests you. Last night, you told me something. Many things. I told you many things. But one thing in particular. And what was that? You told me... You said that you had loved me for a long time. Oh, yes. A very long time. Uh, how long? Since I was quite a young girl. Where did we meet? Oh, here. Here? Here in Amphipolis. You came on business for King Philip. Oh, uh, uh, yes. More yes. than once. Yes, yes, several times. But I knew from the first that I loved you. Would always love you. Love you till my death and beyond. The second time I saw you... My love grew. And the third time, you were so fixed in my young girl's heart that I knew nothing could alter or stifle the love I bore you. Not even marriage to another man. You, you married? Oh, yes. I was nearly 20. My parents arranged it. Who, who, who was the man you married? No, he was very distinguished. A good man. A kind man. He was a general, very high up in the army of King Philip. Perhaps you knew him. Well, what was his name? His name was Criteris. And what happened to him? Well, he died. We were married a scant six months before he died. And that must have made you very unhappy. I grieved for him, yes. And then? And then? Well, then I died too. But, but you are here. My love for you had never died. It burned as fiercely as ever. My violent, my passionate, my unsatisfied love. And when I knew that you would spend three nights in my parents' house... Oh, forgive me. Where are you going? Come back. The monstrous. Come in. Mercedes, no. Traito. We don't want them. Come in, both of you. She is here. No, no, we don't need them. Lenny and my daughter. Lydia, is it you? She's come back to us, Demonstratus. Our daughter has returned from the grave. Oh, dear child. <gasps> to have you back. Oh, the gods are kind. Let us embrace you, dearest girl. Stay away. Stay apart from me. Lillian. Do not approach me. Do not come near me. But we love you. What do you know of love? You doubt that we love you? You are cruel. Cruel and unfeeling. My child, what are you saying? I came here by the grace of the gods. They allowed me three nights to spend with the man of my young heart. But you could not permit that, could you? You could not grant me my three happy nights. Oh, Philemon. I meant no harm to anyone. I did no harm to a single soul in this house. But you, mother, and you, father, with your meddling... Meddling? Yes, your meddling. Your audacious interference. Your bungling. You have destroyed the most sacred wish of my heart. And now... And now... Yes, my daughter. What now? Now must I return to the shadowy place appointed for me. Now... Now at last... It is over... Over at last. What? Is she? She is dead, Charito. Dead? Is that true? Yes, my dear wife. Our daughter is dead. Once again, she is dead. <laughs> The body of the beautiful young woman lay stretched to its full length across the bed. Her parents threw themselves upon it. The house was filled with sorrow and confusion. Philinian was dead, and I shared the grief of Chirito and Demonstratus as best I could. But a question crowded my head and infected my thoughts. When had she been alive? 
If you believe in ghosts, you have plenty of company, as this story, which dates back 2,300 years, well attests. If you do not believe in ghosts, well, many others share your conviction. The question of their existence or non-existence has never been decided, nor is it likely to be. But consider this. Believe or disbelieve as you will. Someday you may be a ghost yourself. I shall be back with our concluding act shortly. Let's be honest, this is a very unsatisfactory world to live in. Long on confusion and contradiction, short on justice and human kindness. Is it any wonder we long so ardently to turn away from it, out of disgust, despair, or simple boredom? But where, towards what do we turn in our extremity? Why, to the mysterious, of course, to the land of the unknown, the unknowable, and the strange creatures who inhabit it. They are good people, I guess, and kind enough in their way, but they are stupid. On the other hand, a slave, unburdened by possessions or position, happily deprived of aspiration and ambition, Limited to menial work that any fool can accomplish. A slave like myself is free at all times to observe and reflect on the riddles and enigmas of life, both here and beyond. This is a freedom which I, in my bondage, cherish above all else. While the household was racked with grief over the second death of the beautiful Felinian, I took it upon myself to seek out Hillis. The greatest diviner among us. What brings you here, Melissa? Have you heard, Hillis, of the awfulness that has come to pass in the house of Charito and demonstrate There have been murmurings in the street, yes. The word goes round that Felinian has come back from beyond the grave. That much is true. I saw her. I was the first. Stay a moment, Melissa. You say you saw the specter of Felinian? Not a specter, Hillis. Felinian as she was before she died. Who would know her better than I? And you say you were the first to see her returned from the grave. Oh, there I misspoke myself. I was not the first, but I was the first to recognize her. Ah, and who was the first to see her? Mercates from Therma, friend to the king who came here for three days on state business and chose, oh, unhappy choice, to spend those three days in the house of demonstrators. But Felinian has been dead for some time now. Mercates was informed of that on arrival. But that night he was tempted and seduced by a beautiful young woman. And when, in the early morning hours, I entered his bedchamber to see what he might need... There they were, together. And you can imagine my horror when I looked down and saw the face of my cherished Felinian. I rushed to tell my masters, and in the morning they confronted Mercades, who swore that it was a living woman who had visited him. He showed them a gold ring and a gold belt, which he said the woman had given him. But, oh, he caught. They recognized the jewelry as having belonged to their daughter. Indeed, she had worn the ring and the belt to her grave. Ah, oh, the horror grows. Mercedes insisted that the woman had been a living, breathing being. No ghost from the other side. And invited the father and mother to hide themselves outside his room. For he said the woman had promised to visit him at the same hour each of the three nights. He slept beneath that roof. And did the father and mother accept the invitation of Mercedes to, to eavesdrop outside his room the next night? Indeed they did. Oh. And indeed Felinian appeared at the very hour he had said she would. They ran to embrace their daughter, so glad they were to see her, as they thought returned to them. But she repulsed them utterly. 
heap scorn and loathing on them for having prevented the second and third nights of her rendezvous with the man she had loved so long. And then... Oh, and then... And then, Melissa... Then she... She fell upon the bed and died. <sighs> that is... That is why I'm here, Hillis. Tell me what they should do. And I will carry your instructions back to them. I do not know how this dreadful event can be finally resolved. But I do know what must be done first before anything else. First, the tomb where they placed Valinian's body must be opened. I took the instructions of Hillis back to Charito and Demonstratus. They had the grace to thank me for my trouble and made ready to visit the tomb that very day. As for Mercades, he nodded dumbly when I told him all that I had done and what remained to be done. But he said that he would not go to the tomb but would wait for us to come back to the house. So we went without him. Here is the beer where the body of my father lies. Yeah, here lies my brother. Here my aunt. The beer of Felenian lies straight ahead. I know very well where she lies. Bring the torches closer. <gasps> Look there. There is no body. But where? Where could... At home... With Mercedes on the bed where we left you? Let us hurry back. Come, Melissa. Wait, wait. Come, Melissa. Look here. What is it? Hmm? See what I found lying on the bier? What? It's an iron ring. A man's ring. And there's something else. Look. A goblet. A goblet with a gold rim. Oh, demonstratus, it's one of ours. It is one of those I left in the bedroom of Mercates that first night. Come, come, both of you. We must go back to the house. We hurry back, half walking, half running along the dusty road, saying nothing to one another, our faces drawn and haggard with anxiety. We were within a few yards of the house when we saw Mercates standing in the middle of the road. Mercates... We entered the tomb. The beer of Felinian is empty. I know. You know? How? What do you know? After you left, I decided that I had been cowardly to refuse to go with you to the tomb. A few minutes past, I made up my mind to join you just outside the house, lying on the grass. I found the body of Felinian. What? Why should she be there? I think... I think that she was trying to return to her beer in the tomb. Her rightful home. Come, Demonstratus. Come, let us find her. Oh, sir. This has been a most dreadful experience. As much for you as for the rest of us. It has, Melissa. Ah, I wish I could help you. Perhaps you can. I? An old woman like me... A slave woman like me. There might be more wisdom in your ancient head than anyone dreams of. There well might be. But what has happened here? These are things that have to do with the netherworld. The dark, the shadowy side of the soul. The mysteries of heaven and hell and human failure. I don't know what to do. I meant no purposeful evil. I know, sir. When she appeared in my room, all beautiful and enticing, she was real. I swear, I had no notion. She spoke of her love for me. She, she gave me her ring. Oh, sir. And her belt of gold from around her waist. They were real. I showed them to you. You saw them. There is something else, sir, which I must show you. What is that? This ring of iron. Why? Right. And that ring is mine. At least it was mine till I, till I gave it to her. 
You gave this ring to Felinian? Yes, that first night. A, a pledge of my love. When the tomb was open, sir, and we went inside, we found the ring lying upon her empty beer. And not just the ring. We found this goblet, too. The goblet? With a rim of gold? Why, why she... She took this with her when she left my room. A memento of our time together. You know what this means, sir. Tell me, t tell me. My, my mind is whirling with confused thoughts. I, I reject them all, but, but they come back. It means, Makedes, that when she left you that night, she returned to the tomb. Oh, no. And there she remained till she reappeared in your room the second night. Melissa, what shall I do? What can I do? Who will tell me what I must do? Sir, go to Hillis. Hillis? Who, who is Hillis? The wisest man in Amphipolis. It was Hillis who told us to open the tomb. You say I should, I, I should seek out this wise man, this Hillis? I can think of nothing else. Now, sir, if you will excuse me, I must join my mistress. She needs me more than you. I suggested to Cherito that she and I should go to the place of assembly. There was bound to be a crowd there, for by now everyone must know of our journey to the tomb and what we had found and not found there. At first she hesitated, but when I said that Hillis would most certainly be one of the crowd, she consented. For she knew she was in drastic need of counsel. Hillis! Hillis! Is Hillis here? He's here! Yes, I'm here. Hillis, I must speak with you. Yes, Sherry, do. I need your help. This awful quandary into which we have been thrown. Be quiet. Quiet, everyone. Be quiet. Hillis, you know of the tragedy that has befallen our family. There is talk of it, Cherry Toe. And Melissa has told me the true details. Which she herself witnessed. And you wish me to tell you what should be done. To wipe away the stain. To cleanse our house. Cherry Toe, make sacrifice to the god Hermes. Yes, and to the Eumenides. Oh, yes. And to Zeus. What of my daughter? Her body lies outside our house. Ah, you would place her back in the tomb. Is that it, Charito? On the beer that is hers? No. No, Charito, no. No? Then what? Then... Where? Elinian cannot be laid to rest within the boundaries of this city. She must be taken outside these walls and buried there. No! It is the law. It was harsh advice to give. But such were the facts... And such was the law. And the sorrowing friends and family did everything that I suggested with the utmost care. The man, Mercedes, never consulted me. That same day, he killed himself. Perhaps had he sought me out and asked my help, Perhaps I would have told him that there was no other proper thing for him to do. But what he did... The story of Night Visitor, which we have brought to you in modern adaptation, was written down in the second century after Christ, during the reign of the Emperor Hadrian, though it is told as happening six centuries previous. Its author was a freed Greek slave by the name of Phlegon, and was circulated in the book titled De Rebus Mirabilis, or Of Miraculous Things. I'll be back shortly. <laughs> The 
opening of the story of Philinian is missing from Phlegon's account, but from other sources it has been ascertained that it was taken from a letter written by a man called Hipparchus to a friend named Eridaus, who was half-brother to son of Philip II, Alexander the Great. Our cast included Terry Keane, Earl Hammond, E.V. Juster, and Ray Owens. The entire production is under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. objects roam, many of them unidentified. Do you ever look to that darkling bowl of the sky, pierced only by the stars, and wonder if strangers come to us from out there? And if so, how many of them are among us already, aliens, unrecognized? Are they friend or foe, terrorist or goodwill ambassador? Always supposing they are there, I wonder sometimes as I am sure the rest of you do. I told you, Moses, you would be part of the whole. And my father? He will not need you much longer. I have to stay with him to the end. So be it. You have chosen your own destiny. You have selected your own living death. <laughs> mystery drama, Alien Presences, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars John Beale and Joan Shea. August 14, 1958, Antelope Crossings, Nebraska. This is the story of today, but it began 21 years ago. You never heard of Antelope Crossing? That's not at all surprising. The population maybe is 105, including children. It's a post office, general store, and not even one street. It's just where two roads meet and leave again. Now that we're leaving, Jim, I kind of hate to go. I know how you feel, Ruth. No matter how barren it is, a person puts down roots. But we're lucky to get away. I reckon. Never could make much of a go of it here. I think it'll be better in Nebraska. I know it will. My brother Ace's farm is a real big spread. We can start to live like people there. Get you some fancy duds and all. Maybe even a TV set. Like I say, we're some lucky. Oh, don't say that. We wouldn't be if that terrible car accident hadn't snuffed out Asa and Sarah and oak their children like they were candles. The Lord give it and the Lord take it away. He should have taken us. We had nothing. Not even children. Oh, I guess the Lord knows best. Oh, you think we should travel in weather like this? Well, if anything happens, we'll be together. In bad weather or not, I got a feeling we're headed for a whole new life. Like you can't believe. Funny. If I'm honest, that's just how I feel. Can't you give any news on the radio, Jim? Listen for yourself, woman. Oh, uh, maybe we should have stayed over till tomorrow. And miss the services? With me, the sole heir, and us, the only family? You, you know that don't make sense, Ruth. Oh, I, I reckon. 
Uh, funny. Think of us chunking along in this old car with the trailer behind us and everything we have in the whole wide world is here. Well, maybe after all these years, I can give you the life I always wanted to give you. You've always given me anything I wanted or needed, Jan Harden, except... Except no child. I, I didn't mean it that way. It's my fault as much as yours. Well, if we had money enough, we just might be able to find a way. You hush up now. We just better put our trust in prayer. It's a little late in life for us, Ruth, to have any prayers answered. We've got to be practical. What's that, Jim? Where? Oh, oh there to your left. It's coming right at us. We just stopped the car. Oh, what is this? Well, I don't know. Maybe one of them big jet planes. It can't be. They always fly so high and then and straight. Look at this one. Why, it's spinning like some child goes up and spitting fire all around like a pinwheel. Well, what do you think it is? Oh, it looks like one of them unidentified objects. Oh, it's that in straight forward. Maybe a bunny. Bunny, but for what? The question of the Lord's will. Sure, oh. it's headed straight for us. Look out, Ruth. Oh. Look. Stop. Went right over us and crashed down there in the ravine. Oh. Come on, let's go see if we can help. If we hadn't been here to track it, like nobody never have seen it. Oh, well, it sure is wilderness. And whatever crashed it, pretty near burned to a crisp already. Oh, Jim, we better see if we can help. I don't see how nobody could have lived through it. Well, it's only Christian to make sure. Of course. Come on. Oh. What do you suppose it could have been? A big jumbo jet? Looking down on it from here, I, I don't think so. There's no path cut through the trees. Oh. It's just like a drop, like a helicopter or, or a stone. <laughs> Don't get too close, Jim. Oh, she's burned herself out by now. Funny. What? She must have had radio contact with the ground, big aircraft like that. There ought to be all sorts of rescue planes, whirly birds here by now. But the sky's plumb empty of everything. Surely they'll be here. You think... You think anyone's alive? Well, not unless they were thrown clear. In the hour or so it took us to get down here, this must have been just plain hell. Everything's burned to a crisp. But we, we still ought to take a look. We sure will, Ruth. Just as soon as it cools off. Well, what is it? Well, I still don't know. Couldn't be one of our regular aircraft. All I can figure, it must be something from another... What was that? Some animal, maybe. No, no, no. It sounded like a baby crying. Oh, that's what it is. But where, Jim? Where? It echoes so here. This way, I think. Come on. Oh, maybe someone did survive the crash. Well, if they did, we're about to find out. There. In that juniper bush. Quick, Jim. He's so hot there. Oh, okay. I got him. Or her, whatever it is. Oh, bleed quickly to the stream. Hurry. Oh, may the good Lord let him not be hurt or burned. Hush, little boy. Hush. It's all right. No need to cry anymore. Is he burned? No. Oh, Jim, it's a miracle. What's he crying for? His mother. For being alone. Oh, Jim. Jim. What is it, darling? Do you... Do you, do you suppose maybe... Maybe we could keep him? What? Keep the baby. Oh, how could we? Oh, we found him. And you said yourself nobody else could have gotten out of that crash alive. Oh, that don't mean this baby hasn't got other kids. 
There's bound to be some other people in his family. Well, suppose they don't want him. Well, that's something we can't decide. And just suppose there isn't anyone else in his family. Well, there's really no way of checking that out. Unless we take him to the authorities, get him identified. Authorities? Well, let's even suppose they do identify him and he has no kin. Then what? Well, I, I guess he... We'd have to be put in some sort of home for a doctor. Then what chance would we have to do that? Well, well, I reckon from here on in we'd have enough money to... It isn't money, Jim. They'd say we were too old. Don't you see? This is a gift from God. Meant to be. This is, this is our baby. Oh, now, now, hold on, honey. We can't figure that way. Someone else could be hankering over this baby and feeling just as deep as you do about him. I still say God sent him to us. Well, it could be. But we got no right to play God. You don't want him? Oh, of course I do. Just as much as you do, but... Then here's what we should do, Jim. Now, now you, you take me to a motel. Or a hotel. Get me some things I'll need for the baby. And, and then you go off to the funeral. Oh, Ruth, you can't keep that baby. Not without letting the police know what's happened. How do we know what's happened? How do we know this baby had anything to do with the aircraft that crashed? But, but, but if that goes for the moment, all I'm asking for, Jim, is a little time. Time for what? To listen to the radio, the TV, watch the paper. Find out if anyone is looking for the baby. And if you do? Well, I'll return him, of course. If he belongs with someone else, that's where he should be. And if there's no news about him? Then I, I want to keep him for my... For our own, Jim. Well, I don't know what to say. That you, Jim? That's me, Ruth. Did you get the newspaper? Yep. And? No news in any of them about either the baby or the crash. I've been listening to the radio and watching TV. There's nothing there either. Well, it's still kind of early on, you know. For the newspapers, maybe. But radio and TV? Nothing at all on either of them yet? No. Well, what are we going to do? Well, if you're going to get in that car and go to the funeral and leave me here with Moses. With who? The boy. I found him like Pharaoh's daughter. Oh. But unlike her, I will nurse him for myself. Well, why don't you both come along with me? How could you suddenly explain the child? It's better this way, Jim. All right. I'll be on my way. And I hope when I come back for you, it won't be for you alone. Jim. Oh, Jim. It's so good to see you back. I miss you, Ruth. And I miss you, Jim. I bet you didn't much. With him to take care of. The baby? Oh, Jim, don't talk that way. I love him. He's so wonderful. But that wouldn't interfere with you and me ever. I know. I can't wait to see him myself. You will. He'll be awake any moment now. But before he does wake up, do you have any news? Nope. Asa left us everything free and clear. It's a right good farm. And we can make a good life on it. That's nice, but I, I meant about little Moses in there. Jim, are we going to be able to keep him? Oh, I don't know, Ruth. There isn't a sign of anyone looking for him. Not a word on TV, radio, nothing in the papers. Have you seen her anything? No. And it's been pretty near a whole week now. Well, we're taking an awful risk, honey. Where did this miracle child come from? Something comes hurtling out of the sky into the wilderness? And every trace of what it was is burned to ashes, along with whoever flew with it or rode in it, excepting just this one baby. Well, his father or mother took a chance and, and, and threw him clear. But from what? What kind of aircraft can fly the sky today without some record being made of it? Where was it headed? Where did it take off from? Why doesn't someone, somewhere, an individual, a control tower, I don't know what, but... 
Why doesn't someone know that that aircraft is missing? What are you trying to get at, Jim? I'm just trying to say that... Well, the only answer I can come up with is... is that what we saw crash, and whose ashes are now already buried under the new growth, was, was something from outer space. That's where you think our little Moses came from? Where else? Well, you come inside to the room with me, Jen. Now, don't get mad, Ruth. I'm not mad. I'm just plain soft. I'm not giving him up. Just look, Jen. Just look down at that sweet baby. Try to tell me he's something from outer space. Why, well, he's the most human thing you ever saw in your life. You're right, Ruth. <laughs> just... Just the kind of boy I've always wanted. He's ours, Jim. We're going to bring him up right. Love and tenderness. And we're going to be proud of him. And we're never going to be sorry. Brave words, Ruth. And perhaps you'll be proven correct. Still, what you're doing is outside the law and may have many unexpected repercussions. You and your husband, Jim, are taking an awesome chance. You have no way of knowing the background of the baby you have called Moses. In this world, or possibly in some other. I shall return shortly with Act Two. fears Ruth or her husband Jem or anyone might have had were dispelled in the 21 years that have passed. Moses Harden has been a joy to his adoptive parents, although he never has known that he is not their own. He has been a loving child, a brilliant student, and thoughtful son. Only two things have set him aside. He has always been a grave and very contemplative boy, even withdrawn at times. And starting with kindergarten, his unusual height has set him apart. For Moses Harden, at 21 years old, stands at 7 feet 6 inches. Oh, I sure do hate to see the fall creeping on so fast. You used to say it was one of your favorite times of year, Mom. Well, that's until you went off to college. And now professional basketball. Oh, it's such a long, long season. <laughs> you should have to play it. The last months are a grind. Oh, you know that isn't true. Must be wonderful to be a hero. To be the best at anything. I don't feel I'm the best. I have certain natural advantages, that's all. You're a big, big man. Sometimes it's hard for me to see in you that little baby I used to hold over my heart. Yeah. I'm sorry I turned out to be such a, a freak. You're not a freak. You're a very handsome man. All in proportion. The best athlete in the country. And a mind just as special. Oh, just a little outsized is all. King size, you mean. But the proud mother always overlooks the fall. The proud mother is grateful for what she's had all these years. Had? Oh, you know what I mean. You're all grown up and ready to spread your wings now that your big basketball star is... You don't need us anymore. I'll always need you and Dad, Mom. You'll never know how much. You're the center of my life, the balance wheel. I, I can't do without you. That Moses Harden, will you stop it? You make me cry. I never would want to do that, Mom. You never have that way. I, I mean, tears of happiness. Happiness I don't deserve. Oh, my dear boy, if you only knew... I know a lot more than perhaps you think I do, Mom. Now, what are you trying to... Oh, dear, here comes your father. I haven't even set the table yet. Well, there isn't all that much for dinner. Forty years we've been married, and I never once let him come home from the field without the table being set and ready. And now, you go on, Moses. Go meet him on the porch till I get everything ready. <laughs> all right, Mom. Hi, Dad. Uh, hi there, big Mo. Where's Mom? Oh, getting things ready for dinner, I guess. You're a bit early. Well, I figured with you leaving tonight and all, the crop would take care of itself without any extra help from me. Matter of priorities. 
Don't get to see all that much of you anymore. Well, me and Topsy, we went and rode. Oh, you can say that again. <laughs> you suppose I'm never going to stop, Dan? Oh, we all do sooner or later. Just plain human nature. Human nature. Well, if Mom's ready in dinner, I guess I'd better get cleaned up. Well, she's not ready yet, Dad. Uh, why don't you sit with me here on the porch and have a talk? Oh, I'm pretty grimy from the field. Oh, it's good clean dirt. You mind if I want to talk to you? Well, sure not, boy. What's on your mind? It's about Mom. Your mother? What? Did you know she's hiding something? She's sick somehow. She told you? No. Then how do you know that, Mo? Well, lots of things I can sense, Dad, without knowing all the way. Yeah, you always did have second sight or something, even when you was a boy. But about your mother, I wouldn't worry. We've talked some about it, but it's, it's nothing. Just an ache or a pain here or there. You get to our age, you're bound to have a few. When was the last time she saw a doctor? Well, I, I don't rightly recall. I want you to promise me to take her to one tomorrow. For well, the first chance you get. And the best. Now, um, Mo, oh, I don't know that... You promised me, Dan. You're scared to death the doctor might find something wrong. I'm just like Mom. How do you know? It doesn't matter. What does is I do know. You promise? You two are going to spend all night out there on the porch? Dan, you better get cleaned up for dinner. Well, I'm coming right away, Ruth. I promise. I promise, sir. And you let me know right away. If it's anything serious. Well, I'm all set to go stepping. Hey, Big Mo, what's the matter, man? Ain't you never going to get dressed? You and me are last out. Oh, I didn't notice, Woody. I have some things on my mind. <laughs> sure wasn't on basketball to practice today. The coach eats you out? No. Hey, what's with you, man? You still, uh, you still worried about your old lady? And some. I thought you told me the Sawbones give her a clean bill of health. I did. Or they, Dad wrote me he did. Last time I talked to Mom on the phone, she sounded fine. Well, then what else is eating you? Yeah, nothing new. Man, where do you go? Hmm? Well, you're in another world half of the time. No way to reach you. Like you just... Wasn't one of us. Uh, I don't mean to seem that way, Woody, but, but I guess, in a sort of a way, I am. Yeah, I don't dig you. Well, well, well take my size alone. I, I can't be like everyone else at seven and a half feet and growing. There practically isn't anyone else my size. Ah, oh, come on. You live in a basketball world. You're not all that outsized. Uh, it's only part of it. Well, what's the rest? <sighs> Something I can't talk about. Oh, it won't. I, you wouldn't understand. Hey, I better get that. Locker room, Woody Spade. Hmm? Oh, listen. Well, sure, sure. He, he, he's right here. Hello. Yeah? A long distance call for you. Who is it? Well, I guess it's your father. Well, I'll take it. Hello? Yeah, Dad? Well, what is it? Oh, no. But how? <laughs> I thought. You said... Well, was it bad? Oh, that's good. I, I, I'll catch the next plane home. Oh, forget the season. The game. We'll, we'll talk when I get home. Bad news, huh? My mom died. Oh, big mom, that's terrible. It's worse than that. I only have two connections with the world. And now one of them's gone. Why didn't you tell me, Dad? Why didn't you tell me? Your mother wouldn't let me. Oh, but, but she knew as soon as she went to the doctor. Well, once the tests were in. And, and you didn't let me know then? Well, what could you have done? There wasn't any alternative. It couldn't be operated on. It was only a matter of time. I could have been back here to spend that time with her. Give up your career? Oh, what do you think a career means next to Mom? The only reason I played basketball is because it was the quickest, surest way of paying you back for all you did for me. <laughs> and, and I never really had enough chance to do that for her. Don't you know 
that just by being, you put us both in your debt forever. Yes, there. I'm not like other people. I know that. And you know it. And I suppose so did Mother. Isn't it time to tell me who I really am? I don't... I don't know how to answer you, son. I was adopted. I mean, I'm not really your child or mom. Well, thank God you never asked her that question. I wish... I wish it had never been asked at all. <laughs> what is it, Dad? Oh, it's nothing. It's nothing. Just some indigestion. Oh, that's what Mom said, and I accepted it. Not this time. We're going to get you to a doctor. <laughs> I know you mean well, Willie, but, but you, you can tell, Coach, I, I'm just not coming back. Moses, man, you got to get with it. They got lawyers from here to Tuesday. No. I know what trouble you're in, but they're going to bust your contract. I don't care. Well, the team needs you. Well, I'm sorry about that, but I need my dad more. You mean he needs you? I meant what I said. He's dying. And once he's gone, I'm lost. No way to explain it. Thanks for the try, Woody. Don't think too bad of me. You, Coach, any of the fellas. I, I never really was one of you. I, I'm somebody who's got to find my own way. Pretty cold for you to be out here on the porch, Dad. Uh, I, I want to enjoy it. Well, I can. Second Indian summer. Just the same. I... I I don't want you worrying about me. This this is nothing. The doctor said I'd be back you on You don't my have feet. to tell me what the doctor said, Dad. But I want No, to. you don't. You want to hide what he said for me. But you can't. What do you mean? I don't ask to know what people are thinking. Really thinking. I've always known. Because I can read it like it was written in a book. You can? Dad, I know. I'm not really your child. I've read that in yours and Mom's mind all my life. No matter how hard you tried to hide it from me. But I've never been able to sense deep enough. Is where did I really come from? Who am I? Why am I so strange? Oh, I guess we had no right to keep it from you. We didn't understand it all the way ourselves. And the truth was too hard to believe. I'd planned to tell you anyways before I died. Well, I reckon now's the time. Dad told me. And now I know why I've never been able to belong. Because this isn't my world, I'm an alien. I lie on my bed, waiting for sleep, which won't come, because I'm afraid. I'm as alone as if I'd crash-landed on Mars. The only one of my kind, condemned to remain a sort of self-imposed pariah for the rest of my life. And then, out of the night, the sky ship came aboard. Don't be afraid, Moses. We are coming for you. You are not alone. Now you can go back to where you belong. deep sound of the whirling mechanism a psychic reaction to the truth his father had just told him? Is there really a space voice calling to him? Is Moses Harding just a freak of nature or a creature from a civilization we can scarcely dream of, let alone imagine? I shall return shortly with Act Three. Out of the night comes the strange, high whine of the spinning disc 
from the beyond. Out of the roar and buzz of its revolving mass comes the deep, compelling voice from an alien presence. The words are reassuring, but are they to be believed? And how will Moses Harden react to the voice's offer? Or is this all a dream in the mind of a tortured young man who has lost his mother and is about to lose his father? You have no place here, Moses. Come home. I can't. Why not? He needs me. Who? My father. What is a father? There is no such thing. He he brought me up. He sacrificed everything for me. He he and my mother. You live in a primitive civilization. Father and mother are outmoded words. You are only a part of the whole. And the whole is the state and the living. Come back. Well, would I be a part of you? Would I stop being different? Would I not feel alone? I told you, you would be a part of the whole. And my father? There is no room for him. He will soon be a non-person. I have to stay with him to the end. Can't you wait a little? Or, or come back? No. You must make your decision now. I, I want to be with my own where I'm not a stranger. But I cannot leave my father now. He, he needs me too much. So be it. You have chosen your own destiny. We cast you out. The world you live in has no place for you. You have selected your own living death. I'm awake. In the inadequate bed as all beds are inadequate for my height. I'm in a cold sweat from the dream. Or was it a dream? Have I thrown away my future? Or is it all fantasy? I don't know what I might have expected to wake into the next day. But certainly not the miracle that happened. Dad was feeling very bad that morning. In a lot of pain. I had brought his breakfast tray downstairs, virtually untouched. I was on my way to the kitchen when the convertible drove on. And she got out. She had a cloud of dusty blonde hair and misty gray eyes. She had all the requisite physical charms and wonder of wonders. When she uncoiled herself from under the wheel and stood up, she was the first woman I had met in my stratosphere. Her eyes couldn't have been more than an inch below mine. She blew my mind in that one first look. But all she said was, Excuse me for busting in, Big Mo. We've met? No. I don't even know why I asked her. I couldn't have forgotten you. I've been wanting to meet you for a long time. What is it? Press? I think it's time for us to talk together. Why? I don't read. You mean what I think? Uh, Yes. You can't. Unless I want you to. I'm shielding. You're what? Shielding. Don't you do that? Well, I... I guess I don't know what you mean. Ah, now I see. I suspected, but I wasn't sure. You've never met any of us, have you? Us? The fugitives. The exorcised. The law. I don't quite understand. (laughs) Poor boy. You really are lost now. Must have been awful for you. Everybody and his uncle's thoughts rattling and jangling in your head, and you with no way of knowing how to shut them out. You are for real. You do know. I promise you I do. I'm lucky to have found you in time. In time for what? Before Calcour got to you and sold you a bill of goods. Calcour? The false ambassador of goodwill who would offer any of us anything within reason to return to Centauri Planet 7. Then he was here. He did come. What did you say to him? I turned him down. Why? Don't you want to go back? How could I go back to somewhere I never was? How did you get to Earth? I I don't quite know. Uh, My stepfather has told me there was an aircraft crash. The craft was burned to a cinder and buried in the wilderness, but, but he and Mom found me just a baby. And because they wanted a child and there seemed to be no one to claim me, they brought me up as their own. 
must have been very difficult for you, Mo. Oh, not really. There was so much love and so much happiness. The worst were the thoughts. For so long, when I was a kid, I didn't understand that I was so different. I thought everyone knew what everyone else was thinking. Why, it got me in a lot of trouble till I realized that I was the only one who did. But that would have been enough to set me apart, but by then, I'd started to grow. When does it stop? I mean, when do we... We're not all that peculiar, Mo. You might grow a few more inches, but that will be it. Well, how can you be so sure? I'll let you judge that for yourself. If you'll allow me to take you to the heartland. Well, I can't go anywhere with you. Uh, oh, what's your name? I'll unshield my mind and think of it so you may read it for yourself. Andaria. Is that all? In the world we came from, one name was enough. I wonder what mine would have been. It doesn't matter. If you come with me, you shall be anointed and given a new one if you want. I told you, I, I can't come with you. Why not? I can't leave my father. He's dying. Bring him with you. We will welcome him in. He, he can't be moved. And I cannot stay. I'm already overdue. And they're waiting for me. Who? My people. Our people. Oh, don't leave me, Andaria, please. I must. Walk me to the car. Where is the heartland? How do I find it? What is it? It's the valley where most of our people landed in the Great Migration. What migration? Hymenopters came. Came in swarms by the billion, swallowing most of us in clouds of poison gas and striking us down with death rays. We were a peaceful people, without weapons of war. And to save our civilization, we had to scatter all over the universe. Many of us landed here on Earth, our astral fuel exhausted. The bulk of them landed in the valley of the heartland. Before you go, you must tell me how to get there. I can't know. When you are ready to come, one of us will read the signal and come for you. Goodbye, Mo. Uh, hey, uh, well, wait a minute, Andaria! Andaria! my own car and followed her. But at that very minute, my father cried out for me. And I went and said to him, he was in pain and I gave him his medicine. He didn't wait until dinner. But afterwards, he perked up some and we talked long into the night. I know you, you've always been special, son. And we had no right to you. I hope you never get punished for whatever wrongs me and your mom did. You never wronged me. Either of you, Dad. You gave me all things that made it possible for me to live in this world. Love, understanding, the only inner peace I ever had. Why don't you stop agonizing over your height, Mo? There's lots of tall people today growing bigger all the time. You don't understand, Dad. I can't shut it out. I know what everyone is thinking. I can feel the hate and the jealousy and the resentment. All the things people try to choke down. But here on the farm, there's such peace. Or has been, except for you and... Oh, you won't have me to worry about much longer. Now, don't, don't feel sad. I'm going to join Ruth. Well, you worried me. What about this fellow, Cal Coor, who could take you back where you came from? Maybe you should go with him. And Daria says he's the enemy. Well, how do you know you can trust her? And you don't even know how to find the valley. But if that's where I belong, I'll find it. And wherever I am... Your mother and I, we'll pray that you do. I love you, son. Good night. It was the last word he said to me. He died peacefully that night. And now I was completely alone. A stranger. 
in an alien world. It was nearly dawn before I fell asleep. Or was I asleep or awake? And the air was full of their humming noise. And the voice called me out into the night. Moses. Moses. Who called me? It is Calcourt. I have relented and come to bring you home. But, but you are my enemy. And Daria told you that, but she lied. And she is not for you. She's already promised. To whom? To the fourth. Who is he? He is the one who succeeds the elder when his force is gone. Well, what is he? He is nothing. Only an empty title. Don't listen to him, Moses. He is the center of us. Our leader. The one Calcourt seeks to destroy. Leave him alone. Don't trust her. Don't trust him. Don't go with him, Moses. He will have no choice. We will take him. Seize him. Moses. The force has been lost ever since the migration. But the elder tells me it could be you. Don't let them take you. Resist. Drag him to the ship. Don't listen to the woman. Don't worry, Andaria. I'll fight. I won't lose you. By the God, he is the force. Come away from him. Come away. We have no weapons to stand against the force. Within 24 hours, Andari had come back for me. There was no sign of the Hymenopterus attack save a large burned area in a field near the house with the tall grass flattened as if by something spinning in a counterclockwise direction. And within a week, Andaria and I had sold the farm and were headed for the heartland. Your father was the force before you. He had long felt our planet was nearing the end of its useful life, and he had gone out to scout the galaxies for a better home for us. Somehow, he was lost and never came back. That's when the Hymenopsis dared to attack us. And you were promised to me. The day I was born. The same day as you. My father, the Elder, and your father, the Fourth, made a solemn promise. Supposing I hadn't turned out to be my father's son. Oh, don't ask me that. How could I have decided between honor and love? Fortunately, the decision never had to be made. I love you, Andaria. As I love you. And am proud of you. For you will lead us back to Alpha Centauri. No. I have no stomach for war or killing. If the valley, the heartland, is as peaceful as you say, let us stay there and build our own new world. The other is dying. But this one... Oh, Andaria. Once you teach me to live in it at peace, with a little imagination and a lot more determination, what a paradise we can make of it. Not a bad ambition. One we could all and should share. And perhaps, for all the agonies it can cause there might be a rebirth of hope if we could all read exactly what is in people's thoughts and what are their desires. Deep in the heart of everyone, surely, the main, the only desire is peace at last. I'll be back shortly. what one may think in the cold light of day, the night is the time when the horizons of the mind expand. Listen on a fall evening to the crickets, the birds, and a thousand rustlings of small hidden animal and insect life. A whole myriad of worlds within worlds. 
Then look up to the stars and the infinity of our universe. You know that somewhere out in the stars, there must be other life. Has got to be. I wonder if it will cross our paths in this century. Our cast included John Deal, Joan Shea, John Lithgow, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. 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 Of Hyman. without a country or nationality. Wanderers, nomads. In other words, gypsies. The gypsy has been the most hated and the most loved. To protect himself, it is said, he is also the most untruthful. Incorrigible, beguiling, living by his own code, gypsies first. You don't think... Someone could have deliberately poisoned Margaret. Well, it's possible. But how or why, I don't yet see. Of course, there's another possibility. If we find she was poisoned, it could have been an accident. An accident? How? The poison might have been intended for someone else. Do you mean... for me? mystery drama, The Romany Revenge, adapted from the classic story by T.L. Meter, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate, Jr., and stars Earl Hammond and Court Benson. be the root of all evil, but from it certainly can stem jealousy, vindictiveness, bitter resentment, and even hatred. And if you've been around mystery theater as long as I have, you know that this kind of enmity can easily begin at the reading of a will. In all the annals of bequests made to the living by the deceased, there has hardly been one instance where the inheritors all came out smiling. I think we have waited long enough for Clifford Milburn and Jose Silva. They were notified that the will of the late Mr. Milburn would be read at noon today. So I suggest we proceed. <coughs> I, Jason Milburn, of sound mind and body, hereby made the following disposition of my estate. The approximate present value being two million pounds. I direct that the income from this estate be divided into four equal parts between my two nieces, Beatrice and Margaret, my nephew Clifford, and my faithful right-hand man, Jose Silva. In the event of the death of any of these four inheritors, the entire principal shall go to the survivors. your pardon. Do you happen to have a match? Match? Oh, yes, certainly. <laughs> You'd better shield it well to light that pipe. There's quite a stiff breeze coming across the deck. <laughs> oh, thank you. <clears throat> Excuse me, but haven't we met before? No, I don't believe so. Yes, yes, yes. Aren't you a Dwight Mason? Why, yes, I am. William Harrow. Don't you know me? Weymouth School. Bill. Bill Harrow. Well, it's been, oh, no, don't tell me, 20 years? Yes, just about. We were both, what, uh, uh, 14 when we graduated. <laughs> what do you do here on a ship from Rio to Southampton? Oh, uh, well, uh, my wife's uncle died, and we went to Rio for a couple of weeks for the reading of the will. Uh, now we're going home. And you? Well, uh, 
I'm with the London Police Special Investigations. I've always wanted to go to Brazil, and as luck would have it, I was assigned on the diamond smuggling case. Oh, wait till I tell Beatrice an old school friend turned out to be a detective. <laughs> oh, you've got to meet her, Dwight. Oh, happy to. Now you know about me, uh, what have you been up to? Uh, well, uh, I sell insurance. Uh, we live in London. Oh, that must be a good business. Uh, you know, Beatrice really got quite an inheritance. Oh, well, at least I uh, hope she will. <laughs> Meaning? Uh, there are four beneficiaries. Uh, two didn't show up. Uh, Beatrice's brother, Clifford, and a man called uh, Jose Silva. That's her uncle's right-hand man. I see. Uh, who was the fourth beneficiary? Oh, uh, Beatrice's sister, Margaret. <laughs> well, she's on board, too. <laughs> she's older. Ah, you'll have to meet Aunt White. She never married. Willie Harrow. <laughs> Are you playing matchmaker? Willie Harrow. Hmm. Owen's no called me. That's in school. <laughs> oh, uh, uh, here comes a lady I do not want to talk to. The world's worst chatterbox. Oh, darling, I've been looking all over the ship for you, Mr. Harrow. Oh, what an exquisite day to be on the sea. Oh, <laughs> yes. Uh, uh, Madame Magda, uh, this is an old friend, Dwight Mason. Oh, madam. <laughs> uh, Madame Magda is a very famous beautician in London. Oh, <laughs> are you a friend of this man with such a beautiful wife and sister-in-law? Isn't this the most glorious day? The sea, the sky, not a cloud. I'm how is Beatrice this morning, Mr. Harrow? And your young, poor sister-in-law with that terrible toothache? Is it better than it was in the Rio? Uh, I should explain to you, Dwight, that by happy coincidence, uh, Madame Magda was staying at the same hotel as Margaret and Beatrice and I in Rio. Oh, right. And uh, yes, Well, one day Margaret had this awful toothache. And of course, you can imagine, Mr. Dwight. Uh, Mason. Uh, Mason, being in a foreign country with no knowledge of doctors, who to see and so forth. I know Rio. It is my second home. So I took Margaret to a famous dentist I know. I know all the best doctors, Rio, London, Paris, everywhere, darling. Yes. So she is all right again, Mr. Harrow? Ah, uh, yes, yes, she seems to be. <laughs> that is wonderful. Superb. Good news. I just came to find out. Oh, you should walk, you two gentlemen, not stand there talking, talking, smoking your pipe. Yes. Au revoir. Adios. Ta ta. Yes. Have a beautiful, healthy day. Yes. Phew. Ah, to see what I mean. Mm -hmm. The woman's impossible. And the unfortunate part of it is that both my wife and sister-in-law were so captivated by her in Rio. Really? <laughs> I know they can't wait to go to Madame Magda's beauty salon in Bond Street as soon as we get home. Hmm. Bad luck, eh? For three days, bright sun, calm seas, and now this fog and rough weather. I hadn't counted on this. Lounge is tilting so badly, we can't keep the chessmen on the board. <laughs> I'm afraid to put my whiskey glass on the table. Yes, and we're deprived of the company of our two lovely ladies. They've both been under the weather since dinner last no. night. Well, I hope this fog won't delay our return. Nah, you police are all alike. You're workaholics. <laughs> Well, I admit to that. Funny, your sister-in-law, Margaret, was saying the same thing to me. But it's the only way of life I know, Bill. Investigating crime isn't a part-time job. It can't be done, so long as there are full-time criminals. Which one of you gentlemen is oh. Mr. William Harrow? Oh, well, I am. I'm Dr. Grace, ship's doctor. Will you be good enough to come with me, sir? But is it my wife? Is something wrong? Please, come with me. Uh, uh, Dwight, I, I want you to come along, too. No, no. Just yourself, Mr. Harrow. Okay. I think you better. If there is something wrong, uh, Mr. Mason is a special investigator with the London police. The police? Oh, yes. That might be a very good idea. Sit down, gentlemen. I, I do not wish to sit down. Now, now, what is the matter, Doctor? Where is my wife? Is she here? She's perfectly all right. She's in her cabin. I... Gave her a sedative, and the nurse is sitting with her. The nurse? Well, what is it? An hour ago, I was called to go to your cabin. Your sister was violently ill. I had her brought here immediately to the ship's hospital. She swallowed something. What, we don't know. Sir. I had her stomach pumped. We did what we could, but whatever it was, it was so virulent and powerful, we, we couldn't save her. What? 
Miss Graham, your sister-in-law, Margaret, is dead, Mr. Harrow. <laughs> Beatrice, Beatrice, darling, you must try and get hold of yourself. It's two days now that Margaret's been gone, and what good does it do to keep crying like that? We all loved her very much. Oh, please, sweetheart. I'm all right, Nora. I'm sorry. Uh, Dwight here, he, he promises he's going to get to the bottom of this. I shall do everything I can when the boat docks, Mrs. Harrow. It's all so unbelievable. The ship's doctor says she must have swallowed something to kill her. But Margaret hasn't eaten anything different from me. Even back in Rio at the hotel, we always ate the same thing. Um, was your sister on any medication? That's just it. That's what's so incredible. Margaret hated medicine, any pill or chemical. She was adamant about that, always was. She'd be darned if she'd even taken aspirin. Uh, do you suppose, Dwight, someone could have given her poison in a glass of wine or a cup of coffee or tea? Well, of course you can't rule that out, but... What would be the motive? I got permission from the captain to interview anyone who came into contact with Margaret in any way. The stewardesses, the, the purser, the deck steward, the cooks, both our waiters. I've questioned them all at length. And I can't say that the slightest suspicion points to any of them. I will know more when we examine and analyze in our laboratory. Run it through all known tests, which even on a ship this size, they are not equipped to do. So you're ruling out someone on this ship's poisoning her? Well, I just can't say how or why as yet. Of course, there is another possibility. It may have been an accident. The poison may have been intended for someone else. Do you mean someone wanted to kill Beatrice or me? <laughs> Come in, come in. Ah, oh, Dwight, I'm glad you're up and dressed. Yes, I, I was just coming down to breakfast. How's Beatrice this morning? Uh, uh, much better, much better. Uh, the purser just came by our cabin. He tells me there'll be a radio phone call coming for me from Rio in about an hour. Uh, would you mind coming along with oh, me? Of course I will. Shipped ashore from Rio? Yes, it could only be from Luis Ortega, uh, the lawyer who's handling this state. Why only from him? Well, we don't know anyone else in Rio. <laughs> Uh, yes, it's me, Mr. Ortega. Uh, can you hear me? I can hear you quite well. It's <laughs> good. Uh, we can both hear each other. Uh, what's happened? Uh, tell me first, Mr. Harrow. How soon does your ship arrive in Southampton? Uh, the day after tomorrow. Why do you ask? I'm uh, trying to determine how essential it would be for you to return to Rio. Did you say return to Rio? Whatever for? It concerns your wife's brother, Clifford. Oh, yes, Clifford. Oh, well, that's good news. That'll facilitate probating the will. Uh, that's true. Uh, however, the unhappy news is that he is dead. Did you say he was dead? Uh, he was found this morning murdered. That is why it occurred to me you might like to return to Rio. Uh, and just, just a moment, Mr. Ortega. Uh, Dwight, yes. they found Beatrice's brother Clifford. He's been murdered. What, what should I do? Here, give me that telephone. What's the name of your lawyer? Uh, Louis Ortega. Uh, uh, Mr. Ortega, this is Dwight Mason of the London Police. Will you tell the Rio Police Chief, George Santos, to cable me all information about the gentleman's death? Mr. Santos and I just worked on a case together. Perhaps I can help. Uh, Mr. Mason, I shall do just that. Uh, we'll be in touch from London. Goodbye. I will speak to Mr. Santos. Goodbye. Clifford murdered. I, I, I can't believe it. Well, that could answer one of the questions regarding your sister-in-law, Margaret. I don't understand. I may still not know how she was killed, but I can now make a fair deduction as to why. You can? Of the four people about to inherit a two million pound estate, two die mysteriously. <laughs> You don't have to be a professional detective, Bill, to understand why. No, you don't have to be a professional detective to solve crimes, but it sure helps. What do we have so far? 
a $2 million estate, four inheritors who has suddenly dwindled to two, a husband, a detective, and a lady in the beauty business. To say nothing of the most important elements of any crime in our theater of mystery, two murders by a person or persons unknown, and by methods as yet undiscovered. I shall return shortly with Act Two. Plautus, the ancient Roman dramatist who inspired even Shakespeare, once said, I hate gold. It has persuaded too many men in too many matters to do evil. And evil it is, surely, to kill for money. And evil it is that our London detective Dwight Mason is tracking down with all the scientific resources the police can command. And to what does the trail lead? A dead end. We took samples of your late sister-in-law's blood, ran it through every known toxology test, checked it against every known poison. It could not be identified. How strange. No, not really. There are hundreds, probably thousands of unknown poisons, some derived from as innocuous a substance as the leaf of a rhubarb or the berry of a mistletoe. Well, what do we do now? Well, we'll wait and see. I expect some details as to how your brother-in-law was killed in Rio. Once we know that, we may be in a position to forge a link. How's Beatrice, your wife? Oh, well, as well as can be expected, I suppose. Uh, this is the first day she's gone out for the afternoon on a little shopping spree. Now, everything is further complicated by her brother's death. What did you tell her? Well, I said I didn't know very much, really. I, I skirted around the cause of his death because, in truth, I don't know. I implied it must have been an accident. A car, maybe, or, or something could have happened to Clifford while he was in swimming. You know, he loved swimming, you know. I certainly didn't say anything about a murder. Mm. Oh, I'd better get that. Uh, Beatrice may have forgotten her key and can't get in. Well, I shall be going now. I'll be in touch the moment I have more news. Uh, shall I call you a cab? Oh, no, no. No, there's a police car waiting outside for me. Oh, good. I'll see you to the door, then. Oh, Mr. Haro. How are you? I've been so worried. And Mr. Dwight. Uh, Mason. Oh, Mason, yes. Forgive me. The both of you again... I simply must talk to you. May I come in? Oh, well, we were just going out, Madam Magda. All the better. May I persuade you to come to my shop on Bond Street? You said you would visit me. I remember distinctly. You said you would bring your adorable Beatrice just as soon as you could. Well, my, my wife hasn't felt much like going out. Of course, darling. May I come in and have a little chat with her? Uh, uh, but uh, she is out right now. Up and about. That's the only way. <laughs> Do you have a moment to stop by and visit me in Bond Street later this afternoon, perhaps? Well, I, I don't know. I, I mean, I'm, I'm not likely to want facial to massage. Oh, but... darling, you never know. My salon is very scientific. The most modern of treatments, as well as my own secret secrets. Oh, let me just peek in the front door of your charming house. Bill, may I speak to you a moment? No, Bill. Go there. No, I have a hunch. Ah, uh, um, uh, Madam Magda, I shall accept your invitation. Uh, where on Bond Street are you? Oh, number 193. I've got to go, Bill. See you soon. Goodbye. Is your Dwight Mason a policeman? Oh, uh, yes. Yes, in my tell you. Oh, I cannot believe it. He is so nice. <laughs> Investigations Department, Mason here. Ortega, Mr. Mason, from Rio. Uh, hello there. Any news about Clifford Milburn's death? That's why I call you. I asked uh, Police Chief Santos to cable you, but he's going to write. <coughs> For me, I couldn't wait since all uh, this affects the will of Jason Milburn. Uh, hold on, Mr. Ortega. I'll have my assistant take all this down. Mansfield, pick up extension two, will you? All right, go ahead, Mr. Ortega. Uh, Mr. Clifford's body was found in a funeral pyre, burned to death. He had been shot in the head. Shot, funeral pyre, burned to death. You got that, Mansfield? Ortega, any clues so far? A piece of wood with a pointed end near the body. 
It had uh, Mr. Clifford's hat on it. Uh, carved into this stake was four words. Wooden stake, four words, yes? And the words are por la puri dai. For the puri dai, whatever that means. And no other clues? No, absolutely nothing. The bullet is being examined. Mr. Mason, will you tell Mrs. Harrow and her sister that I am taking care of their brother's remains and there will be services here in Rio? Yes. Uh, Mr. Ortega, I have sad news here, too. Margaret Milburn has also died mysteriously. She was stricken on the ship going back to Southampton. This is very serious. Yes, I know. Now there are only two people left to inherit the estate. Mrs. Harrow, who is here in London, and Mr. Silva, whom I presume is still in Rio. If I were you, I should warn him to be very careful. And don't be confused, darling Mr. Harrow, by all the rows of bottles and ointments in this room. Each has its own magic. <laughs> well, your, your whole place was most impressive. Uh -huh. I have seen it clients. Never on Mondays, unless I have special personal clients. Now, through this door, in here, we give the facials. Nothing but facials. Now, don't you believe your little Beatrice will be happy here? Well, I suppose so. She wants to. <laughs> what woman does not? <laughs> now, the gesture is installed. This door opens to our private lift, which takes us up to the roof. Uh, this is one of the best kept secrets of my salon. If you came any day but today, there will be so much traffic on this tiny lift. Oh, I have seen clients waiting in line to be taken to the roof. Ah, here we are. Magda's own roof garden. Over your head, a little piece of English sky. And all around, for privacy, I have put trees. Now, do you believe you're in the middle of London? <laughs> it's, it's amazing. It's like a piece of country. You, you can scarcely make out the roof next door. Because the hemlocks are hiding. You see, the lift is hidden in a big rock. And everywhere on the ground, flowers growing. My clients can relax here and no one can see them. <laughs> Magda, you have a great deal of imagination. That is why people come to me. Mr. Harrow, we were fortunate to have met one another in Rio. I was most taken also by your sister-in-law. And I'm glad I was able to help her get rid of that nasty toothache. How she would have loved it here. Yes, yes, I think she would have. A tragedy. A great tragedy. Oh, I don't answer. Someone picks up. Uh, but I, I thought there wasn't anyone here on Mondays. No beauticians, no mercedes, no one at the cash register, but I have a man. Uh, now, now you have seen it all. I invite you to come along as well as your wife and bring that charming policeman. Well, I have to know. He's really very busy. Oh, I have no doubt. Was he seeing you on official business? Well, uh, you might say so. Oh, do tell me. I adore mysteries and crimes. I simply worship criminals. Oh, yes, Raoul. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Harrow, but I am wanted outside. I should be right back. It was nothing. But Raoul knows very little about this business. He's just a caretaker, so how would he know nothing from something? Uh, 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 Madam Magda, I, uh... <clears throat> I have seen Raoul before. You have? Oh, yes, 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 yes. I'm very good at remembering people. Oh, where have you seen my handyman? On the street? Three weeks ago, in Rio. In Rio? Oh, my dear Mr. Harrow, Raoul has never left London. He was born here. His parents, maybe, they come from South America. Has he been with you for a long time? Well, I think so. We have so much help, you know. London, people come, people go, always dissatisfied. No, 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 I am certain I saw this Raoul in Rio. Uh, do, do you remember when Margaret had had that bad toothache and you were kind enough to bring them to a dentist? It was Raoul who opened the door. Oh, oh, you are a funny man, darling. Everybody knows all tall and dark Brazilians look alike. Oh, Raoul, 
I'll answer it. Hello, Madam Margaret speaking. Uh, is Bill Harrow there? Oh, just a moment. It's for you. Oh, really? Oh, who knew I was here? Hello? Bill? Oh, Dwight, what's up? Uh, Bill, stay with Madam Magda. Don't let her out of your sight. Uh, she just this minute walked out of the room. Well, stay right where you are. I'm coming over. You're coming over here? Oh, oh, here she is, Dwight. I should just come back into the room. Oh. Did you want to talk to her? No, keep oh. her there. Don't let her leave. It's official. Oh, official, eh? Well, oh. Hey, she's just keeled over. She's on the floor. What? Madam, Madam Magda, what is it? Oh, Lord, she's fainted. Did you reach your house, Bill? Yes, finally. Uh, Beatrice had just gotten back from shopping. Uh, she'd lost track of the time. I, I told her we were at the hospital in one of the private consulting rooms and all about Madame Magda fainting, and I'd be home as soon as I could. Uh, what did you find out? She's been poisoned. An extremely fast-acting toxicant. What? Well, doesn't that beat all? How is she now? She's doing all right. I was told there wasn't enough in her system to be injurious. Well, then if she's all right, I, I, I'd really like to get home. I, I've got to keep watch over Beatrice. You understand. Are you quite sure, Bill, that Madame Magda never left your side? Well, she went out only the one time just when you called. The caretaker called her out of the room. You know, hmm. it's a funny thing, too. I told her he was the spitting image of a man I saw in Rio. Bill, I don't want you to misconstrue what I'm going to say, but will you promise me not to leave London for the present? I, uh, I don't understand you. Do you think we're in some danger of Beatrice? Well, it's possible. A great part of a detective's work is following up on hunches. And what are hunches? The average of your experience. I have a hunch what this poison might turn out to be. So I'm asking you, Bill, in a nice way, until all the evidence is in, I'd like you to be where I can check some answers if I need to. It could be, when you think about it, who might gain the most upon the deaths of all those entitled to that two million pounds? William Harrow, insurance salesman? Could he have somehow tried to poison Madame Magda? But why? Or was she trying to do away with herself? Again, why? Not an easy case to solve, but intriguing. I'll be returning shortly with Act Three. joke about how does a gypsy cook a chicken. And the recipe begins with, steal one chicken. But that's not the whole truth. Gypsies do have their own ethical code. A Serbian gypsy commits a felony if he steals from someone poorer than himself. If an English gypsy takes something he doesn't need, that is a crime. Why am I talking about gypsies and this tale of death and poisoning anyway? You know me well enough by now to know I kid you not. There must be a reason. Am I tipping you off to a solution? Back now to the hospital. Bill, I am not singling you out for suspicion, believe me. I've just had word from Rio that when they found your wife's brother, he'd been dead for a month. Yes, I see. And I was in Rio at that time. Well, not only you, so were Beatrice and Margaret. More and more, it appears that someone is deliberately narrowing down the number of survivors. Have you ever met this Jose Silva? No, no, never. I'd only just married Beatrice, and a month later we got word her uncle had died, and could we come to Rio? So we used the trip as a kind of a delayed honeymoon. We never met the uncle or his so-called right-hand man, this Jose Silva. He wasn't there when the will was read. Hmm. What are the words puri die mean to you? Well, not a darn thing. Puri what? Die. Oh, what does it mean? Well, I'm trying to find out. One more thing, Bill. You said you recognized a man working for Madame Magda. A man she called Raoul? I've been thinking about that. You know, this Raoul has a scar on his right cheek. 
Oh, he is the same man who opened the door for Margaret and Beatrice that day in Rio when Margaret had her tooth treated. Oh, I am sure of it. Hmm. Now, Bill, don't take my questions unkindly. You run along home to Beatrice, and I'll go and see if Madame Magda is well enough to answer a few questions. Madame Magda, may I come in? Why, that charming policeman, Mr. Mason. Please do come in. Yes. Well, the doctor said you were awake and able to talk. Able to talk? I am always able to talk, darling. Uh, Tell me, what happened to me? Well, that's what I was going to ask you. Well, I felt dizzy, and the next thing I know, I am in the hospital. What is going on? You may have been poisoned. You are joking. Who would poison Madame Magda? I have not an enemy in the world. Madame, what were you doing in Rio? Oh, enjoying the sunshine. You went halfway round the world for sunshine? I would go all the way around the world for sunshine if I had to. This poison which you say brought me here. Could it have killed me? I don't know yet. Generally, any poison can cause death if you take enough of it. But why? How? When? Mr. Mason, I do not know. I uh, beg your pardon. Are you Dwight Mason? Yes. Are you Luis Sortega? <laughs> yes, yes. Well, it's good to see you. I'm glad you were able to fly over from Rio at such short notice. Uh, do you have any luggage? Uh, just one bag. Well, then we're standing in the right place. The bags come around that carousel when the plane is... Unloaded. Uh, I bring you regards from the Rio chief of police, George Santos. Oh. Unfortunately, the only new information he has is that Clifford Milburn died on the 14th of last month. I see. Uh, was there anything special about that death? No, no, nothing. A clear day, a clear night, and a full moon. I told you on the telephone, didn't I, about this Madame Magda who was taken to the hospital? Yes, you did. We learned this morning she had ingested the identical toxic alkaloid that killed Margaret Milburn. Fortunately, a very small dose. Uh, was there anyone with this Magda woman when she was poisoned? Yes. Beatrice's husband, William Harrow. They were, unfortunately, alone when this occurred. Uh -huh. Unfortunate for him. Ah, yeah, I see my handbag. It's the one with the big O painted on the side. Right, you grab your bag and I'll grab a taxi. I usually take the police car, but I thought in this case it would be better if I met you at the airport unobserved. Mr. Ortega, I need your help. And that's why I asked you to come to London. What can you tell me about old Jason Milburn? Uh, he was not loved. He made his fortune out of diamonds, and his estate consists of several mines outside of Rio. You see? Some say he stole the land. Some say he lived too long. Did he deserve to die? Some say he didn't die soon enough. Hmm? My goodness. A popular man in Brazil. <laughs> it's like the plague. This was a silver who I haven't seen, by the way, since the funeral. It was not only Milburn's right-hand man, but his bodyguard. Oh, well, what do you mean, he, he stole his land? Uh, well, Milburn was ruthless. An ancient gypsy family lived on that land where the mines are now. Oh, practically since the time of Amerigo Vespucci. It was granted to one gypsy family in particular uh, by John III of Portugal. So they claim. It was quite a scandal when the authorities made a little search. The page containing the original land grant deed had been torn from the ledger. The gypsies had no legal recourse whatsoever. Jason Milburn picked up the land for next to nothing. Ah, we're here. Uh, I'm putting you up at my place, Mr. Ortega. This is just around the corner from headquarters. We'll have lunch and then go over. Mr. Mason, it's all coming together. Do you remember those words carved on the stake near Clifford Milburn's body? Uh, por la puridai. Look at this. Puridai is their name for the matriarch of the tribe. So, it meant his death was done for the tribal mother. 
Let's pay Mr. and Mrs. William Harrow a social call. Good afternoon, Bill. I brought along someone you know. Mr. Ortega, what are you doing in London? Uh, because of the survivorship, I had to come for your wife's signature. Well, uh, please come in, Dwight. Uh, uh, please. Beatrice is out right now. Uh, we can go into the living room. Uh, how is she taking it, Mr. Harrow? Very hard. Her sister and brother within a month. <laughs> She's, uh, she started going to Madame Magda's salon. What time did Beatrice go out, Bill? Oh, several hours ago. She had this tooth bothering her, and I said, well, we'll go to the dentist. But Beatrice is so like Margaret when it comes to doctors and medicine. She just won't do it. She'd rather suffer. Beatrice? Beatrice, is that you? Yes, it's me. Why, Mr. Ortega, this is nice. Would you like some tea? And Mr. Mason, it's old home week. Yes, I've already offered some whiskey. Uh... How are you feeling now, sweetheart? How's the truth? Oh, you'll never believe this, but it's all right. It's fine. But I hope it doesn't act up again. You know, I wish you'd I go... know, darling, I should go to a dentist. I've done something better. I suddenly remembered that when we were in Rio and Madame Magda took Margaret and me to this marvelous dentist, well, there I was at her shop taking a facial. So I asked her and she said, who do you think is visiting me upstairs? The dentist from Rio. So he looked at my tooth. Gave me something to kill the pain. Poked about in there. And the rest of the afternoon was sheer pleasure. I must say, meeting Madame Magda was one of the luckiest things that ever happened to me. Is uh, this your hunch or a long shot, Mr. Mason? A little of both. But I feel a certain lady may be the answer to the mystery. Yes, you could be. But why in this house on Bond Street, creeping up these stairs? Because this house is right next door to her salon. And this roof touches her roof. So we made an arrangement with the superintendent. Ah, yes, of course. Why didn't I think of that? Now, help me push open the skylight, will you? Uh, uh, I, uh, I have never been... On a London roof before. <laughs> listen, listen to that peculiar music. Where is it coming from? Over there. You mean behind those trees? Yes. That's Madame Magda's famous roof garden. Let's walk to the edge of this roof and take a look through those trees. As with this full moon, that shouldn't be difficult. Uh, have a look at that. Yes, yes. I see two figures. Those, those movements to the music. I have seen that before. In the mountains of Brazil. It's a ritualistic gypsy dance. Worship of the full moon. Their backs are to us. A man and a woman. Who is there? There's someone behind the trees. It's Jose Silva and Madame Magda. Come out from behind the trees, whoever you are. I see you on the next door roof. Slowly, with your hands up. Jose Silva, I don't understand. Why, Mr. Mason, why are you spying on me from the roof next door? I have invited you so many times. What are you doing here? I might ask you the same question. Raoul, I know this man. Put your gun away. No guns. We are having a private celebration, Mr. Mason. Raoul, since when is that your name? Throw your pistol down, Raoul. I'm a police officer. No! Come back here, you! you explain to me, please, what I am doing here in your police headquarters? Madam Magda, I'm detaining you on suspicion of the murder of Margaret Milburn. What are you talking about? Me? Murder? Don't be ridiculous. Where did Jose Silva go? You mean after he made the lift take him downstairs? <laughs> I have no idea. Madam, are you the puri die of a gypsy tribe? No. No. 
Who has told you that? Facts have told us that, madam. Was it not your land belonging to your family that was stolen by Jonas Milburn? Yes. It was always our land. Milburn, the thief. Nor will his family have it either. Not one inch of it. But how can you prove it belonged to your family? Prove it? <laughs> our family goes back centuries. But why would you care? We are always on the run, always being chased. But what is ours is ours and will never belong to anyone else. Madam Magda, the man you call Raoul, I promise you he won't get far. Sooner or later we'll bring him in. Who is he? My brother. He has done nothing I'm ashamed of. Yes, I call him Raoul because that is his real name. You, Mr. Ortega, you call him Jose Silva. That is what he called himself to keep watching our enemy, Jason Milburn. You will never prove I had anything to do with the death of Margaret Milborn. Yes, I did wish them dead, all of them. But Madame Magda raises no hands in violence against anyone. And on your roof in the moonlight, what were you and your brother celebrating? Who said we were celebrating anything? You did, Madame. Perhaps we were. Yes, why not? I admit it. We were celebrating... At long last, justice. What is it? Who is it? Bill, it's I, Dwight. Open up. It's urgent. Whatever brings you here at this hour of the night? It, it, it must be after two. Where's your wife? She's in bed, I suppose. I'll fetch her immediately. This is Dr. Howard with me, the police surgeon. Hurry, Bill. Bring Beatrice downstairs. <laughs> hurt so much now. I think I'm more stunned than in pain. I must say, having a tooth pulled in the living room of one's own house at three o'clock in the morning by a police surgeon is quite an experience. In that filling Dr. Howard removed from your mouth, I wouldn't be at all surprised if we didn't find the same poison that caused the death of your sister. She, too, had a filling made by that same so-called Brazilian dentist in Rio that took care of you not 12 hours ago. A filling? Poisonous? Yes. And covered with gutta perca, which wears away when you eat. Who knows when this poison would have been released into your mouth, Beatrice? But why? It doesn't make sense. Didn't you tell me the same poison was swallowed by Madame Magda? Ah, she's a clever one. Yes, she did take some. But only enough to land her in the hospital. But, but why? To throw us off the trail. Well, when did you decide that she was the mastermind? At midnight tonight. Luis Ortega took one look at this Raul on her roof garden and said, That is Jose Silva. And then I knew. Silva was to be the sole survivor, the sole inheritor. The poison had been placed into your wife's tooth. It was only a question of time... And so they were celebrating in their gypsy ritual the final and total revenge against Jason Milburn. And all because gypsies have been cheated and slaved and even put to death over the centuries just because they were gypsies. In this case, though, unfortunate that Madame Magda and her brother had to find justice by using the same unjust means used for so long... Against them. The great Miguel de Cervantes has written, Having learned early to suffer, we gypsies suffer not at all. The cruelest torment does not make us tremble. We shrink from no form of death. But our oppressors should beware, for one day there shall be a Romany revenge. I shall return shortly. How empty is revenge. What a pyrrhic victory. Despotic Nero, with his dying breath, has said, How foolish it is to be avenged on your neighbor by setting his house on fire.
surely the noblest and most telling revenge of all is to turn the other cheek and forgive. Our cast included Court Benson, Earl Hammond, and Bryna Rayburn. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. 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 Today, an account of an unusual method of solving crime, the psychic method. What it is and what it isn't, you'll soon find out. Crime has been in our history since the beginning of recorded time. Adam and Eve broke the law of the Garden of Eden, and not many pages later, Cain slew Abel. One might say the first psychic manifestation of a murder is in the Bible where it is written, And the Lord said, What have you done? The voice of your brother's blood is crying to me from the ground. I need a magician who knows how to make his own disappearing act. Not interested. Fifty thousand dollars interest you? No. A hundred thousand? Perhaps. What's the scam? The carnival necklace. I need one of your magic tricks to make it disappear. Why, you cheap chiseler, those diamonds are worth two million. Our mystery drama, The Devil's Bargain, adapted from a story by Guy Boothy, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate Jr. and stars Robert Dryden. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Sign Off, the sinus medicines. I'll be back shortly with Act One. He had solved them all. The disappearance of the Mona Lisa from the Louvre, the Fort Knox hijacking, a million in gold bars that never reached their destination, the theft of the historic crown jewels in the Tower of London. In each case, Otto Glazer undertook the task of finding the stolen valuables. And in each case, through much heralded psychic means, he eventually led the police to their reward. His fees were astronomically high, but since what he regained was priceless, no individual, insurance company, or nation felt defrauded. Let Otto Glazer speak for himself. So much had been said and written about my supernormal powers, some of it exaggerated, some true, that perhaps I'd become complacent, careless. And as a result, the way this case ended was quite a shock to me. It began at Heathrow Airport, London, on the Monday morning when a distinguished son of the British nobility came to meet a no less distinguished son of the Arab nobility. Sheikh Maraki, welcome to England. Oh, Lord Carnovan, to what do I owe the pleasure of your company? I'm merely returning your hospitality when I came to Tehran last spring for the OPEC conference. To mingle friendships far is mingling bloods. Uh, as your immortal Englishman, William Shakespeare, has said. Now I remember. You're still at it, quoting the bard. Practically every time we talked in Tehran. Well, even in my country, we recognize his poetic supremacy, Lord Carnival. I uh, suppose you find our new airport quite a change from what it used to be. Oh, yes, yes. So many billboards advertising products I am unfamiliar with. And uh, here, for instance, along this wall... Uh, what is Otto Glazer? No problem too small. <laughs> That's quite a story. <laughs> is he a doctor, lawyer, or mind reader? You've come very close, Sheikh Maraki. This Glazer chap is rather a combination of all three. Well, shall we go? He certainly believes in advertising. Oh, please, do lead the way. My car is just outside these doors. Uh, allow me to escort you to your new home. Mm-hmm. 
But another five minutes and we'll be there. I meant to ask you, Sheikh Maraki, how did you happen to find a house to rent in such an excellent neighborhood? I had an agent here. I understand the house had been vacant for some time. I have wanted to live in London since I was at school at Oxford. Oh, we are turning into your street. I shouldn't look out of your window. Why not? Oh, dear me, no. A whole line of those dreadful posters advertising this glazer person. Oh, you were going to tell me who he was? Otto Glazer is probably the most prominent psychic detective in the world. He can find almost any stolen object that baffles the police. He's had amazing success. Better than your Scotland Yard? I've never known Glazer to fail. He says he's an authentic psychic. You come to his house, he listens to you behind a screen, and he'll tell you how to go about finding what's stolen. Why behind the screen? Oh, very few have ever seen him or know what he looks like. He's a master at changing his voice and disguising his entire appearance. Ah, this is it, Sheikh Maraki. Oh, Allah be praised. There is one of those posters on the front door next to mine. I regret it, but this Otto Glazer just happens to be your next door neighbor. Welcome home, Otto. Oh, I love you in the shake's outfit. You look marvelous. I've got a splitting headache. It's this darn headdress the Arabs wear. Oh, what a trip. Let me hear how you sound as an Arab. All right, like this. I am Sheikh Maraki. Pleased to make your acquaintance. Oh, wonderful, Arthur. Uh, you sound just like you look. I think I prefer you as an Arab Sheikh. Oh, so the trip was horrible. Unbelievable. The flight was late. Then I had to hide in the lavatory at the airport and change into this Sheikh's outfit. Then flying back to London with this tight headpiece. It better be worth it. But you wore an Arab headdress during the OPEC conference last spring. I detested that costume then also. But when one pretends to be a potentate to lay a trap for an Englishman, one can't be choosy about the bait. <laughs> Ancient Arab proverb. Now, Marisa, help me get out of this tent. It's 20 to 12, and if I don't hurry, my clients will become impatient. <laughs> Sheikh Maraki and I, Otto Glazer, are one and the same. Now, Marissa, you should know, was no ordinary assistant, but the daughter of the great Marvello, that extraordinary magician and escape artist who had little run-in with the law from which I rescued him. When Marvello retired comfortably, out of gratitude, Marissa became my assistant. Uh, quite a clever and dedicated young lady. In three minutes and thirty seconds, I had changed to my tweeds, a distinguished false moustache and matching grey wig. Come along there, Marisa. Open the wardrobe door. Well, go on, go on. The key keeps turning, but doesn't catch. Well, are you sure you have the right key? Of course I'm sure. This is the key for the wardrobe that we always use. It just doesn't this whole operation breaks apart because I can't get through this secret door to the adjoining house. I can't believe it. Well, I am trying. I have your father build me this wardrobe right up against the wall in a matching wardrobe in the adjoining house on the same floor against the same wall. It's supposed to be foolproof so I can get from one house to the other with nobody knowing. No need to get nasty, Otto. Here. Do you want to try the key? Now, look, I have clients waiting on the other side of this wall. Wait. Wait, wait, wait I've got it. Oh, there oh. you see. All you need is a little patience. I've opened it. Well, you'd better get your father on the phone and find out why I can't rely on his lock. In two hours, I'll have seen all my 15-minute cheapy clients, and I'll want to get back here through this hidden door. What if I can't open it from the other side? Well, then why not walk out of Otto Glazer's front door, make a short flight, and go into the front door of this house? They're both yours. Well, I know that, and you know that, but I don't want anyone else in London to know that. Oh, please, Marissa, don't be so dense. You tell your dad the lock sticks or doesn't catch or whatever, and I want it fixed. Oh, what a 
what an exquisite dining room, Lady Carnarvon. An authentic Georgian of the period, as a matter of fact. But I simply can't begin to tell you how pleased we are you joined us for dinner on your first night in London, Sheik Maraki. Ah, I was equally pleased to find your husband at the airport this morning. Oh, he's done nothing but talk about you since he came home from Tehran in April. I'm going to ring for the soup, and then I want you to tell me quite confidentially, do you think the price of oil is going to go up again this year? You may serve, Eustace. Uh, will oil go up in price? Oh, Lady Carnovan, surely it does not affect people of your station? Well, not really. Uh, Hubert tells me that you went to Oxford. All my family have been educated abroad. Oxford is where I developed my taste in Indian art. You too? Oh, then you simply must go to the Victoria and Albert Museum to see the Gosport paintings. I know them quite well. I must show the chic our jewel box. I suppose you have heard of the Carnarvon necklace. Ah, who has not, Lady Carnarvon? Even where I come from, a necklace worth two million is quite a conversation piece. I gave it to Hermione on our 25th anniversary. Uh, the box in which I keep the diamond necklace is pure second century Indian. I'm sure you will appreciate it, Sheik. I should not mind seeing the necklace either. Uh, I don't know whether I mentioned it, but uh, one of the reasons I'm here is to gather material on Indian art. Uh, perhaps I might borrow your antique jewel case one day and have it photographed for my book? Absolutely. Beauty is to be shared. Uh, this box is covered in ancient carvings. Almost an exact replica of the Nativity of Buddha done in limestone at the British Museum. Oh, yes, that one. Is it still on exhibit? You know it. I own it. Also on loan, of course. Splendid. Oh, we shall arrange for you to have a good look at our old wooden jewel box. It's, uh, it's uh, unique. Marisa, this is not going to be a simple swindle. I've got to be very careful, cover my tracks like a cat and make no waves. In and out of his lordship's front door and that clumsy Arab get up. But how to grab the necklace, that's what bugs me. You see, it's kept in the bank, except when Lady Carnarvon's wearing it. After whatever party, she takes it off and keeps it in her... Oh, of course. Keeps her necklace in what? Marissa, that's the answer, the carved box she puts it in. Listen, get your father over here first thing in the morning. He's got the answer. Now you see it, now you don't. That's what I use, your father's great act. The great Marvello's disappearing act. Of course. At least we know who is who and what is what. That Sheik Maraki is one of Otto Glazer's disguises. That this so-called psychic actually engineers thefts and then by pretending paranormal abilities hands back what he's already stolen. What trickery, duplicity, hanky-panky. I could go on, but sticks and stones won't break this artful dodger's bones. What will? What does? Join me in here when I return shortly with Act Two. I think all of us are fascinated by the machinations of the unscrupulous. We like to be let in on the doings of those for whom the straight and narrow is a tool with which to pick a lock. For now, the world believes Otto Glazer has extraordinary see-through eyes, unusual mental powers, and divining insight. It may turn out, unknown to himself, he may actually have those gifts. But in the meantime, give him credit. He's latched onto a good thing. Good morning, Marvello. Oh, chap. Daniel, what are you doing with that crossword puzzle? Oh, uh, no. What's a seven-letter word for how a person feels 
having to arise early in the morning and hustle out of his dwelling when he had planned to sleep late. Uh, look, Marvello, I didn't get you out of bed to help you with a crossword puzzle. That seven-letter word is unhappy. I'll have you know. I am unhappy that my morning rest is disturbed by a psychic chiseler. Now come off it, you old fraud. Would you be unhappy to make 50,000? Yes. 75,000? Definitely not interested. Supposing your cut was 100,000? Not so definitely not interested. 150,000. Cash on the battlehead. Let's say one week after you deliver. Daddy, we don't want you to be unhappy. 175,000, that's my final offer. No, it isn't. You need me. Make it two. And my unhappiness will vanish. Done. What's the scam? The Carnivan necklace. Why, you conniving con, that's worth two million, maybe more. The insurance company won't cough up at 50% of the value. And all you're giving me is 200,000. Take it or leave it, Marvello. I'll take it. All right. We have three options to lift the diamonds. One, when Lady Carnivan is wearing the necklace at some ball or dinner party, snatch them. But the hue and cry, you'd never get away. No, no that's not good. I agree. Option two, when the old gal takes it off at night. However, it goes immediately into a carved box, which is put into his lordship's wall safe to spend the night. The Doberman pinchers are let loose, and in the morning, the bank's armored car picks up the box and takes it to the vault. Uh, which leaves us with the third and last option. Which is? Marvello, do you remember your now you see it, now you don't routine? You mean the disappearing donkey trick when I used to put a donkey into a box stall and press to change your row and behold, no donkey? Yes. Tell you what I have in mind. And as soon as I got your call, I rushed right over. I have told my publishers they will be having quite a surprise in the chapters dealing with ancient carved Indian art. Oh, I am thrilled, Sheikh Mariki. I lie awake at night wondering whether your jewel casket has on it the dream of the Maya and the miraculous birth in the Lumbini Garden. You will see. I've got it here. No. Yes. One of the clasps is loose, so I had it sent over from the bank. The jeweler is upstairs this very minute, mending it. I shall have him put it into the box and have it brought down so that you can have a look. I shan't bore you by repeating the size of the necklace, the size of the blue-white diamonds, how many. You've heard it often. The box was of some dark wood, harder than teak. I'd say about 16 inches long, 12 wide, and 8 deep. Lady Carnivan unlocked the lid, and there, inside, on a quilted bed of Russian leather, lay the necklace. It was all I could do to keep from grabbing it and running. That would have been a stupid thing to do. Uh, well, I was hypnotized, Marissa. I wasn't myself. You haven't been yourself for 25 years. Oh, stop it. My most important role is myself. Otto Glazer, psychic spy and detective. Once we have made the carnival necklace disappear, Otto Glazer will step forward and with trance-induced vision and for a slight fee, he will locate and return the missing anniversary present. Marvella, you will take up residence here until the job is done. To start you off, Lady Carnivan permitted me to make some measurements of the jewel box inside and out. And here also is a sketch I've made for you. Very helpful. Now all I want you to do is to come up with an adaptation of your illusion of the disappearing donkey. For $200,000, I could make a dinosaur disappear.
Why did you send for me, Lady Carnival? Uh, Sheik, uh, do you remember a few days ago you were admiring the workmanship of my jewel box? And I told you the day I'd be wearing the necklace, you might borrow the box to have photographed for your book. Oh, I've never forgotten your words. Well, that day is today. Look at this. A note from the Queen's equerry requesting the pleasure of the company of Lord and Lady Carnarvon for dinner at Buckingham Palace. Oh, congratulations. When is the night? Tonight. Oh. So I've had the necklace sent over from the vault. Here is the box. I am overcome. Oh, go on. Go on, take it. It won't bite you. I've only one request, and that is... May I please have it back before the day is over? Oh, absolutely. Yes, you see, when I return from the palace tonight, I place my necklace inside. The box goes right into Hubert's wall safe. We let the dogs loose to patrol the grounds, and in the morning, the armored bank car fetches it. You shall have the box back today without fail. Marvello. Marvello, here's the box. There. Can you do it? Push it across the table. How's it open, Otto? Well, here's the key. Ah. Tell you what I'm going to do. I'll refit the inside, placing springs between the side panels and the lining. Those will be geared to the lock so that when the key is turned, the springs relax. It's exactly the same principle I used making the donkey disappear in a four-by-six-foot stall. Only here... Save it, Marvella. Don't tell me how. Just tell me if and when. We have nine hours. What ifs? What ifs? No ifs. I've already made the mechanism from the measurements you gave me. Nine hours. I can do it in three. Otto, do you think Daddy's a genius? If he can make a necklace disappear as easily as a donkey before sunset, I'd certainly agree with you. It's five o'clock now. He said three hours. I knew he couldn't do it in that time. What do you mean? Daddy's been taking a nap since lunch. The box is finished. He's done it. Well, didn't you know? How can I be expected to rest with all this racket going on? My dear fellow, I think this retirement has gone to your head. Don't you have something to show me? What? Show me how it works. Otto, don't scold Daddy. I am about to open this box. Will someone from the audience be good enough to step forward? Ah, I see a gentleman in a tweed suit and a gray wig, gray mustache and gray sideburns standing over there. Will you kindly step forward, sir? Ah, that's right. Now, will you be good enough to examine this box? An extraordinary bit of workmanship, I agree. Elaborately carved outside, tastefully leather-lined inside. Now, sir, if you would be so good as to hand it back to me, and also your wristwatch, uh, don't worry, you'll get it back. The great Marbello only steals diamond watches. <laughs> ah, thank you, sir, thank you, thank you. Now, please observe closely. I place your watch into this box. Close the lid. Will you be good enough to turn the little key, sir? Good. Now, I hand to you the box. Please, turn the key and unlock it. Fine, you're doing so splendidly, sir. Now, please, open the lid. What do you see inside? Your wristwatch? Oh, no! Oh, my goodness! The watch has disappeared! What? It's gone. It's gone, Marvello, you old magician. You've done it. Daddy, I knew you were a genius. <laughs> Look at me. I'm shaking the box. You can't hear a thing and nothing rattles. Nobody would know. When the key is turned, Otto, the inside quilting parts and the object drops to a padded bottom. When the lid is opened, the sides are sprung neatly together and the box appears empty. But... It can only be done once. Well, you don't mean it's in there forever, do you? I'll show you how to take the works apart, Otto. Take out the levers and the springs, and no one will know it's been tampered with. You can do it in 30 seconds. You can do it in 30 seconds. It may take me a little longer. Now, uh, may I have my watch back? Shake, old man. 
What brings you here at this hour? It's six o'clock. Oh, Hubert, your wife loaned me this jewel box to have photographed for my book, and I promised she would have it back today. Isn't that just like Hermione? Never told me a thing. The whole house is agog because the queen said come from me. Thank you. I'll see she gets it. What time is it, Marisa? Otto, will you drink your breakfast tea and stop checking your watch? It's eight o'clock. Nah, won't be long now. My educated psychic guess is that in about ten seconds we shall have a visitor. On the button, there's our visitor. Marissa, is my putty nose on straight, the darn hake on my head, huh? You look fine. The most beautiful Arab since Valentino. It's Lord Carnarvon. They've discovered the empty jewel box. Now, listen. In 15 minutes, I shall come knocking at Otto Glazer's front door. You will open it and say that Mr. Glazer is out of town, but expected back at 12 for his daily clients. Yes, of course. Now, up to the dressing room with you and through the wardrobe into my house next door. I hope your father fixed that lock so it works. Why, Hubert, Lord Carnarvon, what are you doing here so early in the morning? Oh, or did you ask me that question yesterday? Oh, Sheik, terrible, terrible. Oh, dear me, you look as if you'd seen a ghost. Uh, please, come along here, Hubert, to the library. Uh, can I get you something, a brandy? No, 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 Sheik, thank you. I've got to keep a cool head. Oh, you alarm me, Hubert, I've never seen you like this. Did something happen at the Queen's dinner party? Uh, no, 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 no. That went perfectly normally. Uh, 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 no, it's nothing to do with the Queen, thank heaven. Bless her. It's the necklace. Not the necklace? It's gone. Missing. Oh. Disappeared. It was Hermione. It was her idea. I come straight here and speak to you. Yes, but what have I got? Oh, dear me. I did not somehow... Damage this gorgeous box, did I? No, 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 the box is all right. I'll begin at the beginning. We come back from the palace last night. Hermione takes off the necklace, gives it to me. I put it in the box, lock the box, place it in the safe, loose the dogs. Anyway, this morning at seven, the bank guards arrive. Hermione opens the box for a last look. No necklace. Ah, oh, that is dreadful. Uh, what did your wife believe I could do? Obviously, our first thought called Scotland Yard. Then I had a better idea, old man. A much better idea. Your neighbor, Otto Glazer. Oh, yes. Glazer. Uh, would you, Shake, as his next-door neighbor, ask him to take on this case, but in utter secrecy? Frankly, I think this is the kind of crime that cries for supernatural or at least supernormal detective work. Well, if you think I can really help... Oh, we do. Both Hermione and I, we beg you. In that case, Hubert, I'm certainly at your service. Let us go next door and see Otto Glazer at once. <laughs> What Lord Hubert Carnarvon does not know is that the famous diamond necklace is still in his house. Still inside the antique Indian jewel case. We're about to see the great Otto Glazer in action. What will he do now? He must remove two things from his lordship. The necklace and a ransom. Of course, Glazer calls it a finder's fee, but whatever you call it, it must be of sufficient size to make all the play acting and disguises worth the effort. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. It is Act Three, the one in which we learn who wins, who loses, who's caught, who escapes. One caution, this is radio theater, not fact. So we can all take the events with a grain of salt and a smile. If you remember that, friends, you won't feel indignant if the imposter succeeds. The flim-flam man makes it. It is moments later at the front door of Otto Glazer's residence. Disguised as Sheikh Meraki, Otto Glazer presses the button of his own doorbell. I beg your pardon? What do you gentlemen want? Is uh, Mr. 
Mr. Otto Glazer at home. And uh, if he is, would you tell him Lord Carnovan and Sheik Marak? He would like to see him. He isn't. Oh. Oh, I see. Uh, when do you expect him? At noon. Uh, come back at 12 o'clock. No problem is too small for Mr. Glazer. Oh, whatever shall I do now? May I suggest you allow me to deal with Mr. Glazer? Oh, my dear Sheikh, would you? I will tell him what I know and persuade him to visit you this afternoon. Uh, but I had better make sure you know it is Otto Glazer and not some charlatan who may have heard of the necklace's disappearance. Uh, I tell you what, I will give him a password. Uh, what shall it be? Something from Shakespeare? Oh, good idea. Uh, a phrase, uh, 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 what comes to your mind? Mm -hmm. Yeah. A diamond gone cost me 2,000 ducats. Merchant of Venice. <laughs> Excellent. Uh, I'll know he's the man if he says that. Oh, this is also upsetting. I'm sure the necklace will be recovered. I am told the mind of this auto glazer is so penetrating, he can actually locate a real needle in a real haystack. Uh, you are auto glazer, sir. I am. You are Lord Carnarvon. You wish to see me. Do you have a message for me? Yes. A diamond gone cost me 2,000 ducats. Mr. Glazer, I'm delighted to meet you. Unfortunately, Lady Carnarvon cannot be here. She was quite beside herself with worry, so I have sent her off to the country with a doctor friend of mine. But I can tell you everything. You don't suspect anyone in your household, I suppose? Not a soul. This theft is such a mystery that we don't know what to think. The servants? Oh, they're as innocent as I am, I'm positive. Can you remember what happened this morning when you discovered the necklace missing? The telephone rang at seven. It was the bank. The armored car would be here at ten past. I unlocked my safe, removed the box, put it on the table of my study, and went upstairs to say good morning to my wife. I couldn't have been out of the room more than ten minutes. My wife came down with me. The guards from the bank arrived, and then Hermione, that's my wife, she said to me, I suppose you've looked to see if the necklace is all right. I said, how could I? You have the key. And then? She took the key, opened the box, and the necklace was gone. I don't know if you're familiar with the way I work, Lord Carnarvon. I have a vague idea. It's called psychometry, picking up psychic vibrations from the surroundings at the scene of the crime. I shall wish to see the box first, then your safe. Uh, they are both together, the empty box and the empty safe. I'll show you. I also make it a policy to accept payment for my services in advance. The amount is 50% of the value of the item to be recovered. 50%? That's rather steep. Is the necklace insured? I'm afraid not. Even Lloyd's felt such an extravagant piece of jewelry in private hands was not insurable. Well, it's up to you to decide, Lord Carnarvon. If you feel the yard can find it before it's broken up in separate stones and sent out of the country, then, of course, you'll have it back at no cost. The police make no charge. However... It I... hadn't occurred to me that possibility, the necklace being broken up and each stone sold separately. What would you say the necklace is worth? Oh, a million. You sure? Is that all? Well, perhaps closer to two. Then you're aware of my fee. Suppose you don't find it. Well, that's possible. Then you've only lost a million. It's your gamble, Lord Carnarvon. You wouldn't let me out of the house. I barely reached the front door when Lord Carnarvon called me back. Made out a bank draft for a million. Called his bank to verify and led me to his open safe and the carved jewel box. I asked to be left alone. In less than a minute, I, re I removed the necklace from the false bottom, took out the springs and levers, and put the necklace in my pocket. Half an hour later, I bid Lord Carnarvon adieu and told him he would be hearing from me. Otto, I have never seen anything like this necklace. Oh, look at it sparkle. It could light up a city. Oh, what next? Well, now it so happens the house next door to Lord Carnarvon's is up for sale. 
It's exactly as the block we live on with the identical houses side by side, an entire row of them. I shall disguise myself as a retired elderly army officer and you shall be my nurse. And you and I shall go there to make some inquiries about the house for sale. Driver, this is the place. Well, come along, nurse. Hand me my cane and help me out. Uh, uh, mind my injured leg, nurse. Uh. You see, Marissa, that's Lord Carnarvon's house next door. Yes, but what am I supposed to do? Follow instructions and follow my lead. Yes. Oh, uh, Colonel Riley presents his compliments. Uh, this is my nurse. I understand this house is for sale. Yes, it is. Uh, I'd be happy to show you about. Uh, there's a gentleman for you. Uh, uh, when I see you, you've got a napkin about your neck. Are we interrupting your dinner? Well, I was just sitting down for a bite, but I can have that later. It's only seven o'clock. No, 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 I wouldn't hear of it. Interfere with a man at trial time. Uh, why don't you just let us wander about the house and, uh... Oh, caretaker, uh, do take these few coins as a token of my appreciation. Oh, thank you, Colonel. Thank you, sir. Uh, do come in. Come in. Just switch on the lights in whichever room you wish to see. Now, this room, I believe, is on the same floor as Lord Carnarvon's bedroom. This, uh, this is what I'm going to do. Begin by opening this window. Now, if you look out, there's quite a wide coping that runs below this window and attaches itself to an identical coping on Lord Carnarvon's house, which is smack dab against this one, right? But it's pretty dark out there. Ah, just what I need not to be noticed. What I'm about to do, Marissa, is engineer a series of false clues, which later the police will believe is how the necklace was stolen. Now, I take my trusty old walking stick and I pull and pull. See? It becomes three times as long. Now, I remove my right shoe, into which I've had a metal screw hole attached, and into it, I screw the very end of the extended, collapsible walking stick. I want you to stand guard by the door while I'm balancing myself like a human fly. Yes, but you haven't explained what you're going to do with your shoe attached to the end of that long pole. I'd better tell you when I get back. Marissa. Marissa, give me a hand over the window ledge. I made it. I did it. Ah, now quick. Pull down the window while I put my shoe back on. Ooh, I'm glad that's over. I tried watching you out of the window, but it was so dark I simply couldn't see anything. I made my way along the coping and then made certain there was no one in the bedroom in which Carnarvon's butler sleeps. Then, with this telescopic walking stick and the shoe attached, I made footprints in the dust along the ledge back to where I was kneeling. That's all. That's it. How long was I gone? Oh, uh, five minutes. Good. Downstairs we go. Bye-bye to the caretaker. We'll be in touch. And back to our house. Well, he's a jolly good fellow, which nobody can deny. <laughs> Thank you, Marissa Marvello. I do believe I have this time pulled off a really big one. Oh, you do, do you? Do you all alone, eh? Daddy. He's such a big shot, this psychic faker. Where would you be if I hadn't made my disappearing donkey box? Marvello, old chap, you got paid, didn't you? I still have to do my psychic act and find the necklace and bring it over to Hubert, a Lord Carnival. You know what? I haven't even seen the darn necklace. That's right, you haven't. I'm sorry, chum. I got it right here in my pocket. I... Uh, my other pocket? My... my inside pocket? Oh, no, Otto, you didn't lose it. No, 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 let me think. Let me retrace my steps. Uh, what did I do... When I left Carnarvon's... Ladies and gentlemen, for the final feat of Monsieur de Mans of the evening... Will you shut up, you has-been? I'm trying to think. Has-been, eh? 
for my final act of the evening. A drink to your else with diamonds. Freddy, stop. Stop him. Marissa, why'd you knock my glass out of my hand? Look on the floor. Daddy had the necklace in his glass of champagne. Has been, eh? <laughs> I tell you, old chap, I'm sorry to see you go. If it hadn't been for you, Sheikh Maraki, I owe everything to you. Oh, no. Your friendship has paid for everything. The necklace is back in your house, and uh, in time, as your great Shakespeare has said, all doers of evil will be punished. The thieves will be caught. You should have been there, Sheikh, to see how this extraordinary Otto Glazer went straight to my window. His psychic super senses led him to it. There on the ledge were footprints leading to the house next door. Amazing. Then Glazer alerted the police. They interrogated the caretaker, and sure enough, a man disguised as an army officer had gone into that house, perhaps even to pick up the necklace from a hiding place. How he did it, I don't know, but that great man returned to me the necklace this morning. Lady Carnival must have been overjoyed. What an extraordinary man to have such psychic power. I would not like to pit my wits against his. <laughs> I did, Sheikh. And I came out pretty well, if I do say so myself. Oh, uh, how do you mean? I gave him a million for his fee, which he thought was half the value of the necklace. Actually, it's worth four million. <laughs> so you see, psychic or not, to quote our old friend, I think I rather got the best of the devil's bargain. I told you at the start, perhaps I'd become too complacent, too careless. I had to face it. Oh, Lord Carnarvon had cheated me. Not only that, he'd insulted my profession. So, I shall just have to steal the diamond necklace again. Perhaps I should feel guilty telling you a tale of an innocent victim losing and the guilty party gaining. But I look at it this way. Otto Glazer was a kind of Robin Hood who robbed the wealthy to be charitable to the poor. Only he believed true charity begins at home. I'm not saying every time you meet up with someone with psychic powers to beware, but to be careful, never hurt anyone. I'll be back shortly. course, true psychics. Their powers have been documented and centuries ago have even been foretold. Back to the Bard, his very last play, The Tempest, and his thoughts on the supernormal. He said, do not infest your mind with beating on the strangeness of this business. At pick leisure, which shall be shortly, I'll resolve to you some answers which to you shall seem probable. Did Bill Shakespeare know something we don't? Our cast included Robert Dryden, Joan Shea, Gordon Heath, and Jackson Beck. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Sinoff, the sinus medicines, and True Value Hardware Stores. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. Atomic here. And injuring 22 others, the bus was nearly cut in half by the impact. Witnesses said the 18-wheel truck may have run a flashing red light at the intersection. Oil industry spokesman said today there's no general shortage of gasoline despite the supply problems of the Shell Oil Company. Furthermore, the spokesman said there is no future gasoline shortage on the horizon. But looking farther ahead, industry officials express concern gasoline supplies could become tight unless new refineries are built. Now this. 
Oh, I love jogging with you, Janet. What's that awful noise? What awful noise? The clanking. I don't hear any clanking. I do. It's coming what? from over here. Hey, over, it's, it's coming, coming from, from me. You. Yeah, well, you see, it's my underwear. <laughs> Your underwear? Well, don't laugh. It's metal underwear. <laughs> Well, I have to wear metal underwear because it lasts. It lasts? It's so noisy. Well, I wouldn't say that. <laughs> and isn't it uncomfortable? Well, of course it's uncomfortable, yeah. but who can think about comfort these days? Well, I can. Well, I can. I mean, durability is what counts. Well, I can't be buying underwear every week, Janet. Well, then why don't you wear J.C. Penny underwear? J.C. Penny underwear? Yeah. They sell more men's underwear than any other store in America. Including Cleveland? For a good reason. Uh-huh. It lasts, but it's comfortable, too. Oh, that's wonderful. Yeah. And it's a treat we just blend of Selenese, Fortrell, Polyester, and Comb Cotton. Yeah? Yeah, you can wash it and wear it and wash it and wear it and wash it. Wash it and wear it and yeah. wash it and wear it? Oh, I've got I can durable underwear. I don't yeah. have to wear this metal stuff. Oh, Janet, you made me so happy. Oh, please don't cry. Why not? You'll rust. The London Daily Telegraph reports from Peking that a wall poster in the Chinese capital urges President Carter to pay attention to the state of human rights in China. The paper quotes the poster as saying, China is a quarter of mankind, and the Chinese people do not want to repeat the tragic life of the Soviet people in the Gulag Archipelago. The report says the poster was signed by the Human Rights Group, a signature not seen before on posters in Peking. This is Doug Poling, CBS News. Take a break from your shopping and share some of the real holiday spirit with the city of Pittsburgh. Every noon hour beginning December 13th and continuing through December 22nd, choirs from Pittsburgh schools will carol in the lobby of the city county building. Choirs from St. Paul's Cathedral High School, the School for the Blind, Peabody High School, and Sacred Heart will be among the schools participating. Come hear the carols and see the holiday flower show December 13th through the 22nd. First in community service and first in news. KQ. UV News Radio 14. The weather forecast for Pittsburgh and vicinity. Rain tonight changing to freezing rain Saturday morning into snow midday Saturday. It will diminish to snow showers Saturday night and flurries on Sunday. Right now, the winds from the north at 12 miles per hour. The barometric pressure 29.85 inches and it is rising. The relative humidity 100%. It is raining all around the Pittsburgh area and we have a temperature reading of 37 degrees. And now it's time for Mystery Theater. The CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall... No form of medicine is so dramatic and so mysterious as the art of the surgeon. Surgery has not changed a great deal since Hippocrates laid down the basic principles. Life is short and art is long. The crisis fleeting. Experiment risky. Decision difficult. Not only must the physician be ready to do his duty, but the patient and external circumstances must conduce to the cure. That's the crux of Dr. Matthew Bard's problem. But what is an aneurysm? It's a blood vessel that is dilated, like an inner tube, for example. If the walls of the tube are weak enough, it swells out like a blister and eventually can explode. And if you operate now? I'm not pulling any punches. It's a 50-50 chance. And if you don't operate? There isn't any chance at all. mystery drama, The Exploding Heart, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Bob Caliban. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Deck the halls with boughs of holly, fa-la-la-la-la-la-la-la-la. Ah, you're probably sick of hearing that. But then, maybe not. In any case... Let's get down to business. I'm Tony Randall, thank you. And I'm back again for Matus, the superb rosé and white wines that add dash to any holiday dish. Glazed ham, duck l'orange, smoked eel even. Or a partridge in a pear tree. 
Anyway, I bring glad tidings. Zesty Matus Rosé and delectable white Matus have been graciously placed in special holiday gift cartons. Give each one separately, or give them together in a beautiful dual carton. Whichever way you choose to give them, you'll be giving friends the wines they choose to get. Remember, a gift is but a gift, but a gift of Matus is a gift of... of Matus. Matus Rosé and White Matus, separately or together in holiday gift cartons, imported by Dreyfus Ashby and Company, New York, New York. If you're a driver, if you're actually driving a car right now, consider this. 55 miles per hour saves you gasoline, and you know how much money that can cost you these days. 55 miles an hour saves you other troubles you don't need, like the worry about that car behind you with the flashing light on top. It's after somebody else. 55 also saves wear and tear on your car. But even more important than any of those things, 55 saves lives. Since 1974, when this national speed limit began, driving 55 miles an hour has been the single biggest factor in reducing highway deaths by more than 36,000 people. That's a lot of lives. So check your speedometer frequently. And remember, 55 saves lives. One of them could be you. A public service of this station, the U.S. Department of Transportation, and the Advertising Council. Short 25 years ago, surgery had come a long way in its techniques from the time that Hippocrates formulated his famous oath. Not so far as today, or this story would never have been possible. In the year 1979, Dr. Matthew Bard is a towering figure in the field of surgery. In the early 1950s, he was just beginning to establish his name and his career as Chief of Surgical Services at Williams Memorial Hospital. It was there that the biggest crisis of his life arose, a crisis that was solved by him with supernatural help. Dr. Bard, will Dr. Bard please contact the first floor desk as soon as he is free? Well, that's your page, man. You want Dr. to get it? Bard, oh, nothing vital, Dr. Contact. Harkness. What was it you wanted me for? Mm, nothing too vital either, depending on how seriously a fellow takes his game. I was wondering if we could get nine holes in before the light goes. <laughs> I'd love to. My golf is so rusty, I don't think I could break a hundred anymore. Well, we have kept you pretty busy the last six months. You owe it to yourself and your patients to take a little time off. Well, that's a pretty good offer coming from the chief of staff. The chief of staff knows a good thing when he's got one. I don't want any chance of my top surgeon falling apart on me. Look, I'd like to, sir, but uh, I'm afraid tonight is not the night. I have a big dinner date with a certain young lady. Well, that's an item, all right. If the wedding bells are in the offing, I hope you picked a local girl so you'll settle down here and we can keep you. Wedding bells are involved, all right, but uh, not for me. My sister Kim. Tonight's the night I meet the guy who snared her. <laughs> yeah, she's a lovely girl and she deserves the best. Who's the fella? Are you ready for this? J. Norton. Well, that's a distinguished family, all right. Uh-huh. This hospital wouldn't be here if it weren't for Norton money. Or oh, this town. Norton Mills is what keeps it going. I just wish he wasn't so rich. Hmm? Who? J. Norton. Kim's boyfriend. Why, do you have anything against money? No, except maybe that uh, I've never had that much so far, and it uh, scares me when it comes in gobs. Well, don't you worry about young Jay Norton. I've met him once or twice. He's a big, good-looking fellow, and I'm sure he'll make your sister very happy. Give him my regards. I will, sir. And uh, don't mind me. I'm just disgruntled that I'm in the way of losing my built-in housekeeper. Uh, what am I going to do without Kim? Why don't you find a girl of your own? Now, that's easier said than done with my hours. Station one, paging Dr. Matthew Bard. Will the doctor pick up the... Well, I guess I'll let you get on with it. You better answer your phone. Station Maybe we can get some golf in this weekend. Bard. I'll count on it. Paging Dr. Bard. Station one, please. Dr. Bard speaking. 
Station one, Nurse James. Matt here. What's on your mind, Jimmy? Your sister was on the line, but she just hung up. Any idea what she wanted? I think just to be sure you hadn't forgotten an important dinner appointment tonight. Would I do a thing like that? Oh, you certainly would. Jimmy, you're a bully. Well, I only do it to those I like. Go on home now, Matt Bard. You know, if you were five years younger, I'd marry you and take you home with me. <laughs> do you know if I were, I might just take you up on that. <sighs> I better do as you say, Jimmy. First, I've got to check out this Jane Norton... And he'd better check out good. Hey, Kim. Your favorite cut-up is home. Oh, funny man. You just keep me in stitches. <laughs> oh, it comes in the family, sister. Oh, I guess you're my favorite brother. Got to be. I'm the only one. Well, is the prospective bridegroom here yet? Mm-hmm. He's in the living room. Oh. Come on in and meet him. And try to be nice. When am I not? He's good enough for you? He's got to be good enough for me. Well, he is. Here he is. And here I am. With my two favorite men in the world. It's a pleasure to meet you, Doctor. For me, too. I've heard enough about you. I'll bet I've heard more about you. From the same source. Not just Kim. From lots of other people, including my father. Your father? Sure. He knows everything that goes on at Williams Memorial. It's his pet project. He thinks very highly of you. I'm flattered. You should be. He's a good man to have on your side. But don't ever let him get on the other side. He's a tough old boy. Oh, I don't think Matt plans to ruffle his feathers, do you, Matt? <laughs> hmm? I mean, you don't have any bright notion of trying to stop Jay and me from getting married. Why should I? What's more to the point, how could I? <laughs> you are the head of the Bard household, aren't you? I'm going to leave you two alone while I check on dinner. Now, you get to know each other. You're both very important to me. <laughs> my sister. <laughs> uh, a drink? Yeah, no, thanks. I want to keep my head clear. But don't let me stop you. Oh, it isn't a surgeon's habit, generally. I'll wait for dinner. We'll have some wine. That suits me. Uh, doctor... Uh, can I make it Matt? Of course. Uh, this is a little awkward for both of us. Except it shouldn't be. Wherever Kim's and my home is can be your home. Kim and you are headed for your own life first, and my part in it, I hope, will be substantial. But you too come first. I love her very much, Matt. You better. I want to give her everything in the world. Oh, I think she's ready to settle for just you. If I'm good enough... Yeah, Matt, before we're married, I want to be checked out all the way. Checked out? How do you mean? Well, shouldn't I have a complete physical examination? What? Have you had any problems? No, none I know of. I think I'm pretty healthy. Well, you look it. But if you want to, a complete workup isn't a bad idea, just to clear your mind. You want me to set up something at the hospital? I want to be honest. My old man is rich. That doesn't mean I am. I have a job and prospects, don't get me wrong. I know I can provide for Kim, and one day I'll inherit the whole ball of wax. It's just, right now, I'm no big deal. Can you make Kim happy? I think so. The rest will work out. I still think a complete physical would be a good idea. Okay, you got it. Who am I to hold up the course of true love? I'll set it up for tomorrow. Check into outpatient tomorrow morning at 8 o'clock, and uh, we'll put you through the works. Uh, here's your toast, Matt. Oh, I thought this was a morning off. You didn't tell me you were scheduled for surgery. No, oh, I'm not. I just want to get in early. Habit, I guess. Oh, you work too hard, Matt. Here's some coffee. You, uh, like Jay, don't you? What's not to like? Matt? Yeah? He, he's coming in for a checkup, isn't he? Sure. That's why I'm off early. Just wanted to make sure he'd uh, clear all the humps and move on through. What do you mean, humps? You don't think there's anything wrong with Jay? Why should there be anything wrong? Not from my point of view. 
Well, you're the diagnostician. Uh, correction, love. Uh, hand me the sugar, hmm? Oh, sure. I'm the fella fixes up what the fella you mentioned turns up wrong. Mm, here, here's the sugar. What could turn up wrong? Mm. Well, nothing, baby. It's, uh... <laughs> what is this? Uh, it's just a routine checkup. <laughs> oh, not when it's my fella. Oh, it's the difference. Unless you expect something to turn up wrong. Oh, no, nothing like that. I guess I... I just keep thinking about Mom and Dad. I thought we'd finally lock that away. I try to. But it isn't easy. Both of them within six months. Why, Matt? Why is there a disease that takes away without reason? You know I can't answer that. It's why you became a doctor. Maybe. For all the lives I save, I... I still have to deal with mortality. I couldn't have saved Mom and Dad. Oh, I know. Just, just every now and then it sweeps over me. Only promise me, please, you won't find anything wrong with Jay. Now, come on, sis. A big muscle man like Jay. I wish I could see myself that healthy. Well, what's the matter with you? <laughs> uh, nothing. A, a little early middle-aged flab beneath the rib cage. Now, come on, Cassandra. Stop singing the blues. Dr. Bard, please contact your office if available. This is Station One calling Dr. Matthew Bard. Please contact your office as soon as available. What is it, Jimmy? Sorry to put you on page. But Dr. Schultz thought you ought to see these as soon as possible. See what? Chest x-rays he took on Mr. Norton. Jay? Your brother-in-law, about to be. What's wrong? He has a report with them, but he thought maybe you ought to view them on the scanner yourself. Okay, Jimmy. Set them up while I read his diagnosis. Will do. They're ready for viewing, Doctor. I don't want to look at them. They're that bad, then? Can't you read them for yourself, Jimmy? You see this dark mass here between the lungs? Mm-hmm. That's an aortic aneurysm, big as a grapefruit, just waiting to explode. You'll have to operate? I can't. It's inoperable under present techniques. But if it ruptured, the man could die. Any minute, any hour, any day, any year. But he could keep on living with that? It's possible. And not be aware of his condition? It varies. He might have chest pain or referred pain or no pain at all. Do you tell him? What do you do? Well, he's the man my sister plans to marry. Do I have any choice? How long can he live with this condition? How long has he lived already with it? You've answered my question. Now I'll answer yours. I think you do have a choice. What? If you don't tell the patient, you can't tell your sister. If you tell one, you have to tell the other. But that would wreck the marriage. It doesn't seem to have much chance either way you look at it. Does it, Doctor? All of us at various times face the decision whether to pass on bad news or to keep it to ourselves. The physician is no different, except in his case, the decision is almost always an overwhelming one, which can affect not only his patient, but the lives of everyone around him. Dr. Matthew Bard faces such a decision now, and beyond it, an even more tremendous one. I shall return shortly with Act Two. Merry Christmas, Merry, Merry Christmas from your Kmart Christmas store. You know, Christmas is one of the most dangerous times of the year for home fires. So now's the time to give your family the gift of safety with the new First Alert smoke detector with escape light. Unlike other smoke detectors that warn you by sound only, the new First Alert has a bright, built-in escape light that turns on when the alarm sounds. So it not only warns you, it lights your way to safety. And this is important in case of a power failure during a dangerous night fire. The First Alert smoke detector with escape light is easy to install and comes with two replaceable 9-volt batteries. So protect yourself this holiday season and all year long by installing a First Alert smoke detector with new escape light from Kmart. Christmas fun like every place is Kmart's Christmas saving place. 
changed, Bernard. You're not the man I married. What do you mean, Francine? Remember the way you were, vulnerable. You made mistakes. But now, look, you're confident. Everything you do turns out right. It's that book you sent away for. It's just a catalog mm. from the Consumer Information Center. It lists more than 200 federal publications you can send for. On building, fixing, eating... Buying, selling, working, playing, living... And more than half of them are free. Yes, Francine, the man you married is gone for good. Mm. All right, Bernard. But would you make just one more mistake for old time's sake? All right. For you, oh. I'll just replace that window glass like I used to. Whatever you do, learn to do it better. Send for your free catalog. Just write Consumer Catalog, Pueblo, Colorado, 81009. Francine, send for that publication on first aid. What was that address? Pueblo, Colorado, 81009. been a miserable evening for Dr. Matthew Bard. Fortunately, he has not had to face Jay Norton, since he wasn't directly involved in the physical examination. Nor has he had to face his sister, Kim, since some emergency procedures have kept him at the hospital. And by the time he has gotten home, Jay and Kim are out for the evening. So we find Matt, at this moment, brooding in a chair by the fireplace, looking up at the full-length portrait of his father. What do I do, Dad? If I tell Jay the truth, the boy will never marry Kim. That washes that up and breaks her heart. And if I tell her, I know Kim. She'll marry him just the same. But what chance does a marriage have when it begins knowing one partner is sentenced to death? And if I don't tell her, her heart is going to be broken anyway, sooner or later sooner. So what do I do? Well, they're home. Do I bite the bullet or not? And which bullet do I bite? You want to come in, Jay? I guess not, Kim. It's late and I have a big day tomorrow. Hmm. The big day for me was today, Jay. Oh, it's so wonderful to know you have a clean bill of health. What did you expect me to come up with? I didn't expect you to come up with anything else. But when you love someone as much as I do you, you just can't help being scared. I, I'd just die if I lost you. Hey, hey, what's with the tears? Oh, they're just thankfulness. Because I'm, I'm so lucky to have you. Turn that around, baby. I'm the lucky one. Oh, I love you, Jay. I want to love you for a hundred years. As long as you're around, count on me. Good night, darling. Good night, Jay. I love you. I love you. Matt, I thought you'd gone to bed and left a light on in here. No, I, um, I just got back from the hospital. Oh, you must be tired. I'm glad I didn't ask Jay in. Yeah, I'm glad you didn't, too. Why? Something wrong? No. No, what could be wrong? It's it's just that I'm so tired. I, <laughs> I've been yawning in his face. Matt, you don't look well. Are you all right? Of course. I'm fine. Well, you, you work too hard. It's my life. I wish you could find someone to give you the kind of life you're missing. Oh, I'll find her, whoever she is, one of these days. Oh, Matt, I'm so lucky. Jay's really a terrific guy. You do like him, don't you? Of course. I can't wait to have children. Big, healthy hunks like him. I, I bet he's the healthiest specimen your old clinic has seen in a long time. Uh, I didn't examine Jay, you know. But you know they gave him a clean bill. So I understand. <laughs> you know, it's silly of me. Now, what could be wrong with a big lummox like Jay? <laughs> but I swear... I... I worried all day long till he phoned me with the good news. You you shouldn't go borrowing trouble, kid. I can't help it, Matt. Ever since Mom and Pop... 
I mean, it was bad enough the way it happened to Mom so fast. But six months later, to have that lousy, creeping thing hit Pop. Look at him. I hate that painting of him. Why? Because he looks so alive. As if he were ready to step right out of the frame. But he isn't. And he won't be here to give me away the way I always... What? Now, easy, sis. Come on, easy, honey. That's what made me so afraid about Jay. I thought Mom and Pop were indestructible. And all of a sudden, poof, just like that, they were gone. Nothing we can do about it. Yet. Now, don't think Mom and Dad didn't zonk me out. It's, it's almost worse being a doctor, a surgeon. I wanted to cut the malignancy out for them, but... There was nothing I could do. I only hope in my whole life nothing like that can ever happen again. I don't think I can take it. Hey, hey, easy does it. <laughs> okay. The vapors are blown away. <laughs> <laughs> I won't put you through anything like this again. And I... I didn't mean it about Dad's portrait. I mean hating it. I meant the other, though. He does look alive. I wish he were. I could use his help right now. For what? Oh, just a... Just a case I have. I... I can't think of anyone who might be better able to give me the right answer. Dad was that good a surgeon? The best. They never came any better. He was the same kind of father. Oh! What? I don't know where that came from. Well, that comes from being completely <laughs> relaxed and happy and ready for bed. Good night, Kim. Mm. Sleep well. What about you? Aren't you going to turn in, too? Oh, not for a while. Well, you need the rest more than I do. I don't think I can sleep. I've got a little problem gnawing at me. Anything I can help solve? No, 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 no. No, you can't help me with this one, hon. Okay, big brother. Good night. Oh! <gasps> Oh. What is it? Oh, I, I was looking at Dad's portrait, and I could swear I saw him move. Trick of the firelight. Now, come on. Get on to bed before oh. you start dreaming on your feet. <laughs> this time for good. So, I didn't tell her. Is that the answer? Or am I just putting it off? Lord, help me. What am I supposed to do? What's the right thing to do? Well, Matt, the first thing I'd recommend is to get your face out of your hands. Father? Dad? Don't look to the picture. It's a blank. I'm sitting here. In the chair. Opposite you. The way we used to sit. So many evenings. To hash out problems, medical or otherwise. Yes. Want to hash this one out? Oh, you know it. I need you to find an answer. Then let's consider the options. I have. They're all hopeless. Are they? It is an aneurysm? Oh, yes. A true one. Not dissecting? No. Pulsating. In the thoracic chamber? No. Peritoneal. In the stomach. Ah, tricky to get at behind the stomach. Yes. It hasn't ruptured. No, but it will, soon. It's fulminating. And it will kill the young man. Not a shadow of a doubt. Then the answer is clear. What? If you tell Kim you break her heart, tell the young man you break up the marriage. And break my sister's heart anyway. Yes, Tell them both and you're no better off. Keep silent. And the boy is dead before he gets to be 27 years old. Well, that's the dilemma. And there's no good answer. Except that if I don't say anything, they have happiness for whatever little time is left. You could give them happiness for the rest of their lives. Good long ones. How? Operate. You know it's inoperable. Is it why? Because, because. Oh, you know why? 
We've discussed it often enough in the past. The grafts are too sophisticated for us. We have no adequate prosthesis. You and I were working on one before I died for arterial and vein grafts just like this. But you never had a chance to use it. You do. Me? Would I dare? What have you got to lose? Only your reputation as a surgeon? A risk you take every time you operate. Besides, what's that compared to the life of one patient? I'd have to tell Jay first and let him make the choice. Yes. Only this way, Matt, you bring him not only despair, but hope. Do I dare, Father? Do I dare? That's a choice which only you can make. I don't know what to say, Matt. I'm just... just stunned. I don't blame you. But I feel as healthy as a horse. I know. How could a thing like this happen to me? Who knows? A bacterial infection that weakened the walls of the artery at some time? A heavy blow? You played some football, didn't you? Yeah. Or an accident in a car? Hey, that could be it. A kid a couple of months ago tried to run a light in front of me. I had to make a panic stop, and the guy behind me climbed right up my tail, and I took a whack from the steering wheel and knocked all the breath out of me. Maybe that was it? Uh, what, what is an aneurysm exactly? Well, it's a dilation of blood vessel because there's some weakness in the wall of it. Like an inner tube, you know. And if there's a weak spot and the air pressure is strong enough, it pushes out a sort of bubble that gets larger and larger or bursts. But how come I can't feel it? At the moment, it's not pinching any nerves or pressing on any internal organs. If it does, you'll have pain. And if it explodes? Hemorrhage. You could bleed to death. Or there could be a fatal compression of any of the vital organs near it. Couldn't you operate then? In 25 years, maybe, but uh, not in 1957. Even if we did, it would probably be too late. And if you operate now? I'm pulling no punches, Jay. It's no better than a 50-50 chance. But if there's no operation? You haven't any chance at all. When? The sooner the better. I want to check you in tonight and operate tomorrow or the next day at the latest. Does Kim know? Not yet. Don't tell her till after. That's making it pretty tough. No, it isn't. If she knew, she might try to talk me out of it. And that way, I might as well be dead. I couldn't marry her knowing that any minute... Well, I, I couldn't marry her. I thought that's the way you'd figure it. Okay, we keep it from Kim till after it's over. <laughs> Nurse Germs. Yes, Dr. Harkness. Did uh, Dr. Bard go up to surgery? I don't think so. He's not scheduled this morning. I believe he's still in his office. That's good. Thank you, nurse. I'll see him there. Good morning, Dr. Harkness. Matt, I've just learned that you plan to operate on Jane Orton. The first moment I can. We're only holding for blood cross-matching now. You can cancel that. There'll be no operation. Why? Matt, I can understand your personal concern, your, what shall I say, quixotic desire, but it makes no sense. And as chief of staff, I can't countenance the wild risk that you plan to take. You may be thinking of a human being, and I hope before God I feel the same way, but I have other considerations that bind me as chief of staff. I don't believe this operation is warranted. And if it is, neither you nor I as individuals can sanction it. It's up to the medical board. Unless they agree, there will be no operation. The lines are drawn to operate or not. 
a frequent dilemma for any surgeon, but complicated by the world of figures, the world that establishes the odds for certain types of surgery as immutably as it does for a horse race or the roulette wheel. Remember, the year is 1957. Where does Surgeon Matthew Bard go from here? We'll have to wait for that till I return with Act Three. They should pass a law. When it's time for Christmas shopping, you get paid every day. So many gifts, so little cash. I can't wait for payday, so I don't. Thanks, Master Charge. I couldn't manage Christmas without that clout. When you carry Master Charge, you carry clout. Master Charge carries clout. It's good in more places than any other card. This time of year, you appreciate that kind of acceptance. Master Charge, use its clout. What a year. One daughter had a baby, the other had twins. Now it's Christmas and I've got a pregnant shopping list. Ah, but this father, father-in-law, grandfather, doesn't panic easy. Thanks, Master Charge, for all the clout. When you can't be Master Charge. One of the very special problems a doctor or a surgeon faces is that of objectivity. Is any given decision, any action he takes, sheerly guided by the facts of the case? Or does some personal attitude creep in, some fear or fancy that is not justified by the evidence? The surgeon is, after all, a man, not a god. And perhaps the thing he has to guard against most zealously is any thought that he has special knowledge. That's why this interview with his superior, Dr. Harkness, the chief of staff, is so fraught with difficulty for Dr. Matthew Bard. I can't agree, Dr. Harkness. You haven't any option. Of course I have. In my opinion, the operation is mandatory. In the opinion of most of the rest of the world, the percentage figures do not support your optimism. Each case is individual. This one certainly is. What does that mean? Matt, your judgment isn't clear on this operation. It simply doesn't hold water. We say the chances are 50-50. That isn't really carried out on any graph. It's a rule of thumb. The truth is that the operation itself hasn't been tried that many times. Perhaps at some future time, but not in 1957. When you go in on something like this, it's a no-man's land today. All right. But at least it's a chance for the patient... An alternative to sitting under a sword of Damocles, knowing that death is inevitable, only just not when. Perhaps never. Very few of us know what we live with inside our bodies. But in this case, I do know. The threat, but not the answer to it. There is only one answer. No. Now use your head, Matt. You know who Jay Norton is. If you operate and fail, as most indications say you might, how can I answer to Jay's father? Our whole new research wing, which we must have, depends on his good graces. If his son dies on the operating table, can you imagine that he'll contribute the basic expansion money we need? I'm not interested in politics. I'm interested in a man's life. So am I. 
Give me mortality figures, a special risk, a new procedure, anything to suggest this operation is justified, and I'll back you. But as it stands, I have to tell you it can't be done. And it won't be done, as long as I'm chief of staff of this hospital. I question your right to stop me. Kim. What are you doing here in the hospital? Waking up to all that's going on around me. Now, honey, whatever it is that you're all steamed up about, why don't you just sit down? I don't want to sit down. I want to know about Jay. All right. What do you want to know about Jay? He has an aneurysm. Aortic, right? Right. And it's fatal. Terminal. Whatever term you want to use. As far as we know. How do you know about all this? Dr. Harkness just called me. He wanted to try to explain... And did he? Not very well. What's to explain? Jay has something inside him which could kill him today, tomorrow, next year. Since it's all out in the open. Correction. By all past experience. This year. Oh, no. You want to operate. And Jay goes along with you. I think it's the best chance, Kim. But Dr. Harkness doesn't agree. That's the problem. It is a chancy operation. And I can't honestly tell you that I would have thought of risking it, except... Except what? Except for you. Except for Jay, whom I like. But way beyond that, except for a feeling I have in me that someone else helped put there, that it's time to cross a new frontier. That this is something that can be licked. How can you be so sure? Because of where I came from. Because Dad gives me the courage to try and be damned. But if Dr. Harkness won't allow you to operate at Williams... Then I'll find a hospital that will. I want to buy you a future, Kim. But you're not accredited to any other hospitals. Where else do you operate? Then do you agree with me that I should? Oh, yes. Both me and Jay. Good. Then I'll find an operating room to set him free. But if you can't do it in your own hospital, what... Dr. Bard. What? Uh, Yes. Yeah, yes, of course. Uh, Prep him immediately. I'll want whole blood. Has he been cross-typed? Good. Then I'll be right up and make the cut down. Alert OR. We'll operate immediately. What is it, Matt? I said it could happen any time. Well, it has. The aneurysm? It... It blew up? It's ruptured. Oh. Now all the questions are answered. There isn't any room for doubt anymore. We have to operate. Dr. Harkness. Hello, Matt. What are you doing in O.R. Skivvies? I'm uh, scrubbing up with you. I want to be an observer on this one. Fine. I need all the help I can get. Can you also uh, use an apology? It isn't necessary. Not to you, perhaps it is to me. I was too quick to write off your interest in this case to personal interest. But uh, you think you can bring him through? I don't know. the patient, Jimmy? Stabilized at the moment. What do you have, Schultz? Respiration shallow. BP 120 over 60. Better get this show on the road. Can do. Is he prepped? Ready to open. What are we waiting for? Scalpel. Retractor. Retractor. Get it on the other side, Jimmy. Have it, doctor. Scalpel. Scalpel. Fasty hair like steel springs. There. Retractor. Retractor. I'm opening the peritoneum now. How's he doing, Schultz? Marginal. I'm not all that happy. Better move it. I will. There uh, isn't as much blood as I have suspected. The trouble is all in the posterior peritoneum. When I get behind the stomach is when the trouble begins. Suction. 
stop him. Gently now. As soon as I can see, we... Ah. There it is. It's bleeding profusely. Of course. Clampers. What are you doing, man? Cutting off the circulation from the renal artery down. Well, that gives you less than an hour to complete the operation. I'll be lucky if we have that long. There. Now, we'll clamp above and excise the shattered artery. Thank you, nurse. Uh, what are you going to replace it with? I made up a prosthesis. We graft the artery to the top of it and the bottom and suture it home. Yes, but will it work? Well, research and common sense says it will. For the rest... Matt. What is it, Schultz? He's throwing premature beats. Uh, is he on whole blood? Yes, doctor. I'll give him all he can take. Scalpel. Scalpel, doctor. Keep it all coming, Jimmy. We've got to work as fast as we can. He's hemorrhaging. Give me more suction. You have it. We can't keep up with the blood flow. You have to. Or we'll lose him, doctor. What is it? He's fibrillating. I can't hold him. We have to close. We can't. I'm not finished yet. I've only begun. And I have to keep him under anesthetic. We'll lose him on the table. The bleeding's getting worse, doctor. It can't. We have him clamped. The ventricular beats. They're getting stronger. You've got to hold him for me, Schultz. He'll die unless we can complete the graft. His heart is giving out. I told you the operation was impossible. It can't be impossible. Not if Dad thought it wasn't. Not if I had his help. You only have to ask. Dad? I'm here. Now you've ligated above and below. Take the prosthesis. Now, cut out the damaged part of the artery and link it with the prosthesis. Uh, I can't see to make the linkage. What did you say, Doctor? Uh, uh no, nothing. I... If the suction isn't enough, swab gently. There. Now you can see to make the graft. What did you say, Doctor? I, I, I said a sponge. And, and hand me the graft. That's it, Matt. It isn't so difficult if you have faith. Why are you here? Because I'm always here, son. I'm part of your heritage, as long as you don't deny me. What I learned, I passed on to you, just as you will pass it on to whoever comes after you. Dr. Bard. Huh? The patient. If we don't close soon, we'll lose him. We're not going to lose him, Jimmy. He stopped fibrillating. I have a good beat. Sure we have, Schultz. It's going to be all right. There. The graft is set. Suture. Suture. Oh, sits home just like it belongs. Now, let's get this anchored below. How is he, Schultz? Steady. We're just about home. Thank you, Dad. What did you say, Doctor? Oh, nothing, Jimmy. Maybe I've uh, got into the habit of talking to myself. But it won't happen again. There won't be any need to. How is he, Matt? He's going to be fine. Good as new. Oh, thank God. Oh, thank you, darling. <laughs> oh, Matt. Oh, I wish you really could give thanks where thanks are due. <laughs> what do you mean? Well, you'll think I'm crazy, Kim, but... <laughs> I I've got to tell someone. All during the operation, I... I can't tell you how helpless I was. I hadn't any hope at all for Jay. I was only doing what I felt ought to be done. I, I, I don't think I'd have had the courage to go on if it hadn't been for Dad. Dad? You know, the evening alone by the fire. R remember? Mm-hmm. Yeah. I thought I'd talk to him. I, I feel crazy to admit it. Well, I don't know why. You know, sometimes when I'm alone, I have the darndest talks with Mother. 
all the things we never had a chance to discuss when she was alive. You mean it? Of course. Well, that's what I mean, Kim. When I was operating, and believe me, it seemed a disaster at one point, suddenly, Dad was beside me, calm, relaxed, telling me not to panic, that no matter how bad it looked, we were going to make it a success. While you were in there with Jay, I could hear Mother telling me, there's nothing, either good or bad, but thinking makes it so. Trust your brother. And it's going to be all right. They don't die, do they? Not for me. Our parents are there when we need them. I never thought you could be so sentimental. Oh, but I love you for it. What a marvelous godfather you're going to make. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'll settle for that. I want to have some of my own someday. I'd like to be able to pass on to them what my dad passed on to me. I guess that's what life is all about. What is life all about? Do you want to argue, question, protest, fight, accept? Go ahead. It's your prerogative. I can't give you any answers. Only one suggestion. For those who believe they have found the answer, leave them be. For most of us who are looking for something, it's marvelous to realize that some people have found it. I'll be back shortly. This year, help someone permanently capture the fond memories of Christmas. Hi, Pat Summerall for True Value Hardware Stores to suggest you give a Panasonic portable cassette recorder for just $34.95. It's the fun, easy way to record all the excitement of Christmas morning around the tree or to capture the voices of relatives and friends. The Panasonic cassette recorder features one-touch recording and tone control, has a built-in mic, and runs on house current or with optional batteries for use at home or away. Or give the Panasonic Mr. Thin AM-FM pocket radio from True Value Hardware Stores. It's just five-eighths of an inch thick. It has a film cone speaker with a rare earth magnet to help provide high-quality sound. And it's just $49.95 at participating True Value Hardware Stores. shopping, you know, if it's something that we eat and we like it, we buy it. Mrs. Lana Locke depends on certain foods for her family. My kids really like the Kraft macaroni and cheese. They really do. I know if it's going to get eaten, that they're going to be happy with what I'm going to give them because they like it. I think it's in the cheese flavor, too, in itself. It all gets eaten. It never goes to waste. It's easy to prepare, and it's good. I know that they're going to like it. Kraft macaroni and cheese dinner. You know they're going to like it. Take your contact. Take it now. Give your cold to contact. I'm going to change your mind about nighttime cold medicine. You see, of all major medicines, only one works up to 12 hours against the cloggy virus symptoms that keep you awake. Only contact. One capsule's relief stays with you all through a long night's sleep, no matter what cold virus attacks. Only contact. Give your cold to contact. Take only as directed. It occurs to me that in the presentation of this story, we may have seemed touched by the brush of little orphan Annie or other characters in imagination who rose to heights of fortune. Pragmatically, I would like to point out that in the generation since this story was told, aortic aneurysms, due to modern techniques, are a routine operation. The mortality rate is something less than 2%. Our cast included Bob Caliban, Gordon Gould, E.B. Juster, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and True Value Hardware Stores.
Mrs. E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. KQB News Time is 10.59. We have a special weather statement to pass on to you tonight. A flash flood watch has been issued for streams and low-lying areas and a traveler's advisory for Saturday. The details on those two weather statements will follow the news and, uh, from CBS at 11.06. Rain tonight changing to freezing rain Saturday morning and to snow midday Saturday, causing hazardous driving conditions. Snow will be diminishing to snow showers Saturday night and Sunday. Temperatures falling slowly to near 30 Saturday afternoon to the upper teens by Sunday morning. The high on Sunday will be 20 to 25 degrees. Right now, the winds are from the north at 12 miles per hour. The barometric pressure, measure, pressure measures 29.85 inches and rising. The temperature still raining in downtown Pittsburgh, 37 degrees. Now, more up to the minute news from CBS. CBS News. President Carter went before the delegates to the Democratic Party's midterm convention in Memphis tonight, saying he'll stick with his anti inflation program despite criticism from liberal Democrats and organized labor. I'm Christopher Glenn reporting on the CBS radio network. Mr. Carter's address to the gathering also included several strong statements about his Republican predecessors in the White House, and he spoke of the accomplishments of his administration, including equality of the sexes. We have already extended the time limit for ratifying the Equal Rights Amendment. Now, now let us join forces to wipe out discrimination based on sex and make the Equal Rights Amendment the law of the land. Earlier in the day, the midterm convention delegates had adopted without dissent a motion which will split seats at the 1980 Democratic National Convention equally between women and men. More CBS News coming up. Yesterday, I felt like taking on the world, so I wore my taking on the world perfume. But today, I feel like being soft and gentle and letting the world come to me. I feel very chantilly today. Sometimes I like a really sporty fragrance, but today I feel like wearing something very feminine and romantic. I feel very chantilly today. Very chantilly today. Tomorrow I don't know how I'll feel, but today I want the world to see the softer side of me. I feel very chantilly today. Very chantilly today. Major lettuce grower in Arizona is predicting prices could double to about a dollar a head at retail in the next few weeks because of the current cold snap chilling parts of the southwest and southern California. Terry Drinkwater has more on the unusual wintry weather from Los Angeles. The tomato crop in many parts of Southern California was literally frozen on the vine. These plants would have yielded another harvest, but they are now withered and worthless. It's been that cold, below freezing, for two nights, and it will be again tonight. Record December lows for the century. Young celery plants, too, bitten by the frost. State agriculture officials called the overall loss extensive. They say it's too early to set a dollar figure, but that it will be high. Citrus is the big question. Damage to oranges doesn't show up for a few days. The thin-skinned navels particularly vulnerable. This could be disaster, said one grower. In supermarkets here and elsewhere in the country, the freeze is going to mean higher prices for what can be harvested in California. Terry Drinkwater, CBS News, Los Angeles. 
Cuban President Castro and more than 100 Cuban exiles met in Havana today for the signing of an agreement which could lead to freedom for 3,600 political prisoners in Cuba. The agreement, considered by political observers to be very unusual, was reached after several weeks of dialogues between the Cuban government and representatives of exile communities in the United States and other nations. A school bus packed with high school basketball players was nearly cut in half today in an accident with a tractor trailer near the town of Roby, Texas. Four of the students, members of both the boys' and girls' basketball teams at Macaulay High School, were killed. Twenty-two others were injured. The youngsters had been on the way to take part in a tournament. The punk rock musician who calls himself Sid Vicious is back in jail. A judge in New York City today revoked his $50,000 bail. The musician, whose real name is John Ritchie, had been on bail after being charged in the stabbing death of his girlfriend in October. And he was arrested yesterday, charged with assaulting a man with a beer mug in a discotheque. The judge ordered him to return to jail today, saying he shows signs of instability and unreliability. More after this. Harriet? Yeah? Where are the children? We don't have any children. Oh, good. Because mm-hmm. I don't know how to tell you this. Why? Thing. I just heard some terrible voices coming from the laundry room. Voices? Yeah, tiny little voices in excruciating pain, and they were screaming. Screaming? Yeah, things like, help. Ouch. Oh, it hurts. I'm burning. I'm shrinking. Oh, that's just your old underwear. My old underwear? You should hear them in the dryer. Oh, I oh, hate oh, to. Oh, oh. I, can't we do something about it? I have done something about it. I bought you J.C. Penny underwear. Oh? They sell more men's underwear than any other store in America. Including Cleveland? Maybe. You're wearing it. No, I'm not wearing any underwear. Oh, yes, you are. No, I'm not. Can't you feel the soft Salonese Fortrell polyester and comb cotton? Is that what it is? Yeah, it's the Salonese Fortrell polyester and comb cotton. Oh, I did notice something different. Uh Uh-huh. How does it work? Well, they're shrink-resistant with heat-resistant elastic. Oh. So no shrinking, no burning, no screaming. No shrinking? No burning? No. Oh, no more terrible voices coming from the laundry room? No. You know something, Harriet? What? Kind of miss them already. Secretary of State Vance is flying the Atlantic tonight, heading for the Middle East. He'll hold talks in Cairo and Tel Aviv, trying to get Egyptian and Israeli negotiators working again to conclude a peace treaty between the two nations. Diplomatic sources are being quoted as saying Vance will propose a one-month extension of the talks if it appears the two sides will not reach final agreement by December 17th, the deadline agreed to at the Camp David meeting at which the two nations vowed to achieve the settlement. I'm Christopher Glenn, CBS News. CBS Radio Mystery Theater presents... Come in. Welcome. I'm E.G. Marshall. Tell me the truth. Are you sensitive... Impressionable, tender-hearted, squeamish, maybe? Are your sensibilities easily offended? Are you fussy or persnickety? If you are all or any of these things, perhaps you had better not listen to what follows, for the tale we are going to tell you is aptly called a horror story. Take them back. Take back these slippers. You don't like them? They are bewitched. But they're so beautiful. They are cursed. They are the spawn of Satan. Take them back. Our mystery drama, A Horror Story, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Elspeth Eric and stars Robert Dryden. It is sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and ARM, Allergy Relief Medicine. I'll be back shortly with Act One. You have been warned. You're about to hear as dreadful a tale as has ever been told. Appalling in its frightfulness. So pause a moment. Think hard whether you're able to endure it. 
If you have qualms about listening, turn to something sweet and soothing. But I urge you to gather your courage and listen. Nothing on the first floor. Nothing on the second. Only the third floor remains to be explored. Uh, mm, why do I bother? Why do I persist? Well, if anyone cares, this place fascinates me. Has for 20 years. Ever since I first came to New Orleans in 1829 and saw a crowd of frightened people gathered outside this building on Common Street. Mm, by eavesdropping among them, I learned that they thought the place haunted by a collection of gruesome ghosts. Now, let's see what's in here. Oh, I declare, if the third floor yields no more than the other two, I... Ooh, I say, what an exquisite fireplace. So delicate. Pure Adam. As a world traveler, I've become something of a connoisseur. Still, you... Oh, what's this? Looks like a loose brick in the chimney breast. Oh, really, the town should take better care of... Let's see if I can pry it loose. Oh, yes, I can. Oh, why are people so neglectful? Still, no one comes here anymore. They're too frightened, I suppose. Imagine being afraid of ghosts. <laughs> uh -huh. Got it. Good. Now, what may I find here? What could there be in the space behind the... Oh, oh, yes, there's something. Yes, 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 there's a, a, a little book. A little book bound in red Morocco leather. And that... Wait, what have we here? Oh, good gracious. A pair of shoes. Oh, how sweet, how dainty. Uh, now back to the little book. Uh, oh, my word. It's a diary. And the name embossed on the cover is plain as day, Gaston Donnet. Gaston. Gaston Donnet. Monsieur Savinet? Come here immediately. Something wrong, Monsieur Savinet? An emergency. The Count is coming for dinner. It's his first visit to the Palais Savinet, and what do you think has happened? The head chef has had an accident, and he's in the hospital. Oh, what a pity. Well, you know who the Count is, don't you? Oh, I know, I know. What's to be done? There's nothing to be done but turn the whole thing over to you, Gaston. What? But I've been engaged as assistant chef. I don't have the capacity, the experience. My friend, I... there is no help for it. I'll tell you what. I'll give you Pierre all to yourself. Pierre? The scullery boy? Well, he's been with me for two whole years. Pierre, come here. You'll see Pierre is very knowledgeable. Yes, Monsieur Le Sauvignon. Pierre, my boy, who do you think will dine with us tonight? Hmm? The Count himself, friend to the king. But the head chef, he, he's at the hospital. Unhappily, but we must not let that affect us in the least. Monsieur Gaston Donnet here will be in charge. Oh. And you, Pierre, you are to leave everything else to others and devote yourself to him. Do you understand? I understand. Now, what shall we prepare for the Count, huh? Perhaps a, a, a leg of lamb, Eslington, with the proper vegetables? A Normandy sole before that. Oh, and, and, and for his particular pleasure, truffles served in the silver cocot and wrapped in our finest linen napkin. The poor Gaston Donnet, poor chap. It's no small thing to prepare a superlative dinner for an important client. I know, I've wandered the world. I've been in Paris, ho, 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 more than once. Well, uh, uh, let us read on in the diary what happens next. Ah, uh, when the Count has eaten his dinner of truffles, of Normandy sole, of lamb Eslington, and all accompanied with the best wine, and all finished off with an exquisite plum brandy... What then? Success, success, Gaston. Oh, what a great success. I'm so happy, Monsieur Sylvain. He raved about the souffle. He was ecstatic over the leg of lamb. He all but, but kissed the vegetables. Oh, let the head.
head chef, stay in the hospital. You, you, Gaston Donnet, you are the best chef in all of Paris. Oh, Monsieur Sauvignet, surely not. Now listen, listen, dear chap. The Count intimated to me just before he departed. He plans to come back soon. It's too much. Da, 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 da. Try your eyes oh. and get on home, because that's where I'm going. Pierre? Monsieur? You'll uh, close the place, won't you, so that our heroic friend here can go home? Yes, Monsieur Souvenet. Then good night, my valiant Gaston. Good night until tomorrow. Good night. Oh, what a glorious night it has been. Aren't you going home, Monsieur Nene? What? Oh? <laughs> to tell your wife about your success. I have no wife. Oh, there must be someone you can boast to. Monsieur Sauvignet said the Count adored the souffle and the lamb. All but kissed the vegetables, he said. But he said nothing about the truffles. <laughs> no, he didn't. The beautiful truffles in the silver cocotte. Pierre, did the Count enjoy the truffles, do you think? Well... If so, why didn't Monsieur Sauvignet mention it? Well, they were a little overcooked. Overcooked? You said overcooked? I heard the Count remark to his lady friend that they were slightly overdone. After all, they require only seven to eight minutes in the oven, and yours were in there for ten. That's not so. That's not so. Oh, yes, I noticed. At least ten minutes. Why, you dirty little beggar. Why, you... Oh, gee, keep, keep away from me. Keep away from sure, me. Sure, thumb. Knife. No, the knife. Put down the knife. Help. Please. Help. 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 Oh. Oh. You... You... You killed my... Piece of dirt. Nothing but a piece of dirt. Oh, absolutely incredible. Fantastic. Oh, my, I'm not at all sure I should let you hear this part. It's too, uh, too, uh, too, uh, uh, well, we've read this far together, and I know you're perishing to find out what comes next, so, all right. Gaston Donnet, as you've heard, stuck a kitchen knife right through Pierre's heart, and Pierre fell down dead. Then Gaston, appalled at what he'd done, dragged the boy's body into the little cuisine, and there he... Oh, there I tell you. Uh, there he removed Pierre's clothes and burned them in the small fireplace, ordinarily used to incinerate discarded skin and feathers and uh, other rubbish. Then he... Oh, this is fantastic. He, uh, well, he dissected and dismembered the body and removed every last bit of flesh. And then, <laughs> really, this part is superb. He prepared the flesh in any number of ways. Marinated, stuffed, gratinated, minced. Pickled, smoked. Oh, you do have to admire the man's ingenuity. Oh, say you do. And then the following day, there was such an outcry in the kitchen. Where is he? Where is that boy? Where is that good-for-nothing boy? Gaston, heaven's name, what's the matter? That stupid upstart. Pierre never showed up, Monsieur Sauvignet. I've waited all morning. I've searched the place. No sign of him. No word from him. Nothing. Gaston, calm yourself. What am I to do without a scullery boy? I shall find you a scullery boy. Within the hour, you shall have a scullery boy, and a good one, too. Because you know what? The Count is repeating his visit. The Count? Yes. He's enamored of your cooking. Who knows? One day he might invite the King to be his guest. Would he come? Who knows? Now, what shall we serve the Count tonight, huh? Monsieur Sauvignet... Is it true that the Count did not appreciate my truffles? I heard something to the effect... Oh, that was nothing. A trifle overcooked, he said, but it was nothing. Now, for this evening, first, uh, some scampi, perhaps? Leave the menu to me, monsieur. I shall prepare something... something... incomparable. Something 
new. You don't want to tell me what you have in mind. I want to work from my own inspiration, my own invention. I want it to be a, a surprise. Oh, I don't have to tell you, do I? That evening's repast was a mad success, a wild triumph, start to finish. Such fragrance, freshness, such combinations of flavors, eight courses, and each one better than the last. The Count and his dinner guests agreed to a man that never, never in their gastronomic lives had they enjoyed such a repast, and they sent a great storm of compliments to the genius chef. <laughs> oh, isn't it marvelous? Isn't it divine? For, of course, you know what they had eaten with such gusto. Oh, my dear Gaston, let me kiss you, Boutique. Uh, Oh, I kiss your hands. The Count and his friends enjoyed their dinner? Enjoyed. They were rapturous, Gaston. They were ecstatic. They were they were beside themselves. Ah, I'm so glad. And the new scullery boy, Francois, he, he served you well? Well enough. Francois's a good boy. But you, oh, you need no one but yourself and your incomparable talent. Ah, you're very kind. Gaston, I cannot keep a secret. I must tell you. What secret is that? The Count is coming back. Oh? And this time, tomorrow or the night after, but certainly within a week, he hopes to bring a guest, a solitary guest. A lady? Oh, I think not. A gentleman, a high-born gentleman, the most noble gentleman of them all. What you mean? A royal gentleman, Gaston. Him? Of course, he will come disguised. It wouldn't do. Oh, but... no, no. Of course not. No. And the Count wants you to prepare for this noble, this, this, uh, royal gentleman. The same dinner you prepared tonight. The same? The very same. Oh, my reputation is made. Just wait till everyone hears. <sighs> Francois. Francois. Come here, my boy. Oh, and uh, bring the large mallet with you. The one we use to hammer out the scallops. Oh, yes. Yes, that's the one. Hand it over. Thank you, Francois. Now, turn around. And I'll face the other way. Yes. That's it. Now stand very still. <coughs> I'm sorry, Francois. But what else could I do? say in the diary if the Count's guest was actually the king himself, although it does say that both gentlemen enjoyed their dinner immensely and sent the most effusive compliments to the chef. <laughs> However, according to what it says here, shortly thereafter, great outcries were raised by the mothers of the two vanished boys, and Gaston Donnet suddenly left Paris, never to return. <laughs> Which is quite understandable. Wouldn't you say? Ready to continue? Be very sure, won't you? Because there's more to come. And if your heart stops or your hair turns white, don't blame me. I warned you, didn't I? Yes, I did. I told you from the very beginning, this is a horror story. <laughs> Proceed, sweet ladies, kind gentlemen. Remember, this tale has come down to us in the form of a legend, built little by little by one storyteller after another. Each one delighted in what he had been told and then added whatever provocative details he thought might captivate his audience and seduce it into listening longer. That is, after all, how legends have come into being since the world began. 
Ready for the diary again, hmm? And for a change of scene? In 1829, New Orleans was already a fair city and a prosperous one. A proud and stylish and extremely forceful man, Mr. Poncet, was the leading citizen of New Orleans. And uh, into his office one day stepped a sturdy, aggressive man who looked to be about, oh, 50 years of age. Mr. Poncet, I believe. Ah, uh, the same, sir. And whom do I have the pleasure of addressing? Uh, my name is Ferro, sir. Lucien Ferro. Ah, a stranger to New Orleans? Well, not completely, sir. I have been plying my trade for some months. And your trade is? I am a shoemaker. Ah, 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 ah. You mend shoes, do you? No, I do not mend shoes, Mr. Poncet. I make shoes by hand. I cut every piece of leather. I sew every stitch with these two hands. I see. <laughs> well, now... What can I do for you, Mr. Perot? Everyone tells me you are the most influential man in New Orleans. I want to buy that building on Common Street. Uh, which one do you have your eye on? The one with three stories, six chimneys. It's the only one vacant at present. And you want to move your shoemaking enterprise into that building? I do, sir. Uh, isn't it a bit large? Three floors? Oh, one floor. Uh, the first one will suffice for my workroom. The third floor, that will be my home. I have walked through it. The light is wonderful. And the exquisite fireplaces in every room. Uh, but do you need so many rooms, a man living alone? No, nah, but I shall not be living alone. I got married yesterday. Did you now? Well, that's splendid. <laughs> Congratulations. As soon as Camille said yes, I made up my mind that the building on Common Street must be mine. Uh, you? You are married? I, uh, alas, sir, uh, I am a widower. But my beloved wife blessed me with a daughter, my angelic Monique who is more precious to me than all the world's treasure. Now, of course. Now, how old is Monique? Seventeen in a few months. <laughs> Soon she will make her debut. Oh, how splendid. It will be splendid, I promise you that, sir. I'm willing to spend half of all I've got to see that she's introduced to society in the grand style. Perhaps, uh, perhaps when she has chosen her gown and had it made... Perhaps you would come to me for the shoes? <laughs> Perhaps I shall. Uh, by the way, Ferro, what do you uh, propose to do with the second floor? You'll have your little shop on the first, you'll have your living quarters on the third, but uh, what about the second? What, what'll you do with that? Oh, I'll find a use for it. Things are settling down. Quite a prosaic little diary, after all. There are lots of mundane details I won't bother to pass on to you, all about Ferro fixing up the top floor. This very floor, which I stand on now, and moving in with his rather uh, colorless wife, Camille. Grandiose claims of how his shoemaking industry flourished. A lot of petty boasting that you wouldn't be interested in. But now... Ah, yes. Here it starts to get interesting again. <laughs> you like this part, I think. Good morning, good morning. Oh, uh, I was looking for Mr. Lucien Ferreau. Is he here? He's gone out on an errand. But he will be back. He didn't say when. Oh. I, uh, I wanted to ask him to make something for me, something very special for my daughter, Monique Ponce. <laughs> Uh, you, uh, you, you work here for Mr. Perot? I'm his wife. Oh, I'm sorry. I didn't realize I haven't had the pleasure. <laughs> uh, tell me, Mrs. Perot, uh, are you enjoying your new home? It's very nice. Your husband's fame is spreading, you know, all over New Orleans. So he tells me. Everyone says his slippers are the softest, the most pliable, so flexible. The ladies who've worn them say they can dance all night and on into the morning. So I've heard. I'll tell you why I'm here, Mrs. Ferro. I, 
I wanted to order a pair of his wonderful slippers for my daughter, Monique. Uh, look here, I brought a swatch of the material her dress is to be made from. My, my daughter has dark hair and dark eyes. Well, you can see, this is the material. Damask, isn't it? I believe that is what they call it. White damask, with just the faintest little thread of gold running through it. Beautiful. <gasps> Beautiful. Now, if uh, your husband can make shoes to match, <laughs> will he be back soon, do you think? I've got no way of knowing. He never tells me anything. Oh, well, I'll, I'll wait a bit. Suit yourself. <clears throat> Tell me, uh, your husband has rented out the second floor, hasn't he? Yes, he has. To a restaurateur, I believe. A private dining salon, they say. So they say. Small, but uh, elegant. So I've heard. Oh, forgive me, Mr. Faroe, but you, you talk as though you'd never seen it. I never have. Well, I am surprised. Your husband makes a, an excellent investment, and you you don't even care to see it? Oh, I care. It's grown famous all over New Orleans. The cuisine, everyone raves about it. So he tells me. But you have never dined there. Oh, no. Here's my husband now. Ah, uh, Mr. Ponce. Well, glad to see you, Mr. Perot. Mr. Ponce wants to order a pair of slippers. Oh, fine, fine. For Monique. For my daughter. I showed your wife the material her dress is being made from. You see, this, this is a small swatch. Very nice. I can get more if you'd care to make the slippers to match exactly. No. No, that wouldn't do at all. Well, I simply thought... I have my own materials. Well, if, if you insist... I do insist. My materials are a thousand times more pliant than this damask. Oh, whatever you say, Vero. Well, good day, Mrs. Farrow. Good day. How long was he here? Only a few minutes, Lucien. That's all. We chose to wait for you. What did you two talk about? Oh, your success for the most part. He mentioned the restaurant on the second floor. He asked if I'd ever dined there. He asked you that? Of course I said I hadn't. I said I'd never even set foot in the place. Why can't I see it, Lucien? Because I say you can't. But why can't I? I'd like to so much, Lucien. I've already told you why you can't. Because you say I can't. Precisely. I see. But I'd certainly like to. <laughs> hesitate to tell you what the next few pages of the diary hold. Oh, I don't think I can read on. Uh, yet I must, if we're ever to finish this macabre tale. So I'll just tell you straight out. The secret material Pharaoh used for his extraordinary slippers was human skin. There, I've said it. And the source of his supply was the slave market. Oh, my word, what a really terrible fellow he was. Yet you do have to admire his enterprise and his courage in setting it all down here. You do have to respect that, don't you? Yes, sir? Do you have a reservation? Oh, I yes. The name is Ponce. Table for two. Ah, may I show you to your table, Mr. Ponce? <laughs> I suppose you might as well, but keep an eye out for my daughter, will you? We're dining together. She has dark hair, dark eyes, and she'll arrive alone. I'll watch for her and bring her to you. Ah, here's your table. Can I order you an aperitif? Oh, no, thank you. Uh, I'll just wait for my daughter. As you wish, sir. My appetite has been whetted by what I've heard of your cuisine. I'm looking forward to... I beg your pardon. I think I see a lady alone. It could be your daughter. Ah, uh, Monique. Her name is Monique. Good evening, madame. You're expecting a gentleman? No, I'm by myself. I just wanted to see what it looks like. The management does not permit ladies unescorted. Are you the owner? I am the owner. 
Now, if you please... Lucien Perrault's my husband. He's your landlord. I cannot permit you to stay. He owns this entire building. It's his shoe shop on the first floor. I help him there sometimes. And we live on the third floor. But I've never set foot on this floor. And I thought... Absolutely I... impossible. If I could just look in this one... Ah. Uh, on the other hand... Come with me. I'll show you the whole place. Oh, it's, it, it's lovely. I'll show you everything. You're very kind. Through this door here, if you please. Is there another room? Yes. Through here. Oh, but... but Go on. Go on. But I, I don't... Uh, but this is the kitchen. It is the kitchen, and that is the back door. But I don't want... And you're leaving by the back door. No, I don't you're want... You're leaving now. I don't want to leave. Now, Camille, this instant... You... You called me Cammy. Oh. Oh, Lord. How do you know my name? Shut up, woman. Shut up. Why? Lucia. It's you. What on earth have you done to yourself? Shut your mouth. But you look so young. You you, you sound so young. You, oh, you're quite different. You be quiet and get out, Cammy. You're, you're ruining me. What's the point of this masquerade? Why are you pretending to be two people? You're a fine shoemaker. Why do you have to be a chef as well? Why should I be one man when I can be two? But which is my husband? What is my name? You can't go on with this deception. You must stop. Never. Never. We shall be so rich coming... No. No. I won't go on this way. I can't. I don't know who I am, who you are. I'll, I'll tell. I'll tell everyone. You'll tell no one. Uh, no, no, no. you come here just when everything was going so well? Poor Camille, indeed. For her desperately ambitious husband strangled her right there in his own kitchen. And that... Oh, merciful heavens, I... I hate to tell you what comes next. But what it says here... As he looked around him, and the pots and the pans and all the accoutrements of his profession, the thought crossed his mind that... Oh, how can I say it? He, uh... He thought to himself, What a fabulous, what a fantastic dish I shall serve my customers tomorrow night. perfectly content that such should be the case. I'll be back shortly with Act Three. Back to our legend, which was invented to curdle your blood and freeze the marrow in your bones. If it has not done so, then it has failed in its purpose. For to make you gasp, exclaim, to make the hairs on your body stand on end. Why, that is the very proper purpose of a horror story. Oh, I'm feeling better now. Able to read on, I think. There's a passage here that reveals what you must already have guessed. The proprietor of the restaurant on the second floor was not only Lucien Ferraud, he was likewise Gaston Donnet from Paris. <laughs> oh, dear me, how things have turned around in this world. It's enough to make one's head spin. Uh, well, anyway, the diary goes on quite calmly for a while, and then... Ah, Mr. Ferraud. Mr. Ponce. 
Welcome to my little shop. <laughs> You're looking extremely well. Oh, thank you. I never felt better. And your charming wife, is she doing well? Satisfactorily, thank you. I'm uh, sorry not to see her. She's elsewhere. You know, it was to your wife that I first showed the little swatch of damask. She admired it so much. And I told her about Monique's debut. She seemed most interested. Yes, I'm sure she was. Oh, yes, we had a nice little chat, nice little chat. We spoke of your tenant. My tenant? The man to whom you let the second floor. Oh, yes. And the restaurant that he opened? Why, it's become almost as famous in New Orleans as your delectable little slippers. Has it indeed? Yes. Well, shall I fetch the slippers, Mr. Ponce, uh, for your daughter? Ah, money slippers. Yes. Of course. That's what I came for. I have them right here. Here. Here they are. Oh, Mr. Ferro. Oh, my friend. You like them? Like them? I have no words to convey what I feel. How white they are. How pure and white. Yes. Oh, they are like jewels. Royal jewels. I call them my masterpiece. <laughs> Has your wife seen them? Any? Uh, No. I haven't shown them to her. It'd be so nice if she were to come in right now. That is unlikely. Before I take them home? You might have a long wait. Yes, you're right. I must take them home and show them to Monique. God bless you, Faro, and give you continued success. Have you guessed it? Has your clever little mind penetrated the secret of Lucien Faro's latest adventure? Have you succeeded in following the intricacies of his criminality? <laughs> if so, I don't have to tell you that the soft and supple slippers which Mr. Poncet carried home in triumph were made of the white young skin of Camille Ferro. Hello! Hello! Are you here? Where are you, you rogue? Come out here. <laughs> Mrs. Perot, are you here? I must see your husband at once. It is imperative. Well, I, I must see someone. I must see someone now. You were looking for oh, me? You villain, you monster. Something is wrong, sir. Being the devil. I, Mr. Ponce, well, what... Or are you a sorcerer, a wizard? Mr. Ponce. Or do you yes, have the sir. evil eye? Confess, you barbarian. But what is it? What must I confess to? Oh, you know very well. No, I don't. Mr. Poncet, you left here an hour ago with the slippers. You seemed to have... The slippers, yes, yes, the slippers. You don't like the Those slippers? Those cursed slippers, the abominable your slippers. Your daughter does not like the slippers. There are your slippers. Uh, take them. You're bringing them back? You take them and never let me see them again. You don't want them? You unwrap them and you'll see. Unwrap them and see what you have created. Unwrap them and behold your masterpiece. Well, I shall, I shall. Not in my presence, you won't. Wait till I'm out the door and never come near me again. What in the world? What went wrong? What? What's that? What's, what's that sound? Can, can it be? Is it? Is it in here? Ah, ah, my, my slippers! My, my beautiful white slippers! What, what's got into them? What, 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 is, what are you saying? Are you, are you mad? Wait, wait, no, come back! Stay still! Where are you going? Hey, what, what, what's got into you? No, 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 don't touch me! Not me! Hey, not me, not me, not me! Stay away from me! I, 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 I'm all scared. I, 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 what? They're, they're following me. You will leave me if I can get to my own floor, my own place. Let them on the floor, floor, to, to the top. I, I'll, I'll hide. Yes, yes, yes. I'll hide. I'll, I'll hide here. Quiet! They're here. They got in. They're coming at me. Ah, they're on me. They're crawling up my back. They're inside my hair. On my face. Oh, no, there's 
sliding down my back. I... Oh, good Lord. No. Who knew I was there on my diary? No one must ever see my diary. No one would ever know what I have done. If anyone is to know... Oh, no, no, no. Heaven forbid. Ah, where can I hide it so that... Yeah. Yes, yes. I'll hide it here behind this brick in the chimney. Yes, yes, here, here. Behind this brick. No one will ever find it. Aha. Now, now. I, I did put back the brick. I, oh, Lord! The slippers have slipped into the chimney. They're sitting on top of the diary. I, uh, well, at any rate, they're not chasing me. Well, put back the brick now. Yes, a peace. A little peace. Ah. Uh, uh, yes. No noise. All quiet now. It's all very quiet. Uh, Come in. Where are you? Where, where have you gone, Come in. Uh, and Francois. And Pierre. Oh. The police. They're here to get me. They're... They're going to arrest me. But, but what have I done? I haven't done anything. Just tried to make a living. Had little success. I, I, I'm innocent. I'm innocent. I'm innocent. Dear friends and citizens, may I have your attention? I know you... I know you expect from me some explanation of what was found in the place on Common Street a few weeks back. The authorities have said that I might tell you all that is known. Though how it all came about is a matter for conjecture. When the police broke in on the third floor of the Common Street building, they found... uh, Be brave, my friends. Be prepared for something... Horrendous. They found a dead man. They think they recognized him as the owner of the building. Though, to be brutally honest, they could not be absolutely sure because the body... The body, good people, had been... skinned. Yes, my friends, they have concluded that this poor man went mad and flayed himself alive. I know what you're saying to yourself. Yes, I do. You're saying, how could he read all that last part in the diary? How could anybody have written it down with the slippers carrying on like that? It's impossible. Well, you're right. The reason I know what happened is that I am Gaston Donnet, later Lucien Ferro. That is to say, I am his astral, his uh, etherical body, vulgarly called a ghost. So I know all about it. Oh, and that banging at the door that poor Donnet Ferro thought was the police... No, not so. It was two ordinary men who knocked. One wanted to buy the restaurant for an astronomical sum. The other had come all the way from Paris. A certain wealthy count had died and left a quantity of money to Gaston Donnet in memory of a marvelous meal he had cooked for the count some years before. All that work for nothing. Where did I go wrong? Where? It seems clear that there was a place on Common Street in New Orleans 150 years ago, and a man certainly did rent it and opened a shoe shop on the first floor and rented out the second floor for a restaurant and lived with his wife on the third floor. 
and later died. And no doubt there was something strange about the man. But those are all the verifiable facts we have. As for the rest, well, you know how people talk. And as they talk, legends are born. And legends grow. And legends never die. I'll be back shortly. story in modern literature started with The Castle of Otranto, written by Horace Walpole, quickly followed by The Mysteries of Udolfo by Anne Radcliffe. Honore Balzac took up the form and improved on it in France. Bulwer-Lytton rivaled him in England, and in America it was brought to a peak by our own Edgar Allan Poe. Let's face it, the horror story is here to stay. Our cast included Robert Dryden, Mary Jane Higby, Ian Martin, and Arnold Moss. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by ARM, Allergy Relief Medicine, and True Value Hardware Stores. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams... I'm E.G. Marshall. Physical illness is generally something that can be diagnosed, labeled, and treated. But mental illness, that can be another matter altogether. Of course, tests exist, and symptoms can be isolated. But with mental illness, we enter into the vague area of value judgment and personal opinion. Standards are frequently relative and depend on an individual's point of view. Yes, I am ill. But there are hundreds of madmen walking around free simply because you doctors are too ignorant to distinguish them from the sane. I agree with you. <laughs> you agree? <laughs> what do you know, anyway? You are the first intelligent man I've met in 20 years in this town. Ah, well, if you think that, then you've got me locked up here illegally, or you are as crazy as I am. <laughs> mystery drama, Ward 6, was adapted from a short story by Anton Chekhov, especially for the Mystery Theater by Percy Granger. It stars Norman Rose. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule, and True Value Hardware Stores. I'll be back shortly with Act One. spent his lifetime trying to prove that all which is rational is real, and all which is real is rational. But the great Spanish mystic, Unamuno, contends that reason builds on irrationality. Perhaps we can set ourselves a middle course at the outset of our story. If one looks deeply enough, one can always find an explanation for things. But that explanation won't always be rational. It may be banal or bizarre, or it may be both. We're in a small village in the Russian heartland 
of the last century. My name is Dariushka, and I don't understand anything. I readily admit it, though I doubt that makes me better than anyone else. For 20 years, I was the housekeeper for Andrei Yefimich, a doctor who was once in charge of our local hospital. The doctor was a good man, and he had noble intentions, so how could such a thing have happened? Why, well, I remember when he was first appointed to his position, the mayor himself showed him the hospital. Uh, well, doctor, <clears throat> there you have it. Now, what do you think? I think some improvements will have to be made. <laughs> no doubt, no doubt. I noticed filth and vermin everywhere. The attendants sleep in the wards. The superintendent's wife uses the bathtubs for storing potatoes. There's not a single thermometer and only two scalpels in the surgical room. <laughs> well, it may be as you say, of course. I, I have no experience with medicine myself. This is just what we need, you know. Young blood, a, a, a fresh point of view. I think that I've seen enough for one day. Oh, but there is still one more ward. It's uh, in the annex out back. It's ward six. Oh? What patients are kept there? Uh, the insane. Oh. Uh, well, here we are. Oh, uh, be careful of that rubbish there. Huh. <clears throat> Old mattresses, hospital gowns, shoes. Well, this must be cleaned up. Isn't there an attendant here? Right, that's me, Your Honor. Oh, uh, 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 this is Nikita. Uh, Nikita, this is the new doctor, Andrei Yefemich. Uh, everything's under control here. I see to that. The foyer is filthy. What's the ward like? Well, see for yourself. So dark. Well, sure, you can't give them candles. They'd burn the place down. Ah, the place reeks. It needs ventilation. Well, open windows. They'd only try to escape. Tell me, how many patients are there? Five. Everything's in order. You, you see how quiet they are. Because a man is quiet means nothing at all. What care are they given? Well, they're fed twice a day, and the barber comes once a month. Everything's under control, sir. Everything's under control. Yes. Thank you, I can see that. Oh. That man, Nikita, he's really not at all suited to be the attendant for that ward. I think he ought to be replaced. Oh, oh no, 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 no. Well, why not? Well, he is a retired soldier, you see. He, <clears throat> he lives on a pension which comes to him only because he holds a job here at the hospital. But I could see bruises on the patients where he's beaten them. Uh, yes, yes, yes. Well, it, it is up to you, of course. Perhaps I can see to it that he mends his ways then, that at least ventilates the ward. At first, the doctor was a very hard worker and saw patients from morning till night. And he was honest, too, no question about that. The only person in the whole village whose presence didn't irritate him was Mikhail, the postmaster. Mikhail wasn't especially well-educated, but he was the best the town had to offer. And he came to see the doctor almost every evening. Hello, hello, here I am. What a day. Well, my friend, and how are you? You look concerned. Is something the matter? It all seems so futile, Mikhail. I just had two new cases of instruments installed in the surgical ward, but I can't see what earthly good they'll do unless the ward itself is kept cleaner. Well, well, what can you do? The town is too poor to support a decent hospital without help from the district. But the district refuses to build a new hospital on the ground that we already have one. Well, look at it this way. Who uses the hospital? Only working men and peasants, and they've got nothing to complain about. They'd be worse off at home. In theory, a hospital exists to cure disease, not spread it. I give orders, yet they never seem to be carried out. Daryushka. Yes, doctor. Daryushka, we might have some beer now. Yes, sir. Right away. One can see very clearly where the problem lies. You're too timid, Andre. Mind you, that's not meant as a criticism, just an observation. <laughs> you think that I'm timid? Well, look how you ordered our beer just now from your servant. We might have some beer. But what was wrong with that? 
I sometimes suspect you must have taken a vow once never to raise your voice. Why should I raise my voice with Dariushka? Not here in your own home. At the hospital. You're in charge there. You're the leader, as it were. People look to you for decisions. Excuse me, sir. Here's your beer. Oh, I'm sorry. Uh, thank you, Dariushka. Will there be anything else? No, nothing more just now. Very well. <laughs> well you see, you did it again. That apologetic tone. That was my nature, I suppose. Anyway, none of this matters. Giving orders, taking them. What's the difference? What difference does any of it make? A hundred years from now, we'll all be dead and forgotten. <laughs> Absolutely right. My friend, I cannot stay today. A comrade of mine from my old cavalry regiment is in town. You will excuse me? Of course. And mind what I said. A man in your position needn't apologize for giving orders. I suppose not. Au revoir. Good night, my friend. Daryushka. Yes? Daryushka, I might have dinner now, if it won't be too much trouble. Once the doctor settled into the routine of life in our village, the irregularities at the hospital seemed to bother him less and less. The futility of trying to cure the endless stream of patients depressed him. And eventually, he turned his duties over to his assistants and gave up going to the hospital every day. Over the years, his one regular visitor continued to be the postmaster, Mikhail Aberyanich. Here I am. How are you today, my friend? You're probably getting sick of me by now, huh? On the contrary, <laughs> I'm delighted to see you. They would sit and smoke in silence for a while. It was always the doctor who began the conversation. What a pity that our town is devoid of people who enjoy intelligent conversation. It is the mind which separates us from the animal. The mind which is the only possible source of enjoyment. Yet we neither see nor hear any traces of intellect around us. I tell you, it's not like the old days. Life was gay, people were clever, there were values. I often dream about intelligent people and conversations with them. There was the wife of one of the battalion commanders. <laughs> she used to put on an officer's uniform and drive off alone into the mountains. It was said she was having a romance with some prince in one of the native villages. We can only hope things will be better in the future. <sighs> if only we could return to the past. Day in, day out, it was always the same. So nice, so orderly. The doctor hardly troubled himself at all anymore about the hospital, but left it to run itself. Then, one day, only a few years ago, the mayor came to call on the doctor, who was, as usual, reading in his study. Yes, Andrei Yefevich, I come with some good news, uh, with some excellent news. Uh, uh, the district council has magnanimously decided to contribute 3,000 rubles a year to your hospital. 3,000? Why, then at last we can renovate some of the ward. Oh, but the money has already been spent. <laughs> They've hired another doctor as your assistant. But I have one assistant already. Now, in my opinion, it would be better to buy medicine and new bedding. Uh, nevertheless, Dr. Khobotov arrives tomorrow. There you have it, Dr. Khobotov. What do you think? A well, fine hospital, doctor. You're to be congratulated. That is your honest opinion. Well, of course. Well, the stench is rather strong, I'm afraid. Oh, it's to be expected. Besides, one gets used to it. And no matter how many times I ask for things to be cleaned up, it never seems to get done. Mm, the sign of a busy institution. So, they've finally given me the money I asked for years ago, and with it they have sent me you. I am honored, Doctor. And happy to be here in this town, working with you. You are happy to be in this town? Have you looked around? To be sure. This village is a pit. I know very well that miraculous changes are taking place in medicine. Unheard of operations can now be performed. Anywhere else, the public would have demolished this abomination years ago. And yet, and... Uh, what's the difference? 
Antiseptics, Pasteur, hygienic psychiatry, yes. But the essentials haven't changed. Sickness and mortality remain the same. So it's all futile and senseless and, well, there's not a wit's difference between the best Viennese clinic and my hospital, and why should I trouble myself? I couldn't agree with you more, Doctor. And now, if uh, you'll excuse me, this tour of inspection has given me a most marvelous appetite. And then, only a few months ago, the rumor began. A strange rumor. Dr. Andrei Yefimich has begun visiting Ward 6. That's the annex out behind the hospital. The lunatic ward. Dr. Andrei Yefimich seems to be a man with an intense love of honesty and reason. But he lacks the willpower and self-confidence to organize a reasonable and honest life around him. And now he has taken to visiting the lunatic ward. It could be that years of futile routine have driven him mad. But there is another possibility. From what we've seen of the town and its inhabitants, the madhouse just might be the sanest place in the area. I'll return shortly with Act Two. A mind is neither water, shell, skin, nor fire, says Edward Dahlberg. It is good and then evil, savage and then domestic. We are each of us bound by the way we see the world. And that vision can become distorted by a process as gradual as aging itself. Indeed, it is possible to lose one's grasp of reality, not in any cataclysmic fashion, but step by step. And not only by wrong actions, but by no action at all. I can't say for certain when the doctor started his daily visits to the lunatic ward. But I think it was one afternoon when he was out by the gate saying goodbye to Mikhail. Moisika came by. Moisika was the one patient from the ward six who was allowed to roam freely. He was a harmless old man who begged bits of food or kopecks from those he passed. This particular day, was cold, and Moisika was barefoot. The doctor watched him in pity, and then followed him to the annex. Good evening, Nikita. Yes, sir, Your Honor. I saw Moisika. He was barefoot, and it's quite damp out. Perhaps you could see to it that he gets a pair of boots. Otherwise, I'm afraid he might catch cold. Yes, sir. Yes, Your Honor. I'll report it to the superintendent at once. Please do. Ask him in my name. Say that I requested it. <laughs> The doctor has come at last. I congratulate us. Who's that? Who's that? <laughs> New patient, Ivan Dmitrich, uh, the uh, young <laughs> aristocrat you admitted three months ago. Well, the doctor has stopped to visit us. The dirty dog. Look, don't worry, Your Honor. I'll, I'll shut him up. No, no, no. Yeah. I'll speak to him. Yeah. Kill the cat. Go kill him. No, 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 no. Killing's too good for him. Drown him in the swamp. Why would you want to kill me? Why? Oh, thief. I've never stolen anything. Quack! Hangman! Now, try to compose yourself. Tell me, what is it that makes you so angry? Why do you keep me here? Because you are ill. So? So are thousands of others. But they walk around free because you are too ignorant to distinguish them from the sick. That's probably quite true. Yes. So why am I shut up here as a scapegoat for all of you? Eh? It is immoral. It, it is illogical. Unfortunately, morals and logic have nothing to do with it. It all depends on chance. <laughs> well, you admit that then, do you? Yes, I do. Then let me out. I can't. Why not? You're the doctor. What would be the use? The police and townspeople would only bring you back. <laughs> yeah. well, what, what am I to do then? I don't know. The best thing would be to run away, but that would be useless. Oh. Better times 
Better times will come, won't they? I mean, justice will triumph. I don't expect to see it, but other men's grandchildren will, and I rejoice with them. I congratulate them. From behind these bars, I send them my blessing. I see no reason for rejoicing. Even if we do away with prisons and asylums, the essence of things won't change. People will still fall ill, grow old, and die. We'll all end up the same in the coffin or the pit. And immortality? I don't believe in it. You're an educated man. Yes, I attended the university. Why are you here? I have a persecution mania. In any case, you know how to think. That's what's important. You can find solace within yourself. Oh, I love life. I love it passionately. Give me news of the outside world. T tell me, what is it like in town? The town. Well, the town is insufferably boring. There's no one to talk to. No new people. Except a young doctor by the name of Khabotov. <laughs> yes, I met him. He is a boor. Oh, no. <laughs> well, yes, he is. A man of no culture whatsoever. Yes, uh, but, but, but how are things in general? Uh, what do they write about now in the newspapers and magazines that come from Moscow and Petersburg? Well, let me see now. Where to begin? You know, in all the time that I've lived here, you are the first man I've been able to talk to. Good day, Ivan Dmitrich. How do you feel today? You won't get a word out of me. Well, that's strange. Do you think that I'm a spy? Spy or a doctor. It's all the same. Doesn't it follow, then, that there's nothing to be afraid of? It has been so long since I've lived like a human being. It is unbearably foul in here. But is there any difference, really, between a comfortable study and this ward? Contentment lies within man, not outside it. It's all in the mind. Marcus Aurelius said pain is merely the representation of pain. Change the image, reject it, and the pain will disappear. <laughs> and I must be an idiot. One must strive for a comprehension of life. Oh. That's all. Well, why do you consider yourself an expert on suffering, huh? Have you ever suffered? Well, I... Mm, as well. Uh, no. For more than 20 years now, you've worked here as a doctor. You have a servant, a free house, and the right to turn all your duties over to your assistants. You beguile yourself with all kinds of nonsensical thoughts. <laughs> Strive for comprehension. No difference between this ward and a warm study. You've never seen life. This isn't philosophy. It's laziness and mental stagnation. <laughs> you know, I must confess that talking with you gives me great pleasure. Good day, Daryushka. Is the doctor in? Hello, Mikhail. No, I'm afraid he's gone to the annex again. Again? It seems he goes there every day now. Oh, it's worse than that. Twice a day. And today, three times. It is strange. Oh, go to him, Mikhail. Talk to him. Me? What would I say? You're his friend. The rumor about his frequent visits to the lunatic ward is spreading everywhere. But he is the head doctor, after all. And if he chooses to visit a certain ward, he must have a perfectly good reason. Still. Still, I'll go and see him. Nikita. Yes? Oh, it's you, postmaster. Is Andrei Yefimich here? Uh, yes, but I don't think he'd thank you for disturbing him. He's in uh, consultation with one of the patients. Yes, uh, so I've heard. Uh, don't ask me what good it does. Oh? Uh, he sits and talks to that Ivan Dmitrich for hours, but I've never once seen him write a prescription. Do you suppose perhaps I might uh, overhear a bit of their conversation? Well, that's easy enough. Come over here. I'll uh, open the door a crack and you can listen. Oh, be careful. Uh, uh, they won't notice you. Not them, not the way they carry on. You'll never succeed in converting me to your beliefs. You know nothing of reality. 
for you have never suffered. I have absolutely no intention of converting you. That's not the point, my friend. Suffering and joy are transitory. Ah. The point is that we can think. You and I were capable of reasoning. That's what creates the bond between us. You see how they Reasoning sit together on his bed, side by side? Is it always like this? Oh, yes, to be sure. I've heard enough. Dr. Kobotov, the assistant, was here yesterday. He listened, too. What does he think? It's his opinion that Andrei Efimich has completely lost his moorings. <laughs> Daryushka. Uh, yes, doctor. Daryushka, have you noticed anything odd lately? Odd? Yes. I could swear that people are behaving differently towards me. Oh, you must be imagining things. The nurse looks at me inquisitively. And then they avert their eyes and they don't speak to me. They can help it. Oh, I'm sure it will pass. Then there is something. But what? I, I don't know. A letter came today while you were out. A letter? It's, uh, it's from the mayor. Oh. The mayor wants me to come see him first thing in the morning. He says it's a very important matter. <laughs> Dr. Andrei Yefimich. Good morning, Your Honor. <clears throat> well, I have a uh, deposition that concerns you. We're uh, waiting for you in my office. We? Uh, yes, yes, yes. Your assistant, Dr. Kowalov, and uh, a number of representatives from the district council. Uh, uh, this way, Doctor. <clears throat> now, gentlemen, <clears throat> may I present Dr. Andrei Yefimich Ragin. Hello, Kobotov. Good morning, Doctor. Uh, yeah, please, if we can proceed. <clears throat> The uh, deposition concerns uh, the setting up of a new dispensary. Well, why do that? Well, uh, what that says is there's insufficient room in the main hospital. Yes, my suggestion is to uh, renovate the left wing. Uh, yes, uh, well, what, uh, well, what do you think, Doctor? I submitted such a plan years ago, and it was ignored. And now things have come to such a pass, I think renovation would be too costly. Uh, I see. Well, uh, then, well, what would you advise? <laughs> Shutting down the hospital altogether. What? Oh, really, Doctor, come now. Except that it would serve no purpose. Oh, wait, wait, I'm uh, not quite sure we follow you. If you drive physical and moral impurity out of one place, it only moves to another. Doctor, you consider our hospital impure? You work there, Khabotov. You're a doctor. The place is understaffed, filthy, and underfinanced. But with diligence, couldn't this be remedied? Why bother? It's all a fraud. A fraud? The mortality rate never goes down. The sick never stop coming. To give any real help to the number of people who need it is impossible. Ergo, you have fraud. Well, well can't we talk of uh, alleviating these conditions? But why alleviate them? Since death is natural, why work to keep people from dying? But it's our job as doctors to ease suffering. Why? Suffering leads to self-perfection. If we learn to ease pain with pills and drops, gentlemen, to what will it eventually lead? The complete abandonment of religion and philosophy. Why should any of us here in this room be spared illness when our insipid lives would be empty as an amoebas were it not for our suffering? Uh, yes. <clears throat> Thank you, Doctor, for coming to uh, give us your opinion on the dispensary. Now it's uh, time for us old fellows to take a rest, eh? <laughs> good day. Uh, yes, good day. Good day. Huh. I think they weren't interested in a dispensary at all. That was a committee appointed to investigate my mental condition. Andre, Andre, you finished. Hmm? Oh, oh, Mikhail. Mikhail, what are you doing here? My dear friend, you are not well. Dr. Hobotov has told me that for the sake of your health, it is essential that you have a rest. I'm taking a leave of absence in a few days myself, going away for a change of air. Prove to me that you're my friend. Come with me. Mikhail, I feel perfectly well. I don't want to go away. Don't you understand? You must. 
before it's too late. Yeah. Well, you may be right. Or maybe not. What difference does it make? We all end up in the same place. If those people consider you ill, your very life is in danger. The mind may still function. Indeed, in a doctor's case, we might conclude it functions too well. For it is almost as if he were using a certain kind of philosophy and logic to hasten his own doom. I'll return in a few minutes with our final act. It has been observed that either we control events or the events will control us. Dr. Andrei Yefimich is now threatened by the very system he might have reformed. And just how serious his situation is can be realized if we remember this fact. While today attempts are made to cure the mentally ill, in the 19th century, if you were locked up as insane, that was usually the last you were seen or heard of. After the doctor's visit to the mayor's office, Events moved very quickly indeed. I confess I couldn't understand it at all. Why, for 20 years, everything had been exactly the same. The doctor had risen each morning at 8 o'clock. He'd eaten his breakfast and then gone to the hospital to see patients. He'd return from the hospital in the middle of the morning and go straight to his study, where he would read for hours on end. Every half hour. He'd pour himself a glass of vodka that he drank without taking his eyes off his book. At three o'clock, he approached the kitchen door. He'd clear his throat and say, Uh, Dalyushka, I might have dinner now. He ate in silence, always lost in some deep thought. After dinner, he would pace from room to room, his arms folded on his chest, still thinking, still lost in thought. And then, toward evening, the postmaster, Mikhail, would come for his visit. And that was how it was, year in and year out. He never raised his voice. He was never violent, never would have thought of harming a soul. A week after he was called to the mayor's office, an important-looking person came to the house, a man I'd never seen before. I heard him suggest to the doctor that he send in his resignation. He talked for half an hour. The doctor sat very still. He didn't say a single word. Finally, the strange man left. Less than an hour later, Mikhail came by. Mikhail, I, I feel perfectly well. I cannot go away. Why not? To go somewhere for no reason? Without my books, without Dariushka, to disturb my routine? Oh, it's too fantastic an idea. You must. You absolutely must, Andre. Really, for your own health. Ah, well, if it's true, that the stupid people here think I'm a madman. Perhaps I should. Ah, but where would we go? Moscow, Petersburg, Warsaw. I spent the five happiest years of my life in Warsaw. What an amazing city. Let us go, my friend. We'll recapture our youth <laughs> while there's still time. And in less than a week, they were on the stagecoach, which would take them to the train station, 200 miles from our village. When we got to Moscow, Mikhail put on his old military uniform. When we were out on the streets, the soldiers saluted him. And tomorrow, just think of it, Andre. Tomorrow we leave for Warsaw. My dear man, 
Why should I go to Warsaw? Go without me. Let me go home. I beg you. On no account. Warsaw is an amazing city. I'm sure it is. I spent the five happiest years of my life there. I'm sure you did, but please, please, you go on by yourself. But the doctor lacked the will to insist on having his own way. So they both went to Warsaw. There, Mikhail fell prey to the gaming tables. He lost all his money and had to borrow 500 rubles from Andrei Yefimich. After making the loan and paying for the trip, which he'd only gone on in the first place because his friend had insisted, the doctor returned home with 86 rubles to his name. What was supposed to have been a vacation had frayed his nerves and left him broke. But that wasn't all. Dariushka! Dariushka, I'm home! Andrei, how good to see you. Oh. Dr. Khobotov, what are you doing here? Come in, come in. Yes, thank you. Well, how was your trip? Insufferable. Mikhail considered it his duty to talk heartily to me the entire time. Where, where is Dariushka? Uh, she's not here anymore. Is there something wrong? No. Is she all right? Nothing has happened to her, has it? No, no. She's living in the house of Maria Belyova. Living there? I don't understand. Well, there's a room there for you, too. But this is my house. Didn't you know? I'm head of the hospital now. Oh. Oh. I see. But, of course, I couldn't know. I... You see, I, I've been away. Oh, well, I, I, I was probably gone too long. Huh? Uh, what happened? Happened? Our life was much more cramped now. But Andre still rose at eight. And after morning tea, he would sit down to read. But... Reading no longer seemed to interest him. He even began going to church, something he'd never done in 20 years. He went twice to see that madman, Ivan Dmitrich, in Ward 6. Why do you keep coming to see me? Leave me in peace. I grow sick of empty prattle like a long time ago. There's only one thing I want in repayment for all the suffering you scoundrels have subjected me to, and that is solitary confinement. Both Dr. Sibotov and Mikhail felt obliged to drop in on the doctor frequently to see how he was getting on. Now, well, today, my friend, you've got much better color. It's high time you were improving, my colleague. You'll live to a hundred. Just see if you don't. God, leave me alone. Get out. Both of you. What? Stupid people. Fools. I don't want your friendship or your medicine. Your vulgarity is sickening. Andrei Yefimich, you haven't moved since your two friends left. Are you sure you're all right? I, I must go. This is terrible. It's awful. What have I done? I must go at once. Go where? Andre, wait! Where are you going? Where are your muffler? It's cold out! Mikhail, my friend. Andre, you see me? I have come to apologize for my outburst. I, I want to ask for your forgiveness. I, I cannot for the life of me imagine why I was so rude. I have forgotten about it already. Oh, where was my intellect, my Act. What happened to my my comprehension of things? Bygones are bygones. It never entered my head to take offense. Illness is no joke, you know. What? So you, you too think that I am ill? Why do you refuse to take it seriously? You live in cramped, dirty quarters with no money for medical treatment. Really, I implore you, take my advice. What advice? Go to the hospital. Go? You, you mean my hospital? They'll give you proper treatment. Oh, my dear friend, don't believe it. It's a trick. I'm not ill. I'm simply caught 
in a vicious circle from which there is no way out. Go to the hospital. Ah, the hospital or the pit, it's all the same. I'm caught. Now everything, even my closest friend's interest, is leading to only one thing. My ruin. Dr. Khobotov is here to see you. Hmm. Doctor, I... I want to apologize. No, 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 no. Not a word of that now. I've come on business. Oh, on business? Yes, I, I want to ask you to join me in a consultation. <laughs> You're offering me a chance to make a bit of money, huh? Mm, yes. That's very kind of you. Tell me, where is your patient? At the hospital. Oh, the hospital. Yes. Uh, to be more exact, it's in Ward 6. <laughs> I've been wanting to show you this for a long time now. A most interesting case. Now, come into the ward. One of the uh, patients here has developed a complication in the lungs. Mm. Now, uh, you wait here. I'll be right back. I'm just going to get a stethoscope. Kobotov? Oh, Nikita. Hey, uh... Brought you a dressing gown and some slippers, Your Honor. Please uh, change your clothes. Oh, yes. This is your cot here next to Ivan Dmitrich. Um, don't worry. You'll get well, God willing. It's all the same. A hospital or the pit, a frock coat or a uniform or this gown. It's all the same. <laughs> Who is that? The doctor in a hospital gown. <laughs> so they've locked you up, too. It is delightful. Oh, no. No, no. You see, this is some sort of misunderstanding. Mm -hmm. I must speak to them. Yes, it won't do any good. It's getting dark. It's time for my beer and cigarettes. Nikita must have my cigarettes by mistake when he took my clothes. I'm going out. I'll, I'll tell them to give us some light. <laughs> Where are you going? Nikita, you, you must have taken my cigarettes. It's time you were in bed. But I'm only going out for a minute just to walk a little in the yard. You know that's not allowed. But, but what difference will it make if I go out? I don't understand. Nikita, I must go out. Don't cause any disorder now. But this is tyranny. I want to go out. You have no right to stop me. Open the door. Open They'll it. They'll never let us out. We'll rot in here. No, no. Open the door, you dumb brute. Open it up or I'll break it down. I'll teach you to cause a row. was not a writer to use the supernatural for striking dramatic effect. 
He built his stories from the brick and mortar of the smallest details of daily experience. And in the process, he showed how meaningless labels like sanity and insanity can be. And why they will always be with us. I'll return with a final word in a moment. It is said that God showed Solomon highest favor because he asked for understanding rather than a long life. But understanding without action can turn sour and pessimistic and lead a man to his ruin, especially if the times he lives in are less than perfect. And what times are not? Our cast included Norman Rose, Bryna Rayburn, Earl Hammond, Russell Horton, and Eugene Trubnik. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by True Value Hardware Stores and Contact the 12-hour cold capsule. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams. it is to be alive, but ah, to be young is heaven. Youth, squandered gold so quickly spent. But how else could it be? If youth were the careful and prudent time of life, how could one enjoy it? If only you could have youth at a mature age, when you would really know what to do with it. But that would be like having your cake and eating it. Well, who says you can't? You want me to become a Spy, Colonel? What a horrid word, spy. No, never. Say better, a guide. But you're saying I must... Re Different? No. Aren't those who ridicule the people's government also very sick? Aren't they also in desperate need of help? Well... As a true friend, have you a choice? Our mystery drama, If I Can't Have You, was written especially for the Mystery Theater by Sam Dan and stars Bob Caliban and Russell Horton. It is sponsored in part by ARM, Allergy Relief Medicine. I'll be back shortly with Act One. Oh, come on. Stain over paint? Now you can stain over paint with Olympic Latex Stain. Stain over paint? Why, that's impossible. Olympic Latex Stain covers paint with rich, mellow color, cleans up in water, and lasts for years. Great idea. And right now, you'll save two fifty dollars a gallon on Olympic Latex July 14th at participating Olympic dealers. Attractive, talented, famous. Victor Volovsky plays the violin. Vaskovia Suslov is the cellist. Sergei Berdayov is at the piano. Each is a virtuoso. 
and they have combined to form this magnificent chamber music trio. They live in a country where this type of music is taken very seriously. They call themselves the February Trio. In their country, February is almost a holy word because it is the month of the Great Revolution, an event that not only changed their nation, but the rest of the world as well. However, here we are in a glittering concert hall where the trio, as usual, is holding its audience spellbound. But, as you will notice, the beautiful harmony, the marvelous blend, the magnificent togetherness seems to exist only on stage. Sergey, shouldn't we take another bow? Oh, why don't you relax, Victor? But they're still on their feet out there. Mm, I suppose we could milk them for another ovation. <laughs> Look who's suddenly talking about milking an audience. I could have gone out for a smoke during your 16-bar solo. Oh, well, the two of you stop it. Now, act your age. Dearest Praskovia, if Victor acted his mental age, we should have to buy him a perambulator. <laughs> Victor, are we having supper at the apartment tonight? Of course we are. Oh, uh, no, uh, we're not. Why not? Uh, I have an interview for, for the television. Oh, with whom? With whom do you think? With Mademoiselle Fifi. Why don't you cut it out, Sergei? Her name is Marina Trigorin. Mm, you should hear her. Mon cher, you play with such fools. Formidable. Where does she come off talking like that? She's a girl from the Donuts Basin. Her old man's a coal miner. Sergei. You're just jealous. Me? Jealous of, of who? What? Does the distinguished critic of Red Music Magazine go out of her way to interview you? Red Music Magazine. You have to be a party hack to write for it. This Marina Trigorin with her pathetic pretensions masquerading as a person of culture. She's a joke. Well, why do you have to be interviewed at night, Victor? Darling, the program is on tonight. Well, where's the interview to be held? At Comrade Tregoran's apartment. Oh, don't you love the way he says that? Comrade Tregoran. Makes her sound like some serious, austere spinster. And she isn't? Everyone knows she got the job because of certain physical attributes. Are you going to listen to him and ruin your evening, Prescovia? Well, why don't we all go to the interview? Oh, uh, we can't. It's, uh... A rather small apartment. Oh? And it will be filled with uh, technicians and cameras and cables. You know, those things turn into a madhouse. And besides, Marina doesn't like to have strangers on the set. Strangers? Oh, well, you know, uh, people who are not directly involved in the telecast. Besides, the poor girl is really quite shy. I'm going home, Victor. Praskovia, darling. You know I could never seriously look at another woman. You just try not to be late. You are a great help, Sergei. You are not being honest with her, Victor. Ah, Sergei. Because one enjoys the nectar of a rose, does it mean one must forego the sweetness of all the other flowers in the field? Oh, Victor, you have absolutely no moral sense. How can you say that? You don't deserve Praskovia. Nobody deserves Praskovia. She's an angel. Too good for any of us. Well, then let us say, you deserve her least. And who deserves her most, Sergei? You? I would make her happy. And what do I make her? Miserable. Evidently, she would rather be miserable with me than happy with you. Hmm. Well, what do you plan to talk about on this interview? I don't know what Marina is going to ask. Oh, yes, you do. Stupid, insipid questions. They're the best kind. Really? They're the safety. Ah! Safety, that's the watchword, isn't it? Sergey, what's gotten into you this evening? I know what you'll talk about. How the aspirations of the people are expressed in music. What nonsense. Does the music care who plays it? You might be a little bit more careful how you talk. The only people who truly have aspirations in this country are the ones who are in prison. Sergey, don't say that. Not even to me. Not even in private. Why, Victor? Would you ever inform on me? How do you know this dressing room isn't bugged? Why can't we talk about the government and what we really think of these insipid television programs? Because we would wind up being exiled to the mines. That's the kind of government we have. Come on, Sergey. When did this country have a government that was any good? 
For the last thousand years, no matter who was running it, didn't the government always oppress the people? So, you admit it. The truth is, the tyranny does not affect you and me. It's bad, perhaps, for writers, artists, scientists, people like that, whose stock in trade is ideas. But you and I, we're musicians. We deal in emotions. Aren't we free to concertize as we like? I'm sorry I started the discussion. You refuse to see it. You're angry about Praskovia. What can I tell you, Sergei? The better man won. Oh, Sergei. May I come in, Praskovia? All right. I, um, I brought some bread and cheese and sausages. I, I knew with Victor away you'd forget all about supper. You always know how to do the little things. Well, that's probably because the big things are beyond me. Don't say that. Mm, I failed to accomplish the biggest and most important thing in my life. Pascovia, what do you see in him? Mmm, everything smells delicious. Oh, Sergei. I'm really sorry. He's careless, unreliable. Is this how you talk about your best friend? Because he is my best friend. He has no secrets from me. Unfortunately, love doesn't ask the right questions. Actually, love asks no questions. <laughs> if love were sane and sensible, I'd be in love with you. Would you? You're a very logical, dependable person, Sergei. Both feet on the ground. You give a woman a feeling of security. And still... You chose Victor. I didn't choose him. Love chose him. Well, it's almost time for that uh, television program. Oh, must we watch that abomination? No, you mustn't be so hard on people, Sergei. Oh, wait till you hear this woman. You'll think I'm being kind to her. Go, go ahead. Turn on the set. Good evening, citizens. This is Marina Trigorin with another sparkling melodic page from Red Music. And who is sitting here beside me but the world's handsomest violinist, Viktor Ivanovich Belovsky. Darling, show the people that radiant smile. Mm. This is going to be worse than I thought. The French have a word for him. Adorable. Viktor Ivanovich, darling, say something. Well, turn him off. He's said enough. Well, he hasn't said anything yet. He's already said everything. What do you mean? I can tell by the way they look at each other. What can you tell? Everything. They exchange the glances of a man and a woman who already know each other very well. Oh, turn on the set. But you, you told me to turn it off. I'll turn it on. His playing, as everyone knows, is, is absolutely, as they say in French, comme il faut. Millions know the man of music, but who knows the man himself? Is it true that you and that very sweet Praskovia Suslav, the cellist in your trio, are engaged? Oh, yes. Uh, does Praskovia know how lucky is. Sometimes. Oh, turn it off. I wish you'd make up your mind. It isn't going to get any better. Is it true that you and that very sweet Praskovia Suslav are engaged? Oh, you'd think I was a chocolate bar. What does he see in her, anyhow? Oh, she is pretty. Oh, what am I going to do, Sergei? You could marry me. Mm. Where did you find such heavenly sausage? I said you could marry me. Oh, dear, Sergei, I don't love you. You think you don't love me. I know I don't love you. Only because you refuse to give yourself a chance to try me for a while. Try you? I love you so completely you don't have to share me with anyone, especially Mademoiselle Fifi. Oh, this caviar divine. But it's not that good. Love me instead of Victor. No, but you're his best friend. Then why isn't he here to protect his interests? He becomes infatuated easily. But he always comes back to me. One day he'll meet someone who won't let him come back. He may have met her already. Sergei, I... No, oh, you're worried. Already there are shadows, little lines of care on your adorable face. Praskovia, 
be in love with me. But, but I'm not. Try it. Who knows? Perhaps you actually will begin to love me. At any rate, it will do you no end of good. How? Why does Victor feel free to try his wings? Because he is secure in the knowledge that his own little bird will never leave the nest. She will wait patiently, lovingly for him to return. Isn't that so? Oh, well... Why not give Victor something to worry about? I... What have you got to lose? Prescovia, pretend to love me. What can happen? Either Victor will behave himself or you will discover that all along... I've been the one for you. I don't know. Look, we shall turn on the television set. No. It should be against the law for one man to be so handsome and so talented. You see how she clutches his arm? Talents like a vulture. Oh, turn it off. How he eats it up. The fool. Shall we give Victor something to worry about? Yes, Sergey. We shall definitely give Victor something to worry about. These things, they start out innocently enough. When the loved one's attention begins to wander, someone suggests making him jealous. However, as no less an authority on love than our own George Washington said, when we are young... We are made of highly combustible materials, but what burns brightly is consumed quickly. You must agree that we are dealing here with some highly volatile objects. We'll have some sparks in Act Two. Jealousy is always born together with love as a very discerning French philosopher once said. And therefore, we may safely assume that they are twins. And not just ordinary twins, but Siamese twins at that. They are indivisible. Where you find one, you must also deal with the other. Love and jealousy. Has anyone ever been able to separate them? Not in this particular story, anyhow. We have no time to lose, darling Prascovia. You must leave at once. Leave you? Of course. You shouldn't be here when Victor returns. Where can I go? To my place. Your place? From now on, you're to live with me. But uh, I don't love you. For the time being, you'll pretend to live with me. Well, as long as that's clearly understood. It's understood for just as long as you care to understand it. All right. When you get to know me, really know me as a man, not just as the pianist in a trio, you will awake one morning and exclaim, Sergei is the one that I truly love. Well, you are right. This will teach him a lesson. Absolutely. He'll come crawling back to me on his hands and knees. That stupid television person. Does Pascovia know how lucky she is? Sometimes. Oh. You'll eat those words, my fine victor. <laughs> Shall we answer it? It's your apartment, Sergei. It has now also become your apartment, Boscovia. Let me in, Boscovia. I know you're there. Go away, Victor. You're becoming a nuisance. Open the door. We'll see you promptly at nine in the morning for rehearsal. I'll be bringing this bell all night. Oh, let him in, Sergei. As you like, darling. What's going on here? Well, that should be obvious. I no longer choose to live with you. Instead, I have chosen to live with Sergei. Why? Because, uh, in answer to a question posed by that intellectual giantess, Mademoiselle Fifi, I do not know how lucky I am to be engaged to the adorable, desirable Victor Ivanovich Volovsky. Raskovia, you know I love you. Me? Among others. And where do you figure in this, Sergei? Sergei is a fine, spiritual, perceptive human being. Yes, oh, this fine, spiritual, perceptive human being doesn't hesitate one second to steal his best friend's fiance. Steal? Is this some bourgeois society where one human being is the property of another? Oh, cut it out, Sergei. Go ahead, Proskovia. 
Live with Sergei for a while. See what a pain in the neck this fine, perceptive human being can be. Spiritual. <laughs> oh, you'll come crawling back to me. I may or may not forgive you. Yes, sir. Uh, is there any mail for me, Olga Fedorovna? Oh, the government should have a special post office just for you. Yeah, all right. I'll 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 look at all of it later. So, Victor, things must be turbulent at home, no? Turbulent? Why? I, I have never heard the trio playing better. Everyone agrees. Oh, is that so? Oh, yes. The more discord at home, the more harmony on stage. Is that so? She loves you, Victor. But she lives with Sergei. Oh, a diversion. And only because you blonde, that blonde, blonde uh, 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 how, how do the Americans say? Ah, that blonde bombshell. Send that one packing. Were there any calls for me, Olga Fedorovna? Calls? Uh, oh, yes. Uh, you are to phone this number. I uh, have written down here. Oh? Who, who is it? Oh, I, I, I'm not to tell anyone of this call. Who are you? Well, that sounds like the secret police. Oh, are you mad? You must never say that. How do you know this office isn't bugged? <sighs> I don't have enough problems. Come in. Yes? I, I was uh, told to see a... Colonel Rostov. Uh... I am Colonel Svetlana Rostov. Oh. Well, uh, how do you do? I, I had expected some... Um... <laughs> Burly, bearded Cossack? Well, maybe... Uh, won't you have a chair? Comrade Velovsky? Oh, thank you. Uh, comrade Colonel. <laughs> and I, I, I can tell you right now, the answer is yes. Uh, the answer is yes? Well, absolutely. <laughs> you see... Uh, comrade Colonel, uh, ever since I was summoned uh, here, I... Invited. Oh, oh, of course, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, cordially invited. I asked myself, why should the secret police want... Uh, the guardians of the people. Uh, that's exactly what I intended to say. Mm -hmm. Yes, the uh, guardians of the people. <laughs> Who, I might add, never sleep in their zeal. Please continue. Well, uh, I asked myself, uh, why should they want to see me? Me, Victor Volosky, a musician, a, a person who has done nothing else in his life but play music. Nothing else? Played music, made love. Mm -hmm. I ask you, Comrade Colonel, what else is there? Uh, you were saying... Oh, yeah, well, I, I said to myself, the only thing they could possibly ask of me is to uh, have the February trio play at a benefit concert for the widows and orphans of the secret police. Ah. The guardians of the people. Yes, yes, those uh, valiant, ever-watchful guardians of the people. Yeah, when I think of the poor, work-worn widows and and those thin, large-eyed children, I, I, I tell you, Comrade Colonel, my heart weeps. Of course, the the, the trio shall be honored to play. Uh, that is not why you were invited to come here. It is, it is... No. But then, Comrade Colonel, may I ask... Of what? course. It is our wish that you supply us with um, information. Information? Mm -hmm. Well, what sort of information? All sorts of information. Such as... Statements that might injure the people. Y you mean... You want me to be a spy? A spy? Comrade Victor, how can you say such an ugly word? But I... See, Comrade Victor, the people's government must be on constant alert. Of course. The imperialist enemy is everywhere. I wouldn't doubt that, but... Spreading the infection of treason. Now... At first, treason may consist of cynical, sarcastic remarks, little jibes at the people's government. These may seem harmless enough, but they are the prelude to a more serious counter-revolutionary activity. 
Tell me, Conrad Victor, have you heard anyone speaking in that manner recently? I beg your pardon? Have you heard anyone saying, well, um, nasty things about the people's government? Have I heard anyone say uh, things? Uh, no. Do not hesitate to let me know if you do. I mean, you may think this makes you an informer, but it doesn't. No? No, of course not. Informer. Oh, what a hard, ugly word. Yes. In truth, what you become is something beautiful. A guide, a teacher. Oh, yes. Uh... For we intend to teach, to guide these uh, these deluded unfortunates away from the snares of the imperialists and home again to the safety and security and love of the people. You understand? Certainly. Ah, thus, you do your friends a favor. Uh, I, I've never been involved in politics. <laughs> oh, life is politics. But I am... Always so busy rehearsing and playing. That uh, I really... Of course, of course. But you are not too busy to enjoy the delicious fruits of our glorious people's country. No. Uh... So then, like all citizens, you must also perform your duty. Now, I have here um, your uh, dossier. My dossier? Of course. Everyone has a dossier. Oh, yeah. I shall make the following notation in it. Comrade Victor Velosky, being duly informed as to the serious nature of the task demanded of him, gives his enthusiastic agreement to cooperate completely. Ah, you will notice I have inserted the word enthusiastic. Yeah. You have already earned a plus on your record. Splendid. But what if I uh, don't hear any untoward remarks? Ah, a person with as gifted an ear as yours? <gasps> I'm sure you must hear a great deal, Comrade Victor. Yes, Comrade Colonel. And I know. I'll hear from you soon. Speak of the devil. Who is speaking of the devil? We were speaking of you. Praskovia and I. I'm coming in. Don't try to stop me. Be my guest. All right, Praskovia. Let's go. Go? Well, we don't rehearse again until tomorrow. Let's go home. Home? With me. You love me. I love you. We belong together. Victor, I think you're reading the wrong note. You keep out of this. Well, he can't very well. Uh... Sergey and I are going to be married. That's impossible. Why is it impossible? He's the best pianist in the world. No, he isn't. He may be in the top ten. Is that a reason to marry him? Well, I don't need a reason to get married. So, you see, old boy... Don't but... call me old boy. Don't patronize me with your superior attitude. You're angry about Praskovia. Yeah. What can I tell you, Victor? The exact words you told me, the better man won. Just wish me luck. All right. Sergey, I wish you all the luck in the world. See, Praskovia? He's really a good sport. You're going to need all the luck you can get. In light of certain information that is now in our possession, wouldn't you say there's an ominous ring to Victor's statement? After all, as we have just heard, Victor now possesses a certain power. But would he use it selfishly for his own ends? We must wait to find out when I return with Act Three. Help! Jealousy is the rage of a man. Therefore, he will not spare in the day of vengeance. So the Bible tells us. Yes, and jealousy is also a two-edged sword... The most dangerous of all deadly blades because once drawn from the scabbard, it may never be sheathed again. To continue. Praskovia, darling, I, I told you. What did you tell me? I told you when you got to know me better, you'd be sure to fall in love with me. And you did. 
Oh, I'm sorry, Sergey. But I didn't. I'm not going to marry you. But you said we would be married. If... Well, I know I said it. Uh, but that doesn't mean it's going to happen. Then you didn't mean it? No, Sergey. I didn't mean it. Why did you say it? Because I... I want to teach Victor a lesson. You... You're using me. Well, it was your idea. Weren't you the one who said, give Victor something to worry about? Well, yes, Didn't but... you say, pretend to love me? What can happen? Either Victor will come running back and behave himself, or you'll discover that all along I've been the one for you. I'm sorry. The experiment didn't work. I can't help it if I still love Victor. Plus, Cove, if I could only make you see things as they really are. The way things are. I love Victor. I just can't help it. <laughs> Oh, don't stop on my account. It was very good. Thank you. Is Praskovia here yet? It's early. In the second movement, six bars after the letter E. Yes, I know the part. A little more attack might be good. I thought I gave it a little too much. It could use just a bit more. I'll try it. You're not going to marry Praskovia. I won't allow it. You won't? I won't. What do you think you can do about it? I know I know how to stop you, Sergei. Do you? A word to the wise should be sufficient. Where it concerns Pascov, your wisdom has never been my long suit. I'd hate to do it. Hate to do what? Stop you. Just don't force me. If I can't have Praskovia, nobody else can. Praskovia... What are you doing? Can't you see? I'm getting my things together. Where are you going? Home. To Victor. Hmm. You've decided. There was never really anything to decide. You can't go back to him. Oh, please, Sergei. I'm sorry. Yes. And I'm sorry, too. How sorry, you'll never know. Come in, dear comrade Victor. You asked to see me. I know someone who, uh, as you so correctly informed me earlier, uh, so someone in need of guidance. Yes. A deluded unfortunate who ridicules the people's government. A sick person in need of help. Uh, uh, yes. Ah, we have special areas set aside for that very purpose. And uh, who is this person? A friend, Comrade Victor? A close friend. Ah, you are being a true friend to him indeed. He completely misunderstands the function of a people's government. We must send him away in order that he may learn. And to do that, we, uh, we must know his name. His name? Yes. Uh, it's... It's possible. I've been mistaken. Comrade, the first time is always difficult. You'll get used to it. Um, I'm sure I'm, I'm wrong. Ah, your best friend. It must be Sir Gabor Dyaf. You see, I had to help you. Uh, but but I, I won't enter that detail on your record. Now, go, Comrade Victor, and continue the good work. <laughs> Any mail, Olga Fedorovna? Mail? Oh, the usual stuff. Oh, now what is wrong with you, Viktor Ivanovich? Are you sick? Yes, I'm. I'm sick. I have committed a sin. Oh, oh, we don't have sins in this country anymore. The government did away with all that. We have crimes, yes, but sins, no. Still, I have sinned. And what have you done? Something so vile, so despicable. Oh, I know who that is. Praskovia? No, your blonde friend. Her? 
<laughs> She's the cause of all my troubles. The gloves, you surely are. I have lost the love of Proskovia. Why do you say that? I saw the way she looked at Sergei. I'm being punished. But do you mind answering that phone? It's for you. Tell Marina I never want to see her again. All right. If that's the way you feel about it. Uh, hello? Who is this? Oh, Mary, not recording us. Oh, you want to speak with Victor? Well, he told me to inform you. Just a moment. Hold on, Olga. I'll speak with her. Hmm. Had there been a taker, I would have won the bet. Oh, he- hello, Marina. No, 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 no. I've, uh, I've been busy. Huh? Y- you need more talk for the magazine interview? Um, uh, so I, I can't come over. Uh, I, I must practice at home. Oh, yes, four or five hours a day. Well, uh, I wouldn't want you to get your editor angry. Uh, if all you want me to do is talk into a tape recorder, uh, yeah, yes, all, all right. Uh, I'll be home in uh, t- t- ten minutes. Uh, yes, Marina, uh, uh, au revoir. <laughs> tape do you need? I have enough. I'm glad you got what you need. (laughs) Silly Victor. I do not have what I need. What do you need? Can't you guess? Mon cher, kiss me. Uh, I I don't think we should. uh... Kiss me. Well, all right, it's just this once. Yes, it's Praskovia. Well, when when did you get here? Just a few moments ago. Well, I, I didn't hear you come in. So, you are the sweet and lovely Praskovia. Yes, the chocolate bar. Oh, <laughs> but she is charming, Victor. Well, I'm sorry I interrupted you. No, no, M- Marina was just leaving. She, uh... She came here to get some more tape for her interview. You see? There, there, there. That's, that, that's her t- tape recorder. Oh, you'll never change. Darling, that, that isn't true. When I think of how I loved you, how I was willing to crawl back to you on my hands and knees, I come here and find you making love. Oh, well, we weren't exactly making love. Well, suppose I'd walked in two minutes later. Two minutes. Uh... And you, mademoiselle, you think he belongs to you now, do you? Well, what can I tell you? <gasps> I suppose the best woman won. You chose her, didn't you, Victor? Praskovia, I didn't. Please, listen. No, you listen. If I can't have you, well, neither can anyone else. Huh? Who's that at the door? Open. In the name of the people. It's three o'clock in the morning. Open the door or we'll break it down. No, 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 please. Um, wait. Say, what is the Colonel Rostov. Uh, Svetlana. I-, I didn't recognize you with your overcoat on. Silence. Sergeant, search the apartment. Corporal? Put his clothes in a bag. But, but... I shall now read the sentence of the People's Court. Who, who, whose sentence? Your sentence. How, how could I be sentenced? I was, I was never put on trial for anything. You were tried and found guilty. But I wasn't there to defend myself. An irrelevant bourgeois detail. Citizen Victor Ivanovich Velovsky, you have been found guilty... Of anti people's activity. You are sentenced to a five year course of re education oh. in the mines at Varemia. Varemia? Well, that's. That's almost at the North Pole. Sergeant, take him away. But you, you can't! And if he tries to escape, shoot him! <laughs> Captain 
in what the shape of what is this arrest home or a prison camp? Then there are meat way when I call. Send in the new fish. Oh, things are too soft around here. Ah, what is your name? I'm uh, Victor Velosky. Ah, it's about time you showed up. Uh, come on. Captain, there's a mistake. There, there must be a mistake. That's what they all say. Oh, you're in the right place. I've been waiting for you. Here you have, Comrade Captain? And so have the other two. The, the other two? Yes, at last. I'm going to hear some chamber music. Chamber music? I can hardly wait to hear you play the Beethoven D major. The ghost, they call it. It has such marvelous musical texture in that second movement. But come on, Captain. Uh, now you have your violin. What are we waiting for? Uh, I, I don't understand. What's to understand? We're going to have a concert tonight. Or would you rather go to work in the mine? Oh, no, no, sir. You no. go in there and practice. Uh. And don't rush the adagio in the third movement. I heard you play it once. You got a lot to learn. Well, you got plenty of time inside. Uh, yeah, yes, sir. Hello, Victor. Victor? Pascoia. Sergey, what are you both doing here? Well, I'm here because you sent me here. I'm here because Sergei sent me here. And you're here because I sent you here. Sergei, can you ever forgive me? I think we've all forgiven each other. If we haven't, we should. Praskovia, I love you. I always loved you. And I'll always love you. That thing with Marina Trigorin. She only came up to finish an interview. It, it meant nothing. I know, darling. She told me. She told you? Mm-hmm. When? Yesterday. She's here. Marina's here? Yes. And now that I know her, I find her a very interesting lady. Oh, I'm so happy for you, Sergei. Well, what's Marina doing here? Well, what are so many of us doing here? Someone probably said of Marina, if I can't have you, nobody else will. Well, shall we begin, gentlemen? Uh, I understand a mutual friend of ours is expected to arrive any day now. Comrade Colonel Svetlana. <laughs> you must be joking. Is anyone safe? <laughs> what a reunion we shall have. Hmm? Will you give us the downbeat, darling? And... Where will it all end? Oh, well. And. To answer Victor's question, where will it all end? In that kind of situation, obviously it must end when the people inside the prisons outnumber the people who are outside the prisons. At that time, those who are confined break their bonds. However, once free themselves, they begin to build prisons of their own. And so the entire process repeats itself. And what is it called? Why, history. We shall have some further details in a few moments. Your pictures are important, so when you get them developed, take them to a store with a sign that says, We use Kodak paper for a good look. Just catch what Kodak paper is for a good look. know your pictures can look their best because Kodak paper will be behind them. Ask for Kodak paper wherever you see the Kodak paper sign. Just ask for Kodak paper for a good look. Kodak paper for a good look. Why don't you pour on the snap? Pour on the snap. Pour on the craft. Barbecue sauce. Pour on the snap.
has been said, and you've heard it before on our show, quis custodiat ipsos custodis? Who shall guard the guards themselves? And not just the armed guards, the ones who carry guns and clubs, but the guards of all shapes, forms, and types, those who attempt to guard our virtues, our morals, our thoughts, our arts, and science, and literature, and especially those who are self-appointed. Our cast included Bob Caliban, Russell Horton, Ann Williams, and Carol Titel. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. And now, a preview of our next tale. Well, you can't add, can't you? Yes, but I... Get yourself one of these pocket computers if you can. Uncle, I've added it three times. It always comes out the same. Then it's correct. Yeah, hand it over, I'll pay it. Here. $21.70... 72 cents. Yeah. Good Lord. 2172. The license plate? My address? Now this. Why, it's... It's... Uh... Uncanny. I kept telling myself it was a coincidence. Just a coincidence. That's all it was. The same number turning up on the same day three times. A coincidence. That's all. But that didn't stop a shiver from running through me. That didn't keep me from feeling that the whole thing was uncanny. Mrs. E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. 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 For an- Samuel Clemens, better known by his pen name, Mark Twain, had a long love affair with the Mississippi River. Glowing with sparkling remembrance, he has claimed, considering the Missouri its main branch, it is the longest river in the world, 4,300 miles. The Mississippi is remarkable in another way. It is always moving its habitat bodily, always moving sideways. Remember that and listen. That is the reason for the ring on the finger. The ring? So that if one should wake and twitch, the dead bell would ring. What a fearful bell. If you were a corpse and woke back to life in the dead house, you might not hear it that way. mystery drama, The Dead House, was adapted especially for the Mystery Theater by Ian Martin and stars Leon Janney and Robert Dryden. It is sponsored in part by Contact, the 12-hour cold capsule. I'll be back shortly with Act One. nothing has been more romantic than the sailing of a Mississippi River boat. From an hour before sailing, they would be burning pitch and rosin, and from the double smokestacks, columns of coal black smoke would rise and hang in the air like the flags flying from the jackstaffs. The last bells would clang out over the end of feverish loading. The gangways were snatched away. The majestic boat moves out into the stream. This is the world Mark Twain wrote about 21 years after being a riverboat pilot. And this is one of the stories he tells of that voyage. Welcome aboard, sir. I thank you, Captain. I have just turned over the boat to the pilot. I'm surprised you didn't make straight for the pilot house the moment you came aboard. Why, I considered it closed to ordinary passengers. Oh, indeed it is. But you're not going to try to hoodwink me and tell me that you are any ordinary passenger. Well, 
are just poor scribbler and indifferent journalist who hopes to make a chronicle of the voyage, which perhaps might make a book. Oh, you think our voyage might provide you with enough incident for that? It is my hope. <laughs> Why don't you go on up to the pilot house where you can swap told stories with a master? I'm hoping to run this trip incognito. Sam, it's up to you. If you want my pledge, no one should know you're aboard, you have it. I thank you for that. Uh, how far will you be going with us? Uh, uh, all the way to New Orleans? Well, I'd like to, for old time's sake, but no, not near as far. Yeah, just tell me your port of call and we'll set you down easy. I'll let you know in time to bring her to shore. So, once again, I was aboard a paddle steamer going down the Mississippi. But since I wanted to observe and report, I needed to remain objective. And then there was my special errand. I suppose I might as well drift into that history now. Toward the end of the previous year, I had been in Germany, in Munich, spending some time there with the hope of polishing my proficiency in the language. I am an incurable rambler, and during one of my wanderings, I visited the Dead House. An establishment where the government keeps and watches corpses until they decide that they are permanently dead and not in a trance. It was a grisly place that I shared with 36 corpses and the old lady who watched over them. Can I here help, mein Herr? Ein Schuldiger mir. Ich kann einzig klein Deutsch sprechen. Ich bin Amerikanischer. So, we can speak English, if you will. Oh, thank you, thank you. Uh, to whom do I speak? I am the Frau Dahlweiner, now a widow. What brings you to the Schermittig place? Schermittig? That means in English what? Uh, uh, sad, melancholy? Yeah, melancholy. Uh. Here are the poor on these boards... No one mourns or cares for them. Well, they're wrapped in shrouds, so they must be dead. Perhaps. Who is dead and who is alive? These are the doctor's choices. <laughs> and the doctor is only a man. That is the reason for the ring on the finger. The ring? To which the wire is attached, which mounts to the ceiling, and so back into the watch room where it is attached to the dead bell. A uh, bell? So that if one should revive and twitch or move, the dead bell will ring, and we shall know that they are not dead. Oh, how strange. What a fearful bell. Oh, if you were a corpse and woke back to life in the dead house, you might not hear it that way. It's fascinating. Uh, may I ask more questions? Your English is very good. Oh, my lodger has taught it to me. He is an American. Uh, here in Munich? Yes. If you are staying here, would you not like to come and see him? He is very ill. Perhaps you can raise his spirits. He knows far more of this fearful place than I do. This watchman's job was his before he took sick. Well, I don't know. I, I shall be leaving Munich shortly. Oh, such a short walk. And it would mean so much to him. Surely a man needs some warmth from some fire if he is about to die. I had simply thought, of course, that I was making a good Samaritan's trip. And from my first meeting, nothing should have changed that thought. He was a living man, but he did not look it. Propped on the pillows, his face was wasted. His hand on his breast so emaciated it was like a talon. 
Uh, As Frau Dahlweiner began her introduction, his eyes opened slowly and glittered wickedly from the twilight of their caverns. Uh, Herr Ritter, here's Herr Clemens come to meet you. Uh, <coughs> now, uh, now, Herr Ritter, that is no way to treat a stranger in our country, an American besides. American, is it? Yeah, that's right. What brings you to see me? The gentleman came to see you at, at my request. I thought to talk to an American again would lift your spirits. There's no can do that. An American? From where in America? Well, I was brought up in Hannibal, Missouri. Missouri? State next to Arkansas. You wouldn't know Mariana, no? I do, for a fact. Then that would make us neighbors. Oh, I, I think I should leave you two gentlemen alone. I'll make some coffee while you get acquainted. Oh, danke. Never mind the coffee. Would you say we were neighbors? Well, not quite. Hannibal is north of St. Lou. Mariana, a piece far south. Every 450 miles, the crow flies from Hannibal to Mariana. But near... Twice that far by the river. Uh, the Mississippi. The Mississippi. You know that river? Yes, I know it. Once upon a time, like the palm of my hand, and better. How come? Up to 21 years ago, I was a riverboat pilot. But I left the river. You don't make your home there anymore? No. My home now is in Hartford, Connecticut. So, you don't ever expect to go back west, eh? Oh, sure I do. When I return to the States, the first thing I plan to do is to go back and take a journey down the Mississippi. See if I even recognize her anymore. What do you mean? Mr. Ritter, there never was a woman as fickle, as flighty as the Mississippi. Why, that river can make prodigious jumps almost by night. And by cutting through narrow necks of land, straighten and shorten itself and change the shape of the country. A man could go to sleep one night in the state of Mississippi and wake up to find himself in Louisiana the next morning. I know. Well, you worked on the river. No, but I sure made use of it. Oh, how's that? Oh, when I was young, I was a hell of a, a fighting, drinking, gambling man. And then when I had a little money and a rage to settle down at last, I I bought me some land in Arkansas to sheep and settled in to make a homestead. But I was too far from the river for it to pay, so I... I... So you made a cut. <laughs> I guess I, I can afford to admit it now. No human laws are going to catch up with me anymore. Yes, sir. On a dark night when the river was rising fast, I cut me a little gutter across the neck of land. I don't have to tell you what happened. <laughs> In no time at all, old lady Mississippi wrought a miracle. Uh, the whole river took possession of that little ditch and put your plantation flat on its bank. Well, the other party's property became an island that shoaled up so no boat could get within ten miles of it. And by as much as his property went down, mine went up. And if you'd been caught cutting that ditch, they'd have tarred and feathered you and strung you from a tree. In a lot of ways, I might have been better off. Well, why'd you do it? Was money all that important to you? It was, and it wasn't. Oh, that's a little cryptic. I don't quite follow that. I sold the land. For a handsome profit. $25,000. Why? <laughs> that's a fortune. I know. The trouble was that you and I are not alone in recognizing it. Well, what do you mean by that? I never told this to another living soul. I never thought I would. But now I must, if you will help me... But for today, I, I'm too worried to tell you the story, and I, I still must think on whether I can trust the stranger. Could you, oh, well, could you come back tomorrow? Well, I, I, I'm not sure. You that must. I... 
You have to hear my story. You cannot refuse the request of a dying man. You, you were a miracle sent by God. The only man who can bring me salvation, who can save my soul. And with these words, according to Mark Twain's story, the dying man fell back on the bed, asleep or in some sort of coma. In haste, Mark Twain fetched the widow and left the man in her care, troubled in his mind as to whether it would be in Ritter's best interest or his own to return. I shall be back with his decision shortly. If no one has said it, someone should have. Words to this effect. Unless you are a priest or a doctor, avoid the confession of a dying man. He is only trying to transfer the cross from his shoulders to yours. In that early winter of 1883, Mark Twain, living in Munich, Germany, or as it was then Bavaria, fell into this trap. I could have taken to my heels and run. Then again, the... Incurable curiosity of the author beckoned me to stay. I could not resist. I had to hear the dying man's confession. I have never given up before, but last night I did. I know I'm going to die. You say you are going to revisit your river. If you do... You will see Napoleon, Arkansas, and I ask you when you are there to do a certain thing for me. I can make no promises. I ask none. Only the dictates of your conscience. Now come back with me all those years towards the end of the war between the states. Here's what happened. And I guess the way you'd have to understand it best is to meet Nell. How do you like it, Mrs. Ritter? It's heaven. I just want it to go on and on and never end. That's the way I hope to make life for you, Nell. How soon do we get to Napoleon, Carl? How soon would you like to? You know the answer to that. I, I want to be home. I don't want you to get two grand expectations. It's just a place I built myself. But it's good enough for the two of us right now. Oh, it, it won't be for long. Now, Nell, Carl? I never promised you no mansion or... Hey, wait a minute. What do you mean it won't be for long? Can't you guess? You mean you... you you're expecting... Well, it'll take a doctor to know for sure, but... I don't have any doubts. Why, honey, we only got married a little over two months ago. It, it don't take that long, Carl, when a woman's got herself a man like you and has a strong desire to make him a family. Oh, Nell. <laughs> Nell, I love you. Like I love you. Just give me the chance and I'll make a home big enough for you to be proud of. And... Big enough to bring up as many young'uns as you could want. If the war don't interfere... It won't. Not for me. I don't belong on either side. Don't you worry, Nell. What's that? That's saying to Napoleon, steamboat are coming. We'd best get ready to land. Is it very far to Mariana from there? Well, no. Just a piece south and inland. It's not on the river? You want to be on the river, honey, that's where you'll be. By the time you have your firstborn. I started digging my ditch within a month after we settled in. And the first thing in early spring when the waters began to rise, I opened up the end of it to the river. So by the time my daughter was born, I was able to give her the best present in the world. Carl! Carl! I'm coming, Nell. You all right? Where's the midwife? Oh, well, she, she's gone. I left you alone? Oh, I'm fine. Don't you worry about me. Oh, darling, don't you want to see your daughter? Oh, I sure do. Oh, 
she's so beautiful. And she's the spitting image of you. Where were you? Why weren't you here when she was born? I couldn't bear to see you hurting, Nell. Oh, silly. That's a woman's lot. And isn't it worth it to bring something like this into the world? Uh, you know what we're going to call her? No, what? Missy. Missy? Where did you get it from? From the present I promised you with your firstborn. Right almost in your front yard. Here, let me help you oh. sit up. Yeah. Nell, look. Where? Well, what's happened down there at the end of the slope? The fields are all gone. And it looks like... Like water. That's not just any water, Nell girl. That's the Mississippi flowing right through our front yard. Oh, oh you, you promised me a river, and, and you brought it to me. That's not the only thing, Nell. It's going to make us rich. And in the next two years, Mr. Clemens, it did make us rich. In money, but not all the way in happiness. It was a lonely place, and except for the river, isolated from people. Uh, it was a bad time. The war was over, and renegade soldiers dressed as tramps and such were plundering the land. They all were scared of them. I should have listened to her sooner than I did, but I moved too late. I sold the property, and there was over 25000 in cash gold the night they came. I woke from a deep sleep to find myself bound and gagged in the air, tainted with chloroform. It was black as a witch's pocket. Somewhere far off, I heard the baby crying in my wife's voice. Don't hold it, please. Oh, my baby, I told you where the money is. So you have, lady. Now all that's left is to shut your mouth forever. Shut that kid up. No, please, you said no violence. Roof C is moving out. The road of the river is alive with soldiers. We can't be caught. And if it won't shut its mouth, I will shut it for it. No, don't touch me. Let me go, woman. Now, shut that kid. You, you killed my baby. Your assassin will kill you for that. I told you, woman, get, get out of here. You said no violence. You said... We'd only gag them, not hurt them. Or I would not have come. Shut up. I had to change our plan when they waked up. You done all you could to protect them. Let that satisfy you. You relieved the woman and the baby alone now? Of course. And uh, what about him? He might be playing possum. We should club him. No. No more clubbing. Suppose he could recognize us. He can't. We put him to sleep with the chloroform. Besides, it is pitch black in here. Okay, Trooper, okay. We would take the chance. We have got the money. So strike a light so we can see to get out of here. I had no way to stop them. I couldn't move. The gag was so stifling that when I tried to speak, I could make no sound. It was dawn before I managed to wriggle free. And staggering to the other side of the room, I found my wife and daughter. Alive? No, Mr. Clemens, dead. There they lay, the poor unoffending ones, their troubles ended. When mine had just begun. Did you go to the law? <laughs> no law of gallows could pay the debt that was owing me. Well, how could you expect to take matters into your own hands? If it was so dark, you couldn't identify the man. I had some clues, Mr. Clemens. I heard their voices. And when they lit the match to see their way out, the hand that held it was missing a thumb. And when I went to the place my money had been hidden among the papers tossed around was one containing a bloody thumbprint. Well, what use could the last piece of information be to you? The man without the thumb was the one who had begged his companion should not hurt us. 
If the print on the paper belonged to the other man, I could identify him definitely enough to kill him. The man's thumbprint is the one sure proof of his identity. Well, still and all, grant that to be true. How could you go about a search for these passing traps? Remember my story. The one I knew I must kill someday had said, Troop C is moving out. We can't be caught. And also he called his companion Trooper. Then you think they were soldiers? A few miles away, two companies of U.S. cavalry were billeted. Company A was stationary, but Company C had been ordered 50 miles north to Napoleon. And you followed them? Yeah. With what money I had left, I made a disguise for myself out of odds and ends of clothing after I had buried my wife and daughter. By the time I reached Napoleon, I had a new trade. I had become a fortune teller. Did you find your men? It didn't take me long to find the one who lacked the thumb. His name was Kruger. He was a German, one of nine in the company. And the only one who had suffered such a wound. The only one. Besides, I recognized that whining voice. But he was not my prey. It was the other. So how did you locate the other? As a fortune teller, I would pass each client a sheet of paper daub his thumb with red paint and take a print. It wasn't until the 43rd member of the troop visited me for a reading that I found my man. How? I poured over the print of the ball of his thumb with a magnifying glass one whole night. It matched the bloody print left on the paper rifled from secret cash exactly. So you took the law into your own hands. Not yet. I had to be totally sure. So I went to Kruger. He was the weak link. He was a superstitious little coward. If I broke him, then I could be sure. What did you have to drag me down here by the river to this Lord Forsaken spot for? I have been rereading your fortune, and a part of it is so grave, it can't be said in public. Well, well what part? What, what? You and another man, whose fortune I also was studying last night, have murdered a woman and a child. Ah! Uh, no! The palm does not lie. The truth is not to be hidden. Your companion's name was Franz Adler. Ah! Uh, how did you know that? Who are you? What's the matter, Kruger? Was it too dark in that cabin for you to remember the man whose wife and child you slaughtered? Well, it, well, it was pitch black. We were only shadows. If I don't remember you, how can I you... could feel uh, you were missing a thumb. Well, uh, no, I, I didn't do it. Franz did. I tried to stop him, but I was too late for your wife and the baby. But I made him leave you alone. I saved your life. Now, please, please, don't, don't, don't kill me. I have no intention of killing you. Well, what is it that you want? The money? Yes. Why? I don't have it. He took it from me. He has it hidden away. Then let him find it and bring it to me. Not you. Him. At this spot tonight at the stroke of twelve. Yeah, but how can I be sure? You that... had better be sure. But... The sentries... If I... I can avoid them, so can he. If not, I promise you, you will die. I have read it in your palm. Oh, no, 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 please. I don't want to die. Then have him meet me here at midnight. Tell him to come by horse and bring the money in the saddlebags. Otherwise, I shall go to the authorities and see you both hung. The man was a coward, Mr. Twain, and superstitious to his roots. 
I knew my revenge was near at last, and I could taste the sweetness of it. I settled down by the riverbank to wait for the murderer. At this moment in his story, Mark Twain reports that the dying man sagged back against his pillows, gasping for breath, as though in his last throes. Was he going to be able to finish his story? I'm afraid, like Mark Twain, we're going to have to wait until I return with Act Three. We left Samuel Clemens, better known as Mark Twain, by the bedside of a dying man whose story he later penned and made immortal. Exhausted by his narrative and the reliving of his tragic life, the man had sunk back against his pillows, fighting for breath. Aware that every breath may well be the man's last, Mark Twain leans over him anxiously. Mr. Ritter. Mr. Ritter. I'm not done yet. I have to tell you the rest so I can make my request. Uh, It might be better if I fetch a doctor. No duck can do anything for me now. I don't know if you should tax your strength. What other use have I for it? It won't keep me alive any more than I had determined Franz Adler would live beyond the moment I saw him. I wanted to watch his face to glow as he struggled in the death agony to save him my revenge for my wife and child that he had killed. But that was to be denied me. He didn't meet the appointment? Oh, yes. He came. But before midnight, the moon had gone behind heavy clouds. And the night was as pitch black as the night he had come to my cabin. I lay hidden in the mangrove and watched him come on horseback. All I could see was a silhouette and the bulging saddlebags. My knife was in my hand. As he passed me with one leap, I was on him and had him dragged off his horse. And then all the plans went wrong. Instead of being the ambusher, I was ambushed. I drove my knife straight up through his belly, under the rib cage, and into his heart. He was dead before he could cry out. And I had my own life to think of. I mounted the plunging horse. And when the shots rang out, I clapped my heels to him and fled. So, you had your revenge? I thought so. Though I was cheated out of the money. Oh, how so? By dawn, I had to rest the horse and myself. But when I stripped the saddle and looked in the bags, there wasn't any money. They were stuffed with sage grass and the like. Did you go back for it? And put my neck in a noose? No. Besides, I didn't care all that much. About $25,000? It was blood money. If I hadn't cheated to get it in the first place, my wife and child might be alive today. Besides, the first man, Kruger, had double-crossed me. You could be sure he had picked up the money, deserted, and faded out of sight as I did. Well, how did you fade out of sight? How did Kruger? That's one part of the story. For the moment, the way I did was to beat my way to New Orleans. Ship on board as a hand before the mast stagger across the world waiting only for death. Two years ago, my health began to fail. And in my purposeless way, I had wandered here into Munich. I had no money, sought work, and was hired to be the night watchman in the dead house you have just visited. I liked it. I felt I belonged among the dead. Then one night, alone in the watch room, cold, numb, comfortless, the incredible happened. Over my head, the dead bell rang. It was the first time I had ever heard it. For a moment, I was almost paralyzed, and 
I pulled myself together and ran to the corpse room. On the board table, one of the shrouded corpses wagging its head from side to side was sitting up. <laughs> Help him! Help me! It's all right. I, I, I'm here. Are you really alive? For this! But I am bound. I can't move. I can't, can't talk. Get the old of this. Who, who are you? What does this matter? I am in Franz Adler. If you must know. Franz Adler? But she can't be. You are dead. dead. Not dead yet, as you can see. After 17 years. Oh, what are you talking about? I was only knifed last night. Get me out of this bone. Yes, yes. Uh, first, let me strip the winding cloth from your face. <coughs> oh, 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 yes. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. That is good. Oh. Good. <coughs> no. It is you. The same Franz Adler. What is the matter with you, fool? Unwind the rest of these bandages so I can move. I am dying. Have mercy. Did you have mercy 20 years or so ago when you murdered my wife and my baby? What, what, are, what are you talking about? Napoleon. Do you remember the town in America? Where you and Kruger were stationed as you served your time in the U.S. Cavalry? How, how could you know about that? You murdered my wife and baby. You? Oh, the, the fort and dead, the one who drove poor Kruger out of his mind. I had a rendezvous with you by the Mississippi River. Do you remember that? Uh, yes, yes, I remember. I thought I killed you there, Adler. No man could have lived after the way I sank my knife. You are right. And why are you here and still alive? Because you killed the wrong man. It was Kruger you drove your knife into. I was stunned. My whole life fell away from under me. I looked at the ghastly specter in front of me, his whole body swathed in bandages. Helpless. My prisoner. And all through his stammered explanations, the one inflexible thought in my mind was, you escaped me once, you won't escape this time. Please, please, what, what do you want of me? I want to know how you're still alive. When I killed you all those years ago. You, you talked to that fool Kruger. You scared him half to death. Uh, he, he came to me saying that I had to meet you by the river with the money. But you sent him instead? Uh, he had no choice. He knew I would kill him unless he obeyed. Poor silly little man caught between forces he could not handle. So you double-crossed him, too, and allowed me to kill him first. What do you mean, first? Before you started shooting and trying to kill me. No, 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 that, that was the watch patrol. Don't lie to me. Was... Only one person was firing. You would have killed me with as little compunction as you killed my wife and my baby. No, no, that was an accident. Look, please, help me out of here. I, 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 I can make you rich again. How? The money, the, the $25,000, your money. It isn't all spent by now? No, 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 it is still hidden where it was 17 years ago. You didn't take it and spend it? When Kruger was found dead, I was arrested for his murder. I managed to escape from the army stockade and flee America back to Germany. I, I never had a, a, ch a chance to pick up the money. The money poor Kruger thought he was bringing me in the saddlebags. Uh, yes, he, he was a, a fool. But we, we, we have not. Huh? We, we are men. We, we can make a bargain. What bargain? Yeah, and loose me from these bandages. Set me free. And I will tell you where to find the money. How can I trust you? You can trust me. As much as you trust me? Uh, yes, yes. All right. First, where's the money? It is in, in the town of Napoleon. As a corner... Wait, wait, not so fast. Let me... Let me write this down. 
Napoleon. Yes. Corner of the... The corner of Orleans and Market. Mm-hmm. A brick livery stable. Yes. A cut a corner from the courthouse. <laughs> Third stone. Fourth... Fourth row. Behind the... Oh, God. This house. Help me out of the bandages. <laughs> I need the doctor. Or or I will die. But you are here in the dead house. You are already dead. No, no. I ran the dead bell. In all the years in this dead house, the dead bell has never rung. I didn't hear it ring. You you came in answer to it. Did I? Yeah, and we, we made the bargain. Please, I, I, I told you where the money is. You, you can have it back. Can I have my wife back? Or my baby daughter? You've, you've got to hurt me. I will. I caught you escaping from the grave. This time I intend to make sure that you will be thrust into it forever. <laughs> He had a long, hard death of it. I sat and watched him all the time. It was all of three hours and six minutes from the time he rang the bell. That's a terrible story. I'm sorry you told me all this. I had to... to be sure you would do me this last favor. And what is that? Yeah. Huh? Take this. Please. What is it? It's the directions where to find the money. In Napoleon, Mr. Clemens. You expect to be there in the next year. I want you to find it. And send it... (coughs) Uh, I'll send it to you? No. I shall be gone by then. (sighs) After Adler died, I spent some months making inquiries. Kruger's death was very much on my mind. I found he had a son, a shoemaker at number 14 Koenigstrasse, Mannheim. A widower with some young children. I want the money to go to him as some amends. The man did try to save my wife and child's life. It was a poor recompense for me to, even in accident, take his life. This tortured man was dead. And he had laid on me a heavy burden. Within the next year, here I was on the Mississippi, nearing Napoleon, with my scribbled directions of how to find a foot. I was far from morally sure anyone should own. But, willy-nilly, I was cursed with having to make that decision. Well, Miss Clemens, you've been a stranger during the voyage. We're approaching a landfall I must make. I don't know if it's a regular port of call for you. Well, where might that be? Napoleon. Napoleon? (laughs) Yeah, that's right. (laughs) You you wish me to land you there? (laughs) Have you any objection? Me? For myself? No. But I just don't hardly know how I could go about it. What do you mean? Well, about seven years ago, the Arkansas River crested and bust right through Napoleon, tore it all to rags, and emptied it into the Mississippi. Why, right this moment, the boat is paddling dead center over where the town used to be. There just isn't that in Napoleon anymore. No secret cabin. And a way out from under a promise I never should have made. I've always loved the Mississippi. And I love her still. Among all her other virtues, the lady knows how to bury her dead. (laughs) 
A complex story related by a master storyteller. Sandwiched among fact and fiction in Mark Twain's account of his return to the Mississippi. Is it true? I can only quote Mr. Twain himself. I was gratified to be able to answer promptly, and I did. I said, I didn't know. I'll be back shortly. Mark Twain, Samuel Langhorn Clemens. Under either name, he is one of America's immortals. Changing times may make succeeding generations less aware of him, but somewhere, always, there will be those to rediscover him and not allow him to die, as he himself was unwilling to when in reply to a false news story, he sent the famous cable to the New York press. The reports of my death are greatly exaggerated. Our cast included Leon Janney, Bryna Rayburn, Robert Dryden, and Ian Martin. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. This is E.G. Marshall inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time, pleasant dreams.